Chapter Fifty Eight of Middlemarch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. Middlemarch by George Eliot. Chapter Fifty Eight. For there can live no hatred in thine eye. Therefore in that I cannot know thy change. In many's looks the false heart's history Is writ in moods and frowns and wrinkles strange. But heaven in thy creation did decree That in thy face sweet love should ever dwell. Whate'er thy thoughts or thy heart's workings be, Thy looks should nothing thence but sweetness tell. Shakespeare's Sonnet at the time when Mr. Vincy uttered that presentiment about Rosamond, she herself had never had the idea that she should be driven to make the sort of appeal which he foresaw. She had not yet had any anxiety about ways and means, although her domestic life had been expensive as well as eventful. Her baby had been born prematurely, and all the embroidered robes and caps had to be laid by in darkness. This misfortune was attributed entirely to her having persisted in going out on horseback one day, when her husband had desired her not to do so. But it must not be supposed that she had shown temper on the occasion, or rode rudely told him that she would do as she liked. What led her particularly to desire horse exercise was a visit from Captain Lydgate, the baronet's third son, who, I am sorry to say, was detested by our Tertius of that name as a vapid fop parting his hair from brow to nape in a despicable fashion, not followed by Tertius himself, and showing an ignorant security that he knew the proper thing to say on every topic. Lydgate inwardly cursed his own folly that he had drawn down this visit by consenting to go to his uncle's on the wedding tour, and he made himself rather disagreeable to Rosamond by saying so in private. For to Rosamond this visit was a source of unprecedented but gracefully concealed exultation. She was so intensely conscious of having a cousin who was a baronet's son staying in the house, that she imagined the knowledge of what was implied by his presence to be diffused through all other minds. And when she introduced Captain Lydgate to her guests, she had a placid sense that his rank penetrated them as if it had been an odour. The satisfaction was enough for the time to melt away some disappointment in the conditions of marriage with a medical man, even of good birth. It seemed now that her marriage was visibly as well as ideally floating her above the Middlemarch level, and the future looked bright, with letters and visits to and from Collingham, and vague advancements in consequence for Tertius, especially as probably at the captain's suggestion his married sister, Mrs. Mengen, had come with her maid and stayed two nights on her way from town. Hence it was clearly worth while for Rosamond to take pains with her music, and the careful selection of her lace. As to Captain Lydgate himself, his low brow, his aquiline nose bent on one side, and his rather heavy utterance, might have been disadvantageous in any young gentleman who had not a military bearing and moustache to give him what is doted on by some flower-like blonde heads as style. He had, moreover, that sort of high breeding which consists in being free from the petty solicitudes of middle-class gentility, and he was a great critic of feminine charms. Rosamond delighted in his admiration now even more than she had done at Collingham, and he found it easy to spend several hours of the day in flirting with her. The visit altogether was one of the pleasantest larks he had ever had, not the less so, perhaps, because he suspected that his queer cousin Tertius wished him away. The Lydgate, who would rather, hyperbolically speaking, have died than have failed in polite hospitality, suppressed his dislike, and only pretended generally not to hear what the gallant officer said, consigning the task of answering him to Rosamond. For he was not at all a jealous husband, and preferred leaving a feather-headed young gentleman alone with his wife to bearing him company. "'I wish you would talk more to the captain at dinner, Tertius.' said Rosamond, one evening, when the important guest was gone to Loamford to see some brother officers stationed there. 
you really look so absent sometimes. You seem to be seeing through his head into something behind it, instead of looking at him. "'My dear Rosie, you don't expect me to talk much to such a conceited ass as that, I hope,' said Lydgate, brusquely. "'If he got his head broken, I might look at it with interest. Not before.' "'I cannot conceive why you should speak of your cousin so contemptuously,' said Rosamond, her fingers moving at her work while she spoke with a mild gravity which had a touch of disdain in it. "'Ask Ladislaw if he doesn't think your captain the greatest bore he ever met with. Ladislaw has almost forsaken the house since he came.' Rosamond thought she knew perfectly well why Mr. Ladislaw disliked the captain. He was jealous, and she liked his being jealous. "'It is impossible to say what will suit eccentric persons,' she answered. "'But in my opinion Captain Lydgate is a thorough gentleman, and I think you ought not—' out of respect to Sir Godwin, to treat him with neglect. "'No, dear, but we have had dinners for him, and he comes and goes out as he likes. He doesn't want me.' "'Still, when he is in the room, you might show him more attention. He may not be a phoenix of cleverness in your sense. His profession is different, but it will be all the better for you to talk a little on his subjects. I think his conversation is quite agreeable, and he is anything but an unprincipled man.' "'The fact is, you would wish me to be a little more like him.' "'Rosie,' said Lydgate, in a sort of resigned murmur, with a smile which was not exactly tender, and certainly not merry. Rosamond was silent, and did not smile again, but the lovely curves of her face look good-tempered enough without smiling. Those words of Lydgate's were like a sad milestone, marking how far he had travelled from his old dreamland, in which Rosamond Vincy appeared to be that perfect piece of womanhood who would reverence her husband's mind after the fashion of an accomplished mermaid, using her comb and looking-glass and singing her song for the relaxation of his adored wisdom alone. He had begun to distinguish between that imagined adoration and the attraction towards a man's talent, because it gives him prestige, and is like an order in his buttonhole, or an honourable before his name. It might have been supposed that Rosamond had travelled too, since she had found the pointless conversation of Mr. Ned Plymdale perfectly wearisome. But to most mortals there is a stupidity which is unendurable, and a stupidity which is altogether acceptable. Else, indeed, what would become of social bonds? Captain Lydgate's stupidity was delicately scented, carrying itself with style, talked with a good accent, and was closely related to Sir Godwin. Rosamond found it quite agreeable, and caught many of its phrases. Therefore, since Rosamond, as we know, was fond of horseback, there were plenty of reasons why she should be tempted to resume her riding, when Captain Lydgate, who had ordered his man with two horses to follow him and put up at the Green Dragon, begged her to go out on the grey, which he warranted to be gentle and trained to carry a lady. Indeed, he had bought it for his sister, and was taking it to Quallingham. Rosamond went out the first time without telling her husband, and came back before his return. But the ride had been so thorough a success, and she declared herself so much the better in consequence, that he was informed of it with full reliance on his consent that she should go riding again. On the contrary, Lydgate was more than hurt. He was utterly confounded that she had risked herself on a strange horse without referring the matter to his wish. After the first almost thundering exclamations of astonishment, which sufficiently warned Rosamond of what was coming, he was silent for some moments. "'However, you have come back safely,' he said at last, in a decisive tone. "'You will not go out again, Rosie. That is understood. If it were the quietest, most familiar horse in the world, there would always be the chance of accident, and you know very well that I wished you to give up riding the roan on that account.' "'But there is the chance of accident indoors, Tertius.' "'My darling, don't talk nonsense,' said Lydgate, in an imploring tone. "'Surely I am the person to judge for you. I think it is enough that I say you are not to go again.' Rosamond was arranging her hair before dinner, and the reflection of her head in the glass showed no change in its loveliness, except a little turning aside of the long neck. Lydgate had been moving about with his hands in his pockets, and now paused near her, as if he awaited some reassurance. "'I wish you would fasten up my plaits, dear,' said Rosamond, letting her arms fall with a little sigh, 
so as to make her husband ashamed of standing there like a brute. Lydgate had often fastened the flat plaits before, being among the deftest of men with his large, finely formed fingers. He swept up the soft festoons of plaits and fastened in the tall comb. To such uses do men come. And what could he do then but kiss the exquisite nape which was shown in all its delicate curves? But when we do what we have done before, it is often with a difference. Lydgate was still angry, and had not forgotten his point. "'I shall tell the captain that he ought to have known better than offer you his horse,' he said, as he moved away. "'I beg you will not do anything of the kind, Tertius,' said Rosamond, looking at him with something more marked than usual in her speech. "'It will be treating me as if I were a child. Promise that you will leave the subject to me.' There did seem to be some truth in her objection. Lydgate said, "'Very well,' with a surly obedience, and thus the discussion ended with his promising Rosamond, and not with her promising him. In fact, she had been determined not to promise. Rosamond had that victorious obstinacy which never wastes its energy in impetuous resistance. What she liked to do was to her the right thing, and all her cleverness was directed to getting the means of doing it. She meant to go out riding again on the grey, and she did go on the next opportunity of her husband's absence, not intending that he should know until it was late enough not to signify to her. The temptation was certainly great. She was very fond of the exercise, and of the gratification of riding on a fine horse, with Captain Lydgate, Sir Godwin's son, on another fine horse by her side, and of being met in this position by any one but her husband was something as good as her dreams before marriage. Moreover, she was riveting the connection with the family at Quallingham, which must be a wise thing to do. But the gentle Grey, unprepared for the crash of a tree that was being felled on the edge of Halsell Wood, took fright, and caused a worse fright to Rosamond, leading finally to the loss of her baby. Lydgate could not show his anger towards her, but he was rather bearish to the captain, whose visit naturally soon came to an end. In all future conversations on the subject, Rosamond was mildly certain that the riot had made no difference, and that if she had stayed at home, the same symptoms would have come on and would have ended in the same way, because she had felt something like them before. Lydgate could only say, Poor, poor darling! But he secretly wondered over the terrible tenacity of this mild creature, there was gathering within in him an amazed sense of his powerlessness over Rosamond. His superior knowledge and mental force, instead of being, as he had imagined, a shrine to consult on all occasions, was simply set aside on every practical question. He had regarded Rosamond's cleverness as precisely of the receptive kind which became a woman. He was now beginning to find out what the cleverness was, what was the shape into which it had run, as into a close network, aloof and independent. No one quicker than Rosamond to see causes and effects which lay within the track of her own tastes and interests. She had clearly seen Lydgate's pre-eminence in Middlemarch society, and could go on imaginatively tracing still more agreeable social effects when his talent should have advanced him. But for her, his professional and scientific ambition had no other relation to these desirable effects than if they had been the fortunate discovery of an ill-smelling oil. And, that oil apart, with which she had nothing to do, of course she believed in her own opinion more than she did in his. Lydgate was astounded to find in numberless trifling matters, as well as in this last serious case of the riding, that affection did not make her compliant. He had no doubt that the affection was there, and had no presentiment that he had done anything to repel it. For his own part, he said to himself that he loved her as tenderly as ever, and could make up his mind to her negations. But, well, Lydgate was much worried, and conscious of new elements in his life as noxious to him as an inlet of mud to a creature that has been used to breathe and bathe and dart after its illuminated prey in the clearest of waters. Rosamond was soon looking lovelier than ever at her work-table, enjoying drives in her father's phaeton, and thinking it likely that she might be invited to Quallingham. 
she knew that she was as much more exquisite ornament to the dining-room there than any daughter of the family, and in reflecting that the gentlemen were aware of that, did not perhaps sufficiently consider whether the ladies would be eager to see themselves surpassed. Lydgate, relieved from anxiety about her, relapsed into what she inwardly called his moodiness, a name which to her covered his thoughtful preoccupation with other subjects than herself, as well as that uneasy look of the brow and distaste for all ordinary things, as if they were mixed with bitter herbs, which really made a sort of weathered last to his vexation and foreboding. These latter states of mind had one cause amongst others, which he had generously but mistakenly avoided mentioning to Rosamond, lest it should affect her health and spirits. Between him and her, indeed, there was that total missing of each other's mental track, which is too evidently possible even between persons who are continually thinking of each other. To Lydgate it seemed that he had been spending month after month in sacrificing more than half of his best intent and best power to his tenderness for Rosamond, bearing her little claims and interruptions without impatience, and, above all, bearing without betrayal of bitterness to look through less and less of interfering illusion at the blank, unreflecting surface her mind presented to his ardour for the more impersonal ends of his profession and his scientific study, an ardour which he had fancied that the ideal wife must somehow worship as sublime, though not in the least knowing why. But his endurance was mingled with a self-discontent, which, if we know how to be candid, we shall confess to make more than half our bitterness under grievances, wife or husband included. It always remains true that if we had been greater, circumstance would have been less strong against us. Lydgate was aware that his concessions to Rosamond were often little more than the lapse of slackening resolution, the creeping paralysis apt to seize an enthusiasm which is out of adjustment to a constant portion of our lives. And on Lydgate's enthusiasm there was constantly pressing not a simple weight of sorrow, but the biting presence of a petty, degrading care, such as casts the blight of irony over all higher effort. This was the care which he had hitherto abstained from mentioning to Rosamond, and he believed with some wonder that it had never entered her mind, though certainly no difficulty could be less mysterious. It was an inference with a conspicuous handle to it, and had been easily drawn by indifferent observers, that Lydgate was in debt, and he could not succeed in keeping out of his mind for long together that he was every day getting deeper into that swamp, which tempts men towards it with such a pretty covering of flowers and verdure. It is wonderful how soon a man gets up to his chin there, in a condition in which, spite of himself, he is forced to think chiefly of release, though he had a scheme of the universe in his soul. Eighty months ago Lydgate was poor, but had never known the eager want of small sums, and felt rather a burning contempt for any one who descended a step in order to gain them. He was now experiencing something worse than a simple deficit. He was assailed by the vulgar, hateful trials of a man who has bought and used a great many things which might have been done without, and which he is unable to pay for, though the demand for payment has become pressing. How this came about may be easily seen without much arithmetic or knowledge of prices. When a man, in setting up a house and preparing for marriage, finds that his furniture and other initial expenses come to between four and five hundred pounds more than he has capital to pay for, when at the end of a year it appears that his household expenses, horses and etc., amount to nearly a thousand, while the proceeds of the practice reckoned from the old books to be worth eight hundred per annum, have sunk like a summer pond and make hardly five hundred, chiefly in unpaid entries. The plain inference is that, whether he minds it or not, he is in debt. Those were less expensive times than our own, and provincial life was comparatively modest. But the ease with which a medical man who had lately brought a practice, who thought that he was obliged to keep two horses, whose table was supplied without stint, and who paid an insurance on his life and a high rent for house and garden, might find his expenses doubling his receipts, can be conceived by any one who does not think these details beneath his consideration. Rosamond, accustomed from her to an extravagant household, 
thought that good housekeeping consisted simply in ordering the best of everything. Nothing else answered, and Lydgate supposed that, if things were done at all, they must be done properly. He did not see how they were to live otherwise. If each head of household expenditure had been mentioned to him beforehand, he would probably have observed that he could hardly come to much, and if any one had suggested a saving on a particular article, for example the substitution of cheap fish for deer, it would have appeared to him simply a penny-wise, mean notion. Rosamond, even without such an occasion as Captain Lydgate's visit, was fond of giving invitations, and Lydgate, though he often thought the guests tiresome, did not interfere. This sociability seemed a necessary part of professional prudence, and the entertainment must be suitable. It is true Lydgate was constantly visiting the homes of the poor, and adjusting his prescriptions of diet to their small means. But, dear me, has it not by this time ceased to be remarkable? Is it not rather that we expect in men that they should have numerous strands of experience lying side by side, and never compare them with each other? Expenditure like ugliness and errors, becomes a totally new thing when we attach our own personality to it, and measure it by that wide difference which is manifest, in our own sensations, between ourselves and others. Lydgate believed himself to be careless about his dress, and he despised a man who calculated the effect of his costume. It seemed to him only a matter of course that he had abundance of fresh garments. Such things were naturally ordered in sheaves, it must be remembered that he had never hitherto felt the check of importunate debt, and he walked by habit, not by self-criticism. But the check had come. Its novelty made it the more irritating. He was amazed, disgusted that conditions so foreign to all his purposes, so hatefully disconnected with the objects he cared to occupy himself with, should have lain in ambush and clutched him when he was unaware. And there was not only the actual debt, there was the certainty that in his present position he must go on deepening it. Two furnishing tradesmen at Brassing, whose bills had been incurred before his marriage, and whom uncalculated current expenses had ever since prevented him from paying, had repeatedly sent him unpleasant letters which had forced themselves on his attention. This could hardly have been more galling to any disposition than to Lydgate's, with his intense pride, his dislike of asking a favour, or being under an ab obligation to any one. He had scorned even to form conjectures about Mr. Vince's intentions on money matters, and nothing but extremity could have induced him to apply to his father-in-law, even he had not been made aware, in his various indirect ways since his marriage, that Mr. Vince's own affairs were not flourishing, and the expectation of help from him would be resented. Some men easily trust in the readiness of friends, it had never been the former part of his life occurred to Lydgate that he should need to do so. He had never thought what borrowing would be to him. But now that the idea had entered his mind, he felt that he would rather incur any other hardship. In the meantime, he had no money or prospects of money, and his practice was not getting more lucrative. No wonder that Lydgate had been unable to suppress all signs of inward trouble during the last few months. And now that Rosamond was regaining brilliant health, he meditated taking her entirely into confidence on his difficulties. New conversance with tradesmen's bills had forced his reasoning into a new channel of comparison. He had begun to consider from a new point of view what was necessary and unnecessary in goods ordered, and to see that there must be some change of habits. How could such a change be made without Rosamond's concurrence? The immediate occasion of opening the disagreeable fact to her, was forced upon him. Having no money, and having privately sought advice as to what security could possibly be given by a man in his position, Lydgate had offered the one good security in his power to the less peremptory creditor, who was a silversmith and jeweller, and who consented to take on himself the upholsterer's credit also, accepting interest for a given term. The security necessary was a bill of sale on the furniture of his house, which might make a creditor easy for a reasonable time about a debt amounting to less than four hundred pounds, and the silversmith, Mr. Dover, was willing to reduce it by taking back a portion of the plate 
and in any other article which was as good as new. Any other article was a phrase delicately implying jewellery, and more particularly some purple amethysts costing thirty pounds which Lydgate had brought as a bridal present. Opinions may be divided as to his wisdom in making this present. Some may think that it was a graceful attention to be expected from a man like Lydgate, and that the fault of any troublesome consequences lay in the pinched narrowness of provincial life at that time, which offered no conveniences for professional people whose fortune was not proportioned to their taste. Also, in Lydgate's ridiculous fastidiousness about asking his friends for money. However, it had seemed a question of no moment to him on that fine morning when he went to give a final order for plate. In the presence of other jewels enormously expensive, and as an addition in order of which the amount had not been exactly calculated, thirty pounds for ornaments so exquisitely suited to Rosamond's neck and arms could hardly appear excessive when there was no ready cash for it to exceed. But at this crisis, Lydgate's imagination could not help dwelling on the possibility of letting the amethysts take their place again among Mr. Dover's stock, though he shrank from the idea of proposing this to Rosamond. Having been roused to discern consequences which he had never been in the habit of tracing, he was preparing to act on this discernment with some of the rigour, by no means all, that he would have applied in pursuing experiment. He was nerving himself to this rigour as he rode from Brassing, and meditated on the representations he must make to Rosamond. It was evening when he got home. He was intensely miserable, this strong man of nine-and-twenty and of many gifts. He was not saying angrily within himself that he had made a profound mistake, but the mistake was at work in him like a recognised chronic disease, mingling its uneasy importunities with every prospect and enfeebling every thought. As he went along the passage to the drawing-room, he heard the piano and singing. Of course, Ladislaw was there. It was some weeks since Will had parted from Dorothea, yet he was still at the old post in Middlemarch. Lydgate had no objection in general to Ladislaw's coming, but just now he was annoyed that he could not find his hearth free. When he opened the door, the two singers went on towards the keynote, raising their eyes and looking at him indeed, but not regarding his entrance as an interruption. To a man galled with his harness as poor Lydgate was, it is not soothing to see two people warbling at him, as he comes in with the sense that the painful day has still pains in store. His face, already paler than usual, took on a scowl as he walked across the room and flung himself into a chair. The singers, feeling themselves excused by the fact that they had only three bars to sing, now turned round. "'How are you, Lydgate?' said Will, coming forward to shake hands. Lydgate took his hand, but did not think it necessary to speak. "'Have you dined, Tertius? I expected you much earlier,' said Rosamond, who had already seen that her husband was in a horrible humour. She seated herself in her usual place as she spoke. "'I have dined. I should like some tea, please,' said Lydgate curtly, still scowling and looking markedly at his legs stretched out before him. Will was too quick to need more. "'I shall be off,' he said, reaching his hat. "'Tea is coming,' said Rosamond. "'Please don't go.' "'Yes, Lydgate is bored,' said Will, who had more comprehension of Lydgate than Rosamond had, and was not offended by his manner, easily imagining outdoor causes of annoyance. "'There is the more need for you to stay,' said Rosamond playfully, and in her lightest accent. "'He will not speak to me all the evening.' "'Yes, Rosamond, I shall,' said Lydgate, in his strong baritone. "'I have some serious business to speak to you about.' No introduction of the business could have been less like that which Lydgate had intended, but her indifferent manner had been too provoking. "'There, you see,' said Will, "'I am going to the meeting about the Mechanics Institute. Good-bye.' And he went quickly out of the room. Rosamond did not look at her husband but presently rose and took her place before the tea-tray. She was thinking that she had never seen him so disagreeable. Lydgate turned his dark eyes on her, and watched her 
as she delicately handled the tea-service with her taper fingers, and looked at the objects immediately before her with no curve in her face disturbed, and yet with an ineffable protest in her air against all people with unpleasant manners. For the moment he lost the sense of his wound in a sudden speculation about this new form of feminine impassibility revealing itself in the sylph-like frame which he had once interpreted as the sign of a ready, intelligent sensitiveness. His mind glancing back to Law, while he looked at War Rosalind, he said inwardly, "'Would she kill me because I wearied her?' And then, "'It is the way with all women.' But this power of generalising, which gives men so much the superiority and mistake over the dumb animals, was immediately thwarted by Lydgate's memory of wandering impressions from the behaviour of another woman. From Dorothea's looks and tones of emotion about her husband, when Lydgate began to attend him, from her passionate cry to be taught what would best comfort that man for whose sake it seemed as if she must quell every impulse in her except the yearnings of faithfulness and compassion. These revived impressions succeeded each other quickly and dreamily in Lydgate's mind while the tea was being brewed. He had shut his eyes in the last instant of reverie while he heard Dorothea saying, "'Advise me, think what I can do. He's been all his life labouring and looking forward. He minds about nothing else, and I mind about nothing else.' That voice of deep-souled womanhood had remained within him as the enkindling conceptions of dead and sceptred genius had remained within him. Is there not a genius for feeling nobly which also reigns over human spirits and their conclusions? The tones were a music from which he was falling away. He had really fallen into a momentary doze, when Rosalind said in her silvery neutral way, "'Here is your tea, Tertius,' said he on the small table by his side and then moved back to her place without looking at him. Lydgate was too hasty in attributing insensibility to her. After her own fashion she was sensitive enough, and took lasting impressions. Her impression now was one of offence and repulsion. But then Rosamond had no scowls, and had never raised her voice. She was quite sure that no one could justly find fault with her. Perhaps Lydgate and she had never felt so far off each other before. But there were strong reasons for not deferring his revelation, even if he had not already begun it by that abrupt announcement. Indeed, some of the angry desire to rouse her into more sensibility on his account, which had prompted him to speak prematurely, still mingled with his pain in the prospect of her pain. But he waited till the tray was gone, the candles were lit, and the evening quiet might be counted on. The interval had left time for repelled tenderness to return into the old course. He spoke kindly. "'Dear Rosie, lay down your work and come to sit by me,' he said gently, pushing away the table and stretching out his arm to draw a chair near his own. Rosamond obeyed. As she came towards him in her drapery of transparent, faintly tinted muslin, her slim yet round figure never looked more graceful. As she sat down by him and laid one hand on the elbow of his chair, at last looking at him and meeting his eyes, her delicate neck and cheek and purely cut lips never had more of that untarnished beauty which touches it in springtime and infancy and all sweet freshness. It touched Lydgate now, and mingled the early moments of his love for her with all the other memories which were stirred in this crisis of deep trouble. He laid his ample hand softly on hers, saying, Dear, with the lingering utterance which affection gives to the word. Rosamond, too, was still under the power of that same past, and her husband was still in part the Lydgate whose approval had stirred delight. She put his hair lightly away from his forehead, then laid her other hand on his, and was conscious of forgiving him. I am obliged to tell you what will hurt you, Rosie, but there are things which husband and wife must think of together. I dare say it has occurred to you already that I am short of money. Lydgate paused, 
but Rosamond turned her neck and looked at a vase on the mantelpiece. "'I was not able to pay for all the things we had to get before we were married, and there have been expenses since which I have been obliged to meet. The consequence is there is a large debt at Brassing, three hundred and eighty pounds, which has been pressing on me a good while, and in fact we are getting deeper every day, for people don't pay me the faster because others want the money. I took pains to keep it from you while you were not well, but now we must think together about it, and you must help me. What can I do, Tertius? said Rosamond, turning her eyes on him again. That little speech of four words, like so many others in all languages, is capable by varied vocal inflections of expressing all states of mind from helpless dimness to exhaustive argumentative perception, from the completest self-devoting fellowship to the most neutral aloofness. Rosamond's thin utterance threw into the words, "'What can I do?' as much neutrality as they could hold. They fell like a mortal chill on De Gates' roused tenderness. He did not storm in indignation. He felt too sad a sinking of the heart. And when he spoke again, it was more in the tone of a man who forces himself to fulfil a task. "'It is necessary of you to know, because I have to give security for a time, and a man must come to make an inventory of the furniture.' Rosamond coloured deeply. "'Have you not asked Papa for money?' she said, as soon as she could speak. No. Then I must ask him, she said, releasing her hands from the gates, and rising to stand at least two yards distance from him. No, Rosie, said the gate decisively, it is too late to do that. The inventory will be begun to-morrow. Remember, it is a mere security. It will make no difference. It is a temporary affair. I insist upon it that your father shall not know, unless I choose to tell him, added Lydgate, with a more peremptory emphasis. This certainly was unkind, but Rosamond had thrown him back on evil expectation as to what she would do in the way of quiet, steady disobedience. The unkindness seemed impardonable to her. She was not given to weeping, and disliked it. But now her chin and lips began to tremble, and the tears welled up. Perhaps it was not possible for Lydgate, under the double stress of outward material difficulty, and of his own proud resistance to humiliating consequences, to imagine fully what this sudden trial was to a young creature who had known nothing but indulgence, and whose dreams had all been of new indulgence, more exactly to her taste. But he did wish to spare her as much as he could, and her tears cut him to the heart. He could not speak again immediately, but Rosamond did not go on sobbing, she tried to conquer her agitation, and wiped away her tears, continuing to look before her at the mantelpiece. "'Try not to grieve, darling,' said Lydgate, turning his eyes up towards her. That she had chosen to move away from him in this moment of her trouble made everything harder to say. But he must absolutely go on. "'We must brace ourselves to do what is necessary. It is I who have been in fault. I ought to have seen that I could not afford to live in this way. But many things have told against me in my practice, and it really just now has ebbed to a low point. I may recover it, but, but in the meantime we must pull up. We must change our way of living. We, we shall weather it. When I have given this security I shall have time to look about me. And you are so clever that if you turn your mind to managing you will school me into carefulness. I have been a thoughtless rascal about squaring prices, but come, dear, sit down and, and forgive me." Lydgate was bowing his neck under the yoke like a creature who had talons, but who had reason, too, which often reduces us to meekness. When he had spoken the last words in an imploring tone, Rosamond returned to the chair by his side. His self-blame gave her some hope that he would tend to her opinion, and she said, "'Why can you not put off having the inventory made? You can send the men away to-morrow when they come.' "'I shall not send them away,' said Lydgate, the peremptoriness rising again. "'Was it of any use to explain?' 
if we left Middlemarch, there would, of course, be a sale, and that would do as well. But we are not going to leave Middlemarch. I am sure, Tertius, it would be much better to do so. Why can we not go to London, or near Durham, where your family is known? We can go nowhere without money, Rosamond. Your friends would not wish you to be without money, and surely these odious tradesmen must be made to understand that, and to wait, if you would make proper representations to them. Uh, this is idle, Rosamond, said Lydgate angrily. You must learn to take my judgment on questions you don't understand. I have made necessary arrangements, and they must be carried out. As to friends, I have no expectations whatever from them, and shall not ask them for anything. Rosamond sat perfectly still. The thought in her mind was that if she had known how Lydgate would behave, she would never have married him. "'We have no time to waste now on unnecessary words, dear,' said Lydgate, trying to be gentle again. "'There are some details that I want to consider with you. Dover says he will take a good deal of the plate back again, and any of the jewellery we like. He really behaves very well.' "'Are we to go without spoons and forks, then?' said Rosamond, whose very lips seemed to get thinner with the thinness of her utterance. She was determined to make no further resistance or suggestions. "'Oh, no, dear,' said little Lydgate. "'But look here,' he continued, drawing a paper from his pocket and opening it. "'Here is Dover's account. See? I've marked a number of articles, which, if we return them, will reduce the amount by thirty pounds, and more.' I have not marked any of the jewellery. Lydgate had really felt this point of the jewellery very bitter to himself, but he had overcome the feeling by severe argument. He could not propose to Rosamond that she should return any particular present of his. But he had told himself that he was bound to put Dover's offer before her, and her inward prompting might make the affair easy. "'It is useless for me to look, Tertius,' said Rosamond calmly. You will return what you please. She would not turn her eyes on the paper, and Lydgate, flushing up to the roots of his hair, drew it back and let it fall on his knee. Meanwhile, Rosamond quietly went out of the room, leaving Lydgate helpless and wondering. Was she not coming back? It seemed that she had no more identified herself with him than if they had been creatures of different species and opposing interests. He tossed his head and thrust his hands deep into his pockets with a sort of vengeance. There was still science, there were still good objects to work for. He must give a tug still, all the stronger, because other satisfactions were going. But the door opened, and Rosamond re-entered. She carried the leather box containing the amethysts, and a tiny ornamental basket which contained other boxes. And laying them on the chair where she had been sitting, she said— with perfect propriety in her air. "'This is all the jewellery you ever gave me. You can return what you like of it, and of the plate also. You will not, of course, expect me to stay at home to-morrow. I shall get a papa's.' To many women, the look Lydgate cast at her would have been more terrible than one of anger. It had in it a despairing acceptance of the distance she was placing between them. Uh, "'And when shall you come back again?' he said, with a bitter edge on his accent. "'Oh, in the evening. Of course, I shall not mention the subject to Mamma. Rosamond was convinced that no woman could behave more inapproachably than she was behaving, and she went to sit down at her work-table. Lydgate sat meditating a minute or two, and the result was that he said, with some of the old emotion in his tone, now we have been united, Rosie, you should not leave me to myself from the first trouble that has come. Certainly not, said Rosamond. I shall do everything it becomes me to do. It is not right that the thing should be left to servants, or, or that I should have to speak to them about it. And I shall be obliged to go out. I don't know how early. I understand your shrinking from the humiliation of these money affairs, but, my dear Rosamond, as a question of pride, which I feel just as much as you can— it is surely better to manage the thing ourselves, and let the servants see as little of it as possible. And since you are my wife, there is no hindering your share in my disgraces, if there were disgraces. Rosamond did not answer immediately, but at last she said, "'Very well. 
I will stay at home. I shall not touch these jewels, Rosie. Take them away again. But I will write out a list of plates that we may return, and that can be packed up and sent at once. The servants will know that, said Rosamond, with the slightest touch of sarcasm. Well, we must meet some disagreeables as necessities. Where is the ink, I wonder? said Digate, rising, and throwing the account on the larger table where he meant to write. Rosamond went to reach the inkstand, and after setting it on the table was going to turn away, when Lydgate, who was standing close by, put his arm round her and drew her towards him, saying, "'Come, darling, let us make the best of things. It would only be for a time, I hope, that we shall have to be stingy and particular. Kiss me.' His native warm-heartedness took a great deal of quenching, and it is a part of manliness for a husband to, to feel keenly the fact that an inexperienced girl has got into trouble by marrying him. She received his kiss, and returned it faintly, and in this way an appearance of accord was recovered for the time. But Lydgate could not help looking forward with dread to the inevitable future discussions about expenditure, and the necessity for a complete change in their way of living. End of chapter 58 Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 59 of Middlemarch This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Red Abrus, Middlemarch by George Eliot, Chapter Fifty Nine. They said of old the soul had human shape, but smaller, subtler than the fleshy self, so wandered forth for airing when it pleased. And see, beside her cherub face there floats a pale lipped form, aerial whispering its promptings in that little shell her ear. News is often dispersed as thoughtlessly and effectively as that pollen which the bees carry off, having no idea how powdery they are, when they are buzzing in search of their particular nectar. This fine comparison has reference to Fred Vincy, who on that evening at Lowick Parsonage heard a lively discussion among the ladies on the news which their old servant had got from Tantrip concerning Mr. Cossabon's strange mention of Mr. Ladislaw in a codicil to his will made not long before his death. Miss Winifred was astounded to find that her brother had known the fact before, and observed that Camden was the most wonderful man for knowing things and not telling them. Whereupon Mary Garth said that the codicil had perhaps got mixed up with the habits of spiders, which Miss Winifred never would listen to. Mrs. Fairbrother considered that the news had something to do with their having only once seen Mr. Ladislaw at Lowick, and Miss Noble made many small compassionate mewings. Fred knew little and cared less about Ladislaw and the Cossabons, and his mind never recurred to that discussion till one day calling on Rosamond at his mother's request to deliver a message as he passed, he happened to see Ladislaw going away. Fred and Rosamond had little to say to each other now that marriage had removed her from collision with the unpleasantness of brothers, and especially now that he had taken what she held the stupid and even reprehensible step of giving up the church to take to such a business as Mr. Garth's. Hence Fred talked by preference of what he considered indifferent news, and a propos of that young Ladislaw mentioned what he had heard at Lowick Parsonage. Now Lydgate, like Mr. Fairbrother, knew a great deal more than he told, and when he had once been set thinking about the relation between Will and Dorothea, his conjectures had gone beyond the fact. He imagined that there was a passionate attachment on both sides, and this struck him as much too serious to gossip about. He remembered Will's irritability when he had mentioned Mrs. Cossabon, and was the most circumspect. On the whole, his surmises, in addition to what he knew of the fact, increased his friendliness and tolerance towards Ladislaw, 
and made him understand the vacillation which kept him at middlemarch after he had said that he should go away it was significant of the separateness between lydgate's mind and rosamond's that he had no impulse to speak to her on the subject indeed he did not quite trust her reticence towards will and he was right there though he had no vision of the way in which her mind would act in urging her to speak when she repeated fred's news to lydgate he said take care you don't drop the faintest hint to ladislaw rosie he is likely to fly out as if you insulted him of course it is a painful affair rosamond turned her neck and patted her hair looking the image of placid indifference but the next time will came when lydgate was away she spoke archly about his not going to london as he had threatened i know all about it i have a confidential little bird said she showing very pretty airs of her head over the bit of work held high between her active fingers there is a powerful magnet in this neighbourhood to be sure there is nobody knows that better than you said will with light gallantry but inwardly prepared to be angry it is really the most charming romance mr cosabon jealous and foreseeing that there was no one else whom mrs cosabon would so much like to marry and no one who would so much like to marry her as a certain gentleman and then laying a plan to spoil all by making her forfeit her property if she did marry that gentleman and then and then and then oh i have no doubt the end will be thoroughly romantic great god what do you mean said will flushing over face and ears his features seeming to change as if he had had a violent shake don't joke tell me what you mean you don't really know said rosamond no longer playful and desiring nothing better than to tell in order that she might evoke effects no he returned impatiently don't know that mr cosabon has left it in his will that if mrs cosabon marries you she is to forfeit all her property how do you know that it is true said will eagerly my brother fred heard it from the fair brothers will started up from his chair and reached his hat i dare say she likes you better than the property said rosamond looking at him from a distance pray don't say any more about it said will in a hoarse undertone extremely unlike his usual light voice it is a foul insult to her and to me then he sat down absently looking before him but seeing nothing now you are angry with me said rosamond it is too bad to bear me malice you ought to be obliged to me for telling you so i am said will abruptly speaking with that kind of double soul which belongs to dreamers who answer questions i expect to hear of the marriage said rosamond playfully never you will never hear of the marriage with those words uttered impetuously will rose put out his hand to rosamond still with the air of a somnambulist and went away when he was gone rosamond left her chair and walked to the other end of the room leaning when she got there against a chiffonier and looking out of the window wearily she was oppressed by ennui and by that dissatisfaction which in women's minds is continually turning into a trivial jealousy referring to no real claims springing from no deeper passion than the vague exactingness of egoism and yet capable of impelling action as well as speech there really is nothing to care for much said poor rosamond inwardly thinking of the family at quallingham who did not write to her and that perhaps tertius when he came home would tease her about expenses she had already secretly disobeyed him by asking her father to help them and he had ended decisively by saying i am more likely to want help myself end of chapter 59 recording by red abrus august 2008
Middle March by George Eliot. Chapter sixty. Good phrases are surely and ever were very commendable. Justice shallow. A few days afterwards, it was already the end of August. There was an occasion which caused some excitement in Middlemarch. The public, if it chose, was to have the advantage of buying, under the distinguished auspices of Mr. Barthrop Trumbull, the furniture, books, and pictures, which anybody might see by the handbills to be the best in every kind, belonging to Edwin Larcher, Esquire. This was not one of the sales indicating the depression of trade. On the contrary, it was due to Mr. Larcher's great success in the carrying business, which warranted his purchase of a mansion near Riverston, already furnished in high style by an illustrious spa physician, furnished indeed with such large framefuls of expensive flesh painting in the dining room, that Mrs. Larcher was nervous until reassured by finding the subjects to be scriptural. Hence the fine opportunity to purchasers which was well pointed out in the handbills of Mr. Barthrop Trumbull, whose acquaintance with the history of art enabled him to state that the hall furniture to be sold without reserve comprised a piece of carving by a contemporary of Gibbons. At Middlemarch in those times a large sale was regarded as a kind of festival. There was a table spread with the best cold eatables, as at a superior funeral, and facilities were offered for that generous drinking of cheerful glasses which might lead to generous and cheerful bidding for undesirable articles. Mr. Larcher's sale was the more attractive in the fine weather because the house stood just at the end of the town, with a garden and stables attached, in that pleasant issue from Middlemarch called the London Road, which was also the road to the new hospital and to Mr. Bulstrode's retired residence, known as the Shrubs. In short, the auction was as good as a fair, and drew all classes with leisure at command to some who risked making bids in order simply to raise prices it was almost equal to betting at the races the second day when the best furniture was to be sold everybody was there even mr thesiger the rector at st peter's had looked in for a short time wishing to buy the carved table and had rubbed elbows with mr bambridge and mr horrock there was a wreath of middlemarch ladies accommodated with seats round the large table in the dining room where mr barthrop trumbull was mounted with desk and hammer but the rows chiefly of masculine faces behind were often varied by incomings and outgoings both from the door and the large bow window opening on to the lawn everybody that day did not include mr bulstrode whose health could not well endure crowds and draughts, but Mrs. Bulstrode had particularly wished to have a certain picture, a supper at Emmaus, attributed in the catalogue to Guido, and at the last moment before the day of the sale, Mr. Bulstrode had called at the office of the pioneer, of which he was now one of the proprietors, to beg of Mr. Ladislaw as a great favour that he would obligingly use his remarkable knowledge of pictures on behalf of Mrs. Bulstrode, and judge of the value of this particular painting, if, added the scrupulously polite banker, attendance at the sale would not interfere with the arrangements for your departure which i know is imminent this proviso might have sounded rather satirical in will's ear if he had been in a mood to care about such satire it referred to an understanding entered into many weeks before with the proprietors of the paper that he should be at liberty any day he pleased to hand over the management to the sub-editor whom he had been training since he wished finally to quit middlemarch but indefinite visions of ambition are weak against the ease of doing what is habitual or beguilingly agreeable and we all know the difficulty of carrying out a resolve when we secretly long that it may turn out to be unnecessary in such states of mind the most incredulous person has a private leaning towards miracle impossible to conceive how our wish could be fulfilled still 
very wonderful things have happened. Will did not confess this weakness to himself, but he lingered. What was the use of going to London at that time of the year? The rugby men who would remember him were not there, and so far as political writing was concerned, he would rather for a few weeks go on with the pioneer. At the present moment, however, when Mr. Bulstrode was speaking to him, he had both a strengthened resolve to go, and an equally strong resolve not to go till he had once more seen Dorothea. Hence he replied that he had reasons for deferring his departure a little, and would be happy to go to the sale. Will was in a defiant mood, his consciousness being deeply stung with the thought that the people who looked at him probably knew a fact tantamount to an accusation against him as a fellow with low designs which were to be frustrated by a disposal of property like most people who assert their freedom with regard to conventional distinction he was prepared to be sudden and quick at quarrel with any one who might hint that he had personal reasons for that assertion that there was anything in his blood his bearing or his character to which he gave the mask of an opinion when he was under an irritating impression of this kind he would go about for days with a defiant look the colour changing in his transparent skin as if he were on the qui vive watching for something which he had to dart upon this expression was peculiarly noticeable in him at the sale and those who had only seen him in his moods of gentle oddity or of bright enjoyment would have been struck with a contrast he was not sorry to have this occasion for appearing in public before the middlemarch tribes of toller hackbutt and the rest who looked down on him as an adventurer and were in a state of brutal ignorance about dante who sneered at his polished blood and were themselves of a breed very much in need of crossing he stood in a conspicuous place not far from the auctioneer with a forefinger in each side pocket and his head thrown backward not caring to speak to anybody though he had been cordially welcomed as a connoisseur by mr trumbull who was enjoying the utmost activity of his great faculties and surely among all men whose vocation requires them to exhibit their powers of speech the happiest is a prosperous provincial auctioneer keenly alive to his own jokes and sensible of his encyclopedic knowledge some saturnine sour-blooded persons might object to be constantly insisting on the merits of all articles from bootjacks to burghams but mr borthorpe trumbull had a kindly liquid in his veins he was an admirer by nature and would have liked to have the universe under his hammer feeling that it would go at a higher figure for his recommendation meanwhile mrs larcher's drawing-room furniture was enough for him when will ladislaw had come in a second fender said to have been forgotten in its right place suddenly claimed the auctioneer's enthusiasm which he distributed on the equitable principle of praising those things most which were most in need of praise the fender was of polished steel with much lancet shaped open work and a sharp edge now ladies said he i shall appeal to you here is a fender which at any other sale would hardly be offered without reserve being as i may say for quality of steel and quaintness of design a kind of thing here mr trumbull dropped his voice and became slightly nasal trimming his outlines with his left finger that might not fall in with ordinary tastes allow me to tell you that by and by this style of workmanship will be the only one in vogue half a crown you said thank you going at half a crown this characteristic fender and i have particular information that the antique style is very much sought after in high quarters three shillings three and sixpence hold it well up joseph look ladies at the chastity of the design i have no doubt myself that it was turned out in the last century four shillings mr momsey four shillings it's not a thing i would put in my drawing-room said mrs momsey audibly for the warning of the rash husband i wonder at miss slarcher every blessed child's head that fell against it would be cut in two the edge is like a knife quite true rejoined mr trumbull quickly 
and most uncommonly useful to have a fender at hand that will cut if you have a leather shoe tie or a bit of string that wants cutting and no knife at hand many a man has been left hanging because there was no knife to cut him down gentlemen here's a fender that if you had the misfortune to hang yourselves would cut you down in no time with astonishing celerity four and sixpence five five and sixpence an appropriate thing for a spare bedroom where there was a four-poster and a guest a little out of his mind six shillings thank you mr clintup going at six shillings going gone the auctioneer's glance which had been searching round him with a preternatural susceptibility to all signs of bidding here dropped on the paper before him and his voice too dropped into a tone of indifferent despatch as he said mr clintop be handy joseph it was worth six shillings to have a fender you could always tell that joke on said mr clintop laughing low and apologetically to his next neighbour he was a diffident though distinguished nursery man and feared that the audience might regard his bid as a foolish one meanwhile joseph had brought a tray full of small articles now ladies said mr trumbull taking up one of the articles this tray contains a very recherche lot a collection of trifles for the drawing-room table and trifles make the sum of human things nothing more important than trifles yes mr ladislaw yes by and by but pass the tray round joseph those biocks must be examined ladies this i have in my hand is an ingenious contrivance a sort of practical repos i may call it here you see it looks like an elegant heart-shaped box portable for the pocket there again it becomes like a splendid double flower an ornament for the table and now mr trumbull allowed the flower to fall alarmingly into strings of heart-shaped leaves a book of riddles no less than five hundred printed in a beautiful red gentlemen if i had less of a conscience i should not wish you to bid high for the slot i have a longing for it myself what can promote innocent mirth and i may say virtue more than a good riddle it hinders profane language and attaches a man to the society of refined females this ingenious article itself without the elegant domino box card basket and and see ought alone to have a high price to the lot carried in the pocket it might make an individual welcome in any society four shillings sir four shillings for this remarkable collection of riddles with the etc here is sample how must you spell honey to make it catch lady birds answer money you hear lady birds honey money this is an amusement to sharpen the intellect it has a sting it has what we call satire and wit without indecency four and sixpence five shillings the bidding ran on with warming rivalry mr bower was a bidder and this was too exasperating bowyer could not afford it and only wanted to hinder every other man from making a figure the current carried even mr horrock with it but this committal of himself to an opinion fell from him with so little sacrifice of his neutral expression that the bid might not have been detected as his but for the friendly oaths of mr bambridge who wanted to know what horrock would do with blasted stuff only fit for haberdashers given over to that state of perdition which the horse dealer so cordially recognized in the majority of earthly existence the lot was finally knocked down at a guinea to mr spilkins a young slender of the neighbourhood who was reckless with his pocket money and felt his want of memory for riddles come trumbull this is too bad you have been putting some old maid's rubbish into the sale murmured mr toller getting close to the auctioneer i want to see how the prints go and i must be off soon immediately mr toller it was only an act of benevolence which your noble heart would approve joseph quick with the prints lot two thirty five now gentlemen you who are connoisseurs you are going to have a treat here is an engraving of the duke of wellington surrounded by his staff on the field of waterloo and notwithstanding recent events which have as it were enveloped our great hero in a cloud 
i'll be bold to say for a man in my line must not be blown about by political winds that a finer subject of the modern order belonging to our own time and epoch the understanding of man could hardly conceive angels might perhaps but not men sirs not men who painted it said mr powderell much impressed it is a proof before the letter mr powderell the painter is not known answered trumbull with a certain gaspingness in his last words after which he pursed up his lips and stared round him i'll bid a pound said mr powderell in a tone of resolved emotion as of a man ready to put himself in the breach whether from awe or pity nobody raised the price on him next came two dutch prints which mr toller had been eager for and after he had secured them he went away other prints and afterwards some paintings were sold to leading middle marchers who had come with a special desire for them and there was a more active movement of the audience in and out some who had bought what they wanted going away others coming in either quite newly or from a temporary visit to the refreshments which were spread under the marquee on the lawn it was this marquee that mr bambridge was bent on buying and he appeared to like looking inside it frequently as a foretaste of its possession on the last occasion of his return from it he was observed to bring with him a new companion a stranger to mr trumbull and every one else whose appearance however led to the supposition that he might be a relative of the horse dealers also given to indulgence his large whiskers imposing swagger and swing of the leg made him a striking figure but his suit of black rather shabby at the edges caused the prejudicial inference that he was not able to afford himself as much indulgence as he liked who is it you have picked up bam said mr horrock aside ask him yourself returned mr bambridge he said he had just turned in from the road mr horrock eyed the stranger who was leaning back against his stick with one hand using his toothpick with the other and looking about him with a certain restlessness apparently under the silence imposed on him by circumstances at length the supper at emmaus was brought forward to will's immense relief for he was getting so tired of the proceedings that he had drawn back a little and leaned his shoulders against the wall just behind the auctioneer he now came forward again and his eye caught the conspicuous stranger who rather to his surprise was staring at him markedly but will was immediately appealed to by mr trumbull yes mr ladislaw yes this interests you as a connoisseur i think it is some pleasure the auctioneer went on with a rising fervour to have a picture like this to show to a company of ladies and gentlemen a picture worth any sum to an individual whose means were on a level with his judgment it is a painting of the italian school by the celebrated guido the greatest painter in the world the chief of the old masters as they are called i take it because they were up to a thing or two beyond most of us in possession of secrets now lost to the bulk of the mankind let me tell you gentlemen i have seen a great many pictures by the old masters and they are not all up to this mark some of them are darker than you might like and not family subjects but here is a guido the frame alone is worth pounds which any lady might be proud to hang up a suitable thing for what we call a refectory in a charitable institution if any gentleman of the corporation wished to show his munificence turn it a little sir yes joseph turn it a little towards mr ladislaw mr ladislaw having been abroad understands the merit of these things you observe all eyes were for a moment turned towards will who said coolly five pounds the auctioneer burst out in a deep remonstrance ah oh, mr ladislaw the frame alone is worth that ladies and gentlemen for the credit of the town suppose it should be discovered hereafter that a gem of art has been amongst us in this town and nobody in middlemarch awake to it five guineas five seven six five ten still ladies still it is a gem and full many a gem as the poet says has been allowed to go at a nominal price because the public knew no better because it was offered in circles where there was i was going to say a low feeling but no 
six pounds six guineas a guido of the first order going at six guineas it's an insult to religion ladies it touches us all as christians gentlemen that a subject like this should go at such a low figure six pounds ten seven the bidding was brisk and will continued to share in it remembering that mrs bulstrode had a strong wish for the picture and thinking that he might stretch the price to twelve pounds but it was knocked down to him at ten guineas whereupon he pushed his way towards the bow window and went out he chose to go under the marquee to get a glass of water being hot and thirsty it was empty of other visitors and he asked the woman in attendance to fetch him some fresh water but before she was well gone he was annoyed to see entering the florid stranger who had stared at him it struck will at this moment that the man might be one of those political parasitic insects of the bloated kind who had once or twice claimed acquaintance with him as having heard him speak on the reform question and who might think of getting a shilling by news in this light his person already rather heating to behold on a summer's day appeared the more disagreeable and will half seated on the elbow of a garden chair turned his eyes carefully away from the comer but this signified little to our acquaintance mr raffles who never hesitated to thrust himself on unwilling observation if it suited his purpose to do so he moved a step or two till he was in front of will and said with full-mouthed haste excuse me mr ladislaw was your mother's name sarah dunkirk will starting to his feet moved backward a step frowning and saying with some fierceness yes sir it was and what is that to you it was in will's nature that the first spark it threw out was a direct answer of the question and a challenge of the consequences to have said what is that to you in the first instance would have seemed like shuffling as if he minded who knew anything about his origin raffles on his side had not the same eagerness for a collision which was implied in ladislaw's threatening air the slim young fellow with his girl's complexion looked like a tiger cat ready to spring on him under such circumstances mr raffles pleasure in annoying his company was kept in abeyance no offence my good sir no offence i only remember your mother knew her when she was a girl but it is your father that you feature sir i had the pleasure of seeing your father too parents alive mr ladislaw no thundered will in the same attitude as before should be glad to do you a service mr ladislaw by jove i should hope to meet again hereupon raffles who had lifted his hat with the last words turned himself round with a swing of his leg and walked away will looked after him a moment and could see that he did not re-enter the auction room but appeared to be walking towards the road for an instant he thought that he had been foolish not to let the man go on talking but no on the whole he preferred doing without knowledge from that source later in the evening however raffles overtook him in the street and appearing either to have forgotten the roughness of his former reception or to intend avenging it by a forgiving familiarity greeted him jovially and walked by his side remarking at first on the pleasantness of the town and neighbourhood will suspected that the man had been drinking and was considering how to shake him off when raffles said i have been abroad myself mr ladislaw i have seen the world used to parley vows a little it was at boulogne i saw your father a most uncommon likeness you are of him by jove mouth nose eyes hair turned off your brow just like his a little in the foreign style john bull doesn't do much of that but your father was very ill when i saw him lord lord hans you might see through you were a small youngster then did he get well no said will curtly ah well i have often wondered what became of your mother she ran away from her friends when she was a young lass a proud spirited lass and pretty by jove i knew the reason why she ran away said raffles winking slowly as he looked sideways at will 
you know nothing dishonourable of her sir said will turning on him rather savagely but mr raffles just now was not sensitive to shades of manner not bit said he tossing his head decisively she was a little too honourable to like her friends that was it here raffles again winked slowly lord bless you i knew all about them a little in what you may call the respectable thieving line the high style of receiving house none of your holes and corners first rate slap up shop high profits and no mistake but lord sarah would have known nothing about it a dashing young lady she was fine boarding school fit for lord's wife only archie duncan threw it at her out of spite because she would have nothing to do with him and so she ran away from the whole concern i travelled for them sir in a gentlemanly way at a high salary they didn't mind her running away at first godly folks sir very godly and she was for the stage the son was alive then and the daughter was at a discount hello here we are at the blue bull what do you say mr ladislaw shall we turn in and have a glass no i must say good evening said will dashing up a passage which led into lowick gate and almost running to get out of raffles reach he walked a long while on the lowick road away from the town glad of the starlit darkness when it came he felt as if he had had dirt cast on him amidst shouts of scorn there was this to confirm the fellow's statement that his mother never would tell him the reason why she had run away from her family well what was he will ladislaw the worse supposing the truth about the family to be the ugliest his mother had braved hardships in order to separate herself from it but if dorothea's friend had known this story if the chathams had known it they would have had a fine colour to give their suspicions a welcome ground for thinking him unfit to come near her however let them suspect what they pleased they would find themselves in the wrong they would find out that the blood in his veins was as free from the taint of meanness as theirs end of chapter 60 recording by red abrus august 2008
I have a good deal of pain in my head, said Mr. Bulstrode, who was so frequently ailing that his wife was always ready to believe in this cause of depression. Sit down and let me sponge it with vinegar. Physically, Mr. Bulstrode did not want the vinegar, but morally the affectionate attention soothed him. Though always polite, it was his habit to receive such services with marital coolness, as his wife's duty. But today, while she was bending over him, he said, You are very good, Harriet, in a tone which had something new in it to her ear. She did not know exactly what the novelty was, but her woman's solicitude shaped itself into a darting thought that he might be going to have an illness. "'Has anything worried you?' she said. "'Did that man come to you at the bank?' "'Yes, it was as I had supposed. "'He is a man who at one time might have done better, "'but he has sunk into a drunken, debauched creature.' "'Is he quite gone away?' said Mrs. Bulstrode anxiously, "'but for certain reasons she refrained from adding. "'It was very disagreeable to hear him calling himself a friend of yours.' At that moment, she would not have liked to say anything which implied her habitual consciousness that her husband's earlier connections were not quite on a level with her own. Not that she knew much about them, that her husband had at first been employed in a bank, that he had afterwards entered into what he called city business and gained a fortune before he was three and thirty, that he had married a widow who was much older than himself, a dissenter, and in other ways probably of that disadvantageous quality usually perceptible in a first wife, if inquired into with the dispassionate judgment of a second, was almost as much as she had cared to learn beyond the glimpses which Mr. Bulstrode's narrative occasionally gave of his early bent towards religion, his inclination to be a preacher, and his association with missionary and philanthropic efforts. She believed in him as an excellent man, whose piety carried a peculiar eminence in belonging to a layman, whose influence had turned her own mind towards seriousness, and whose share of perishable good had been the means of raising her own position. But she also liked to think that it was well in every sense for Mr. Bulstrode to have won the hand of Harriet Vincy, whose family was undeniable in a Middlemarch light, a better light, surely, than any thrown in London thoroughfares or dissenting chapel yards. The unreformed provincial mind distrusted London, and while true religion was everywhere saving, honest Mrs. Bulstrode was convinced that to be saved in the church was more respectable. She so much wished to ignore towards others that her husband had ever been a London dissenter, that she liked to keep it out of sight even in talking to him. He was quite aware of this. Indeed, in some respects, he was rather afraid of this ingenuous wife, whose imitative piety and native worldliness were equally sincere, who had nothing to be ashamed of, and whom he had married out of a thorough inclination still subsisting. But his fears were such as belonged to a man who cares to maintain his recognized supremacy. The loss of high consideration from his wife, as from everyone else who did not clearly hate him out of enmity to the truth, would be as the beginning of death to him. When she said, Is he quite gone away? Oh, I trust so, he answered, with an effort to throw as much sober unconcern into his tone as possible. But in truth, Mr. Bulstrode was very far from a state of quiet trust. In the interview at the bank, Raffles had made it evident that his eagerness to torment was almost as strong in him as any other greed. He had frankly said that he had turned out of the way to come to Middlemarch just to look about him and see whether the neighborhood would suit him to live in. He had certainly had a few debts to pay, more than he expected, but the two hundred pounds were not yet gone. A cool five and twenty would suffice him to go away with for the present. What he had wanted chiefly was to see his friend Nick and family and know all about the prosperity of a man to whom he was so much attached. By and by he might come back for a longer stay. This time, Raffles declined to be seen off the premises, as he expressed it, declined to quit Middlemarch under Bulstrode's eyes. He meant to go by coach the next day, if he chose. Bulstrode felt himself helpless. Neither threats nor coaxing could avail. He could not count on any persistent fear, nor on any promise. On the contrary, he felt a cold certainty at his heart that Raffles, unless Providence sent death to hinder him, would come back to Middlemarch before long, and that certainty was a terror. It was not that he was in danger of legal punishment or of beggary. 
He was in danger only of being disclosed to the judgment of his neighbors and the mournful perception of his wife certain facts of his past life, which would render him an object of scorn and an opprobrium of the religion to which he had diligently associated himself. The terror of being judged sharpens the memory. It sends an inevitable glare over that long, unvisited past which has been habitually recalled only in general phrases. Even without memory, the life is bonded into one by a zone of dependence in growth and decay. But intense memory forces a man to own his blameworthy past. With memory set smarting like a reopened wound, a man's past is not simply a dead history, an outworn preparation of the present. It is not a repented error shaken loose from the life. It is a still quivering part of himself, bringing shudders and bitter flavors and the tinglings of a merited shame. Into this second life, Bulstrode's past had now risen, only the pleasures of it seeming to have lost their quality. Night and day, without interruption save of brief sleep, which only wove retrospect and fear into a fantastic present, he felt the scenes of his earlier life coming between him and everything else, as obstinately as when we look through the window from a lighted room, the objects we turn our backs on are still before us, instead of the grass and the trees. The successive events inward and outward were there in one view. Though each might be dwelt on in turn, the rest still kept their hold in the consciousness. Once more he saw himself the young banker's clerk, with an agreeable person, as clever in figures as he was fluent in speech, and fond of theological definition, an eminent though young member of a Calvinistic dissenting church at Highbury, having had striking experience in conviction of sin and sense of pardon. Again he heard himself called for as Brother Bulstrode in prayer meetings, speaking on religious platforms, preaching in private houses. Again he felt himself thinking of the ministry as possibly his vocation and inclined towards missionary labor. That was the happiest time of his life. That was the spot he would have chosen now to awaken and find the rest a dream. The people among whom Brother Bulstrode was distinguished were very few, but they were very near to him and stirred his satisfaction the more. His power stretched through a narrow space, but he felt its effect the more intensely. He believed without effort in the peculiar work of grace within him and in the signs that God intended him for special instrumentality. Then came the moment of transition. It was with the sense of promotion he had when he, an orphan educated at a commercial charity school, was invited to a fine villa belonging to Mr. Dunkirk, the richest man in the congregation. Soon he became an intimate there, honored for his piety by the wife, marked out for his ability by the husband, whose wealth was due to a flourishing city and West End trade. That was the setting in of a new current for his ambition, directing his prospects of instrumentality towards the uniting of distinguished religious gifts with successful business. By and by came a decided external leading. A confidential subordinate partner died, and nobody seemed to the principal so well fitted to fill the severely felt vacancy as his young friend Bulstrode, if he would become confidential accountant. The offer was accepted. The business was a pawnbroker's of the most magnificent sort, both in extent and profits, and on a short acquaintance with it, Bulstrode became aware that one source of magnificent profit was the easy reception of any goods offered without strict inquiry as to where they came from. But there was a branch house at the West End and no pettiness or dinginess to give suggestions of shame. He remembered his first moments of shrinking, they were private and were filled with arguments, some of these taking the form of prayer. The business was established and had old roots. Is it not one thing to set up a new gin palace and another to accept an investment in an old one? The profits made out of lost souls, where can the line be drawn at which they begin in human transactions? Was it not even God's way of saving his chosen? Thou knowest the young Bulstrode had said then, as the older Bulstrode was saying now, Thou knowest how loose my soul sits from these things, how I view them all as implements for killing, thy garden rescued here and there from the wilderness. Metaphors and precedences were not wanting. Peculiar spiritual experiences were not wanting, which at last made the retention of his position seem a service demanded of him. 
The vista of a fortune had already opened itself, and Bulstrode's shrinking remained private. Mr. Dunkirk had never expected that there would be any shrinking at all. He had never conceived that trade had anything to do with the scheme of salvation. And it was true that Bulstrode found himself carrying on two distinct lives. His religious activity could not be incompatible with his business as soon as he had argued himself into not feeling it incompatible. Mentally surrounded with that past again, Bulstrode had the same pleas. Indeed, the years had been perpetually spinning them into intricate thickness, like masses of spider web, padding the moral sensibility. Nay, as age made egoism more eager but less enjoying, his soul had become more saturated with the belief that he did everything for God's sake, being indifferent to it for his own. And yet, if he could be back in that far-off spot with his youthful poverty, why then he would choose to be a missionary. But the train of causes in which he had locked himself went on. There was trouble in the fine villa at Highbury. Years before, the only daughter had run away, defied her parents, and gone on the stage. And now, the only boy died, and after a short time, Mr. Dunkirk died also. The wife, a simple, pious woman, left with all the wealth in and out of the magnificent trade, of which she never knew the precise nature, had come to believe in Bulstrode and innocently adore him, as women often adore their priest or man-made minister. It was natural that after a time marriage should have been thought of between them. But Mrs. Dunkirk had qualms and yearnings about her daughter, who had long been regarded as lost, both to God and her parents. It was known that the daughter had married, but she was utterly gone out of sight. The mother, having lost her boy, imagined a grandson, and wished in a double sense to reclaim her daughter. If she were found, there could be a channel for property, perhaps a wide one, in the provision for several grandchildren. Efforts to find her must be made before Mrs. Dunkirk would marry again. Bulstrode concurred, but after advertisement as well as other modes of inquiry had been tried, the mother believed that her daughter was not to be found and consented to marry without reservation of property. The daughter had been found, but only one man besides Bulstrode knew it, and he was paid for keeping silence and carrying himself away. That was the bare fact which Bulstrode was now forced to see in the rigid outline with which acts present themselves onlookers. But for himself at that distant time, and even now in burning memory, the fact was broken into little sequences, each justified as it came by reasonings which seemed to prove it righteous. Bulstrode's course up to that time had, he thought, been sanctioned by remarkable providences, appearing to point the way for him to be the agent in making the best use of a large property and withdrawing it from perversion. Death and other striking dispositions, such as feminine trustfulness, had come, and Bulstrode would have adopted Cromwell's words, Do you call these bare events? The Lord pity you. The events were comparatively small, but the essential condition was there, namely, that they were in favor of his own ends. It was easy for him to settle what was due from him to others by inquiring what were God's intentions with regards to himself. Could it be for God's service that this fortune should in any considerable proportion go to a young woman and her husband who were given up to the lightest pursuits and might scatter it abroad in triviality? People who seem to lie outside the path of remarkable providences? Bulstrode had never said to himself beforehand, the daughter shall not be found. Nevertheless, when the moment came, he kept her existence hidden, and when other moments followed, he soothed the mother with consolation in the probability that the unhappy young woman might be no more. There were hours in which Bulstrode felt that his action was unrighteous, but how could he go back? He had mental exercises, called himself not, laid hold on redemption, and went on in his course of instrumentality. And after five years, death again came to widen his path by taking away his wife. He did gradually withdraw his capital, but he did not make the sacrifices requisite to put an end to the business, which was carried on for thirteen years afterwards before it finally collapsed. Meanwhile, Nicholas Bulstrode had used his hundred thousand discreetly and was become provincially solidly important. A banker, a churchman, a public benefactor also a sleeping
acting partner in trading concerns in which his ability was directed to economy in the raw material, as in the case of the dyes which rotted Mr. Vinci's silk. And now, when this respectability had lasted undisturbed for nearly 30 years, when all that preceded it had long lain benumbed in the consciousness, that past had risen and immersed his thought as if with a terrible eruption of a new sense overburdening the feeble being. Meanwhile, in his conversation with Raffles, he had learned something momentous, something which entered actively into the struggle of his longings and terrors. There, he thought, lay an opening toward spiritual, perhaps toward material, rescue. The spiritual kind of rescue was a genuine need with him, there may be coarse hypocrites who consciously affect beliefs and emotions for the sake of gulling the world, but Bulstrode was not one of them. He was simply a man whose desires had been stronger than his theoretic beliefs, and who had gradually explained the gratification of his desires into satisfactory agreement with those beliefs. If this be hypocrisy, it is a process which shows itself occasionally in us all, to whatever confession we belong, and whether we believe in the future perfection of our race or in the nearest date fixed for the end of the world, whether we regard the earth as a putrefying nidus for a saved remnant, including ourselves, or have a passionate belief in the solidarity of mankind. The service he could do to the cause of religion had been through life the ground he alleged to himself for his choice of action. It had been the motive which he had poured out in his prayers. Who would use money and position better than he meant to use them? Who could surpass him in self-abhorrence and exaltation of God's cause? And to Mr. Bulstrode, God's cause was something distinct from his own rectitude of conduct. It enforced a discrimination of God's enemies, who were to be used merely as instruments, and whom it would be as well as possible to keep out of money and consequent influence. Also, profitable investments in trades, where the power of the prince of this world showed its most active devices, became sanctified by a right application of the profits in the hands of God's servant. This implicit reasoning is essentially no more peculiar to evangelical belief than the use of wide phrases for narrow motives is peculiar to Englishmen. There is no general doctrine which is not capable of eating out our morality if unchecked by the deep habit of direct fellow feeling with individual fellow men. But a man who believes in something else than his own greed has necessarily a conscience or standard to which he more or less adapts himself. Bulstrode's standard had been his serviceableness to God's cause. I am sinful and not, a vessel to be consecrated by use, but use me, had been the mold into which he had constrained his immense need of being something important and predominating. And now had come a moment in which that mold seemed in danger of being broken and utterly cast away. What if the acts he had reconciled himself to, because they made him a stronger instrument of the divine glory, were to become the pretext of the scoffer and a darkening of that glory? If this were to be the ruling of providence, he was cast out from the temple as one who had brought unclean offerings. He had long poured out utterances of repentance, but today a repentance had come which was of a bitter flavor, and a threatening providence urged him to a kind of propitiation which was not simply a doctrinal transaction. The divine tribunal had changed its aspect for him. Self-prostration was no longer enough, and he must bring restitution in his hand. It was really before his God that Bulstrode was about to attempt such restitution as seemed possible. A great dread had seized his susceptible frame, and the scorching approach of shame wrought in him a new spiritual need. Night and day, while the resurgent threatening past was making a conscience within him, he was thinking by what means he could recover peace and trust, by what sacrifice he could stay the rod. His belief in these moments of dread was that if he spontaneously did something right, God would save him from the consequences of wrongdoing. For religion can only change when the emotions which fill it are changed, and the religion of personal fear remains nearly at the level of the savage. He had seen Raffles actually going away on the brassing coach, and this was a temporary relief. 
It removed the pressure of an immediate dread, but did not put an end to the spiritual conflict and the need to win protection. At last he came to a difficult resolve, and wrote a letter to Will Ladislaw, begging him to be at the shrubs that evening for a private interview at nine o'clock. Will had felt no particular surprise at the request, and connected it with some new notions about the pioneer. But when he was shown into Mr. Bulstrode's private room, he was struck with a painfully worn look on the banker's face, and was going to say, "'Are you ill?' When checking himself in that abruptness, he only inquired after Mrs. Bulstrode and her satisfaction with the picture bought for her. "'Thank you. She is quite satisfied. She has gone out with her daughters this evening.' I begged you to come, Mr. Ladislaw, because I have a communication of a very private, indeed, I will say, of a sacredly confidential nature, which I desire to make to you. Nothing, I dare say, has been farther from your thoughts than that there had been important ties in the past which could connect your history with mine. Will felt something like an electric shock. He was already in a state of keen sensitiveness and hardly allayed agitation on the subject of ties in the past, and his presentiments were not agreeable. It seemed like the fluctuations of a dream, as if the action begun by that loud, bloated stranger were being carried on by this pale-eyed, sickly-looking piece of respectability, whose subdued tone and glib formality of speech were at this moment almost as repulsive to him as their remembered contrast. He answered with a marked change of color. No, indeed, nothing. You see before you, Mr. Ladislaw, a man who is deeply stricken. But for the urgency of conscience and the knowledge that I am before the bar of one who seeth not as man seeth, I should be under no compulsion to make the disclosure which has been my object in asking you to come here tonight. So far as human laws go, you have no claim on me, whatever. Will was even more uncomfortable than wondering. Mr. Bulstrode had paused, leaning his head on his hand and looking at the floor, but he now fixed his examining glance on Will and said, I am told that your mother's name was Sarah Dunkirk, and that she ran away from her friends to go on the stage. Also, that your father was at one time much emaciated by illness, May I ask if you can confirm these statements? Yes, they are all true, said Will, struck with the order in which an inquiry had come that might have been expected to be preliminary to the banker's previous hints. But Mr. Bulstrode had tonight followed the order of his emotions. He entertained no doubt that the opportunity for restitution had come, and he had an overpowering impulse towards the penitential expression by which he was deprecating chastisement. "'Do you know any particulars of your mother's family?' he continued. "'No. She never liked to speak of them. "'She was a very generous, honorable woman,' said Will, almost angrily. "'I do not wish to allege anything against her. "'Did she never mention her mother to you at all?' "'I have heard her say that she thought her mother did not know the reason of her running away. "'She said, "'Poor mother,' in a pitying tone. "'That mother became my wife,' said Bulstrode, "'and then paused a moment before he added, "'You have a claim on me, Mr. Ladislaw. "'As I said before, not a legal claim, "'but one which my conscience recognizes. "'I was enriched by that marriage, "'a result which would probably not have taken place, "'certainly not to the same extent, "'if your grandmother could have discovered her daughter.' That daughter, I gather, is no longer living. No, said Will, feeling suspicion and repugnance rising so strongly within him that without quite knowing what he did, he took his hat from the floor and stood up. The impulse within him was to reject the disclosed connection. Pray be seated, Mr. Ladislaw, said Bulstrode anxiously. Doubtless you are startled by the suddenness of this discovery, but I entreat your patience with one who is already bowed down by inward trial. Will reseated himself, feeling some pity which was half contempt for this voluntary self-abasement of an elderly man. It is my wish, Mr. Ladislaw, to make amends for the deprivation which befell your mother. 
I know that you are without fortune, and I wish to supply you adequately from a store which would have probably already been yours had your grandmother been certain of your mother's existence and been able to find her. Mr. Bulstrode paused. He felt that he was performing a striking piece of scrupulosity in the judgment of his auditor and a penitential act in the eyes of God. He had no clue to the state of Will Ladislaw's mind, smarting as it was from the clear hints of Raffles, and with its natural quickness in construction stimulated by the expectation of discoveries which he would have been glad to conjure back into darkness. Will made no answer for several moments, till Mr. Bulstrode, who at the end of his speech had cast his eyes on the floor, now raised them with an examining glance, which Will met fully, saying, I suppose you did know of my mother's existence, and knew where she might have been found. Bulstrode shrank. There was a visible quivering in his face and hands. He was totally unprepared to have his advances met in this way, or to find himself urged into more revelation than he had beforehand set down as needful. But at that moment he dared not tell a lie, and he felt suddenly uncertain of his ground, which he had trodden with some confidence before. "'I will not deny that you conjecture rightly,' he answered with a faltering in his tone. "'And I wish to make atonement to you as the one still remaining who has suffered a loss through me. "'You enter, I trust, into my purpose, Mr. Ladislaw, which has a reference to higher than merely human claims, "'and, as I have already said, is entirely independent of any legal compulsion. "'I am ready to narrow my own resources.' and the prospects of my family by binding myself to allow you five hundred pounds yearly during my life, and to leave you a proportional capital at my death, nay, to do still more, if more should be definitely necessary, to any laudable project on your part. Mr. Bulstrode had gone on to particulars in the expectation that these would work strongly on Ladda's law and merge other feelings in grateful acceptance. But Will was looking as stubborn as possible, with his lips pouting and his fingers in his side pockets. He was not in the least touched, and said firmly, "'Before I make you any reply to your proposition, Mr. Bulstrode, I must beg you to answer a question or two. Were you connected with the business by which that fortune you speak of was originally made?' Mr. Bulstrode's thought was, "'Raffles has told him. How could he refuse to answer when he had volunteered what drew forth the question?' He answered, yes. And was that business, or was it not, a thoroughly dishonorable one? Nay, one that, if its nature had been made public, might have ranked those concerned in it with thieves and convicts. Will's tone had a cutting bitterness. He was moved to put his question as nakedly as he could. Bulstrode reddened with irrepressible anger. He had been prepared for a scene of self-abasement, but his intense pride and his habit of supremacy overpowered penitence, and even dread, when this young man, whom he had meant to benefit, turned on him with the air of a judge. The business was established before I became connected with it, sir, nor is it for you to institute an inquiry of that kind. He answered, not raising his voice, but speaking with quick defiantness. Yes, it is, said Will, starting up again with his hat in his hand. It is eminently mine to ask such questions when I have to decide whether I will have transactions with you and accept your money. My unblemished honor is important to me. It is important to me to have no stain on my birth and connections. And now I find there is a stain which I can't help. My mother felt it and tried to keep as clear of it as she could, and so will I. You shall keep your ill-gotten money. If I had any fortune of my own, I would willingly pay it to anyone who could disprove what you have told me. What I have to thank you for is that you kept the money till now, when I can refuse it. It ought to lie with a man's self that he is a gentleman. Good night, sir. Bulstrode was going to speak, but Will, with determined quickness, was out of the room in an instant, and in another the hall door had closed behind him. He was too strongly possessed with passionate rebellion against this inherited blot which had been thrust on his knowledge to reflect at present whether he had not been too hard on Bulstrode, too arrogantly merciless towards a man of sixty who was making efforts at retrieval when time had rendered them vain. 
No third person listening could have thoroughly understood the impetuosity of Will's repulse or the bitterness of his words. No one but himself then knew how everything connected with the sentiment of his own dignity had an immediate bearing for him on his relation to Dorothea and to Mr. Casabon's treatment of him. And in the rush of impulses by which he flung back that offer of Bulstrode's, there was mingled the sense that it would have been impossible for him ever to tell Dorothea that he had accepted it. As for Bulstrode, when Will was gone, he suffered a violent reaction and wept like a woman. It was the first time he had encountered an open expression of scorn from any man higher than Raffles, and with that scorn hurrying like venom through his system, there was no sensibility left to consolations. But the relief of weeping had to be checked. His wife and daughter soon came home from hearing the address of an Oriental missionary and were full of regret that Papa had not heard, in the first instance, the interesting things which they tried to repeat to him. Perhaps, through all other hidden thoughts, the one that breathed most comfort was that Will Ladder's Law, at least, was not likely to publish what had taken place that evening. End of chapter 61. Chapter 62 of Middle March. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Middle March by George Eliot. Chapter 62. He was a squire of low degree that loved the king's daughter of Hungary. Old Romance. Will Lader's Law's mind was now wholly bent on seeing Dorothea again, and forthwith quitting Middlemarch. The morning after his agitating scene with Balstrode, he wrote a brief letter to her, saying that various causes had detained him in the neighbourhood longer than he had expected and asking her permission to call again at Lowick at some hour, which she would mention on the earliest possible day, he being anxious to depart, but unwilling to do so, until she had granted him an interview. He left the letter at the office, ordering the messenger to carry it to Lowick Manor, and wait for an answer. Ladies Law felt the awkwardness of asking for more last words. His former farewell had been made in the hearing of Sir James Chetham, and had been announced as final even to the butler. It is certainly trying to a man's dignity to reappear when he is not expected to do so, a first farewell as pathos in it, but to come back for a second lens an opening to comedy and it was possible even that there might be bitter sneers afloat about Will's motives for lingering. Still, it was on the whole more satisfactory to his feeling to take the directest means of seeing Dorothea than to use any device which might give an air of chance to a meeting of which he wished her to understand that if it was what he earnestly sought. When he had parted from her before, he had been in ignorance of facts which gave a new aspect to the relation between them, and made a more absolute severance than he had then believed in. He knew nothing of Dorothea's private fortune, and being little used to reflect on such matters, took it for granted that according to Mr. Casabon's arrangement marriage to him, Will Ladislaw would mean that she consented to be penniless. That was not what he could wish for even in his secret heart, or even if she had been ready to meet such hard contrasts for his sake. And then, too, there was the fresh smart of that disclosure about his mother's family, which if known would be an added reason why Dorothea's friends should look down upon him as utterly below her. The secret hope that after some years he might come back with the sense 
that he had at least a personal value equal to her wealth, seemed now the dreamy continuation of a dream. This change would surely justify him in asking Dorothea to receive him once more. But Dorothea on that morning was not at home to receive Will's note. In consequence of a letter from her uncle, announcing his intention to be at home in a week, she had driven first to Freshet to carry the news, meaning to go on to the Grange to deliver some orders with which her uncle had entrusted her, thinking, as he said, a little mental occupation for this sort good for a widow. If Will Ladislaw could have overheard some of the talk at Freshet that morning, he would have felt all his suppositions confirmed as to the readiness of certain people to sneer at his lingering in the neighbourhood. Sir James, indeed, though much relieved concerning Dorothea, had been on the watch to learn Ladislaw's movements, and had an instructed informant in Mr. Standish, who was necessarily in his confidence on this matter that Ladislaw had stayed in Middlemarch nearly two months after he had declared that he was going immediately, was a fact to embitter Sir James's suspicions, or at least to justify his aversion to a young fellow, whom he represented to himself as slight, volatile, and likely enough to show some recklessness, as naturally went along with the position unriveted by family ties or a strict profession. But he had just heard something from Standish which, while it justified these surmises about Will, offered a means of nullifying all danger with regard to Dorothea. Unwanted circumstances may make us all rather unlike ourselves. There are conditions under which the most majestic person is obliged to sneeze, and our emotions are liable to be acted on in the same incongruous manner. Good Sir James was this morning so far unlike himself that he was irritably anxious to say something to Dorothea on a subject which he usually avoided as if it had been a matter of shame to them both. He could not use Celia as a medium, because he did not choose that she should know the kind of gossip he had in his mind, and before Dorothea happened to arrive he had been trying to imagine how, with his shyness and unready tongue, he could ever manage to introduce his communication. Her unexpected presence brought him to utter hopelessness in his own power of saying, anything unpleasant, but desperation suggested a resource. He sent the groom on an unsaddled horse across the park with a pencilled note to Mrs. Cadwalder, who already knew the gossip, and would think it no compromise of herself to repeat it as often as required. Dorothea was detained on the good pretext that Mr. Garth, whom she wanted to see, was expected at the hall within the hour, and she was still talking to Caleb on the gravel when Sir James, on the watch for the rector's wife, saw her coming and met her with the needful hints. "'Enough, I understand,' said Mrs. Cadwallader. "'You shall be innocent. I am such a blackamoor that I cannot smirch myself. I don't mean that it's of any consequence.' said Sir James, disliking that Mrs. Cadwallader should understand too much. Only it is desirable that Dorothea should know there are reasons why she should not receive him again, and I really can't say so to her. It will come lightly from you. It came very lightly indeed, when Dorothea quitted Caleb and turned to meet them. It appeared that Mrs. Cadwallader had stepped across the park by the merest chance in the world, just to chat with Celia in a matronly way about the baby, 
and so Mr. Brook was coming back. Delightful! Coming back! It was to be hoped, quite cured of parliamentary fever and pioneering. A propose of the pioneer. Somebody had prophesied that it would soon be like a dying dolphin, and turn all colours for want of knowing how to help itself, because Mr. Brook's protégé, the brilliant young Ladislaw, was gone or going. Had Sir James heard that, the three were walking along the gravel slowly, and Sir James, turning aside to whip a shrub, said he had heard something of that sort. All false, said Mrs. Cadwallader. He is not gone, or going, apparently. The pioneer keeps its colour, and Mr. Orlando Ladislaw is making a sad dark blue scandal by warbling continually with your Mr. Lydgate's wife, who they tell me is as pretty as pretty can be. It seems nobody ever goes into the house without finding this young gentleman lying on the rug or warbling at the piano. But the people in manufacturing towns are always disreputable. You began by saying that one report was false, Mrs. Cadwallader, and I believe this is false too, said Dorothea, with indignant energy. At least I feel sure it is a misrepresentation. I will not hear any evil spoken of Mr. Ladislaw. He has already suffered too much injustice. Dorothea, when thoroughly moved, cared little what any one thought of her feelings, and even if she had been able to reflect, she would have held it petty to keep silence at injurious words about will from fear of being herself misunderstood. Her face was flushed and her lip trembled. Sir James, glancing at her, repented of his stratagem, but Mrs. Cadwallader, equal to all occasions, spread the palms of her hands outward and said, Heaven grant it, my dear. I mean that all bad tales about anybody may be false. But it is a pity that young Lydgate should have married one of these Middlemarch girls. Considering he's a son of somebody, he might have got a woman with good blood in her veins, and not too young, who would have put up with his profession. There's Clara Harfarger, for instance, whose friends don't know what to do with her, and she has a portion. Then we might have had her among us, however. It's no use being wise for other people. Where is Celia? Pray, let us go in. I am going on immediately to Tipton, said Dorothea, rather haughtily. Good-bye. Sir James could say nothing as he accompanied her to the carriage. He was altogether discontented with the result of a contrivance which had cost him some secret humiliation beforehand. Dorothea drove along between the buried hedgerows and the shorn cornfields, not seeing or hearing anything around. The tears came and rolled down her cheeks, but she did not know it. The world, it seemed, was turning ugly and hateful, and there was no place for her trustfulness. It is not true, it is not true, was the voice within her that she listened to, but all the while a remembrance to which there had always clung a vague uneasiness would thrust itself on her attention. The remembrance of that day when she had found Will Ladislaw with Mrs. Lydgate, and had heard his voice accompanied by the piano. He said he would never do anything that I disapproved. I wish I could have told him that I disapproved of that, said poor Dorothea inwardly, feeling a strange alternation between anger with Will and the passionate defence of him. They all try to blacken him before me, but I will care for no pain, if he is not to blame. I have always believed he was good, 
These were her last thoughts before she felt that the carriage was passing under the archway of the lodge gate at the Grange, when she hurriedly pressed her handkerchief to her face and began to think of her errands. The coachman begged leave to take out the horses for half an hour, as there was something wrong with a shoe, and Dorothea, having the sense that she was going to rest, took off her gloves and bonnet, while she was leaning against a statue in the entrance hall, and talking to the housekeeper, at last she said, I must stay here a little, Mrs. Cowell. I will go into the library and write you some memoranda from my uncle's letter, if you will open the shutters for me. The shutters are open, madam, said Mrs. Cowell, following Dorothea, who had walked along as she spoke. Mr. Ladislaw is there, looking for something. Will had come to fetch a portfolio of his own sketches, which he had missed in the act of packing his movables, and did not choose to leave behind. Dorothea's heart seemed to turn over as if it had had a blow, but she was not perceptibly checked. In truth, the sense that Will was there was for the moment all satisfying to her, like the sight of something precious that one has lost. When she reached the door, she said to Mrs. Cowell, Go in first and tell him that I am here. Will had found his portfolio, and had laid it on the table at the far end of the room, to turn over the sketches and please himself by looking at the memorable piece of art which had a relation to nature too mysterious for Dorothea. He was smiling at it still, and shaking the sketches into order with the thought that he might find a letter from her awaiting him at Middlemarch, when Mrs. Cowell, close to his elbow, said, Mrs. Casabon is coming in, sir. Will turned round quickly, and the next moment Dorothea was entering. As Mrs. Cowell closed the door behind her, they met. Each was looking at the other, and consciousness was overflowed by something that suppressed utterance. It was no confusion that kept them silent, for they both felt the parting was near, and there is no shamefacedness in a sad parting. She moved automatically towards her uncle's chair against the writing-table, and Will, after drawing it out a little for her, went a few paces off and stood opposite to her. "'Pray, sit down,' said Dorothea, crossing her hands on her lap. "'I am very glad you were here.' Will thought that her face looked just as it did when she first shook hands with him in Rome, for her widow's cap, fixed in her bonnet, had gone off with it, and he could see that she had lately been shedding tears." but the mixture of anger in her agitation had vanished at the sight of him. She had been used, when they were face to face, always to feel confidence and the happy freedom which comes with mutual understanding, and how could other people's words hinder that effect on a sudden? Let the music which can take possession of our frame and fill the air with joy for us sound once more, what does it signify that we heard it found fault within its absence? I have sent a letter to Lowick Manor to-day, asking leave to see you, said Will, seating himself opposite to her. I am going away immediately, and I could not go without speaking to you again. I thought we had parted when you came to Lowick many weeks ago. You thought you were going then, said Dorothea her voice trembling a little. Yes, but I was ignorant then of things which I know now, things which have altered my feelings about the future. When I saw you before, I was dreaming that I might come back some day. I don't think I ever shall now. We will pause here. You wish me to know the reasons, 
said Dorothea timidly. Yes, said Will impetuously, shaking his head backward, and looking away from her with irritation in his face. Of course I must wish it. I have been grossly insulted in your eyes and in the eyes of others. There has been a mean implication against my character. I wish you to know that under no circumstances would I have given men the chance of saying that I sought money under the pretext of seeking something else. There was no need of other safeguard against me. The safeguard of wealth was enough. Will rose from his chair with the last word and went. He hardly knew where, but it was to the projecting window nearest him, which had been open as now about the same season a year ago, when he and Dorothea had stood within it and talked together. Her whole heart was going out at this moment in sympathy with Will's indignation. She only wanted to convince him that she had never done him injustice, and he seemed to have turned away from her as if she too had been part of the unfriendly world. It would be very unkind of you to suppose that I ever attributed any meanness to you, she began. Then in her ardent way, wanting to plead with him, she moved from her chair and went in front of him, to her old place in the window, saying, Do you suppose that I ever disbelieved in you? When Will saw her there, he gave a start and moved backward out of the window, without meeting her glance. Dorothea was hurt by this movement, following up the previous anger of his tone. She was ready to say that it was as hard on her as on him and that she was helpless, but those strange particulars of their relation which neither of them could explicitly mention kept her always in dread of saying too much. At this moment she had no belief that Will would in any case have wanted to marry her, and she feared using words which might imply such a belief. She only said earnestly, recurring to his last word, I am sure no safeguard was ever needed against you. Will did not answer. In the stormy fluctuation of his feelings, these words of hers seemed to him cruelly neutral, and he looked pale and miserable after his angry outburst. He went to the table and fastened up his portfolio while Dorothea looked at him from the distance. They were wasting these last moments together in wretched silence. What could he say, since what had he got obstinately uppermost in his mind was the passionate love for her which he forbade himself to utter? What could she say, since she might offer him no help? since she was forced to keep the money that ought to have been his, since today he seemed not to respond as he used to do to her thorough trust and liking. But Will at last turned away from his portfolio and approached the window again. I must go, he said, with that peculiar look of the eyes which sometimes accompanies bitter feeling as if they had been tired and burned and gazing too close at a light. "'What shall you do in life?' said Dorothea timidly. "'Have you intentions remained just the same as when we said good-bye before?' "'Yes,' said Will, in a tone that seemed to waive the subject as uninteresting. "'I shall work away at the first thing that offers.' I suppose one gets a habit of doing without happiness or hope. Oh, what sad words, said Dorothea, with a dangerous tendency to sob. Then trying to smile, she added, We used to agree that we were alike in speaking too strongly. I have not spoken too strongly now, said Will, leaning back against the angle of the wall. 
There are certain things which a man can only go through once in his life, and he must know some time or other that the best is over with him. This experience has happened to me while I am very young, that is all. What I care more for than I can ever care for anything else is absolutely forbidden to me. I don't mean merely by being out of my reach, but forbidden me, even if it were within my reach, by my own pride and honour, by everything I respect myself for. Of course I shall go on living as a man might do who had seen heaven in a trance. Will paused, imagining that it would be impossible for Dorothea to misunderstand this. Indeed, he felt that it was contradicting himself and offending against his self-approval in speaking to her so plainly. But still it could not be fairly called wooing a woman to tell her that he would never woo her. It must be admitted to be a ghostly kind of wooing, but Dorothea's mind was rapidly going over the past with quite another vision than this. The thought that she herself might be what Will most cared for did throb through her an instant, but then came doubt, the memory of the little they had lived through together, turned pale and shrank before the memory which suggested how much fuller might have been the intercourse between Will and someone else with whom he had constant companionship. Everything he had said might refer to that other relation, and whatever had passed between him and herself was thoroughly explained by what she had always regarded as their simple friendship and the cruel obstruction thrust upon it by her husband's injurious act. Dorothea stood silent, with her eyes cast down dreamily, while images crowded upon her which left the sickening certainty that Will was referring to Mrs. Lydgate. But why sickening? He wanted her to know that here, too, his conduct should be above suspicion. Will was not surprised at her silence. His mind also was tumultuously busy while he watched her and he was feeling rather wildly that something must happen to hinder their parting, some miracle, clearly nothing at their own deliberate speech. Yet, after all, had she any love for him? He could not pretend to himself that he would rather believe her to be without that pain. He could not deny that a secret longing for the assurance that she loved him was at the root of all his words. Neither of them knew how long they stood in that way. Dorothea was raising her eyes, and was about to speak, when the door opened and her footman came to say, "'The horses are ready, madam, whenever you like to start.' "'Presently,' said Dorothea. Then turning to Will, she said, "'I have some memoranda to write for the housekeeper.' "'I must go,' said Will." when the door had closed again, advancing towards her. The day after tomorrow I shall leave Middlemarch. You have acted in every way rightly, said Dorothea, in a low tone, feeling a pressure at her heart which made it difficult to speak. She put out her hand, and Will took it for an instant without speaking for her words had seemed to him cruelly cold and unlike herself. Their eyes met, but there was discontent in his, and in hers there was only sadness. He turned away and took the portfolio under his arm. I have never done you injustice. Please remember me, said Dorothea, repressing a rising sob. Why should you say that? said Will, with irritation, as if I were not in danger of forgetting everything else. He had really a movement of anger against her at that moment, and it impelled him to go away without pause. It was all one flash to Dorothea, his last words, his distant bow to her as he reached the door, the sense 
that he was no longer there. She sunk into the chair, and for a few moments sat like a statue, while images and emotions were hurrying upon her. Joy came first, in spite of the threatening train behind it, joy in the impression that it was really herself whom Will loved and was renouncing, that there was really no other love less permissible, more blameworthy, which honour was hurrying him away from. They were parted all the same, but Dorothea drew a deep breath and felt her strength return. She could think of him unrestrainedly. At that moment the parting was easy to bear. The first sense of loving and being loved excluded sorrow. It was as if some hard icy pressure had melted, and her consciousness had room to expand. Her past was come back to her with larger interpretation. The joy was not the less. Perhaps it was the more complete just then, because of the irrevocable parting, for there was no reproach, no contemptuous wonder, to imagine in any eye or from any lips. He had acted so as to defy reproach, and make wonder respectful. Any one watching her might have seen that there was a fortifying thought within her, just as when inventive power is working with glad ease some small claim on the attention is fully met as if it were only a cranny open to the sunlight it was easy now for dorothea to write her memoranda she spoke her last words to the housekeeper in cheerful tones and when she seated herself in the carriage her eyes were bright and her cheeks blooming under the dismal bonnet. She threw back the heavy weepers and looked before her, wondering which road Will had taken. It was in her nature to be proud that he was blameless, and through all her feelings there ran this vein. I was right to defend him. The coachman was used to drive his greys at a good pace. Mr. Casabon being unenjoying and impatient in every way from his desk, and wanting to get to the end of all journeys, and Dorothea was now bowled along quickly. Driving was pleasant, for rain in the night had laid the dust, and the blue sky looked far off, away from the region of the great clouds that sailed in masses. The earth looked like a happy place under the vast heavens, and Dorothea was wishing that she might overtake Will and see him once more. After a turn of the road, there he was with the portfolio under his arm, but the next moment she was passing him while he raised his hat, and she felt a pang at being seated there in a sort of exultation, leaving him behind. She could not look back at him. It was as if a crowd of indifferent objects had thrust them asunder, and forced them along different paths, taking them farther and farther away from each other, and making it useless to look back. She could no more make any sign that would seem to say, Need we part, than she could stop the carriage to wait for him. Nay, what a word of reasons crowded upon her against any movement of her thought towards a future that might reverse the decision of this day. I only wish I had known before, I wish he knew. Then we could be quite happy in thinking of each other, though we are forever parted. And if I could but have given him the money, and made things easier for him, were the longings that came back the most persistently. And yet, so heavily, did the world weigh on her in spite of her independent energy, that with this idea of will as in need of such help, and at a disadvantage with the world, there came always the vision of that unfittingness of any closer relation between them, which lay in the opinion of every one connected with her. 
she felt to the full all the imperativeness of the motives which urged Will's conduct. How could he dream of her defying the barrier that her husband had placed between them? How could she ever say to herself that she would defy it? Will's certainty, as the carriage grew smaller in the distance, had much more bitterness in it. Very slight matters were enough to gall him in his sensitive mood, and the sight of Dorothea driving past him, while he felt himself plodding along, as a poor devil, seeking a position in a world which in his present temper offered him little that he coveted, made his conduct seem a mere matter of necessity, and took away the sustainment of resolve. After all, he had no assurance that she loved him. Could any man pretend that he was simply glad in such a case to have the suffering all on his own side? That evening Will spent with the Lydgates. The next evening he was gone. End of Chapter 62book 7 two temptations chapter 63 of middlemarch this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by ralph snelson middlemarch by george eliot chapter 63 these little things are great to little man Goldsmith. "'Have you seen much of your scientific phoenix Lydgate lately?' said Mr. Toller at one of his Christmas dinner-parties, speaking to Mr. Fairbrother on his right hand. "'Not much, I am sorry to say,' answered the vicar, accustomed to parry Mr. Toller's banter about his belief in the new medical light. "'I am out of the way, and he is too busy.' "'Is he?' "'I am glad to hear it,' said Mr. Minchin, with mingled suavity and surprise. "'He gives a great deal of time to the new hospital,' said Mr. Fairbrother, who had his reasons for continuing the subject. "'I hear of that from my neighbor, Mrs. Cossabon, who goes there often. She says Lydgate is indefatigable, and is making a fine thing of Bulstrode's institution. He is preparing a new ward in case of the cholera coming to us.' "'And preparing theories of treatment to try on the patients, I suppose,' said Mr. Toller. "'Come, Toller, be candid,' said Mr. Fairbrother. "'You are too clever not to see the good of a bold, fresh mind in medicine, as well as in everything else. And as to cholera, I fancy none of you are very sure what you ought to do. If a man goes a little too far along a new road, it is usually himself that he harms more than anyone else.' "'I am sure you and Wrench ought to be obliged to him,' said Dr. Minchin, looking towards Toller, "'for he has sent you the cream of Peacock's patience.' "'Lydgate has been living at a great rate for a young beginner,' said Mr. Harry Toller, the brewer. "'I suppose his relations in the North back him up.' "'I hope so,' said Mr. Chichley, "'else he ought not to have married that nice girl we were all so fond of. "'Hang it, one has a grudge against a man who carries off the prettiest girl in the town. "'Aye, by George, and the best, too,' said Mr. Standish. "'My friend Vincey didn't half like the marriage, I know that,' said Mr. Chichley. "'He wouldn't do much. How the relations on the other side may have come down, I can't say.' There was an emphatic kind of reticence in Mr. Chichley's manner of speaking. "'Oh, I shouldn't think Lydgate ever looked to practice for a living,' said Mr. Toller, with a slight touch of sarcasm, and there the subject was dropped. This was not the first time that Mr. Fairbrother had heard hints of Lydgate's expenses being obviously too great to be met by his practice, but he thought it not unlikely that there were resources or expectations which excused the large outlay at the time of Lydgate's marriage, and which might hinder any bad consequences from the disappointment in his practice. One evening, when he took the pains to go to Middlemarch on purpose to have a chat with Lydgate, 
as of old, he noticed in him an air of excited effort quite unlike his usual easy way of keeping silence or breaking it with abrupt energy whenever he had anything to say. Lydgate talked persistently when they were in his workroom, putting arguments for and against the probability of certain biological views, but he had none of those definite things to say or to show which give the waymarks of a patient uninterrupted pursuit, such as he used himself to insist on, saying that there must be a systole or diastole in all inquiry, and that a man's mind must be continually expanding and shrinking between the whole human horizon and the horizon of an object glass. That evening he seemed to be talking widely for the sake of resisting any personal bearing, and before long they went into the drawing-room, where Lydgate, having asked Rosamond to give them music, sank back in his chair in silence, but with a strange light in his eyes. He may have been taking an opiate, was a thought that crossed Mr. Fairbrother's mind. Tick Dolero, perhaps, or medical worries. It did not occur to him that Lydgate's marriage was not delightful. He believed, as the rest did, that Rosamond was an amiable, docile creature, though he had always thought her rather uninteresting, a little too much the pattern card of the finishing school, and his mother could not forgive Rosamond because she never seemed to see that Henrietta Noble was in the room. However, Lydgate fell in love with her, said the vicar to himself, and she must be to his taste. Mr. Fairbrother was aware that Lydgate was a proud man, but having very little corresponding fiber in himself, and perhaps too little care about personal dignity, except the dignity of not being mean or foolish, he could hardly allow enough for the way in which Lydgate shrank as from a burn from the utterance of any word about his private affairs. And soon after that conversation at Mr. Toller's, the vicar learned something which made him watch the more eagerly for an opportunity of indirectly letting Lydgate know that if he wanted to open himself about any difficulty there was a friendly ear ready. The opportunity came at Mr. Vincey's, where, on New Year's Day, there was a party to which Mr. Fairbrother was irresistibly invited, on the plea that he must not forsake his old friends on the first new year of his being a greater man and rector as well as vicar and this party was thoroughly friendly. All the ladies of the Fairbrother family were present, the Vincey children all dined at the table, and Fred had persuaded his mother that if she did not invite Mary Garth, the Fairbrothers would regard it as a slight to themselves, Mary being their particular friend. Mary came, and Fred was in high spirits, though his enjoyment was of a checkered kind, triumph that his mother should see Mary's importance with the chief personages in the party being much streaked with jealousy when Mr. Fairbrother sat down by her. Fred used to be much more easy about his own accomplishments in the days when he had not begun to dread being bowled out by Fairbrother, and this terror was still before him. Mrs. Vincey, in her fullest matronly bloom, looked at Mary's little figure, rough wavy hair and visage quite without lilies and roses, and wondered, trying unsuccessfully to fancy herself caring about Mary's appearance in wedding clothes, or feeling complacency in grandchildren who would feature the Garths. However, the party was a merry one, and Mary was particularly bright, being glad, for Fred's sake, that his friends were getting kinder to her, and being also quite willing that they should see how much she was valued by others whom they must admit to be judges. Mr. Fairbrother noticed that Lydgate seemed bored, and that Mr. Vincey spoke as little as possible to his son-in-law. Rosamond was perfectly graceful and calm, and only a subtle observation, such as the vicar had not been aroused to bestow on her, would have perceived the total absence of that interest in her husband's presence, which a loving wife is sure to betray, even if etiquette keeps her aloof from him. When Lydgate was taking part in the conversation, she never looked towards him any more than if she had been a sculptured psyche modeled to look another way. And when, after being called out for an hour or two, he re-entered the room, she seemed unconscious of the fact, which eighteen months before would have had the effect of a numeral before ciphers. In reality, however, she was intensely aware of Lydgate's voice and movements, and her pretty, good-tempered air of unconsciousness was a studied negation by which she satisfied her inward opposition to him without compromise of propriety. 
When the ladies were in the drawing-room after Lydgate had been called away from the dessert, Mrs. Fairbrother, when Rosamond happened to be near her, said, "'You have to give up a great deal of your husband's society, Mrs. Lydgate.' "'Yes, the life of a medical man is very arduous, especially when he is so devoted to his profession as Mr. Lydgate is,' said Rosamond, who was standing and moved easily away at the end of this correct little speech. "'It is dreadfully dull for her when there is no company,' said Mrs. Vincey, who was seated at the old lady's side. "'I am sure I thought so when Rosamond was ill, and I was staying with her. "'You know, Mrs. Fairbrother, ours is a cheerful house. "'I am of a cheerful disposition myself, and Mr. Vincey always likes something to be going on. "'That is what Rosamond has been used to. "'Very different from a husband out at odd hours.' and never knowing when he will come home, and of a close, proud disposition. I think, indiscreet, Mrs. Vincey did lower her tone slightly with this parenthesis, but Rosamond always had an angel of a temper. Her brothers used very often not to please her, but she was never the girl to show temper. From a baby she was always as good as good, and with a complexion beyond anything. But my children are all good-tempered, thank goodness." This was easily credible to anyone looking at Mrs. Vincey as she threw back her broad cap-strings and smiled towards her three little girls, aged from seven to eleven. But in that smiling glance she was obliged to include Mary Garth, whom the three girls had got into a corner to make her tell them stories. Mary was just finishing the delicious tale of Rumpelstiltskin, which she had well by heart, because Letty was never tired of communicating it to her ignorant elders from a favorite red volume. Louisa, Mrs. Vincent's darling, now ran to her with wide-eyed serious excitement, crying, "'Oh, Mama, Mama, the little man stamped so hard on the floor he couldn't get his leg out again.' "'Bless you, my cherub,' said Mama. "'You shall tell me all about it to-morrow.' Go and listen, and then, as her eyes followed Louisa back towards the attractive corner, she thought if Fred wished her to invite Mary again, she would make no objection, the children being so pleased with her. But presently the corner became still more animated, for Mr. Fairbrother came in, and seating himself behind Louisa, took her on his lap, whereupon the girls all insisted that he must hear Rumpelstiltskin, and Mary must tell it over again. He insisted, too, and Mary, without fuss, began again in her neat fashion, with precisely the same words as before. Fred, who had also seated himself near, would have felt unmixed triumph in Mary's effectiveness, if Mr. Fairbrother had not been looking at her with evident admiration, while he dramatized an intense interest in the tale to please the children. "'You will never care any more about my one-eyed giant, Lou,' said Fred at the end. "'Yes, I shall. Tell about him now,' said Louisa. "'Oh, I dare say. I am quite cut out. Ask Mr. Fairbrother.' "'Yes,' added Mary. "'Ask Mr. Fairbrother to tell you about the ants whose beautiful house was knocked down by a giant named Tom, and he thought they didn't mind because he couldn't hear them cry or see them use their pocket handkerchiefs.' "'Please,' said Louisa, looking up at the vicar. "'No, no, I am a grave old parson.' If I try to draw a story out of my bag, a sermon comes instead. Shall I preach you a sermon? said he, putting on his short-sighted glasses and pursing up his lips. Yes, said Louisa, falteringly. Let me see, then. Against cakes. How cakes are bad things, especially if they are sweet and have plums in them. Louisa took the affair rather seriously and got down from the vicar's knee to go to Fred. "'Ah, I see it will not do to preach on New Year's Day,' said Mr. Fairbrother, rising and walking away. He had discovered of late that Fred had become jealous of him, and also that he himself was not losing his preference for Mary above all other women. "'A delightful young person is Miss Garth,' said Mrs. Fairbrother, who had been watching her son's movements. "'Yes,' said Mrs. Vincey, obliged to reply, as the old lady turned to her expectantly, it is a pity she is not better looking. I cannot say that, said Mrs. Fairbrother decisively. I like her countenance. We must not always ask for beauty when a good God has seen fit to make an excellent young woman without it. I put good manners first, 
and Miss Garth will know how to conduct herself in any station. The old lady was a little sharp in her tone, having a prospective reference to Mary's becoming her daughter-in-law, for there was this inconvenience in Mary's position with re regard to Fred, that it was not suitable to be made public, and hence the three ladies at Lowick Parsonage were still hoping that Camden would choose Miss Garth. New visitors entered, and the drawing-room was given up to music and games, while whist-tables were prepared in the quiet room on the other side of the hall. Mr. Fairbrother played a rubber to satisfy his mother, who regarded her occasional whist as a protest against scandal and novelty of opinion, in which light even a revoke had its dignity. But at the end he got Mr. Chisley to take his place, and left the room. As he crossed the hall, Lydgate had just come in and was taking off his great coat. "'You are the man I was going to look for,' said the vicar, and instead of entering the drawing-room they walked along the hall and stood against the fireplace, where the frosty air helped to make a glowing bank. "'You see, I can leave the whist-table easily enough,' he went on, smiling at Lydgate. "'Now I don't play for money.' "'I owe that to you, Mrs. Cossabon says.' "'How?' said Lydgate coldly. "'Ah, you didn't mean me to know it. I call that ungenerous reticence. You should let a man have the pleasure of feeling that you have done him a good turn. I don't enter into some people's dislike of being under an obligation. Upon my word, I prefer being under an obligation to everybody for behaving well to me.' "'I can't tell what you mean,' said Lydgate, "'unless it is that I once spoke of you to Mrs. Cossabon but I did not think that she would break her promise not to mention that I had done so," said Lydgate, leaning his back against the corner of the mantelpiece, and showing no radiance in his face. It was Brooke who let it out, only the other day. He paid me the compliment of saying that he was very glad I had the living, though you had come across his tactics and had praised me up as a lean and a Tillotson, and that sort of thing, till Mrs. Cossabon would hear of no one else. Old Brook is such a leaky-minded fool," said Lydgate contemptuously. "Well, I was glad of the leakiness then. I don't see why you shouldn't like me to know that you wished to do me a service, my dear fellow, and you certainly have done me one. It's rather a strong check to one's self-complacency to find how much of one's right doing depends on not being in want of money. A man will not be tempted to say the Lord's prayer backward to please the devil if he doesn't want the devil's services. I have no need to hang on the smiles of chance now. I don't see that there's any money-getting without chance," said Lydgate. If a man gets it in a profession, it's pretty sure to come by chance. Mr. Fairbrother thought he could account for this speech, in striking contrast with Lydgate's former way of talking, as the perversity which will often spring from the moodiness of a man ill at ease in his affairs. He answered in a tone of good-humoured admission, "'Ah, there's enormous patience wanted with the way of the world. But it is the easier for a man to wait patiently when he has friends who love him, and ask for nothing better than to help him through, so far as it lies in their power.' "'Oh, yes,' said Lydgate in a careless tone, changing his attitude and looking at his watch. "'People make much more of their difficulties than they need to do.' He knew as distinctly as possible that this was an offer of help to himself from Mr. Fairbrother, and he could not bear it. So strangely determined are we mortals, that after having been long gratified with the sense that he had privately done the vicar a service, the suggestion that the vicar discerned his need of a service in return made him shrink into unconquerable reticence. Besides, behind all making of such offers, what else must come? that he should mention his case, imply that he wanted specific things. At that moment suicide seemed easier. Mr. Fairbrother was too keen a man not to know the meaning of that reply, and there was a certain massiveness in Lydgate's manner and tone, corresponding with his physique, which if he repelled your advances in the first instance seemed to put persuasive devices out of question. "'What time are you?' said the vicar, devouring his wounded feeling. "'After eleven, said Lydgate. And they went into the drawing-room. End of chapter 63
Recording by Ralph Snelson, Springville, Utah. Chapter sixty four of Middlemarch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Middlemarch by George Eliot. Chapter sixty four. First gentleman. Where lies the power? There let the blame lie too. Second gentleman. Nay, power is relative. You cannot fright the coming pest with border fortresses, or catch your carp with subtle argument. All force is twain in one. Cause is not cause, unless effect be there, and action self must needs contain a passive. So command exists but with obedience. Even if Lydgate had been inclined to be quite open about his affairs, he knew that it would hardly have been in Mr. Fairbrother's power to give him the help he immediately wanted. With the year's bills coming in from his tradesmen, with Dover's threatening hold on his furniture, and with nothing to depend on but slow, dribbling payments from patients who must not be offended, for the handsome fees he had had from Freshet Hall and Lowick Manor had been easily absorbed, nothing less than a thousand pounds would have freed him from actual embarrassment, and left a residue which, according to the favourite phrase of hopefulness in such circumstances, would have given him time to look about him. Naturally, the merry Christmas bringing the happy new year, when fellow-citizens expect to be paid for the trouble and goods they have smilingly bestowed on their neighbours, had so tightened the pressure of sordid cares on Lydgate's mind that it was hardly possible for him to think unbrokenly of any other subject, even the most habitual and soliciting. He was not an ill-tempered man, whose intellectual activity, the ardent kindness of his heart, as well as his strong frame, would always, under tolerably easy conditions, have kept him above the petty, uncontrolled susceptibilities which make bad temper. But he was now a prey to that worst irritation, which arises not simply from annoyance, but from the second consciousness underlying those annoyances, of wasted energy and a degrading preoccupation, which was the reverse of all his former purposes. This is what I am thinking of, and this is what I might have been thinking of, was the bitter, incessant murmur within him, making every difficulty a double goad to impatience. Some gentlemen have made an amazing figure in literature, by general discontent with the universe as a trap of dullness into which their great souls have fallen by mistake. But the sense of a stupendous self and an insignificant world may have its consolations. Lydgate's discontent was much harder to bear. It was the sense that there was a grand existence in thought, and effective action lying around him, while his self was being narrowed into the miserable isolation of egoistic fears and vulgar anxieties for events that might allay such fears. His troubles will perhaps appear miserably sordid, and beneath the intention of lofty persons who can know nothing of debt except on a magnificent scale. Doubtless they were sordid, and for the majority, who are not lofty, there is no escape from sordidness but by being free from money-craving, with all its base hopes and temptations, its watching for death, its hinted requests, its horse-dealer's desires to make bad work pass for good, its seeking for function which ought to be another's, its compulsion often too long for luck in the shape of wide calamity. It was because Lydgate writhed under the idea of getting his neck beneath this vile yoke that he had fallen into a bitter, moody state which was continually widening Rosamond's alienation from him. After the first disclosure about the bill of sale, he had made many efforts to draw her into sympathy with him about possible measures for narrowing their expenses, and with the threatening approach of Christmas his propositions grew more and more definite. "'We can do with only one servant, and live on very little,' he said, "'and I shall manage with one horse.' For Lydgate, as we have seen, had begun to reason, with a more distinct vision, about the expenses of living, and any share of pride he had given to appearances of that sort was meagre, compared with the pride which made him revolt from exposure as a debtor, or from asking men to help him with their money. "'Of course you can dismiss the other two servants, if you like,' said Rosamond, but I should have thought it would be very injurious to your position for us to live in a poor way. You must expect your practice to be lowered. My dear Rosamond, it's not a question of choice. We have begun too expensively. 
Peacock, you know, lived in a much smaller house than this. It is my fault. I ought to have known better, and I deserve a thrashing. If there were anybody who had a right to give it to me, for bringing you into this necessity of living in a poorer way than you have been used to. But we were married because we loved each other, I suppose, and that may help us to pull along till things get better. Come, dear, put down that work and come to me. He was really in chill gloom about her at that moment, but he dreaded a future without affection, and was determined to resist the oncoming of division between them. Rosamond obeyed him, and he took her on his knee, but in her secret soul she was utterly aloof from him. The poor thing saw only that the world was not ordered to her liking, and Lydgate was part of that world. But he held her waist with one hand, and laid the other gently on both of hers. For this rather abrupt man had much tenderness in his manners towards women, seeming to have always present in his imagination the weakness of their frames and the delicate poise of their health both in body and mind, and he began again to speak persuasively. I find now I look into things a little, Rosie, that it is wonderful what an amount of money slips away in our housekeeping. I suppose the servants are careless. And we have had a great many people coming. But there must be many in our rank who manage with much less. They must do with commoner things, I suppose, and look after the scraps. It seems money goes but a little way in these matters, for Wrench has everything as plain as possible, and he has a very large practice. Oh, if you think of living as the Wrenches do, said Rosamond, with a little turn of her neck, but I have heard you express your disgust at that way of living. "'Yes, they have very bad taste in everything. "'They make economy look ugly. "'We needn't do that. "'I only meant that they avoid expenses, "'although Wrench has a capital practice.' "'Why should you not have a good practice, Tertius? "'Mr. Peacock had. "'You should be more careful not to offend people, "'and you should send out medicines as others do. "'I am sure you began well, "'and you got several good houses. "'It cannot answer to be eccentric. "'You should think what will be generally liked.' said Rosamond, in a decided little tone of admonition. Lidgett's anger rose. He was prepared to be indulgent towards feminine weakness, but not towards feminine dictation. The shallowness of a water nixie's soul may have a charm until she becomes didactic, but he controlled himself, and only said with a touch of despotic firmness, "'What I am to do in my practice, Rosie, is for me to judge. That is not the question between us.' It is enough for you to know that our income is likely to be a very narrow one, hardly four hundred, perhaps less, for a long time to come, and we must try to rearrange our lives in accordance with that fact. Rosamond was silent for a moment or two, looking before her, and then said, My uncle Bulstrode ought to allow you a salary for the time you give to the hospital. It is not right that you should work for nothing. It was understood from the beginning that my services would be gratuitous. That, again, need not enter into our discussion. I have pointed out what is the only probability, said Lydgate impatiently. Then, checking himself, he went on more quietly. I think I see one resource which would free us from a good deal of the present difficulty. I hear that young Ned Plymdale is going to be married to Miss Sophie Toller. They are rich, and it is not often that a good house is vacant in Middlemarch. I feel sure that they would be glad to take this house from us with most of our furniture, and they would be willing to pay handsomely for the lease. I can employ Trumbull to speak to Plymdale about it. Rosamond left her husband's knee, and walked slowly to the other end of the room. When she turned around and walked towards him, it was evident that the tears had come, and that she was biting her under lip and clasping her hands to keep herself from crying. Lydgate was wretched shaken with anger, and yet feeling that it would be unmanly to vent his anger just now. "'I am very sorry, Rosamond. I know this is painful. I thought at least, when I had borne to send the plate back and have that man taking an inventory of the furniture, I should have thought that would suffice.' "'I explained it to you at the time, dear. That was only a security. And behind that security there is a debt.' and that debt must be paid within the next few months else we shall have our furniture sold if young plymdale will take our house and most of our furniture we shall be able to pay that debt and some others too and we shall be quit of a place too expensive for us we might take a smaller house trumbull i know has a very decent one to let at thirty pounds a year and this is ninety Lydgate uttered this speech in the curt hammering way with which we usually try to nail down a vague mind to imperative facts 
Tears rolled silently down Rosamond's cheeks. She just pressed her handkerchief against them, and stood looking at the large vase on the mantelpiece. It was a moment of more intense bitterness than she had ever felt before. At last she said, without hurry and with careful emphasis, "'I could never have believed that you would like to act in that way.' "'Like it!' burst out Lydgate, rising from his chair, thrusting his hands in his pocket, and stalking away from the hearth. "'It's not a question of liking. Of course I don't like it. It's the only thing I can do!' He wheeled around, and there turned towards her. "'I should have thought there were many other means than that,' said Rosamond. "'Let us have a sail and leave Middlemarch altogether.' "'To do what? What is the use of my leaving my work in Middlemarch to go where I have none? We shall be just as penniless elsewhere as we are here,' said Lydgate, still more angrily. "'If we are to be in that position, it will be entirely your own doing, Tertius,' said Rosamond, turning round to speak with the fullest conviction. "'You will not behave as you ought to do to your own family. You offend Captain Lydgate.' "'Sir Godwin was very kind to me when we were at Quellingham, "'and I am sure if you showed proper regard to him "'and told him your affairs, he would do anything for you. "'But rather than that, you like giving up our house and furniture "'to Mr. Ned Plymdale.' "'There was something like fierceness in Lydgate's eyes "'as he answered with new violence. "'Well, then, if you will have it so, I do like it.' I admit that I like it better than making a fool of myself by going to beg where it's of no use. Understand, then, that it is what I like to do. There was a tone in that last sentence which was equivalent to the clutch of his strong hand on Rosamond's delicate arm. But for all that, his will was not a whit stronger than hers. She immediately walked out of the room in silence, but with an intense determination to hinder what Lydgate liked to do. He went out of the house, but as his blood cooled he felt that the chief result of the discussion was a deposit of dread within him at the idea of opening with his wife in future subjects which might again urge him to violent speech. It was as if a fracture in delicate crystal had begun, and he was afraid of any movement that might make it fatal. His marriage would be a mere piece of bitter irony if they could not go on loving each other. He had had long ago made up his mind to what he thought was her negative character, her want of sensibility, which showed itself in disregard both of his specific wishes and of his general aims. The first great disappointment had been born. The tender devotedness and docile adoration of the ideal wife must be renounced, and life must be taken up on a lower stage of expectation, as it is by men who have lost their limbs. But the real wife had not only her claims. She still had a hold on his heart, and it was his intense desire that the hold should remain strong. In marriage, the certainty, she will never love me much, is easier to bear than the fear, I shall love her no more. Hence, after that outburst, his inward effort was entirely to excuse her, and to blame the hard circumstances which were partly his fault. He tried that evening by petting her to heal the wound he had made in the morning, and it was not in Rosamond's nature to be repellent or sulky. Indeed, she welcomed the signs that her husband loved her and was under control. But this was something quite distinct from loving him. Lydgate would not have chosen soon to recur to the plan of parting with the house. He was resolved to carry it out and to say as little more about it as possible. But Rosamond herself touched on it at breakfast by saying mildly, "'Have you spoken to Trumbull yet?' "'No,' said Lydgate. "'But I shall call on him as I go by this morning. "'No time must be lost.' He took Rosamond's question as a sign that she withdrew her inward opposition, and kissed her head caressingly when he got up to go away. As soon as it was late enough to make a call, Rosamond went to Mrs. Plymdale, Mr. Ned's mother, and entered with pretty congratulations into the subject of the coming marriage. Mrs. Plymdale's maternal view was that Rosamond might possibly now have retrospective glimpses of her own folly, and feeling the advantages to be at present all on the side of her son, was too kind a woman not to behave graciously. 
Yes, Ned is most happy, I must say. And Sophie Toller is all I could desire in a daughter-in-law. Of course her father is able to do something handsome for her. That is only what would be expected with a brewery like his, and the connection is everything we should desire. But that is not what I look at. She is a very nice girl, no airs, no pretensions, though on a level with the first, I don't mean with the titled aristocracy. I see very little good in people aiming out of their own sphere. I mean that Sophie is equal to the best in the town, and she is contented with that. I have always thought her very agreeable, said Rosamond. I look upon it as a reward for Ned, who never held his head too high that he should have got into the very best connection, continued Mrs. Plymdale, her native sharpness softened by a fervid sense that she was taking a correct view. And such particular people as the Tollers are, they might have objected because some of our friends are not theirs. It is well known that your Aunt Bulstrode and I have been intimate from our youth. And Mr. Plymdale has always been on Mr. Bulstrode's side, and I myself prefer serious opinions. But the Tollers have welcomed Ned all the same. I am sure he is very deserving, well-principled young man, said Rosamond with a neat air of patronage, in return for Mrs. Plymdale's wholesome corrections. "'Oh, he has not the style of a captain in the army, or that sort of carriage, as if everybody was beneath him, or that showy kind of talking and singing and intellectual talent. But I am thankful he has not. It is a poor preparation both for here and hereafter.' "'Oh, dear, yes, appearances have very little to do with happiness,' said Rosamond. I think there is every prospect of their being a happy couple. What house will they take? Oh, as for that, they must put up with what they can get. They have been looking at the house in St. Peter's Place, next to Mr. Hackbutt's. It belongs to him, and he's putting it nicely in repair. I suppose they are not likely to hear of a better. Indeed, I think Ned will decide the matter to-day. I should think it a nice house. I like St. Peter's Place. "'Well, it is near the church and a genteel situation, but the windows are narrow, and it's all ups and downs. You don't happen to know of any other that would be at liberty?' said Mrs. Plymdale, fixing her round black eyes on Rosamond with the animation of a sudden thought in them. "'Oh, no! I hear so little of those things.' Rosamond had not foreseen that question and answer in setting out to pay her visit. She had simply meant to gather any information which would help her to avert the parting with her own house under circumstances thoroughly disagreeable to her. As to the untruth in her reply, she no more reflected on it than she did on the untruth there was in her saying that appearances had very little to do with happiness. Her object, she was convinced, was thoroughly justifiable. It was Lydgate whose intention was inexcusable, and there was a plan in her mind which, when she had carried it out fully, would prove how very false a step it would have been for him to have descended from his position. She returned home by Mr. Borthorpe Trumbull's office, meaning to call there. It was the first time in her life that Rosamond had thought of doing anything in the form of business, but she felt equal to the occasion. That she should be obliged to do what she intensely disliked was an idea which turned her quiet tenacity into active invention. Here was a case in which it could not be enough simply to disobey, and be serenely, placidly obstinate. She must act according to her judgment, and she said to herself that her judgment was right. Indeed, if it had not been, she would not have wished to act on it. Mr. Trumbull was in the back room of his office, and received Rosamond with his finest manners, not only because he had much sensibility to her charms, but because the good-natured fibre in him was stirred by his certainty that Lydgate was in difficulties, and that this uncommonly pretty woman, this young lady with the highest personal attractions, was likely to feel the pinch of trouble, to find herself involved in circumstances beyond her control. He begged her to do him the honour to take a seat, and stood before her trimming and comporting himself with an eager solicitude which was chiefly benevolent. Rosamond's first question was whether her husband had called on Mr. Trumbull that morning to speak about disposing of their house. "'Yes, ma'am, yes, he did, he did so,' said the good auctioneer, trying to throw something soothing into his iteration. "'I was about to fill his order, if possible, this afternoon.' He wished me not to procrastinate. 
"'I called to tell you not to go any further, Mr. Trumbull, "'and I beg of you not to mention what has been said on the subject. "'Will you oblige me?' "'Certainly I will, Mrs. Lidgate, certainly. "'Confidence is sacred with me on business or any other topic. "'I am then to consider the commission with John?' said Mr. Trumbull, adjusting the long ends of his blue cravat with both hands, and looking at Rosamond deferentially. "'Yes, if you please. I find that Mr. Ned Plindell has taken a house, the one in St. Peter's Place, next to Mr. Hackbutt's. Mr. Lydgate would be annoyed that his orders should be fulfilled uselessly. And besides that, there are other circumstances which render the proposal unnecessary.' "'Very good, Mrs. Lydgate, very good. I am at your commands, whenever you require any service of me.' and Mr. Trumbull, who felt pleasure in conjecturing that some new resource had been opened. "'Rely on me, I beg. The affair shall go no further.' That evening Lydgate was a little comforted by observing that Rosamond was more lively than she had usually been of late, and even seemed interested in doing what would please him without being asked. He thought, "'If she will be happy and I can rub through, what does it all signify? It is only a narrow swamp that we have to pass in a long journey.' if i can get my mind clear again i shall do he was so much cheered that he began to search for an account of experiments which he had long ago meant to look up and had neglected out of that creeping self-despair which comes in the train of petty anxieties he felt again some of the old delightful absorption in a far-reaching inquiry while rosamond played the quiet music which was as helpful to his meditation as the plash of an oar on the evening lake it was rather late. He had pushed away all the books, and was looking at the fire with his hands clasped in his head, in forgetfulness of everything except the construction of a new controlling equipment, when Rosamond, who had left the piano and was leaning back in her chair watching him, said, "'Mr. Ned Plimdale has taken a house already.' Lydgate, startled and jarred, looked up in silence for a moment, like a man who has been disturbed in his sleep. Then, flushing with an unpleasant consciousness, he asked, "'How do you know?' "'I called at Mrs. Plimdale's this morning, and she told me that he had taken the house in St. Peter's Place, next to Mr. Hackbutt's.' Lydgate was silent. He drew his hands from behind his head and pressed them against the hair which was hanging, as it was apt to do, in a mass on his forehead, while he rested his elbow on his knees. He was feeling bitter disappointment, as if he had opened a door out of the suffocating place and then found it walled up but he also felt sure that Rosamond was pleased with the cause of his disappointment. He preferred not looking at her and not speaking, until he had got over the first spasm of vexation. After all, he said in his bitterness, what can a woman care about so much as house and furniture? A husband without them is an absurdity. When he looked up and pushed his hair aside, his dark eyes had a miserable, blank, non-expectance of sympathy in them. He only said coolly, "'Perhaps someone else may turn up. I told Trumbull to be on the lookout if he failed with Plimdale. Rosamond made no remark. She trusted to the chance that nothing more would pass between her husband and the auctioneer until some issue should have justified her interference. At any rate, she had hindered the event which she immediately dreaded. After a pause she said, "'How much money is it that those disagreeable people want?' "'What disagreeable people?' "'Those who took the list, and the others. "'I mean, how much money would satisfy them "'so you need not be troubled any more?' "'Lydgate surveyed her for a moment, "'as if he were looking for symptoms, and then said, "'Oh, if I could have got six hundred from Plimdale "'for furniture as a premium, I might have managed. "'I could have paid off Dover and given enough on account "'to the others to make them wait patiently "'if we contracted our expenses.' "'But, I mean, how much should you want if we stayed in this house?' "'More than I am likely to get anywhere,' said Lydgate, with a rather grating sarcasm in his tone. It angered him to perceive that Rosamond's mind was wandering over impracticable wishes instead of facing possible efforts. "'Why should you not mention the sum?' said Rosamond, with a mild indication that she did not like his manners. "'Well,' said Lydgate, in a guessing tone, "'it would take at least a thousand to set me at ease, but—' he said incisively. I have to consider what I shall do without it, not with it. Rosamond said no more. But the next day she carried out her plan of writing to Sir Godwin Lydgate. 
Since the captain's visit, she had received a letter from him, and also one from Mrs. Mengan, his married sister, condoling with her on the loss of her baby, and expressing vaguely the hope that they should see her again at Quallingham. Lydgate had told her that this politeness meant nothing, but she was secretly convinced that any backwardness in Lydgate's family toward him was due to his cold and contemptuous behaviour, and she answered the letters in her most charming manner, feeling some confidence that a specific invitation would follow. But there had been total silence. The captain, evidently, was not a great penman, and Rosamond reflected that the sisters might have been abroad. However, the season was come for thinking of friends at home. And at any rate, Sir Godwin, who had chucked her under the chin, and pronounced her to be like the celebrated beauty Mrs. Crowley, who had made a conquest of him in 1790, would be touched by any appeal from her, and would find it pleasant for her sake to behave as he ought to do towards his nephew. Rosamond was naively convinced of what an old gentleman ought to do to prevent her from suffering annoyance, and she wrote what she considered the most judicious letter possible, one which would strike Sir Godwin as a proof of her excellent sense, pointing out how desirable it was that Tertius should quit such a place as Middlemarch for one more fitted to his talents, how the unpleasant character of the inhabitants had hindered his professional success, and how in consequence he was in money difficulties from which it would require a thousand pounds thoroughly to extricate him. She did not say that Tertius was unaware of her intention to write, for she had the idea that his supposed sanction of her letter would be in accordance with what she did say of his great regard for his uncle Godwin as the relative who had always been his best friend. Such was the force of poor Rosamond's tactics, now she applied them to affairs. This had happened before the party on New Year's Day, and no answer had yet come from Sir Godwin. But on the morning of that day Lydgate had to learn that Rosamond had revoked his order to Bothrop Trumbull. Feeling it necessary that she should be gradually accustomed to the idea of their quitting the house in Lowick Gate, he overcame his reluctance to speak to her again on the subject, and when they were breakfasting, said, "'I shall try to see Trumbull this morning, and tell him to advertise the house in the Pioneer and the Trumpet.' If the thing were advertised, someone might be inclined to take it, who would not otherwise have thought of a change. In these country places many people go on in their old houses, when their families are too large for them, for want of knowing where they can find another, and Trumbull seems to have got no bite at all. Rosamond knew that the inevitable moment was come. "'I ordered Trumbull not to inquire further,' she said, with a careful calmness which was evidently defensive. Lydgate stared at her in mute amazement. Only half an hour before he had been fastening up her plaits for her, and talking the little language of affection, which Rosamond, though not returning it, accepted, as if she had been a serene and lovely image, now and then miraculously dimpling towards her votary. With such fibres still astir in him, the shock he received could not at once be distinctly anger, it was confused pain. He laid down the knife and fork with which he was carving, and throwing himself back in his chair, said at last, with a cool irony in his tone, "'May I ask when and why you did so?' "'When I knew that the Plymdales had taken a house, I called to tell him not to mention ours to them, and at the same time I told him not to let the affair go on any further. I knew that it would be very injurious to you if it were known that you wished to part with your house and furniture, and I had a very strong objection to it. I think that was reason enough.' It was of no consequence, then, that I had told you imperative reasons of another kind? Of no consequence that I had come to a different conclusion, and given an order accordingly? said Lydgate, bitingly, the thunder and lightning gathering about his brow and eyes. The effect of any one's anger on Rosamond had always been to make her shrink in cold dislike, and to become all the more calmly correct, in the conviction that she was not the person to misbehave, whatever others might do, she replied. I think I had a perfect right to speak on a subject which concerns me at least as much as you. Clearly you had a right to speak, but only to me. You had no right to contradict my orders secretly, and to treat me as if I were a fool, said Lydgate, in the same tone as before. Then, with some added scorn, Is it possible to make you understand what the consequences will be? Is it of any use for me to tell you again why we must try to part with the house? It is not necessary for you to tell me again said Rosamond, in a voice that fell and trickled like cold water drops. I remembered what you said. You spoke just as violently as you do now. 
but that does not alter my opinion that you ought to try every other means rather than take a step which is so painful to me and as to advertising the house i think it would be perfectly degrading to you and suppose i disregard your opinion as you disregard mine you can do so of course but i think you ought to have told me before we were married that you would place me in the worst position rather than give up your own will lydgate did not speak but tossed his head on one side and twitched the corners of his mouth in despair rosamond seeing that he was not looking at her rose and set his cup of coffee before him but he took no notice of it and went on with an inward drama and argument occasionally moving in his seat resting one arm on the table and rubbing his hand against his hair there was a conflux of emotions and thoughts in him that would not let him either give thorough way to his anger or persevere with simple rigidity of resolve. Rosamond took advantage of his silence. When we were married, everyone felt that your position was very high. I could not have imagined then that you would want to sell our furniture and take a house in Bride Street where the rooms are like cages. If we are to live in that way, let us at least leave Middlemarch. These would be very strong considerations, said Lydgate, half ironically. Still, there was a withered paleness about his lips as he looked at his coffee, and did not drink. These would be very strong considerations if I did not happen to be in debt. Many persons must have been in debt in the same way. But if they are respectable, people trust them. I am sure I have heard Papa say that the Torbets were in debt, and they went on very well. It cannot be good to act rashly, said Rosamond, with serene wisdom. Lydgate sat paralysed by opposing impulses, since no reasoning he could apply to Rosamond seemed likely to conquer her assent. He wanted to smash and grind some object on which he could at least produce an impression, or else to tell her brutally that he was master and she must obey. But he not only dreaded the effect of such extremities in their mutual life, he had a growing dread of Rosamond's quiet, elusive obstinacy, which would not allow any assertion of power to be final, and again she had touched him in a spot of keenest feeling by implying that she had been deluded with a false vision of happiness in marrying him. As to saying that he was master, it was not the fact. The very resolution to which he had wrought himself by dint of logic and honourable pride was beginning to relax under her torpedo contact. He swallowed half his cup of coffee and then rose to go. I may at least request that you will not go to Trumbull at present, until it has been seen that there are no other means, said Rosamond. Although she was not subject to much fear, she felt it safer not to betray that she had written to Sir Godwin. Promise me that you will not go to him for a few weeks, or without telling me. Lydgate gave a short laugh. I think it is I who should exact a promise that you will do nothing without telling me, he said, turning his eyes sharply upon her, and then moving to the door. "'You remember that we are going to dine at Papa's?' said Rosamond, wishing that he should turn and make a more thorough concession to her. But he only said, "'Oh, yes,' impatiently, and went away. She held it to be very odious in him that he did not think the painful propositions he had to make to her were enough without showing so unpleasant a temper. And when she put the moderate request that he would defer going to Trumbull again, it was cruel in him not to assure her of what he meant to do.' She was convinced of her acting in every way for the best, and each grating or angry speech of Lydgate served only as an addition to the register of offences in her mind. Poor Rosamond for months had begun to associate her husband with feelings of disappointment, and the terribly inflexible relation of marriage had lost its charm of encouraging delightful dreams. It had freed her from the disagreeables of her father's house, but it had not given her everything that she had wished and hoped. The Lydgate, with whom she had been in love, had been a group of airy conditions for her, most of which had disappeared, while their place had been taken by everyday details which must be lived through slowly from hour to hour, not floated through with a rapid selection of favourable aspects. The habits of Lydgate's profession, his home preoccupation with scientific subjects, which seemed to her almost like a morbid vampire's taste, his peculiar views of things which had never entered into the dialogue of courtship all these continually alienating influences even without the effect of his having placed himself at a disadvantage in the town and without the first shock of revelation about dover's debt would have made his presence dull to her 
There was another presence which ever since the early days of her marriage, until four months ago, had been an agreeable excitement, but that was gone. Rosamond would not confess to herself how much the consequent blank had to do with her utter ennui. And it seemed to her, perhaps she was right, that an invitation to Quallingham, and an opening for Lydgate to settle elsewhere than in Middlemarch, in London, or somewhere likely to be free from unpleasantness, would satisfy her quite well, and make her indifferent to the absence of Will Ladislaw, towards whom she felt some resentment for his exultation of Mrs. Cosaborne. That was the state of things with Lydgate and Rosamond, on the New Year's Day when they dined at her father's, she looking mildly neutral towards him in remembrance of his ill-tempered behaviour at breakfast, and he carrying a much deeper effect from the inward conflict in which that morning scene was only one of many epochs. His flushed effort while talking to Mr. Fairbrother, his effort after the cynical pretense that all ways of getting money are essentially the same, and that chance has an empire which reduces choice to a fool's illusion, was but the symptom of a wavering resolve, a benumbed response to the old stimuli of enthusiasm. What was he to do? He saw even more keenly than Rosamond did the dreariness of taking her into the small house in Bride Street, where she would have scanty furniture around her and discontent within, a life of privation, and life with Rosamond were two images which had become more and more irreconcilable ever since the threat of privation had disclosed itself. But even if his resolves had forced the two images into combination, the useful preliminaries to that hard change were not visibly within reach. And though he had not given the promise which his wife had asked for, he did not go again to Trumbull. He even began to think of taking a rapid journey to the north and seeing Sir Godwin. He had once believed that nothing would urge him into making an application for money to his uncle. But he had not then known the full pressure of alternatives, yet more disagreeable. He could not depend on the effect of a letter, and it was only in an interview, however disagreeable this might be to himself, that he could give a thorough explanation and could test the effectiveness of kinship. No sooner had Lydgate begun to represent this step to himself as the easiest, than there was a reaction of anger that he, he who had long ago determined to live aloof from such abject calculations, such self-interested anxiety about the inclinations and the pockets of men with whom he had been proud to have had no aims in common, should have fallen not simply to their level, but to the level of soliciting them. End of chapter 64 Read by Martina, Sydney, Australia Chapter 65 of Middlemarch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Middlemarch by George Eliot. Chapter 65. One of us two must bow in doubtless, and, since a man is more reasonable than woman is, ye men most be sufferable. Chaucer, Canterbury. The bias of human nature to be slow in correspondence triumphs even over the present quickening in the general pace of things. What a wonder, then, that in 1832, old Sir Godwin Lydgate was slow to write a letter which was of consequence to others rather than to himself. Nearly three weeks of the new year were gone, and Rosamond, awaiting an answer to her winning appeal, was every day disappointed. Lydgate, in total ignorance of her expectations, was seeing the bills come in, and feeling that Dover's use of his advantage over other creditors was imminent. He had never mentioned to Rosamond his brooding purpose of going to Quallingham. He did not want to admit what would appear to her a concession to her wishes after indignant refusal. After the last moment, but he was really expecting to set off soon. A slice of the railway would enable him to manage the whole journey and back in four days. But one morning, after Lydgate had gone out, a letter came addressed to him, which Rosamond saw clearly to be from Sir Goodwin. She was full of hope. Perhaps there might be a particular note to her enclosed. But Lydgate was naturally addressed on the question of money or other aid, and the fact that he was written to, nay, the very delay in writing at all, seemed to certify that the answer was thoroughly compliant. She was too much excited by these thoughts to do anything but light stitching in a warm corner of the dining-room with the outside of this momentous letter lying on the table before her. About twelve she heard her husband's step in the passage, 
and tripping to open the door, she said in her lightest tones, "'Tertius, come in here. Here is a letter for you.' "'Ah,' he said, not taking off his hat, but just turning her round within his arm to walk towards the spot where the letter lay. "'My Uncle Godwin!' he exclaimed, while Rosamond reseated herself and watched him as he opened the letter. She had expected him to be surprised. While Lydgate's eyes glanced rapidly over the brief letter, she saw his face, usually of a pale brown, taking on a dry whiteness, with nostrils and lips quivering, he tossed down the letter before her and said violently, "'It will be impossible to endure life with you, if you will always be acting secretly, acting in opposition to me, and hiding your actions.' He checked his speech and turned his back on her, then wheeled round and walked about, sat down, and got up again restlessly, grasping hard objects deep down in his pockets. He was afraid of saying something irredeemably cruel. Rosamond, too, had changed colour as she read. The letter ran this way. "'Dear Tertius, don't set your wife to write to me when you have anything to ask. It is a roundabout wheedling sort of thing which I should not have credited you with. I never choose to write to a woman on matters of business. As to my supplying you with a thousand pounds, or only half that sum, I can do nothing of the sort. My own family drains me to the last penny. With two younger sons and three daughters, I am not likely to have cash to spare.' You seem to have got through your own money pretty quickly, and to have made a mess where you are. The sooner you go somewhere else, the better. But I have nothing to do with men of your profession, and can't help you there. I did the best I could for you as guardian, and let you have your own way in taking to medicine. You might have gone into the army or the church. Your money would have held out for that. And there would have been a surer ladder before you. Your uncle Charles has had a grudge against you for not going into his profession, but not I. I have always wished you well. "'But you must consider yourself on your own legs entirely now. "'Your affectionate uncle, Godwin Lydgate.' "'When Rosamond had finished reading the letter, "'she sat quite still, with her hands folded before her, "'restraining any show of her keen disappointment "'and entrenching herself in quiet passivity under her husband's wrath. "'Lydgate paused in his movements, looked at her again, "'and said with biting severity, "'Will this be enough to convince you of the harm you may do by secret meddling?' Have you sense enough to recognise how your incompetence to judge and act for me, to interfere with your ignorance in affairs which it belongs to me to decide on? The words were hard, but this was not the first time that Lydgate had been frustrated by her. She did not look at him and made no reply. I had nearly resolved on going to Quallingham. It would have cost me pain enough to do it, yet it might have been of some use. But it has been of no use for me to think of anything. "'You have always been counteracting me secretly. "'You delude me with a false assent, "'and then I am in the mercy of your devices. "'If you mean to resist every wish I express, "'say so, and defy me. "'I shall at least know what I am doing then.' "'It is a terrible moment in young lives "'when the closeness of love's bond "'has turned to this power of galling. "'In spite of Rosamond's self-control, "'a tear fell silently and rolled over her lips. "'She still said nothing.' but under that quietude was hidden an intense effect. She was in such entire disgust with her husband that she wished that she had never seen him. Sir Godwin's rudeness towards her and utter want of feeling ranked him with Dover and all other creditors. Disagreeable people who only thought of themselves and did not mind how annoying they were to her. Even her father was unkind and might have done more for them. In fact, there was but one person in Rosamond's world whom she did not regard as blameworthy. And that was the graceful creature with blonde plaits and with little hands crossed before her, who had never expressed herself unbecomingly, and had always acted for the best, the best naturally being what she liked best. Lydgate, pausing and looking at her again, began to feel that half-maddening sense of helplessness which comes over passionate people when their passion is met by an innocent-looking silence, whose meek, victimised air seems to put them in the wrong and at last infects even the justest indignation with a doubt of its justice. He needed to recover the full sense that he was in the right by moderating his words. "'Can you not see, Rosamond,' he began again, trying to be simply grave and not bitter, "'that nothing can be so fatal as a want of openness and confidence between us? It has happened again and again that I have expressed a decided wish—' and you have seemed to assent yet after that you have secretly disobeyed my wish in that way i can never know what i have to trust to 
there would be some hope for us if you would admit this am i such an unreasonable furious brute why should you not be open with me still silence will you only say that you have been mistaken and that i may depend on your not acting secretly in the future said lydgate urgently but with something of request in his tone which rosamond was quick to perceive she spoke with coolness i cannot possibly make admissions or promises in answer to such words as you have used towards me i have not been accustomed to language of that kind you have spoken of my secret meddling and my interfering ignorance and my false assent i have never expressed myself in that way to you and i think that you ought to apologize you spoke of its being impossible to live with me certainly you have not made my life pleasant to me of late i think it was to be expected that i should try to avert some of the hardship which our marriage has brought on me another tear fell as rosamond ceased speaking and she pressed it away as quietly as the first lydgate flung himself into a chair feeling checkmated what place was there in her mind for a remonstrance to lodge in he laid down his hat flung an arm over the back of his chair and looked down for some moments without speaking rosamond had the double purchase over him of insensibility to the point of justice in his reproach and of sensibility to the undeniable hardships now present in her married life although her duplicity in the affair of the house had exceeded what he knew and had really hindered the plimdales from knowing it she had no consciousness that her action could rightly be called false we are not obliged to identify our own acts according to a strict classification any more than the materials of our grocery and clothes rosamond felt that she was aggrieved and that this was what lydgate had to recognize as for him the need of accommodating himself to her nature which was inflexible in proportion to its negations held him as with pincers he had begun to have an alarmed foresight of her irrevocable loss of love for him and the consequent dreariness of their life the ready fullness of his emotions made this dread alternate quickly with the first violent movements of his anger it would assuredly have been a vain boast in him to say that he was her master you have not made my life pleasant to me of late the hardships which our marriage has brought on me these words were stinging his imagination as a pain makes an exaggerated dream if he were not only to sink from his highest resolve but to sink into the hideous fettering of domestic hate rosamond he said turning his eyes on her with a melancholy look you should allow for a man's words when he is disappointed and provoked you and i cannot have opposite interests i cannot part my happiness from yours if i am angry with you it is that you seem not to see how any concealment divides us how could i wish to make anything hard to you either by my words or conduct when i hurt you i hurt part of my own life i should never be angry with you if you would be quite open with me i have only wished to prevent you from hurrying us into wretchedness without any necessity said rosamond the tears coming again from a softened feeling now that her husband had softened it is so very hard to be disgraced here among all the people we know and to live in such a miserable way i wish her had died with the baby she spoke and wept with that gentleness which makes such words and tears omnipotent over a loving-hearted man lydgate drew his chair near to hers and pressed her delicate head against his cheek with his powerful tender hand he only caressed her he did not say anything for what was there to say he could not promise to shield her from the dreaded wretchedness for he could see no sure means of doing so when he left her to go out again he told himself that it was ten times harder for her than for him he had a life away from home and constant appeals to his activity on behalf of others he wished to excuse everything in her if he could but it was inevitable that in that excusing mood he should think of her as if she were an animal of another and feebler species nevertheless she had mastered him end of chapter 65 read by martina sydney australia chapter 66 of middlemarch this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jack Farrell.
Middlemarch by George Eliot Chapter 66 Tis one thing to be tempted, Aeschylus, another thing to fall. Lydgate certainly had good reason to reflect on the service his practice did him in counteracting his personal cares. He had no longer free energy enough for spontaneous research and speculative thinking, but by the bedside of patients the direct external calls on his judgment and sympathies brought the added impulse needed to draw him out of himself. It was not simply that beneficent harness of routine which enables silly men to live respectably and unhappy men to live calmly. It was a perpetual claim on the immediate fresh application of thought and on the consideration of another's need and trial. Many of us looking back through life would say that the kindest man we have ever known has been a medical man, or perhaps that surgeon whose fine tact, directed by deeply informed perception, has come to us in our need with a more sublime beneficence than that of miracle workers. Some of that twice-blessed mercy was always with Lydgate in his work at the hospital or in private houses, serving better than any opiate to quiet and sustain him under his anxieties and his sense of mental degeneracy. Mr. Fairbrother's suspicion as to the opiate was true, however. Under the first galling pressure of foreseen difficulties and the first perception that his marriage, if it were not to be a yoked loneliness, must be a state of effort to go on loving without too much care about being loved. He had once or twice tried a dose of opium, but he had no hereditary constitutional craving after such transient escapes from the hauntings of misery. He was strong, could drink a great deal of wine, but did not care about it, and when the men round him were drinking spirits, he took sugar and water, having a contemptuous pity even for the earliest stages of excitement from drink. It was the same with gambling. He had looked on at a great deal of gambling in Paris, watching it as if it had been a disease. He was no more tempted by such winning than he was by drink. He had said to himself that the only winning he cared for must be attained by a conscious process of high, difficult combination tending towards a beneficent result. The power he longed for could not be represented by agitated fingers clutching a heap of coin, or by the half-barbarous, half-idiotic triumph in the eyes of a man who sweeps within his arms the ventures of twenty chap-fallen companions. But just as he had tried opium, so his thought now began to turn upon gambling, not with appetite for its excitement, but with a sort of wistful inward gaze after that easy way of getting money which implied no asking and brought no responsibility. If he had been in London or Paris at that time, it is probable that such thoughts, seconded by opportunity, would have taken him into a gambling house, no longer to watch the gamblers, but to watch with them in kindred eagerness. Repugnance would have been surmounted by the immense need to win, if change would be kind enough to let him an incident which happened not very long after any notion of getting aid from his uncle had been excluded was a strong sign of the effect that might have followed any extant opportunity of gambling. The billiard-room at the Green Dragon was the constant resort of a certain set. Most of them, like our acquaintance Mr. Bainbridge, were regarded as men of pleasure. It was here that poor Fred Vincey had made part of his memorable debt, having lost money in betting and been obliged to borrow of that gay companion. It was generally known in Middlemarch that a good deal of money was lost and won in this way, and the consequent repute of the Green Dragon as a place of dissipation naturally heightened in some quarters the temptation to go there. Probably its regular visitants like the initiates of Freemasonry, wished that there were something a little more tremendous to keep to themselves concerning it. 
but they were not a closed community, and many decent seniors as well as juniors occasionally turned into the billiard room to see what was going on. Lydgate, who had the muscular aptitude for billiards and was fond of the game, had once or twice in the early days after his arrival in Middlemarch taken his turn with the cue at the Green Dragon, but afterwards he had no leisure for the game and no inclination for the socialities there. One evening, however, he had occasion to seek Mr. Bainbridge at that resort. The horse-dealer had engaged to get him a customer for his remaining good horse, for which Lydgate had determined to substitute a cheap hack, hoping by this reduction of style to get perhaps twenty pounds, and he cared now for every small sum as a help towards feeding the patience of his tradesmen. To run up to the billiard-room as he was passing would save time. Mr. Bainbridge was not yet come, but would be sure to arrive by and by, said his friend Mr. Horrock, and Lydgate stayed playing a game for the sake of passing the time. That evening he had the peculiar light in the eyes and the unusual vivacity which had been once noticed in him by Mr. Fairbrother. The exceptional fact of his presence was much noticed in the room, where there was a good deal of Middlemarch company, and several lookers-on, as well as some of the players, were betting with animation. Lydgate was playing well and felt confident. The bets were dropping round him, and with a swift glancing thought of the probable gain which might double the sum he was saving from his horse, he began to bet on his own play, and won again and again. Mr. Bainbridge had come in, but Lydgate did not notice him. He was not only excited with his play, but visions were gleaming on him of going the next day to Brassing, where there was gambling on a grander scale to be had, and where, by one powerful snatch at the devil's bait, he might carry it off without the hook and buy his rescue from its daily solicitings. He was still winning when two new visitors entered. One of them was a young Hawley, just come from his law studies in town, and the other was Fred Vincy, who had spent several evenings of late at this old haunt of his. Young Hawley, an accomplished billiard player, brought a cool, fresh hand to the cue. But Fred Vincy, startled at seeing Lydgate, and astonished to hear him betting with an excited air, stood aside and kept out of the circle round the table. Fred had been rewarding resolution by a little laxity of late. He had been working heartily for six months at all outdoor occupations under Mr. Garth, and by dint of severe practice had nearly mastered the defects of his handwriting this practice being, perhaps, a little the less severe that it was often carried on in the evening at Mr. Garth's under the eyes of Mary. But the last fortnight Mary had been staying at Lowick Parsonage with the ladies there during Mr. Fairbrother's residence in Middlemarch, where he was carrying out some parochial plans, and Fred, not seeing anything more agreeable to do, had turned into the Green Dragon partly to play at billiards, partly to taste the old flavor of discourse about horses, sport, and things in general, considered from a point of view which was not strenuously correct. He had not been out hunting once this season, had had no horse of his own to ride, and had gone from place to place chiefly with Mr. Garth in his gig, or on the sober cob which Mr. Garth could lend him. It was a little too bad, Fred began to think, that he should be kept in the traces with more severity than if he had been a clergyman. I will tell you what, Mistress Mary, it will be rather harder work to learn surveying and drawing plans than it would have been to write sermons, he had said, wishing her to appreciate what he went through for her sake. And as to Hercules and Theseus, they were nothing to me. They had sport and never learned to write a bookkeeping hand. And now, Mary being out of the way for a little while, Fred, like any other strong dog who cannot slip his collar, had pulled up the staple of his chain, and made a small escape, not of course meaning to go fast or far, 
there could be no reason why he should not play at billiards. But he was determined not to bet. As to money just now, Fred had in his mind the heroic project of saving almost all of the eighty pounds that Mr. Garth offered him, and returning it, which he could easily do by giving up all futile money-spending, since he had a superfluous stock of clothes and no expenses in his board. In that way he could, in one year, go a good way towards repaying the ninety pounds of which he had deprived Mrs. Garth, unhappily at a time when she needed that sum more than she did now. Nevertheless it must be acknowledged that on this evening, which was the fifth of his recent visits to the billiard-room, Fred had, not in his pocket, but in his mind, the ten pounds which he meant to reserve for himself from his half-year salary, having before him the pleasure of carrying thirty to Mrs. Garth when Mary was likely to become home again. He had those ten pounds in his mind as a fund from which he might risk something if there were a chance of a good bet. Why? Well, when sovereigns were flying about, why shouldn't he catch a few? He would never go far along that road again, but a man likes to assure himself, and men of pleasure generally, what he could do in the way of mischief if he chose, and that if he abstains from making himself ill, or beggaring himself, or talking with the utmost looseness which the narrow limits of human capacity will allow, it is not because he is a spoony. Fred did not enter into formal reasons which are a very artificial, inexact way of representing the tingling returns of old habit and the caprices of young blood. But there was lurking in him a prophetic sense that evening, that when he began to play he should also begin to bet, that he should enjoy some punch-drinking, and in general prepare himself for feeling rather seedy in the morning. It is in such indefinable movements that action often begins. But the last thing likely to have entered Fred's expectation was that he should see his brother-in-law Lydgate, of whom he had never quite dropped the old opinion that he was a prig and tremendously conscious of his superiority, looked excited and betting, just as he himself might have done. Fred felt a shock greater than he could quite account for by the vague knowledge that Lydgate was in debt, and that his father had refused to help him and his own inclination to enter into the play was suddenly checked. It was a strange reversal of attitudes. Fred's blond face and blue eyes, usually bright and careless, ready to give attention to anything that held out a promise of amusement, looking involuntarily grave and almost embarrassed, as if by the sight of something unfitting, while Lydgate, who had habitually an air of self-possessed strength and a certain meditativeness that seemed to lie behind his most observant attention, was acting, watching, speaking, with that excited narrow consciousness which reminds one of an animal with fierce eyes and retractile claws. Lydgate, by betting on his own strokes, had won sixteen pounds, but young Hawley's arrival had changed the poise of things. He made first-rate strokes himself and began to bet against Lydgate's strokes the strain of whose nerves was thus changed from simple confidence in his own movements to defying another person's doubt in them. The defiance was more exciting than the confidence, but it was less sure. He continued to bet on his own play, but began often to fail. Still he went on, for his mind was as utterly narrowed into that precipitous crevice of play as if he had been the most ignorant lounger there. Fred observed that Lydgate was losing fast, and found himself in a new situation of puzzling his brains to think of some device by which, without being offensive, he could withdraw Lydgate's attention, and perhaps suggest to him a reason for quitting the room. He saw that others were observing Lydgate's strange unlikeness to himself, and it occurred to him that merely to touch his elbow and call him aside for a moment might rouse him from his absorption. He could think of nothing cleverer than the daring and probability of saying that he wanted to see Rosie, and wished to know if she were at home this evening, and he was going desperately to carry out this weak device, when a waiter came up to him with a message, saying that Mr. Fairbrother was below, and begged to speak with him. 
Fred was surprised, not quite comfortably, but sending word that he would be down immediately, he went with a new impulse up to Lydgate, said, "'Can I speak to you a moment?' and drew him aside. "'Fairbrother has just sent up a message to say that he wants to speak to me. He is below. I thought you might like to know he was there, if you had anything to say to him.' Fred had simply snatched up this pretext for speaking, because he could not say, "'You are losing confoundedly, and are making everybody stare at you. You had better come away.' But inspiration could hardly have served him better. Lydgate had not before seen that Fred was present, and his sudden appearance, with an announcement of Mr. Fairbrother, had the effect of a sharp concussion. "'No, no,' said Lydgate. "'I have nothing particular to say to him. But the game is up. I must be going. I came in just to see Bainbridge.' "'Bainbridge is over there, but he is making a row. I don't think he's ready for business. Come down with me to Fairbrother. I expect he is going to blow me up, and you will shield me,' said Fred, with some adroitness. Lydgate felt shame, but could not bear to act as if he felt it, by refusing to see Mr. Fairbrother, and he went down. They merely shook hands, however, and spoke of the frost, and when all three had turned into the street, the vicar seemed quite willing to say good-bye to Lydgate. His present purpose was clearly to talk with Fred alone, and he said, kindly, "'I disturbed you, young gentleman, because I have some pressing business with you. Walk with me to St. Bartholomew's, will you?' It was a fine night, the sky thick with stars, and Mr. Fairbrother proposed that they should make a circuit to the old church by the London road. The next thing he said was, I thought Lydgate never went to the Green Dragon. So did I, said Fred. But he said that he went to see Bainbridge. He was not playing then. Fred had not meant to tell this, but he was obliged now to say, Yes, yes, he was, but I suppose it was an accidental thing. I have never seen him there before. You have been going often yourself then lately? Oh, about five or six times. I think you had some good reason for giving up the habit of going there. Yes, you know all about it, said Fred, not liking to be catechized in this way. I made a clean breast to you. I suppose that gives me a warrant to speak about the matter now. It is understood between us, is it not, that we are on a footing of open friendship. I have listened to you, and you will be willing to listen to me. I may take my turn in talking a little about myself." "'I am under the deepest obligations to you, Mr. Fairbrother,' said Fred, in a state of uncomfortable surmise. "'I will not affect to deny that you are under some obligation to me. But I am going to confess to you, Fred, that I have been tempted to reverse all that by keeping silence with you just now. When somebody said to me, "'Young Vincy has taken to being at the billiard-table every night again,' He won't bear the curb long. I was tempted to do the opposite of what I am doing, to hold my tongue and wait while you went down the ladder again, betting first, and then— I have not made any bets, said Fred hastily. Glad to hear it. But I say, my prompting was to look on and see you take the wrong turning. Wear out Garth's patience, and lose the best opportunity of your life. The opportunity— which you made some rather difficult effort to secure. You can guess the feeling which raised that temptation in me. I am sure you know it. I am sure you know that the satisfaction of your affections stands in the way of mine." There was a pause. Mr. Fairbrother seemed to wait for a recognition of the fact, and the emotion perceptible in the tones of his fine voice gave solemnity to his words. But no feeling could quell Fred's alarm. I could not be expected to give her up, he said, after a moment's hesitation. It was not a case for any pretense of generosity. Clearly not, when her affection met yours. But relations of this sort, even when they are of long standing, are always liable to change. I can easily conceive that you might act in a way to loosen the tie she feels towards you. It must be remembered that she is only conditionally bound to you and that in that case another man, 
who may flatter himself that he has a hold on her regard, might succeed in winning that firm place in her love, as well as respect, which you had let slip. I can easily conceive such a result," repeated Mr. Fairbrother, emphatically. There is a companionship of ready sympathy, which might get the advantage even over the longest associations. It seemed to Fred that if Mr. Fairbrother had had a beak and talons, instead of his very capable tongue, his mode of attack could hardly be more cruel. He had a horrible conviction that behind all this hypothetic statement there was a knowledge of some actual change in Mary's feelings. "'Of course I know it might easily be all up with me,' he said, in a troubled voice. "'If she is beginning to compare—' He broke off, not likely to betray all he felt, and then said, by the help of a little bitterness, "'But I thought you were friendly to me.' "'So I am. That is why we are here. But I have had a strong disposition to be otherwise. I have said to myself, if there is a likelihood of that youngster doing himself harm, why should you interfere? Aren't you worth as much as he is? And don't your sixteen years over and above his, in which you have gone rather hungry, give you more right to satisfaction than he has? If there's a chance of his going to the dogs, let him. Perhaps you could know how hinder it, and do you take the benefit? There was a pause in which Fred was seized by a most uncomfortable chill. What was coming next? He dreaded to hear that something had been said to Mary. He felt as if he were listening to a threat rather than a warning. When the vicar began again, there was a change in his tone, like the encouraging transition to a major key. But I had once meant better than that, and I am come back to my old intention. I thought that I could hardly secure myself in it better, Fred, than by telling you just what had gone on in me. And now, do you understand me? I want you to make the happiness of her life and your own, and if there is any chance that a word of warning from me may turn aside any risk to the contrary. Well, I have uttered it. There was a drop in the vicar's voice when he spoke the last words. He paused. They were standing on a patch of green where the road diverged towards St. Bartholf's, and he put out his hand, as if to imply that the conversation were closed. Fred was moved quite newly. Someone highly susceptible to the contemplation of a fine act has said that it produces a sort of regenerating shudder through the frame and makes one feel ready to begin a new life. A good degree of that effect was just then present in Fred Vincy. "'I will try to be worthy,' he said, breaking off before he could say, "'of you as well as of her.' And meanwhile Mr. Fairbrother had gathered the impulse to say something more. "'You must not imagine that I believe there is at present any decline in her preference of you, Fred.' Set your heart at rest, that if you keep right, other things will keep right. I shall never forget what you have done, Fred answered. I can't say anything that seems worth saying. Only I will try that your goodness shall not be thrown away. That's enough. Good-bye, and God bless you. In that way they parted. But both of them walked about a long while, before they went out of the starlight. Much of Fred's rumination might be summed up in the words, It certainly would have been a fine thing for her to marry, fair brother. But if she loves me best, and I am a good husband? Perhaps Mr. Fairbrother's might be concentrated into a single shrug and one little speech. To think of the part one little woman can play in the life of a man so that to renounce her may be a very good imitation of heroism, and to win her may be a discipline. End of chapter 66chapter 67 of Middlemarch. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jack Farrell Middlemarch by George Eliot Chapter 67 Now is there civil war within the soul. Resolve is thrust from off the sacred throne by clamorous needs, and pride, the grand vizier, makes humble compact, plays the supple part of envoy and deft-tongued apologist for hungry rebels. Happily Lydgate had ended by losing in the billiard-room, and brought away no encouragement to make a raid on luck. On the contrary, he felt unmixed disgust with himself the next day when he had to pay four or five pounds over and above his gains, and he carried about with him a most unpleasant vision of the figure he had made, not only rubbing elbows with the men of the Green Dragon, but behaving just as they did. A philosopher fallen to betting is hardly distinguishable from a Philistine under the same circumstances. The difference will chiefly be found in his subsequent reflections, and Lydgate chewed a very disagreeable cud in that way. His reason told him how the affair might have been magnified into ruin by a slight change of scenery, if it had been a gambling-house that he had turned into, where chance could be clutched with both hands, instead of being picked up with thumb and forefinger. Nevertheless, though reason strangled the desire to gamble, there remained the feeling that, with an insurance of luck to the needful amount, he would have liked to gamble rather than take the alternative which was beginning to shape itself as inevitable. That alternative was to apply to Mr. Bulstrode. Lydgate had so many times boasted both to himself and others that he was totally independent of Bulstrode, to whose plans he had lent himself solely because they enabled him to carry out his own ideas of professional work and public benefit. He had so constantly in their personal intercourse had his pride sustained by the sense that he was making a good social use of this predominating banker, whose opinions he thought contemptible, and whose motives often seemed to him an absurd mixture of contradictory impressions, that he had been creating for himself strong ideal obstacles to the proffering of any considerable request to him on his own account. Still. Early in March his affairs were at that pass in which men begin to say that their oaths were delivered in ignorance, and to perceive that the act which they had called impossible to them is becoming manifestly possible. With Dover's ugly security soon to be put in force, with the proceeds of his practice immediately absorbed in paying back debts, and with the chance if the worst were known, of daily supplies being refused on credit, above all with the vision of Rosamond's hopeless discontent continually haunting him, Lydgate had begun to see that he should inevitably bend himself to ask help from somebody or other. At first he had considered whether he should write to Mr. Vincy, but on questioning Rosamond he found that, as he had suspected, that she already applied twice to her father the last time being since the disappointment from Sir Godwin, and Papa had said that Lydgate must look out for himself. Papa said he had come with one bad year after another to trade more and more on borrowed capital, and had had to give up many indulgences. He could not spare a single hundred from the charges of his family. He said, Let Lydgate ask Bulstrode. They have always been hand and glove. Indeed, Lydgate himself had come to the conclusion that if he must end by asking for a free loan, his relations with Bulstrode, more at least than with any other man, might take the shape of a claim which was not purely personal. Bulstrode had indirectly helped to cause the failure of his practice, and had also been highly gratified by getting a medical partner in his plans. But who among us ever reduced himself to the sort of dependence in which Lydgate now stood, without trying to believe that he had claims which diminished the humiliation of asking. It was true that of late 
there had seemed to be a new languor of interest in Bulstrode about the hospital, but his health had got worse and showed signs of a deep-seated, nervous affection. In other respects he did not appear to be changed. He had always been highly polite, but Lydgate had observed in him from the first a marked coldness about his marriage and other private circumstances, a coldness which he had hitherto preferred to any warmth of familiarity between them. He deferred the intention from day to day, his habit of acting on his conclusions being made infirm by his repugnance to every possible conclusion and its consequent act. He saw Mr. Bulstrode often, but he did not try to use any occasion for his private purpose. At one moment he thought, I will write a letter, I prefer that to any circuitous talk. At another he thought, No, if I were talking to him I could make a retreat before any signs of disinclination. Still the days passed and no letter was written, no special interviews sought. In his shrinking from the humiliation of a dependent attitude towards Bulstrode, he began to familiarize his imagination with another step even more unlike his remembered self. He began spontaneously to consider whether it would be possible to carry out that puerile notion of Rosamond's, which had often made him angry, namely that they should quit Middlemarch without seeing anything beyond that preface. The question came. Would any man buy the practice of me even now for as little as it is worth? Then the sale might happen as a necessary preparation for going away. But against his taking this step, which he still felt to be a contemptible relinquishment of present work, a guilty turning aside from what was a real and might be a widening channel for worthy activity, to start again without any justified destination there was this obstacle, that the purchaser, if procurable at all, might not be quickly forthcoming, and afterwards? Rosamond in a poor lodging, though in the largest city or most distant town, would not find the life that could save her from gloom, and save him from the reproach of having plunged her into it. For when a man is at the foot of the hill in his fortunes, he may stay a long while there, in spite of professional accomplishment. In the British climate there is no incompatibility between scientific insight and furnished lodgings. The incompatibility is chiefly between scientific ambition and a wife who objects to that kind of residence. But in the midst of his hesitation opportunity came to decide him. A note from Mr. Bulstrode requested Lydgate to call on him at the bank. A hypochondriacal tendency had shown itself in the banker's constitution of late, and a lack of sleep, which was really only a slight exaggeration of an habitual dyspeptic symptom, had been dwelt on by him as a sign of threatening insanity. He wanted to consult Lydgate without delay on that particular morning, although he had nothing to tell beyond what he had told before. He listened eagerly to what Lydgate had to say in dissipation of his fears, though this too was only repetition, and this moment in which Bulstrode was receiving a medical opinion with a sense of comfort seemed to make the communication of a personal need to him easier than it had been in Lydgate's contemplation beforehand. He had been insisting that it would be well for Mr. Bulstrode to relax his attention to business. One sees how any mental strain, however slight, may affect a delicate frame," said Lydgate at that stage of the consultation when the remarks tend to pass from the personal to the general, by the deep stamp which anxiety will make for a time, even on the young and vigorous. I am naturally very strong, yet I have been thoroughly shaken lately by an accumulation of trouble. I presume that a constitution in the susceptible state in which mine at present is would be especially liable to fall a victim to cholera if it visited our district, and since its appearance near London we may well besiege the mercy seat for our protection," said Mr. Bulstrode, 
not intending to evade Lydgate's allusion, but really preoccupied with alarms about himself. You have, at all events, taken your share in using good practical precautions for the town, and that is the best mode of asking for protection," said Lydgate, with a strong distaste for the broken metaphor and bad logic of the banker's religion, somewhat increased by the apparent deafness of his sympathy. But his mind had taken up its long-prepared movement towards getting help, and was not yet arrested. He added, The town has done well in the way of cleansing and finding appliances, and I think that if the cholera should come, even our enemies will admit that the arrangements in the new hospital are a public good. Truly, said Mr. Bulstrode, with some coldness. With regard to what you say, Mr. Lydgate, about the relaxation of my mental labor, I have for some time been entertaining a purpose to that effect a purpose of a very decided character. I contemplate at least a temporary withdrawal from the management of much business, whether benevolent or commercial. Also I think of changing my residence for a time. Probably I shall close or let the shrubs, and take some place near the coast, under advice, of course, as to salubrity. That would be a measure which you would recommend?" Oh, yes said Lydgate, falling backward in his chair, with ill-repressed impatience under the banker's pale, earnest eyes, and intense preoccupation with himself. I have for some time felt that I should open this subject with you in relation to our hospital," continued Bulstrode. Under the circumstances I have indicated, of course I must cease to have any personal share in the management, and it is contrary to my views of responsibility to continue a large application of means to an institution which I cannot watch over and to some extent regulate. I shall therefore, in case of my ultimate decision to leave Middlemarch, consider that I withdraw other support to the new hospital than that which will subsist in the fact that I chiefly supplied the expenses of building it, and have contributed further large sums to its successful working. Lydgate's thought, when Bulstrode paused according to his wont, was, he has perhaps been losing a good deal of money. This was the most plausible explanation of a speech which had caused rather a startling change in his expectations. He said in reply, The loss to the hospital can hardly be made up, I fear. Hardly, returned Bulstrode in the same deliberate silvery tone, except by some changes of plan. The only person who may be certainly counted on as willing to increase her contributions is Mrs. Casabon. I have had an interview with her on the subject, and I have pointed out to her, as I am about to do to you, that it will be desirable to win a more general support to the new hospital by a change of system. Another pause, but Lydgate did not speak. The change I mean is an amalgamation with the infirmary, so that the new hospital shall be regarded as a special addition to the elder institution, having the same directing board. It will be necessary also that the medical management of the two shall be combined. In this way, any difficulty as to the adequate maintenance of our new establishment will be removed. The benevolent interests of the town will cease to be divided." Mr. Bulstrode had lowered his eyes from Lydgate's face to the buttons of his coat as he again paused. "'No doubt that is a good device as to ways and means,' said Lydgate, with an edge of irony in his tone but I can't be expected to rejoice in it at once, since one of the first results will be that the other medical men will upset or interrupt my methods, if it were only because they are mine. I myself, as you know, Mr. Lydgate, highly valued the opportunity of new and independent procedure which you have diligently employed. The original plan, I confess, 
was one which I had much at heart, under submission to the divine will. But since providential indications demand a renunciation from me, I renounce. Bulstrode showed a rather exasperating ability in this conversation. The broken metaphor and bad logic of motive which had stirred his hearer's contempt were quite consistent with the mode of putting the facts which made it difficult for Lydgate to vent his own indignation and disappointment. After some rapid reflection, he only asked, "'What did Mrs. Cassavant say?' "'That was the further statement which I wished to make to you,' said Bulstrode, who had thoroughly prepared his ministerial explanation. "'She is, you are aware, a woman of most beneficent disposition.' and happily in possession not i presume of great wealth but of funds which she can well spare she has informed me that though she had destined the chief part of those funds to another purpose she is willing to consider whether she cannot fully take my place in relation to the hospital but she wishes for ample time to mature her thoughts on the subject and I have told her that there is no need for haste, that, in fact, my own plans are not yet absolute. Lydgate was ready to say, If Mrs. Cassabon would take your place, there would be gain instead of loss. But there was still a weight on his mind which arrested this cheerful candor. He replied, I suppose, then, that I may enter into the subject with Mrs. Cassabon. Precisely. That is what she expressly desires. Her decision, she says, will much depend on what you can tell her. But not at present. She is, I believe, just set out on a journey. I have her letter here, said Mr. Bulstrode, drawing it out and reading from it. I am immediately otherwise engaged, she says. I am going into Yorkshire with Sir James and Lady Chetham and the conclusions I come to about some land which I am to see there may affect my power of contributing to the hospital. Thus, Mr. Lydgate, there is no haste necessary in this matter. But I wish to apprise you beforehand of what may possibly occur. Mr. Bulstrode returned the letter to his side pocket and changed his attitude as if his business were closed. Lydgate whose renewed hope about the hospital only made him more conscious of the facts which poisoned his hope, felt that his effort after help, if made at all, must be made now and vigorously. "'I am much obliged to you for giving me full notice,' he said with firm intention in his tone, yet with an interruptedness in his delivery which showed that he spoke unwillingly. "'The highest object to me is my profession.' and I had identified the hospital with the best use I can at present make of my profession. But the best use is not always the same with monetary success. Everything which has made the hospital unpopular has helped with other causes, I think they are all connected with my professional zeal, to make me unpopular as a practitioner. I get chiefly patients who can't pay me, I should like them best if I had nobody to pay on my own side." Lydgate waited a little, but Bulstrode only bowed, looking at him fixedly, and he went on with the same interrupted enunciation, as if he were biting an objectionable leak. I have slipped into money difficulties which I can see no way out of, unless someone who trusts me and my future, will advance me a sum without other security. I had very little fortune when I came here. I have no prospects of money from my own family. My expenses in consequence of my marriage have been very much greater than I had expected. The result at this moment is that it would take a thousand pounds to clear me. I mean to be free from the risk of having all my goods sold in security of my largest debt, as well as to pay my other debts, 
and leave anything to keep us a little beforehand with our small income. I find that it is out of the question that my wife's father should make such an advance. That is why I mention my position to to the only other man who may be held to have some personal connection with my prosperity or ruin. Lydgate hated to hear himself, but he had spoken now, and had spoken with unmistakable directness. Mr. Bulstrode replied without haste, but also without hesitation. I am grieved, though I confess not surprised by this information, Mr. Lydgate. For my own part, I regretted your alliance with my brother-in-law's family, which has always been of prodigal habits, and which has already been much indebted to me for sustainment in its present position. My advice to you, Mr. Lydgate, would be that instead of involving yourself in further obligations, and continuing a doubtful struggle, you should simply become a bankrupt. That would not improve my position, said Lydgate, rising and speaking bitterly, even if it were a more agreeable thing in itself. It is always a trial, said Mr. Bulstrode, but trial, my dear sir, is our portion here, and is a needed corrective. I recommend you to weigh the advice I have given. Thank you, said Lydgate, not quite knowing what he said. I have occupied you too long. Good day. End of chapter 67、Chapter What suit of grace hath virtue to put on if vice shall wear as good and do as well? If wrong, if craft, if indiscretion act as fair parts with ends as laudable? Which all this mighty volume of events, the world, the universal map of deeds, strongly controls and proves from all the sense that the directest course still best succeeds. For should not grave and learned experience, that looks with the eyes of all the world beside, and with all ages holds intelligence, go safer than deceit without a guide? Daniel, Musophilus. That change of plan and shifting of interest which Bulstrode stated or betrayed in his conversation with Lydgate had been determined in him by some severe experience which he had gone through. Since the epoch of Mr. Larch's sale, when Raffles had recognized Will Ladislaw, and when the banker had in vain attempted an act of restitution which might move divine providence to arrest painful consequences, his certainty that Raffles, unless he were dead, would return to Middlemarch before long, had been justified. On Christmas Eve, he had reappeared at the Shrubs. Bulstrode was at home to receive him and hinder his communication with the rest of the family. But he could not altogether hinder the circumstances of the visit from compromising himself and alarming his wife. Raffles proved more unmanageable than he had shown himself to be in his former appearances. His chronic state of mental restlessness, the growing effect of habitual intemperance, quickly shaking off every impression from what was said to him. He insisted on staying in the house, and Bulstrode, weighing two sets of evils, felt that this was at least not a worse alternative than his going into the town. He kept him in his own room for the evening and saw him to bed. Raffles, all the while amusing himself with the annoyance he was causing this decent and highly prosperous fellow sinner, an amusement which he facetiously expressed as sympathy with his friend's pleasure in entertaining a man who had been serviceable to him and who had not had all his earnings. There was a cunning calculation under this noisy joking. A cool resolve to extract something the handsomer from Bulstrode as payment for release from this new application of torture, but his cunning had a little overcast its mark. Bulstrode was indeed more tortured than the coarse fibre of Raffles could enable him to imagine. He had told his wife that he was simply taking care of this wretched creature, the victim of vice, who might otherwise injure himself. 
he implied, without the direct form of falsehood, that there was a family tie which bound him to this care, and that there were signs of mental alienation in Raffles which urged caution. He would himself drive the unfortunate being away the next morning. In these hints he felt that he was supplying Mrs. Bulstrode with precautionary information for his daughters and servants, and accounting for his allowing no one but himself to enter the room even with food and drink but he sat in an agony of fear lest raffles should be overheard in his loud and plain references to past facts lest mrs bulstrode should be even tempted to listen at the door how could he hinder her how betray his terror by opening the door to detect her she was a woman of honest direct habits and little likely to take so low a course in order to arrive at painful knowledge but fear was stronger than the calculation of probabilities in this way raffles had pushed the torture too far and produced an effect which had not been in his plan by showing himself hopelessly unmanageable he had made bulstrode feel that a strong defiance was the only resource left after taking raffles to bed that night the banker ordered his closed carriage to be ready at half-past seven the next morning at six o'clock he had already been long dressed and had spent some of his wretchedness in prayer pleading his motives for averting the worst evil if in anything he had used falsity and spoken what was not true before god for bulstrode shrank from a direct lie with an intensity disproportionate to the number of his more indirect misdeeds but many of these misdeeds were like the subtle muscular movements which are not taken account of in the consciousness though they bring about the end that we fix our mind on and desire and it is only what we are vividly conscious of that we can vividly imagine to be seen by omniscience bulstrode carried his candle to the bedside of raffles who was apparently in a painful dream he stood silent hoping that the presence of the light would serve to waken the sleeper gradually and gently for he feared some noise as the consequence of a too sudden awakening he had watched for a couple of minutes or more the shudderings and pantings which seemed likely to end in waking when Raffles, with a long, half-stifled moan, started up and stared round him in terror, trembling and gasping. But he made no further noise, and Bulstrode, setting down the candle, awaited his recovery. It was a quarter of an hour later before Bulstrode, with a cold peremptoriness of manner which he had not before shown, said, "'I came to call you thus early, Mr. Raffles, because I have ordered the carriage to be ready at half-past seven and intend myself to conduct you as far as Ellsley, where you can either take the railway or await a coach. Raffles was about to speak, but Bulstrode anticipated him imperiously with the words, "'Be silent, sir, and hear what I have to say. I shall supply you with money now, and I will furnish you with a reasonable sum from time to time, on your application to me by letter. But if you choose to present yourself here again, if you return to Middlemarch, or if you use your tongue in a manner injurious to me, you'll have to live on such fruits as your malice can bring you without help from me nobody will pay you well for blasting my name i know the worst you can do against me and i shall brave it if you dare to thrust yourself upon me again get up sir and do as i order you without noise or i will send for a policeman to take you off my premises and you may carry your stories into every pothouse in the town but you shall have no sixpence from me to pay your expenses there Bulstrode had rarely in his life spoken with such nervous energy. He had been deliberating on this speech and its probable effects through a large part of the night, and though he did not trust to its ultimately saving him from any return of Raffles, he had concluded that it was the best throw he could make. It succeeded in enforcing submission from the jaded man this morning. His unpoisoned system at this moment quailed before Bulstrode's cold, resolute bearing, and he was taken off quietly in the carriage before the family breakfast time. The servants imagined him to be a poor relation, and were not surprised that a strict man like their master, who held his head high in the world, should be ashamed of such a cousin, and want to get rid of him. The banker's drive of ten miles with his hated companion was a dreary beginning of the Christmas day, but at the end of the drive Raffles had recovered his spirits, and parted in a contentment for which there was the good reason that the banker had given him a hundred pounds. Various motives urged Bulstrode to this open-handedness but he did not himself inquire closely into all of them. As he had stood watching Raffles in his uneasy sleep, it had suddenly entered his mind that the man had been much shattered since the first gift of two hundred pounds. 
he had taken care to repeat the incisive statement of his resolve not to be played on any more, and had tried to penetrate Raffles with the fact that he had shown the risks of bribing him to be quite equal to the risks of defying him. But when, freed from his repulsive presence, Bulstrode returned to his quiet home, he brought with him no confidence that he had secured more than a respite. It was as if he had had a loathsome dream, and could not shake off its images with their hateful kindred of sensations, as if on all the pleasant surroundings of his life a dangerous reptile had left his slimy traces. Who can know how much of his most inward life is made up of the thoughts he believes other men to have about him, until that fabric of opinion is threatened with ruin? Bulstrode was only the more conscious that there was a deposit of uneasy presentment in his wife's mind, because she carefully avoided any allusion to it. He had been used every day to taste the flavour of supremacy and the tribute of complete deference, and the certainty that he was watched or measured with a hidden suspicion of his having some discreditable secret made his voice totter when he was speaking to edification. Foreseeing to men of Bulstrode's anxious temperament is often worse than seeing— and his imagination continually heightened the anguish of an imminent disgrace. Yes, imminent, for if his defiance of Raffles did not keep the man away, and though he prayed for this result he hardly hoped for it, the disgrace was certain. In vain he said to himself that, if permitted, it would be a divine visitation, a chastisement, a preparation. He recoiled from the imagined burning, and he judged that it must be more for the divine glory that he should escape dishonour. That recoil had at last urged him to make preparations for quitting Middlemarch. If evil truth must be reported of him, he would then be at a less scorching distance from the contempt of his old neighbours, and in a new scene where his life would not have gathered the same wide sensibility, the tormentor, if he pursued him, would be less formidable. To leave the place, finally, would, he knew, be extremely painful to his wife, and on other grounds he would have preferred to stay where he had struck root. Hence he made his preparations at first in a conditional way, wishing to leave on all sides an opening for his return after brief absence, if any favourable intervention of providence should dissipate his fears. He was preparing to transfer his management of the bank, and to give up any active control of other commercial affairs in the neighbourhood, on the ground of his failing health, but without excluding his future resumption of such work. The measure would cause him some added expense and some diminution of income beyond what he had already undergone from the general depression of trade, and the hospital presented itself as a principal object of outlay on which he could fairly economise. This was the experience which had determined his conversation with Lydgate, but at this time his arrangements had most of them gone no farther than a stage at which he could recall them if they proved to be unnecessary. He continually deferred the final steps. In the midst of his fears, like many a man who is in danger of shipwreck or of being dashed from his carriage by runaway horses, he had a clinging impression that something would happen to hinder the worst, and that to spoil his life by a late transplantation might be over-hasty, especially since it was difficult to account satisfactorily to his wife for the project of their indefinite exile from the only place where she would like to live. Among the affairs Bulstrode had to care for was the management of the farm at Stone Court in case of his absence, and on this as well as on all other matters connected with any houses and land he possessed in or about Middlemarch, he had consulted Caleb Garth. Like everyone else who had business of that sort, he wanted to get the agent who was more anxious for his employer's interests than his own. With regard to Stone Court, since Bulstrode wished to retain his hold on the stock, and to have an arrangement by which he himself could, if he chose, resume his favourite recreation of superintendence, Caleb had advised him not to trust to a mere bailiff, but to let the land, stock, and implements yearly, and take a proportionate share of the proceeds. "'May I trust to you to find me a tenant on these terms, Mr. Garth?' said Bulstrode. "'And will you mention to me the yearly sum which would repay you for managing these affairs which we have discussed together?' "'I'll think about it,' said Caleb, in his blunt way. "'I'll see how I can make it out.' If it had not been that he had to consider Fred Vincey's future, Mr. Garth would not probably have been glad of any addition to his work, of which his wife was always fearing an excess for him as he grew older. 
but on quitting bulstrode after that conversation a very alluring idea occurred to him about this sad letting of stone court what if bulstrode would agree to his placing fred vincey there on the understanding that he caleb garth should be responsible for the management it would be an excellent schooling for fred he might make a modest income there and still have time left to get knowledge by helping in other business he mentioned his notion to mrs garth with such evident delight that she could not bear to chill his pleasure by expressing her constant fear of his undertaking too much the lad would be as happy as two he said throwing himself back in his chair and looking radiant if i could tell him it was all settled think susan his mind had been running on that place for years before old featherstone died and it would be as pretty a turn of things as could be that he should hold the place in a good industrious way after all by his taking to business for it's likely enough bulstrode might let him go on and gradually buy the stock he hasn't made up his mind i can see whether or not he shall settle somewhere else as a lasting thing i never was better pleased with a notion in my life and then the children might be married by and by susan you will not give any hint of the plan to fred until you are sure that bulstrode would agree to the plan said mrs garth in a tone of gentle caution and as to marriage caleb we old people need not help to hasten it oh i don't know said caleb swinging his head aside marriage is a taming thing fred would want less of my bit and bridle however i shall say nothing till i know the ground i am treading on i shall speak to bulstrode again he took his earliest opportunity of doing so bulstrode had anything but a warm interest in his nephew fred vincey but he had a strong wish to secure mr garth's services on many scattered points of business at which he was sure to be a considerable loser if they were under less conscientious management on that ground he made no objection to mr garth's proposal and there was also another reason why he was not sorry to give a consent which was to benefit one of the vincey family it was that mrs bulstrode having heard of lydgate's deaths had been anxious to know whether her husband could not do something for poor rosamond and had been much troubled on learning from him that lydgate's affairs were not easily remediable and that the wisest plan was to let them take their course mrs bulstrode had then said for the first time i think you are always a little hard towards my family nicholas and i am sure i have no reason to deny any of my relatives too worldly they may be but no one ever had to say that they were not respectable my dear harriet said mr bulstrode wincing under his wife's eyes which were filling with tears i have supplied your brother with a great deal of capital i cannot be expected to take care of his married children that seemed to be true and mrs bulstrode's remonstrance subsided into pity for poor rosamond whose extravagant education she had always foreseen the fruits of but remembering that dialogue mr bulstrode felt that when he had to talk to his wife fully about his plan of quitting middlemarch he should be glad to tell her that he had made an arrangement which might be for the good of her nephew fred at present he had merely mentioned to her that he thought of shutting up the shrubs for a few months and taking a house on the southern coast hence mr garth got the assurance he desired namely that in case of bulstrode's departure from middlemarch for an indefinite time fred vincey should be allowed to have the tenancy of stone court on the terms proposed caleb was so elated with his hope of this neat turn being given to things that if his self-control had not been braced by a little affectionate wifely scolding he would have betrayed everything to mary wanting to give the child comfort however he restrained himself and kept in strict privacy from fred certain visits which he was making to stone court in order to look more thoroughly into the state of the land and stock and take a preliminary estimate he was certainly more eager in these visits than the probable speed of events required him to be but he was stimulated by a fatherly delight in occupying his mind with this bit of probable happiness which he held in store like a hidden birthday gift for fred and mary but suppose the whole scheme should turn out to be a castle in the air said mrs garth well well replied caleb the castle will tumble about nobody's head End of chapter sixty eight This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Middlemarch by George Eliot. As read for LibriVox by Madame Tusk.
www.rlowalrus.sitesled.com Chapter 69 If thou hast heard a word, let it die with thee. Ecclesiasticus Mr. Bulstrode was still seated in his manager's room at the bank about three o'clock of the same day on which he had received Lydgate there, when the clerk entered to say that his horse was waiting, and also that Mr. Garth was outside and begged to speak with him. "'By all means,' said Bulstrode, and Caleb entered. "'Pray sit down, Mr. Garth,' continued the banker, in his suavest tone. "'I am glad that you arrived just in time to find me here. I know you count your minutes.' "'Oh!' said Caleb gently, with a slow swing of his head on one side, as he seated himself and laid his hat on the floor. He looked at the ground, leaning forward and letting his long fingers droop between his legs, while each finger moved in succession, as if it were sharing some thought which filled his large, quiet brow. Mr. Bulstrode, like every one else who knew Caleb, was used to his slowness in beginning to speak on any topic which he felt to be important, and rather expected that he was about to recur to the buying of some houses in Blind Man's Court, for the sake of pulling them down, as a sacrifice of property which would be well repaid by the influx of air and light on that spot. It was by propositions of this kind that Caleb was sometimes troublesome to his employers, but he had usually found Bulstrode ready to meet him in projects of improvement, and they had got on well together. When he spoke again, however, it was to say, in rather a subdued voice, "'I have just come away from Stone Court, Mr. Bulstrode.' "'You found nothing wrong there, I hope,' said the banker. "'I was there myself yesterday. Abel has done well with the lambs this year.' "'Why, yes,' said Caleb, looking up gravely. "'There is something wrong. A stranger, who is very ill, I think. He wants a doctor, and I came to tell you of that. His name is Raffles.' He saw the shock of his words passing through Bulstrode's frame. On this subject the banker had thought that his fears were too constantly on the watch to be taken by surprise, but he had been mistaken. "'Poor wretch!' he said in a compassionate tone, though his lips trembled a little. "'Do you know how he came there?' "'I took him myself,' said Caleb quietly. "'Took him up in my gig. He had got down from the coach, and was walking a little beyond the turn and from the toll-house, and I overtook him. He remembered seeing me with you once before at Stone Court, and he asked me to take him on. I saw he was ill. It seemed to me the right thing to do, to carry him under shelter. And now I think you should lose no time in getting advice for him. Caleb took up his hat from the floor as he ended, and rose slowly from his seat. Oh, certainly, said Bulstrode, whose mind was very active at this moment. Perhaps you will yourself oblige me, Mr. Garth, by calling at Mr. Lydgate's as you pass. Or stay. He may be at this hour, probably at the hospital. I will first send my man on the horse there with a note this instant, and then I will myself ride to Stone Court. Bulstrode quickly wrote a note, and went out himself to give the commission to his man. When he returned, Caleb was standing as before, with one hand on the back of the chair, holding his hat with the other. In Bulstrode's mind the dominant thought was, perhaps Ruffles only spoke to Garth of his illness. Garth may wonder, as he must have done before, at this disreputable fellow's claiming intimacy with me, but he will know nothing. And he is friendly to me. I can be of use to him. He longed for some confirmation of this hopeful conjecture, but to have asked any question as to what Raffles had said or done would have been to betray fear. "'I am exceedingly obliged to you, Mr. Garth,' he said, in his usual tone of politeness. "'My servant will be back in a few minutes, and I shall then go myself to see what can be done for this unfortunate man. Perhaps you had some other business with me? If so, pray be seated.' "'Thank you,' said Caleb, making a slight gesture with his right hand, to wave the invitation. "'I wish to say, Mr. Bulstrode, that I must request you to put your business into some other hands than mine. I am obliged to you for your handsome way of meeting me, about the letting of Stone Court and all other businesses, but I must give it up.' A sharp certainty entered like a stab into Bulstrode's soul. "'This is sudden, Mr. Garth,' was all he could say at first. "'It is.' said Caleb, but it is quite fixed. I must give it up. He spoke with a firmness which was very gentle, and yet he could see that Bulstrode seemed to cower under that gentleness, his face looking dried and his eyes swerving away from the glance which rested on him. Caleb felt a deep pity for him, but he could have used no pretext to account for his resolve, even if they would have been of any use. 
you have been led to this i apprehend by some slanders concerning me uttered by that unhappy creature said bulstrode anxious now to know the utmost that is true i can't deny that i act upon what i heard from him you are a conscientious man mr garth a man i trust who feels himself accountable to god you would not wish to injure me by being too ready to believe a slander said bulstrode casting about for pleas that might be adapted to his hearer's mind that is a poor reason for giving up a connection which i think i may say will be mutually beneficial i would injure no man if i could help it said caleb even if i thought god winked at it i hope i should have a feeling for my fellow-creature but sir i am obliged to believe that this raffles has told me the truth and i can't be happy working with you or profiting by you it hurts my mind i must beg you to seek another agent very well mr garth but i must at least claim to know the worst that he has told you i must know what is the foul speech that i am liable to be the victim of said bulstrode a certain amount of anger beginning to mingle with his humiliation before this quiet man who renounced his benefits that's needless said caleb waving his hand bowing his head slightly and not swerving from the tone which had in it the merciful intention to spare this pitiable man what he has said to me will never pass from my lips unless something now unknown forces it from me if you led arm for life for gain and kept others out of their rights by deceit to get more for yourself i dare say you repent you would like to go back and can't and that must be a bitter thing caleb paused a moment and shook his head it is not for me to make your life harder for you but you do you do make it harder to me said bulstrode constrained into a genuine pleading cry you make it harder to me by turning your back on me that i'm forced to do said caleb still more gently lifting up his hand i am sorry i don't judge you and say he is wicked and i am righteous god forbid i don't know everything a man may do wrong and his will may rise clear out of it though he can't get his life clear that's a bad punishment if it is so with you well i'm very sorry for you but i have that feeling inside me that i can't go on working with you that's all mr bulstrode everything else is buried as far as my will goes and i wish you good day one moment mr garth said bulstrode hurriedly i may trust then to your solemn assurance that you will not repeat either to man or woman what even if it have any degree of truth in it is yet a malicious representation caleb's wrath was stirred and he said indignantly why should i have said it if i didn't mean it i'm in no fear of you such tales as that will never tempt my tongue. Excuse me, I am agitated. I am the victim of this abandoned man. Stop a bit. You've got to consider whether you didn't help to make him worse when you profited by his vices. You are wronging me by too readily believing him, said Bulstrode, oppressed as by a nightmare, with the inability to deny flatly what Raffles might have said, and yet feeling it an escape that Caleb had not so stated it to him as to ask for that flat denial. No, said Caleb, lifting his hand depreciatingly. I am ready to believe better, when better is proved. I rob you of no good chance. As to speaking, I hold it a crime to expose a man's sin, unless I am clear it must be done to save the innocent. That is my way of thinking, Mr. Bulstrode. And what I say, I have no need to swear. I wish you good day. Some hours later, when he was at home, Caleb said to his wife, incidentally, that he had had some little differences with Bulstrode, and that in consequence he had given up all notion of taking Stone Court and indeed had resigned doing further business for him he was disposed to interfere too much was he said mrs garth imagining that her husband had been touched on his sensitive point and not been allowed to do what he thought right as to the materials and modes of work oh said caleb bowing his head and waving his hand gravely and mrs garth knew that this was a sign of his not intending to speak further on the subject as for bulstrode he had almost immediately mounted his horse and set off for stone court being anxious to arrive there before lydgate his mind was crowded with images and conjectures which were a language to his hopes and fears just as we hear tones from the vibrations which shake our whole system the deep humiliation with which he had winced under caleb garth's knowledge of his past and rejection of his patronage alternated with and almost gave way to the sense of safety in the fact that garth and no other had been the man to whom raffles had spoken it seemed to him a sort of earnest that providence intended his rescue from worse consequences the way being thus left open for the hope of secrecy that raffles should be afflicted with illness that he should have been led to stone court rather than elsewhere 
Bulstrode's heart fluttered at the vision of probabilities which these events conjured up. If it should turn out that he was freed from all danger of disgrace, if he could breathe in perfect liberty, his life should be more consecrated than it had ever been before. He mentally lifted up this vow as if it would urge the result he longed for. He tried to believe in the potency of that prayerful resolution, its potency to determine death. He knew that he ought to say, "'Thy will be done,' and he said it often. But the intense desire remained that the will of God might be the death of that hated man. Yet when he arrived at Stone Court, he could not see the change in Ravels without a shock. But for his pallor and feebleness, Bulstrode would have called the change in him entirely mental. Instead of his loud, tormenting mood, he showed an intense, vague terror, and seemed to deprecate Bulstrode's anger, because the money was all gone. He had been robbed. It had half of it been taken from him. He had only come here because he was ill and somebody was hunting him. Somebody was after him. He had told nobody anything. He had kept his mouth shut. Bulstrode, not knowing the significance of these symptoms, interpreted this new nervous susceptibility into a means of alarming Raffles into true confessions, and taxed him with falsehood in saying that he had not told anything, since he had just told the man who took him up in his gig and brought him to Stone Court. Raffles denied this with solemn adjurations, the fact being that the links of consciousness were interrupted in him, and that his minute, terror-stricken narrative to Caleb Garth had been delivered under a set of visionary impulses which had dropped back into darkness. Bulstrode's heart sank again at this sign that he could get no grasp over the wretched man's mind, and that no word of Raffles could be trusted as to the fact which he almost wanted to know, namely, whether or not he had really kept silence to every one in the neighbourhood except Caleb Garth. The housekeeper had told him, without the least constraint of manner, that since Mr. Garth left, Ravels had asked her for beer, and after that had not spoken, seemingly very ill. On that side it might be concluded that there had been no betrayal. Mrs. Abel thought, like the servants at the shrubs, that the strange man belonged to the unpleasant kin who were among the troubles of the rich. She had at first referred the kinship to Mr. Rigg, and where there was property left. The buzzing presence of such large blue bottles seemed natural enough but how he could be kin to bulstrode as well was not so clear but mrs abel agreed with her husband that there was no knowing a proposition which had a great deal of mental food for her so that she shook her head over it without further speculation in less than an hour lydgate arrived bulstrode met him outside the wainscoted parlour where raffles was and said i have called you in mr lydgate to an unfortunate man who was once in my employment many years ago Afterwards he went to America, and returned, I fear, to an idle, dissolute life. Being destitute, he has a claim on me. He was slightly connected with Rigg, the former owner of this place, and in consequence found his way here. I believe he is seriously ill. Apparently his mind is affected. I feel bound to do the utmost for him. Lydgate, who had the remembrance of his last conversation with Bulstrode strongly upon him, was not disposed to say any unnecessary word to him, and bowed slightly in answer to this account. But just before entering the room he turned automatically and said, "'What is his name?' To know names being as much part of the medical man's accomplishment as of the practical politician's. A Raffles, John Raffles,' said Bulstrode, who hoped that whatever became of Raffles, Lydgate would never know any more of him. When he had thoroughly examined and considered the patient, Lydgate ordered that he should go to bed, and be kept there in as complete quiet as possible, and then went with Bulstrode into another room. "'It is a serious case, I apprehend?' said the banker, before Lydgate began to speak. "'No, and yes,' said Lydgate, half dubiously. "'It is difficult to decide as to the possible effect of long-standing complications, but the man had a robust constitution to begin with. I should not expect this attack to be fatal, though, of course, the system is in a ticklish state. He should be well watched and attended to.' "'I will remain here myself.' said Bulstrode. Mrs. Abel and her husband are inexperienced. I can easily remain here for the night. If you will oblige me by taking a note for Mrs. Bulstrode? I should think that is hardly necessary, said Lydgate. He seems tame and terrified enough. He might become more unmanageable. But there is a man here, is there not? I have more than once stayed here a few nights for the sake of seclusion, said Bulstrode indifferently. I am quite disposed to do so now. Mrs. Abel and her husband can relieve or aid me, if necessary." "'Very well. Then I need give my directions only to you,' said Lydgate, not feeling surprised at a little peculiarity in Bulstrode. "'You think, then, that the case is hopeful?' said Bulstrode, when it, Lydgate had ended giving his orders. "'Unless there turn out to be further complications, such as I have not at present detected, yes,' said Lydgate. 
He may pass on to a worse stage, but I should not wonder if he got the better in a few days, by adhering to the treatment I have prescribed. There must be firmness. Remember, if he calls for liquors of any sort, not to give them to him. In my opinion, men in his condition are oftener killed by treatment than by the disease. Still, new symptoms may arise. I shall come again to-morrow morning. After waiting for the note to be carried to Mrs. Bulstrode, Lydgate rode away, forming no conjectures, in the first instance, about the history of Raffles, but rehearsing the whole argument, which had lately been much stirred by the publication of Dr. Ware's abundant experience in America, as to the right way of treating cases of alcoholic poisoning, such as this. Lydgate, when abroad, had already been interested in this question. He was strongly convinced against the prevalent practice of allowing alcohol and persistently administering large doses of opium, and he had repeatedly acted on this conviction, with a favourable result. "'The man is in a diseased state,' he thought, "'but there's a good deal of wear in him still. I suppose he is an object of charity to Bulstrode. It is curious what patches of hardness and tenderness lie side by side in men's dispositions. Bulstrode seems the most unsympathetic fellow I ever saw about some people, and yet he has taken no end of trouble and spent a great deal of money on benevolent objects. I suppose he has some test by which he finds out whom heaven cares for. He has made up his mind that it doesn't care for me. This streak of bitterness came from a plenteous source, and kept widening in the current of his thoughts as he neared Lowick Gate. He had not been there since his first interview with Bulstrode in the morning, having been found at the hospital by the banker's messenger, and for the first time he was returning to his home without the vision of any expedient in the background, which left him a hope of raising money enough to deliver him from the coming destitution of everything which made his married life tolerable, everything which saved him and Rosamond from that bare isolation in which they would be forced to recognize how little of a comfort they could be to each other. It was more bearable to do without tenderness for himself than to see that his own tenderness could make no amends for the lack of other things to her. The sufferings of his own pride from humiliations past and to come were keen enough, yet they were hardly distinguishable to himself from that more acute pain which dominated them, the pain of foreseeing that Rosamond would come to regard him chiefly as the cause of disappointment and unhappiness to her. He had never liked the makeshifts of poverty, and they had never before entered into his prospects for himself but he was beginning now to imagine how two creatures who loved each other and had a stock of thoughts in common might laugh over their shabby furniture and their calculations how far they could afford butter and eggs but the glimpse of that poverty seemed as far off from him as the carelessness of the golden age in poor rosamond's mind there was not room enough for luxuries to look small in he got down from his horse in a very sad and went into the house not expecting to be cheered except by his dinner, and reflecting that before the evening closed it would be wise to tell Rosamond of his application to Bulstrode and its failure. It would be well not to lose time in preparing her for the worse. But his dinner waited long for him before he was able to eat it, for on entering he found that Dover's agent had already put a man in the house, and when he asked where Mrs. Lydgate was he was told that she was in her bedroom. He went up and found her stretched on the bed, pale and silent, without an answer even in her face to any word or look of his. He sat down by the bed, and leaning over her, said, with almost a cry of prayer, "'Forgive me for this misery, my poor Rosamond, but let us only love one another.' She looked at him silently, still with the blank stare on her face. But then the tears began to fill her blue eyes, and her lip trembled. The strong man had had too much to bear that day. He let his head fall beside hers and sobbed. He did not hinder her from going to her father early in the morning. It seemed now that he ought not to hinder her from doing as she pleased. In half an hour she came back, and said that papa and mamma wished her to go and stay with them, while things were in this miserable state. Papa said he could do nothing about the debt. If he paid this, there would be half a dozen more. She had better come back home again, till Lydgate had got a comfortable home for her. "'Do you object, Tertius?' "'Do as you like,' said Lydgate. "'But things are not coming to a crisis immediately. "'There is no hurry.' "'I should not go till to-morrow,' said Rosamond. "'I shall want to pack my clothes.' "'Oh, I would wait a little longer than to-morrow. "'There's no knowing what may happen,' said Lydgate, with bitter irony. "'I may get my neck broken, and that may make things easier to you.' It was Lydgate's misfortune, and Rosamond's too, that his tenderness towards her, which was both an emotional prompting and a well-considered resolve, was inevitably interrupted by these outbursts of indignation, either ironical or remonstrant. She thought them totally unwarranted, and the repulsion which this exceptional severity excited in her was in danger of making the more persistent tenderness unacceptable. "'I see you do not wish me to go,' said she said, with chill mildness. "'Why can you not say so without that kind of violence? I shall stay until you request me to do otherwise.' 
Lydgate said no more, but went on his rounds. He felt bruised and shattered, and there was a dark line under his eyes which Rosamond had not seen before. She could not bear to look at him. Tertius had a way of taking things which made them a great deal worse for her. End of chapter 69 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Middlemarch by George Eliot, as read for LibriVox by Madame Tusk, www.rlowalrus.sitesled.com. Chapter 70 our deeds still travel with us from afar, and what we have been makes us what we are. Bulstrode's first object after Lydgate had left Stone Court was to examine Raffles's pockets, which he imagined were sure to carry signs in the shape of hotel bills of the places he had stopped in, if he had not told the truth in saying that he had come straight from Liverpool because he was ill and had no money. There were various bills crammed into his pocket-book, but none of a later date than Christmas, at any other place, except one, which bore date that morning. This was crumbled up with a hand-bill about a horse-fair in one of his tail-pockets, and represented the cost of three days' stay at an inn at Bilkley, where the fair was held, a town at least forty miles from Middlemarch. The bill was heavy, and since Raffles had no luggage with him, it seemed probable that he had left his portmanteau behind in payment, in order to save money for his travelling fare, for his purse was empty, and he had only a couple of sixpences and some loose pence in his pockets. Bulstrode gathered a sense of safety from these indications that Raffles had really kept at a distance from Middlemarch, since his memorable visit at Christmas. At a distance, and among people who were strangers to Bulstrode, what satisfaction could there be to Raffles's tormenting, self-magnifying vein in telling old scandalous stories about a Middlemarch banker? And what harm if he did talk? The chief point now was to keep watch over him as long as there was any danger of that intelligible raving, that unaccountable impulse to tell, which seemed to have acted towards Caleb Garth, and Bulstrode felt much anxiety, lest some such impulse should come over him at the sight of Lydgate. He sat up alone with him through the night, only ordering the housekeeper to lie down in her clothes, so as to be ready when he called her, alleging his own indisposition to sleep, and his anxiety to carry out the doctor's orders. He did carry them out faithfully, although Ravels was incessantly asking for brandy, and declaring that he was sinking away, that the earth was sinking away from under him. He was restless and sleepless, but still quailing and manageable. On the offer of the food ordered by Lydgate, which he refused, and the denial of other things which he demanded, he seemed to concentrate all his terror on Bulstrode, imploringly depreciating his anger, his revenge on him by starvation, and declaring with strong oaths that he had never told any mortal a word against him. Even this Bulstrode felt that he could not have liked Lydgate to hear, but a more alarming sign of fitful alteration in his delirium was that in the morning twilight Raffles suddenly seemed to imagine a doctor present, addressing him and declaring that Bulstrode wanted to starve him to death out of revenge for telling, when he never had told. Bulstrode's native imperiousness and strength of determination served him well. This delicate-looking man, himself nervously perturbed, found the needed stimulus in his strenuous circumstances, and through that difficult night and morning, while he had the air of an animated corpse, returned to movement without warmth. Holding the mastery by its chill impassibility, his mind was intensely at work, thinking of what he had to guard against and what would win him security. Whatever prayers he might lift up, whatever statements he might inwardly make of this man's wretched spiritual condition, and this duty he himself was under to submit to the punishment divinely appointed for him, rather than to wish for evil to another, through all this effort to condense words into a solid mental state, there pierced and spread with irresistible vividness the images of the events he desired, and in the train of those images came their apology. He could not but see the death of Raffles, and see it in his own deliverance. What was the removal of this wretched creature? He was impenitent. But were not public criminals impenitent? Yet the law decided on their fate. Should Providence in this case award death? There was no sin in contemplating death as the desirable issue, if he kept his hands from hastening it, if he scrupulously did what was prescribed. Even here there might be a mistake. Human perceptions were fallible things. Lydgate had said that treatment had hastened death. Why not his own method of treatment? But, of course, intention was everything in the question of right and wrong. 
and Bulstrode set himself to keep his intention separate from his desire. He inwardly declared that he intended to obey orders. Why should he have got into any argument about the validity of these orders? It was only the common trick of desire, which avails itself of any irrelevant scepticism, finding larger room for itself in all uncertainty about effects, in every obscurity that looks like the absence of law. Still, he did obey the orders. His anxieties continually glanced toward Lydgate, and his remembrance of what had taken place between them the morning before was accompanied with sensibilities which had not been roused at all during the actual scene. He had then cared but little about Lydgate's painful impressions with regard to the suggested change in the hospital, or about the disposition towards himself which what he held to be his justifiable refusal of a rather exorbitant request might call forth. He recurred to the scene now with a perception that he had probably made Lydgate his enemy, and with an awakened desire to propitiate him, or rather to create in him a strong sense of personal obligation. He regretted that he had not at once made even an unreasonable money sacrifice, for in case of unpleasant suspicions, or even knowledge gathered from the raving raffles, Bulstrode would have felt that he had a defence in Lydgate's mind by having conferred a momentous benefit on him. But the regret had perhaps come too late." strange piteous conflict in the soul of this unhappy man who had longed for years to be better than he was who had taken his selfish passions into discipline and clad them in severe robes so that he had walked with them as a devout choir till now that a terror had risen among them and they could chant no longer but threw out their common cries for safety it was nearly the middle of the day before lydgate arrived he had meant to come earlier but had been detained he said and his shattered looks were noticed by bulstrode but he immediately threw himself into the consideration of the patient, and inquired strictly into all that had occurred. Raffles was worse, would take hardly any food, was persistently wakeful and restlessly raving, but still not violent. Contrary to Bulstrode's alarmed expectation, he took little notice of Lydgate's presence, and continued to talk or murmur incoherently. "'What do you think of him?' said Bulstrode in private. "'The symptoms are worse. You are less hopeful?' "'No, I think he may still come round.' "'Are you going to stay here yourself?' said Lydgate, looking at Bulstrode with an abrupt question, which made him uneasy, though in reality it was not due to any suspicious conjecture. "'Yes, I think so,' said Bulstrode, governing himself, and speaking with deliberation. "'Mrs. Bulstrode is advised of the reasons which detain me. Mrs. Abel and her husband are not experienced enough to be left quite alone, and this kind of responsibility is scarcely included in their service of me. You have some fresh instructions, I presume?' The chief new instruction that Lydgate had given was the administration of extremely moderate doses of opium, in case of the sleeplessness, continuing after several hours. He had taken the precaution of bringing opium in his pocket, and he gave minute directions to Bulstrode as to the doses and the point at which they should cease. He insisted on the risk of not ceasing, and repeated his order that no alcohol should be given. "'From what I see of the case,' he ended, "'narcotism is the only thing I should be much afraid of.' He may wear through even without much food. There's a good deal of strength in him. You look ill yourself, Mr. Lydgate. A most unusual, I may say, unprecedented thing in my knowledge of you, said Bulstrode, showing a solicitude as unlike his indifference the day before as his present recklessness about his own fatigue was unlike his habitual self-cherishing anxiety. I fear you are harassed. Yes, I am, said Lydgate brusquely, holding his hat and ready to go. Something new, I fear— said Bulstrode. "'Pray you be seated.' "'No, thank you,' said Lydgate, with some hot air. "'I mentioned to you yesterday what was the state of my affairs. There is nothing to add except that the execution has since been actually put into my house. One can tell a good deal of trouble in a short sentence. I will say good morning.' "'Stay, Mr. Lydgate, stay,' said Bulstrode. "'I have been reconsidering this subject. I was yesterday taken by surprise, and saw it superficially. Mrs. Bulstrode is anxious for her niece, and I myself should grieve at a calamitous change in your position.' Claims on me are numerous, but on reconsideration I esteem it right that I should incur a small sacrifice rather than leave you unaided. You said, I think, that a thousand pounds would suffice entirely to free you from your burdens, and enable you to recover firm sand? Yes, said Lydgate, a great leap of joy within him surmounting every other feeling. That would pay all my debts, and leave me a little on hand. I could set about economising our way of living, and by and by my practice might look up. "'If you will wait a moment, Mr. Lydgate, I will draw a cheque to that amount. I am aware that help, to be effectual in these cases, should be thorough.' 
While Bulstrode wrote, Lydgate turned to the window, thinking of his home, thinking of his life, with its good start saved from frustration, its good purposes still unbroken. "'You can give me a note of hand for this, Mr. Lydgate,' said the banker, advancing towards him with the cheque, "'and by and by, I hope, you may be in circumstances gradually to repay me. Meanwhile, I have the pleasure in thinking that you will be released from further difficulty.' "'I am deeply obliged to you,' said Lydgate. "'You have restored to me the prospect of working with some happiness and some chance of good.' It appeared to him a very natural movement in Bulstrode that he should have reconsidered his refusal. It corresponded with the more munificent side of his character. But as he put his hack into a canter, that he might get the sooner home, and tell the good news to Rosemond, and get cash at the bank to pay over to Dover's agent, there crossed his mind, with an unpleasant impression as from a dark-winged flight of evil augury across his vision, the thought of that contrast in himself which a few months had brought, that he should be overjoyed at being under a strong personal obligation, that he should be overjoyed at getting money for himself from Bulstrode. The banker felt that he had done something to nullify one cause of uneasiness, and yet he was scarcely the easier. He did not measure the quantity of diseased motive which had made him wish for Lydgate's good will, but the quantity was none the less actively there, like an irritating agent in his blood. A man vows, and yet will not cast away the means of breaking his vow. Is it that he distinctly means to break it? Not at all. But the desires which tend to break it are at work in him dimly, and make their way into his imagination, and relax his muscles in the very movement when he is telling himself over again the reasons for his vow. Raffles, recovering quickly, returning to the free use of his odious powers, how could Bulstrode wish for that? Raffles dead was the image that brought release, and indirectly he prayed for that way of release, beseeching that, if it were possible, the rest of his days here below be freed from the threat of that ignominy which would break him utterly as an instrument of God's service. Lydgate's opinion was not on the side of promise that this prayer would be fulfilled, and as the day advanced Bulstrode felt himself getting irritated at the persistent life in this man, whom he would fain have been sinking into the silence of death imperious will stirred murderous impulses towards this brute life, over which will by itself had no power. He said inwardly that he was getting too much worn. He would not sit up with the patient to-night, but leave him to Mrs. Abel, who, if necessary, could call her husband. At six o'clock, Raffles, having had only fitful perturbed snatches of sleep, from which he waked with fresh restlessness and perpetual cries that he was sinking away, Bulstrode began to administer the opium, according to Lydgate's directions. At the end of half an hour or more he called Mrs. Abel, and told her that he found himself unfit for further watching. He must now consign the patient to her care, and he proceeded to repeat to her Lydgate's directions as to the quantity of each dose. Mrs. Abel had not before known anything of Lydgate's prescriptions. She had simply prepared and brought whatever Bulstrode ordered, and had done what he pointed out to her. She began now to ask what else she should do besides administering the opium. "'Nothing at present, except the offer of the soup or the soda-water. "'You can come to me for further directions. "'Unless there is any important change, I shall not come into the room again to-night. "'You will ask your husband for help if necessary. "'I must go to bed early.' "'You've much need, sir, I'm sure,' said Mrs. Abel, "'and to take something more strengthening than what you've done.' Bulstrode went away now, without anxiety as to what Raffles might say in his raving, which had taken on a muttering incoherence not likely to create any dangerous belief. He went down into the wainscoted parlour first, and began to consider whether he would not have his horse saddled and go home by the moonlight, and give up caring for earthly consequences. Then he wished that he had begged Lydgate to come again that evening. Perhaps he might deliver a different opinion, and think that Raffles was getting into a less hopeful state. Should he send for Lydgate? If Raffles were really getting worse, and slowly dying, Bulstrode felt that he could go to bed and sleep in gratitude to Providence. But was he worse? Lydgate might come and simply say that he was going on as expected, and predict that he would, by and by, fall into a good sleep and get well. What was the use of sending for him? Bulstrode shrank from that result. No ideas or opinions could hinder him from seeing the one probability to be that Raffles recovered would be just the same man as before, with his strength as a tormentor renewed, obliging him to drag away his wife to spend her years apart from her friends and native place, carrying an alienating suspicion against him in her heart. He had sat an hour and a half in this conflict by the firelight only, when a sudden thought made him rise and light the bed-candle, which he had brought down with him. The thought was that he had not told Mrs. Abel when the doses of opium must cease. He took hold of the candlestick, but stood motionless for a long while. She might already have given him more than Lydgate had prescribed. 
but it was excusable in him that he should forget part of an order in his present wearied condition. He walked upstairs, candle in hand, not knowing whether he should straightway enter his own room and go to bed, or turn to the patient's room and rectify his omission. He paused in the passage, with his face turned towards Raffles' room, and he could hear him moaning and murmuring. He was not asleep, then. Who could know that Lydgate's prescription would not be better disobeyed than followed, since there was still no sleep? He turned into his own room. Before he had quite undressed, Mrs. Abel rapped at the door. He opened it an inch, so that he could hear her speak low. "'If you please, sir, should I have no brandy nor nothing to give the poor creature? He feels sinking away, and nothing else will he swallow. And but little strength in it if he did, only the opium, and he says more and more he's sinking down through the earth.' To her surprise, Bulstrode did not answer. A struggle was going on within him. "'I think he must die for want of support if he goes on in that way. When I nursed my poor master, Mr. Robinson, I had to give him port wine and brandy constant, and a big glass at a time,' added Mrs. Abel, with a touch of remonstrance in her tone. But again Mr. Bulstrode did not answer immediately, and she continued, "'It's not time to spare when people are at death's door, nor would you wish it, sir, I'm sure, else I should give him your own bottle of rum as we keep by us. But a sitter up as you've been, and doing everything as laid in your power—' Here a key was thrust through the inch of doorway, and Mr. Bulstrode said huskily, "'That is the key to the wine-cooler. You will find plenty of brandy there.' Early in the morning, about six, Mr. Bulstrode rose, and spent some time in prayer. Does any one suppose that private prayer is necessarily candid, necessarily goes to the roots of action? Private prayer is an audible speech, and speech is representative. Who can represent himself just as he is, even in his own reflections?' Bulstrode had not yet unravelled in his thought the confused promptings of the last four-and-twenty hours. He listened in the passage, and could hear hard, stertorous breathing. Then he walked out in the garden, and looked at the early rime on the grass and fresh spring leaves. When he re-entered the house, he felt startled at the sight of Mrs. Abel. "'How is your patient? Asleep, I think?' he said, with an attempt at cheerfulness in his tone. "'He's gone very deep, sir,' said Mrs. Abel. "'He went off gradual between three and four o'clock.' "'Would you please to go and look at him? "'I thought it no harm to leave him. "'My man's gone afield, and the little girl see into the kettles.' "'Bulstrode went up. "'At a glance he knew that Raffles was not in the sleep which brings revival, "'but in the sleep which streams deeper and deeper into the gulf of death. "'He looked round the room, and saw a bottle with some brandy in it, "'and the almost empty opium phial. "'He put the phial out of sight, and carried the brandy bottle downstairs with him, "'locking it again in the wine-cooler.' While breakfasting, he considered whether he should ride to Middlemarch at once, or wait for Lydgate's arrival. He decided to wait, and told Mrs. Abel that she might go about her work. He could watch in the bedchamber. As he sat there, and beheld the enemy of his peace going irrevocably into silence, he felt more at rest than he had done for many months. His conscience was soothed by the enfolding wing of secrecy, which seemed just then like an angel sent down for his relief. He drew out his pocket-book, to review various memoranda there as to the arrangements he had projected, and partly carried out in the prospect of quitting Middlemarch, and considered how far he would let them stand or recall them, now that his absence would be brief. Some economies which he felt desirable might still find a suitable occasion in his temporary withdrawal from management, and he hoped still that Mrs. Casbon would take a large share in the expenses of the hospital. In that way the moments passed, until a change in the stertorous breathing— was marked enough to draw his attention wholly to the bed, and forced him to think of the departing life, which had once been subservient to his own, which he had once been glad to find base enough for him to act on as he would. It was his gladness, then, which impelled him now to be glad that the life was at an end. And who could say that the death of Raffles had been hastened? Who knew what would have saved him? Lydgate arrived at half-past ten, in time to witness the final pause of the breath. When he entered the room, Bulstrode observed a sudden expression in his face, which was not so much surprise as a recognition that he had not judged correctly. He stood by the bed in silence for some time, with his eyes turned on the dying man, but with that subdued activity of expression which showed that he was carrying on an inward debate. "'When did this change begin?' said he, looking at Bulstrode. "'I did not watch by him last night,' said Bulstrode. "'I was overworn. I left him under Mrs. Abel's care.' She said that he sank into sleep between three and four o'clock. When I came in before eight, he was nearly in this condition. Lydgate did not ask another question, but watched in silence until he said, "'It is all over.' 
This morning Lydgate was in a state of recovered hope and freedom. He had set out on his work with all his old animation, and felt himself strong enough to bear all the deficiencies of his married life, and he was conscious that Bulstrode had been a benefactor to him. But he was uneasy about this case. He had not expected it to terminate as it had done. Yet he hardly knew how to put a question on the subject to Bulstrode without appearing to insult him, and if he examined the housekeeper, why, the man was dead. There seemed to be no use in implying that anybody's ignorance or imprudence had killed him, and, after all, he himself might be wrong. He and Bulstrode rode back to Middlemarch together, talking of many things, chiefly cholera and the chances of the Reform Bill in the House of Lords, and the firm resolve of the political unions. Nothing was said about Raffles, except that Bulstrode mentioned the necessity of having a grave for him in Lowick Churchyard, and observed that, so far as he knew, the poor man had no connections, except Rigg, whom he had stated to be unfriendly towards him. On returning home, Lydgate had a visit from Mr. Fairbrother. The vicar had not been in the town the day before, but the news that there was an execution in Lydgate's house had got to Lowick by the evening, having been carried by Mr. Spicer, shoemaker and parish clerk, who had it from his brother, the respectable bell-hanger in Lowick Gate. Since that evening, when Lydgate had come down from the billiard-room with Fred Vincey, Mr. Fairbrother's thoughts about him had been rather gloomy. Playing at the Green Dragon once or oftener might have been a trifle in another man, but in Lydgate it was one of several signs that he was getting unlike his former self. He was beginning to do things for which he had formerly even an excessive scorn. Whatever certain dissatisfactions in marriage, which some silly tinklings of gossip had given him hints of, might have to do with this change, Mr. Fairbrother felt sure that it was chiefly connected with the debts which were being more and more distinctly reported and he began to fear that any notion of Lydgate's having resources or friends in the background must be quite illusory. The rebuff he had met with in his first attempt to win Lydgate's confidence disinclined him to a second, but this news of the execution being actually in the house determined the vicar to overcome his reluctance. Lydgate had just dismissed a poor patient in whom he was much interested, and he came forward to put out his hand, with an open cheerfulness which surprised Mr. Fairbrother, could this, too, be a proud rejection of sympathy and help? Never mind. The sympathy and help should be offered. "'How are you, Lydgate? I came to see you because I had heard something which made me anxious about you,' said the vicar, in the tone of a good brother, only that there was no reproach in it. They were both seated by this time, and Lydgate answered immediately. "'I think I know what you mean. You had heard that there was an execution in the house?' "'Yes. Is it true?' "'It was true,' said Lydgate, with an air of freedom, as if he did not mind talking about the affair now. "'But the danger is over. The debt is paid. And I am out of my difficulties now. I shall be freed from debts, and able, I hope, to start afresh on a better plan.' "'I am very thankful to hear it,' said the vicar, falling back in his chair and speaking with that low-toned quickness, which often follows the removal of a load. "'I like that better than all the news in the Times. I confess I came to you with a heavy heart.' "'Thank you for coming,' said Lydgate cordially. I can enjoy the kindness all the more, because I am happier. I have certainly been a good deal crushed. I am afraid I shall find the bruises still painful by and by," he added, smiling rather sadly. But just now I can only feel that the torture screw is off. Mr. Fairbrother was silent for a moment, and then said earnestly, "'My dear fellow, let me ask you one question. Forgive me if I take a liberty. I don't believe you will ask me anything that ought to offend me. Then it, this is necessary to set my heart quite at rest. You have not, have you? in order to pay your debts, incurred another debt, which may harass you worse hereafter?" "'No,' said Lydgate, colouring slightly. "'There is no reason why I should not tell you, since the fact is so, that the person to whom I am indebted is Bulstrode. He has made me a very handsome advance, a thousand pounds, and he can afford to wait for repayment.' "'Well, that is generous,' said Fairbrother, compelling himself to approve of the man whom he disliked. His delicate feeling shrank from dwelling even in his thought on the fact that he had always urged Lydgate to avoid any personal entanglement with Bulstrode. He added immediately, "'And Bulstrode must naturally feel an interest in your welfare, after you have worked with him in a way which has probably reduced your income instead of adding to it. I am glad to think that he has acted accordingly.' Lydgate felt uncomfortable under these kindly suppositions. They made more distinct within him the uneasy consciousness which had shown its first dim stirrings only a few hours before, that Bulstrode's motives for his sudden beneficence following close upon the chillest indifference might be merely selfish. He let the kindly supposition pass. He could not tell the history of the loan, but it was more vividly present with him than ever, as well as the fact which the vicar delicately ignored, that this relation of personal indebtedness to Bulstrode was what he had once been most resolved to avoid. 
He began, instead of answering, to speak of his projected economies, and of his having come to look at his life from a different point of view. "'I shall set up a surgery,' he said. "'I really think I made a mistaken effort in that respect, and, if Rosamond will not mind, I shall take an apprentice. I don't like these things, but if one carries them out faithfully, they are not really lowering. I have had a severe galling to begin with. That will make the small rub seem easy.' Poor Lydgate, the if Rosamond will not mind, which had fallen from him involuntarily as part of his thought, was a significant mark of the yoke he bore. But Mr. Fairbrother, whose hopes entered strongly into the same current with Lydgate's, and who knew nothing about him that could now raise a melancholy presentiment, left him with affectionate congratulation. End of chapter 70all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Middlemarch by George Eliot, as read for LibriVox, by Madame Tusk, www.rlowalrus.sitesled.com. Chapter 71 Clown "'Twas in the bunch of grapes, where, indeed, you have a delight to sit, have you not? "'Froth. I have so. Because it is an open room, and good for winter. "'Clown. Why, very well, then. I hope here be truths. "'Measure for measure. Five days after the death of Raffles, Mr. Bambridge was standing at his leisure under the large archway leading into the yard of the Green Dragon. He was not fond of solitary contemplation— but he had only just come out of the house, and any human figure standing at ease under the archway in the early afternoon was as certain to attract companionship as a pigeon which has found something worth peeking at. In this case there was no material object to feed upon, but the eye of reason saw a probability of mental sustenance in the shape of gossip. Mr. Hopkins, the meek-mannered draper opposite, was the first to act on this inward vision, being the more ambitious of a little masculine talk, because his customers were chiefly women. Mr. Bambridge was rather curt to the draper, feeling that Hopkins was of course glad to talk to him, but that he was not going to waste much of his talk on Hopkins. Soon, however, there was a small cluster of more important listeners, who were either deposited from the passers-by, or had sauntered to the spot expressly to see if there were anything going on at the Green Dragon, and Mr. Bambridge was finding it worth his while to say many impressive things about the fine studs he had been seeing and the purchases he had made on a journey in the north from which he had just returned. Gentlemen present were assured that when they could show him anything to cut out a blood mare, a bay rising four, which was to be seen at Doncaster if they chose to go and look at it, Mr. Bambridge would gratify them by being shot from here to Hereford. Also, a pair of blacks which he was going to put into the brake recalled vividly to his mind a pair which he had sold to Faulkner in nineteen for a hundred guineas, and which Faulkner had sold for a hundred and sixty two months later, any agent who could disprove this statement being offered the privilege of calling Mr. Bambridge a very ugly name until the exercise made his throat dry. When the discourse was at this point of animation, came up Mr. Frank Hawley. He was not a man to compromise his dignity by lounging at the Green Dragon, but happening to pass along the high street and seeing Bambridge on the other side, he took some of his long strides across to ask the horse-dealer whether he had found the first-rate gig-horse which he had engaged to look for. Mr. Hawley was requested to wait until he had seen a grey selected at Bilkley. If that did not meet his wishes to a hair, Bambridge did not know a horse when he saw it, which seemed to be the highest conceivable likelihood. Mr. Hawley, standing with his back to the street, was fixing a time for looking at the grey and seeing it tried, when a horseman passed slowly by. Bulstrode, said two or three voices at once in a low tone, one of them, which was the draper's, respectfully prefixing the Mr., but nobody having more intention in this interjectural naming than if they had said the Riverston coach, when that vehicle appeared in the distance. Mr. Hawley gave a careless glance round at Bulstrode's back, but as Bambridge's eyes followed it he made a sarcastic grimace. "'By jingo, that reminds me,' he began, lowering his voice a little. "'I picked up something else at Bilkley besides your gig-horse, Mr. Hawley. I picked up a fine story about Bulstrode. Do you know how he came by his fortune?' Any gentleman wanting a bit of curious information, I can give it him free of expense. If everybody got their deserts, Bulstrode might have had to say his prayers at Botany Bay. "'What do you mean?' 
said Mr. Hawley, thrusting his hands into his pockets and pushing a little forward under the archway. If Bulstrode should turn out to be a rascal, Frank Hawley had a prophetic soul. I had it from a party who was an old chum of Bulstrode's. I'll tell you where I first picked him up, said Bambridge, with a sudden gesture of his forefinger. He was at larger sale, but I knew nothing of him then. He slipped through my fingers. It was after Bulstrode, no doubt. He tells me he can tap Bulstrode to any amount. Knows all his secrets. However, he blabbed to me at Bilkley. He takes a stiff glass. Damn if I think he meant to turn King's evidence, but he's that sort of bragging fellow. The bragging runs over hedge and ditch with him till he'd brag of a spaven as if it'd fetch money. A man should know when to pull up. Mr. Bambridge made this remark with an air of disgust, satisfied that his own bragging should a fine sense of the marketable. "'What's the man's name, and where can he be found?' said Mr. Hawley. "'As to where he's to be found, I left him at the Saracen's head, but his name is Raffles.' "'Raffles!' exclaimed Mr. Hopkins. "'I furnished his funeral yesterday. He was buried at Lowick. Mr. Bulstrode followed him. Very decent funeral.' There was a strong sensation among the listeners. Mr. Bambridge gave an ejaculation in which brimstone was the mildest word, and Mr. Hawley, knitting his brows and bending his head forward, exclaimed, "'What? Where did the man die?' "'At Stone Court,' said the draper. "'The housekeeper said he was a relation of the master's. "'He came there ill on Friday.' "'Why, it was on Wednesday I took a glass with him,' interposed Bambridge. "'Did any doctor attend him?' said Mr. Hawley. "'Yes. Mr. Lydgate. "'Mr. Bulstrode sat up with him one night. "'He died the third morning.' "'Go on, Bambridge,' said Mr. Hawley insistently. "'What did this fellow say about Bulstrode?' "'The group had already become larger.' the town clerk's presence being a guarantee that something worth listening to was going on there, and Mr. Bambridge delivered his narrative in the hearing of seven. It was mainly what we know, including the fact about Will Ladislaw, with some local colour added. It was what Bulstrode had dreaded the betrayal of, and hoped to have buried for ever with the corpse of Raffles. It was that haunting ghost of his earlier life, which, as he rode past the archway of the Green Dragon, he was trusting that Providence had delivered him from. Yes, Providence— he had not confessed to himself yet that he had done anything in the way of contrivance to this end. He had accepted what seemed to have been offered. It was impossible to prove that he had done anything which hastened the departure of that man's soul. But this gossip about Bulstrode spread through Middlemarch like the smell of fire. Mr. Frank Hawley followed up his information by sending a clerk, whom he could trust, to Stone Court on a pretext of inquiring about Hay, but really to gather all that could be learned about Raffles and his illness from Mrs. Abel. In this way it came to his knowledge that Mr. Garth had carried the man to Stone Court in his gig, and Mr. Hawley, in consequence, took an opportunity of seeing Caleb, calling at his office to ask whether he had time to undertake an arbitration, if it were required, and then asking him incidentally about Raffles. Caleb was betrayed into no word injurious to Bulstrode, beyond the fact which he was forced to admit, that he had given up acting for him within the last week. Mr. Hawley drew his references, and feeling convinced that Raffles had told his story to Garth, and that Garth had given up Bulstrode's affairs in consequence, said so a few hours later to Mr. Toller. The statement was passed on until it had quite lost the stamp of an inference, and was taken as information coming straight from Garth, so that even a diligent historian might have concluded Caleb to be the chief publisher of Bulstrode's misdemeanours. Mr. Hawley was not slow to perceive that there was no handle for the law either in the revelations made by Raffles or in the circumstances of his death. He had himself ridden to Lowick Village that he might look at the register and talk over the whole matter with Mr. Fairbrother, who was not more surprised than the lawyer that an ugly secret should have come to light about Bulstrode, though he had always had justice enough in him to hinder his antipathy from turning into conclusions. But while they were talking, another combination was silently going forward in Mr. Fairbrother's mind, which foreshadowed what was soon to be loudly spoken of in Middlemarch as a necessary putting of two and two together. With the reasons which kept Bulstrode in dread of Raffles, there flashed the thought that the dread might have something to do with his munificence towards his medical man, and though he resisted the suggestion that it had been consciously accepted in any way as a bribe, he had a foreboding that this complication of things might be of malignant effect on Lydgate's reputation. He perceived that Mr. Hawley knew nothing at present of the sudden relief from debt, and he himself was careful to glide away from all approaches toward the subject. "'Well,' he said, with a deep breath, wanting to wind up the illimitable discussion of what might have been, though nothing could be legally proven, "'it is a strange story.' So our mercurial Ladislaw has a queer genealogy. 
a high-spirited young lady and a musical polish patriot made a likely enough stock for him to spring from but i should never have suspected a grafting of the jew pawnbroker however there's no knowing what a mixture will turn out beforehand some sorts of dirt serve to clarify it's just what i should have expected said mr hawley mounting his horse any cursed alien blood jew corsican or gypsy i know he's one of your black sheep hawley but he is really a disinterested unworldly fellow said fairbrother smiling ay ay that is your wiggish twist said mr hawley who had been in the habit of saying apologetically that fairbrother was such a damned pleasant good-hearted fellow you would mistake him for a tory mr hawley rode home without thinking of lydgate's attendance on raffles in any other light than as a piece of evidence on the side of bulstrode but the news that lydgate had all at once become able not only to get rid of the execution in his house but to pay all his debts in middlemarch was spreading fast gathering round it conjectures and comments which gave it new body and impetus and soon filling the ears of other persons besides mr hawley who were not slow to see a significant relation between this sudden command of money and bulstrode's desire to stifle the scandal of raffles that the money came from bulstrode would infallibly have been guessed even if there had been no direct evidence of it for it had beforehand entered into the gossip about lydgate's affairs that neither his father-in-law nor his own family would do anything for him and direct evidence was furnished not only by a clerk at the bank but by innocent mrs bulstrode herself who mentioned the loan to mrs plymdale who mentioned it to her daughter-in-law of the house of toller who mentioned it generally the business was felt to be so public and important that it required dinners to feed it and many invitations were just then issued and accepted on the strength of this scandal concerning bulstrode and lydgate wives widows and single ladies took their work and went out to tea oftener than usual and all public conviviality from the green dragon to dollops gathered a zest which could not be won from the question whether the lords would throw out the reform bill for hardly anybody doubted that some scandalous reason or other was at the bottom of bulstrode's liberality to lydgate mr hawley indeed in the first instance invited a select party including the two physicians with mr toller and mr wrench expressly to hold a close discussion as to the probabilities of raffles's illness reciting to them all the particulars that the death was due to delirium tremens and the medical gentlemen who all stood undisturbedly on the old paths in relation to this disease declared that they could see nothing in these particulars which could be transformed into a positive ground of suspicion but the moral grounds of suspicion remained the strong motives bulstrode clearly had for wishing to be rid of raffles and the fact that at this critical moment he had given lydgate the help which he must for some time have known the need for the disposition moreover to believe that bulstrode would be unscrupulous and the absence of any indisposition to believe that lydgate might be as easily bribed as other haughty-minded men when they have found themselves in want of money even if the money had been given merely to make him hold his tongue about the scandal of bulstrode's earlier life the fact threw an odious light on lydgate who had long been sneered at as making himself subservient to the banker for the sake of working himself into predominance and discrediting the elder members of his profession hence in spite of the negative as to any direct sign of guilt in relation to the death at stone court mr hawley's select party broke up with the sense that the affair had an ugly look but this vague conviction of indeterminable guilt which was enough to keep up as much head-shaking and biting innuendo even among substantial professional seniors had for the general mind all the superior power of mystery over fact everybody liked better to conjecture how the thing was than simply to know it for conjecture soon became more confident than knowledge and had a more liberal allowance for the incompatible even the more definite scandal concerning bulstrode's earlier life was for some minds melted into the mass of mystery as so much lively metal to be poured out in dialogue and to take such fantastic shapes as heaven pleased this was the tone of thought chiefly sanctioned by mrs dollop the spirited landlady of the tankard in slaughter lane who had often to resist the shallow pragmatism of customers disposed to think that their reports from the outer world were of equal force with what had come up in her mind how it had been brought to her she didn't know but it was there before her as if it had been scored with a chalk on the chimney-board bulstrode should say he is inside that black as if the hairs of his head showed the thoughts of his heart he'd tear em up by the roots that's odd said mr limp a meditative shoemaker with weak eyes and a piping voice why i read in the trumpet that was what the duke of wellington said when he turned his coat and went over to the romans very like said mrs trollope if one rascal said it it's more reason why another should 
but hypocrite as he's been and old and things with that eye and as there was no parson in the country good enough for him he was forced to take old harry into his counsel and old harry's been too many for him ay ay he's a complice you can't send down the country said mr crabbe the glazier who gathered much news and groped among it dimly but what i can't make out it's there's them says bulstrode was for running away for fear of being found out before now he'll be drove away whether or no said mr dill the barber who had just dropped in i shaved fletcher hawley's clerk this morning he's got a bad finger and he says they're all of one mind to get rid of bulstrode mr thesiger is turned against him and wants him out of the parish and there's gentlemen in this town says they'd as soon dine with the fellow from the hulks and a deal sooner i would says fletcher for what's more against one's stomach than a man coming and making himself bad company with his religion and given out as the ten commandments were not enough for him and all the while he's worse than half the men at the treadmill fletcher said so himself it'll be a bad thing for the town though bulstrode's money gets out of it said mr limp quaveringly ah there's better folks spend their money worse said a firm voice dyer whose crimson hands looked out of keeping with his good-natured face but he won't keep his money by what i can make out said the glazier don't they say as there's somebody can strip it off him by what i can understand they could take every penny off him if they went to law in no such thing said the barber who felt himself a little above his company at dollops but liked it none the worse fletcher says it's no such thing he says they might prove over and over again whose child this young law was and they'd do no more than if they proved i came out of the fens he couldn't touch a penny look you there no said mrs dollop indignantly i thank the lord he took my children to himself if that's all the law can do for the motherless then by what it's no use your father and mother is but as to listening and what one lawyer says without asking another i wonder a man of your cleverness mr dill it's well known there's always two sides if no more else who'd go to law i should like to know it's a poor tale with all the laws there is up and down and if it's no use proving whose child you are fletcher may say that if he likes but i say don't you fletcher me mr dill affected to laugh in a complimentary way at mrs dollop as a woman who was more than a match for the lawyers being disposed to submit to too much twitting from a landlady who had a long score against him if they come to law and it's all true as folks say there's more to be looked to nor money said the glazier there's this poor creature is dead and gone by what i can make out he's seen the day when he was a deal finer gentleman nor bulstrode finer gentleman i'll warrant him said mrs dollop and a far personabler man by what i can hear as i said when mr baldwin the tax-gatherer comes in a stand and where you sit and says bulstrode got all his money as he brought into this town by thieving and swindling oh, i said you don't make me no wiser mr baldwin it set my blood a-creepin to look at him ever since the year he came into sotter lane a wantin to buy the house over my head folks don't look the colour a dough tub and stare at you as if they wanted to see into your backbone for nothink that was what i said and mr baldwin can bear me witness and in the rights of it too said mr crabbe for by what i can make out this raffles as they call him was a lusty fresh-coloured man as you'd wish to see and the best o' company though dead he lies in lowick churchyard sure enough but what i can understand there's them knows more than they should know about how he got there i'll believe you said mrs dollop with a touch of scorn at mr crabbe's apparent dimness when a man's been twice to a lone house and there's them that can pay for hospitals and nurses for half the countryside choose to be sitters up night and day and nobody come near but a doctor as is known to stick at nothing as poor as he can hang together and after that so flush o money he can pay off mr biles the butcher his bill has been running for the best o joints since last michaelmas was a twelfth month i don't want anybody to come and tell me there's been more going on nor the prayer book's got a service for i don't want to stand winking and blinking and thinking mrs dollop looked round with the air of a landlady accustomed to dominate her company there was a chorus of adhesion from the more courageous but mr limp after taking a draught placed his flat hands together and pressed them hard between his knees looking down at them with blear-eyed contemplation as if the scorching power of mrs dollop's speech had quite dried up and nullified his wits until they could be brought round again by further moisture why shouldn't they dig the man up and have the crowner said the dyer it's been done many and many's the time if there has been foul play they might find it out not they mr jonas said mrs dollop emphatically i know what doctors are they're a deal too cunning to be found out and this doctor lydgate that's been for cutting up everybody before the breath as well after their body it's plain enough what use he wanted to make a looking into respectable people's insides he knows drugs you may be sure as you can neither smell nor see neither before they're swallowed nor after why i've seen drops myself ordered by dr gambit as is our club doctor and a good character 
and has brought more live children into the world nor ever another in middlemarch i say i've seen drops myself as made no difference whether they was in the glass or out and yet have gripped you the next day so i'll leave your own sense to judge don't tell me all i say is it's a mercy they didn't take this dr lydgate on to our club as many a mother's child might a rude it the heads of this discussion at dollops had been the common theme among all classes in the town had been carried to lowick parsonage on one side and to tipton grange on the other had come fully to the ears of the vincey family and had been discussed with sad reference to poor harriet by all mrs bulstrode's friends before lydgate knew distinctly why people were looking strangely at him and before bulstrode himself suspected the betrayal of his secrets he had not been accustomed to very cordial relations with his neighbours and hence he could not miss the signs of cordiality moreover he had been taking journeys on business of various kinds having now made up his mind that he need not quit middlemarch and feeling able consequently to determine on matters which he had before left in suspense we will make a journey to cheltenham in the course of a month or two he had said to his wife there are great spiritual advantages to be had in that town along with the air and the waters and six weeks there will be eminently refreshing to us he really believed in the spiritual advantages and meant that his life henceforth should be the more devoted because of those latter sins which he represented to himself as hypothetic praying hypothetically for their pardon if i have herein transgressed as to the hospital he avoided saying anything further to lydgate fearing to manifest a too sudden change of plans immediately on the death of raffles in his secret soul he believed that lydgate suspected his orders to have been intentionally disobeyed and in suspecting this he must also suspect a motive but nothing had been betrayed to him as to the history of raffles and bulstrode was anxious not to do anything which would give emphasis to his undefined suspicions as to any certainty that a particular method of treatment would either save or kill lydgate himself was constantly arguing against such dogmatism he had no right to speak and he had every motive for being silent hence bulstrode felt himself providentially secured the only incident he had strongly winced under had been an occasional encounter with caleb garth who however had raised his hat with mild gravity meanwhile on the part of the principal townsman a strong determination was growing against him a meeting was to be held in the town hall on a sanitary question which had risen into pressing importance by the occurrence of a cholera case in the town since the act of parliament which had been hurriedly passed authorizing assessments for sanitary measures there had been a board for the superintendence of such measures appointed in middlemarch and much cleansing and preparation had been concurred by whigs and tories the question now was whether a piece of ground outside the town should be secured as a burial ground by means of assessment or by private subscription the meeting was to be open and almost everybody of importance in the town was expected to be there mr bulstrode was a member of the board and just before twelve o'clock he started from the bank with the intention of urging the plan of private subscription under the hesitation of his projects he had for some time kept himself in the background and he felt that he should this morning resume his old position as a man of action and influence in the public affairs of the town where he expected to end his days among the various persons going in the same direction he saw lydgate they joined talked over the object of the meeting and entered it together it seemed that everybody of mark had been earlier than they but there were still spaces left near the head of the large central table and they made their way thither mr fairbrother sat opposite not far from mr hawley all the medical men were there mr thesiger was in the chair and mr brooke of tipton on his right hand lydgate noticed a peculiar interchange of glances when he and bulstrode took their seats after the business had been fully opened by the chairman who pointed out the advantages of purchasing by subscription a piece of ground large enough to be ultimately used as a general cemetery Mr. Bulstrode, whose rather high-pitched but subdued and fluent voice the town was used to at meetings of this sort, rose and asked leave to deliver his opinion. Lydgate could see again the particular interchange of glances before Mr. Hawley started up and said in his firm, resonant voice, "'Mr. Chairman, I request that before any one delivers his opinion on this point, I may be permitted to speak on a question of public feeling, which not only by myself, but by many gentlemen present, is regarded as preliminary.' Mr. Hawley's mode of speech, even when public decorum oppressed his awful language, was formidable in its curtness and self-possession. Mr. Thesiger sanctioned the request, and Mr. Bulstrode sat down, and Mr. Hawley continued. "'In what I have to say, Mr. Chairman, I am not speaking simply on my own behalf. I am speaking with the concurrence and at the expressed request of no fewer than eight of my fellow-townsmen, who are immediately around us. 
it is our united sentiment that mr bulstrode should be called upon and i do now call upon him to resign public positions which he holds not simply as a taxpayer but as a gentleman among gentlemen there are practices and there are acts which owing to circumstances the law cannot visit though they may be worse than many things which are legally punishable honest men and gentlemen if they don't want the company of people who perpetrate such acts have got to defend themselves as best they can and that is what i and the friends whom i call my clients in this affair are determined to do i don't say that mr bulstrode has been guilty of shameful acts but i call upon him either publicly to deny and confute the scandalous statements made against him by a man now dead and who died in his house the statements that he was for many years engaged in nefarious practices and that he won his fortune by dishonest procedures or else to withdraw from positions which could only have been allowed him as a gentleman among gentlemen all eyes in the room were turned on mr bulstrode who since the first mention of his name had been going through a crisis of feeling almost too violent for his delicate frame to support lydgate who himself was undergoing a shock as from the terrible practical interpretation of some faint augury felt nevertheless that his own movement of resentful hatred was checked by that instinct of the healer which thinks first of bringing rescue or relief to the sufferer when he looked at the shrunken misery of bulstrode's livid face the quick vision that his life was after all a failure that he was a dishonoured man and must quail before the glance of those towards whom he had habitually assumed the aptitude of a reprover that god had disowned him before men and left him unscreened to the triumphant scorn of those who were glad to have their hatred justified the sense of utter futility in that equivocation with his conscience in dealing with the life of his accomplice an equivocation which now turned venomously upon him with the full-grown fang of a discovered lie all this rushed through him like the agony of terror which fails to kill and leaves the ear still open to the returning wave of execration the sudden sense of exposure after the re-established sense of safety came not to the coarse organization of a criminal but to the susceptible nerve of a man whose intensest being lay in such mastery and predominance as the conditions of his life had shaped for him but in that intense being lay the strength of reaction through all his bodily infirmity there ran a tenacious nerve of ambitious self-preserving will which had continuously leaped out like a flame scattering all doctrinal fears and which even while he sat an object of compassion for the merciful was beginning to stir and glow under his ashy paleness before the last words were out of mr holly's mouth bulstrode felt that he should answer and that his answer should be a retort he dared not get up and say i am not guilty the whole story is false even if he had dared this it would have seemed to him under his present keen sense of betrayal as vain as to pull for covering his nakedness a frail rag which would rend at every little strain for a few moments there was total silence while every man in the room was looking at bulstrode he sat perfectly still leaning hard against the back of his chair he could not venture to rise and when he began to speak he pressed his hands upon the seat on each side of him but his voice was perfectly audible though hoarser than usual and his words were distinctly pronounced though he paused between sentences as if short of breath he said turning first toward mr thesiger and then looking at mr hawley i protest before you sir as a christian minister against the sanctions of proceedings towards me which are dictated by virulent hatred those who are hostile to me are glad to believe any libel uttered by a loose tongue against me and their consciences become strict against me i say that the evil speaking of which i am to be made the victim accuses me of malpractices here bulstrode's voice rose and took on a more biting accent till it seemed a low cry who shall be my accuser not men whose own lives are unchristian nay scandalous not men who themselves who use low instruments to carry out their ends whose profession is a tissue of chicanery who have been spending their income on their own sensual enjoyments while i have been devoting mine to advance the best objects with regard to this life and the next after the word chicanery there was a growing noise half of murmurs and half of hisses while four persons started up at once mr hawley mr toller mr chichley and mr hackbutt but mr hawley's outburst was instantaneous and left the others behind in silence if you mean me sir i call on you and every one else to the inspection of my professional life as to christian or unchristian i repudiate your canting palavering christianity and as to the way in which i spend my income 
It is not my principle to maintain thieves and cheat offspring of their due inheritance in order to support religion and set myself up as a saintly killjoy. I affect no niceness of conscience. I have not found any nice standards necessary yet to measure your actions by, sir. And I again call upon you to enter into satisfactory explanations concerning the scandals against you, or else to withdraw from posts in which we at any rate decline you as a colleague. I say, sir, we decline to cooperate with a man whose character is not cleared from infamous lights cast upon it, not only by reports, but by recent actions. Allow me, Mr. Hawley, said the chairman, and Mr. Hawley, still fuming, bowed half impatiently and sat down with his hands thrust deep in his pockets. Mr. Bulstrode, it is not desirable, I think, to prolong the present discussion, said Mr. Thesiger, turning to the pallid, trembling man. I must so far concur with what has fallen from Mr. Hawley in expression of general feeling as to think it due to your Christian profession that you should clear yourself, if possible, from unhappy aspersions. I, for my part, should be willing to give you full opportunity in hearing, but I must say that your present attitude is painfully inconsistent with those principles which you have sought to identify yourself with, and for the honour of which I am bound to care, I recommend you at present, as your clergyman, and as one who hopes for your reinstatement in respect, to quit the room and avoid further hindrance to business. Mr. Bulstrode, after a moment's hesitation, took his hat from the floor and slowly rose, but he grasped the corner of the chair so totteringly that Lydgate felt sure there was not strength enough in him to walk away without support. What could he do? He could not see a man sink close to him for want of help. He rose and gave his arm to Bulstrode, and in that way led him out of the room. Yet this act, which might have been one of gentle duty and pure compassion, was at this moment unspeakably bitter to him. It seemed as if he were putting his sign-manual to that association of himself with Bulstrode, of which he now saw the full meaning, as it must have presented itself to other minds. He now felt the conviction that this man, who was leaning tremblingly on his arm, had given him the thousand pounds as a bribe, and that somehow the treatment of Raffles had been tampered with from an evil motive. The inferences were closely linked enough. The town knew of the loan, believed it to be a bribe, and believed that he took it as a bribe. Poor Lydgate, his mind struggling under the terrible clutch of this revelation, was all the while morally forced to take Mr. Bulstrode to the bank, send a man off for his carriage, and wait to accompany him home. Meanwhile the business of the meeting was dispatched, and fringed off into eager discussion among various groups concerning this affair of Bulstrode and Lydgate. Mr. Brooke, who had before heard only imperfect hints of it, and was very uneasy that he had gone a little too far in countenancing Bulstrode, now got himself fully informed, and felt some benevolent sadness in talking to Mr. Fairbrother about the ugly light in which Lydgate had come to be regarded. Mr. Fairbrother was going to walk back to Lowick. "'Step into my carriage,' said Mr. Brooke. "'I am going round to see Mrs. Casaubon. She was come back to Yorkshire last night. She would like to see me, you know.' So they drove along, Mr. Brooke chatting with good-natured hope that there had not really been anything black in Lydgate's behaviour, a young fellow whom he had seen to be quite above the common mark, when he brought a letter from his uncle Sir Godwin. Mr. Fairbrother said little. He was deeply mournful. With a keen perception of human weakness, he could not be confident that under the pressure of humiliating needs Lydgate had not fallen below himself. When the carriage drove up to the gate of the manor, Dorothea was out on the gravel, and came to greet them. "'Well, my dear,' said Mr. Brooke, "'we have just come from a meeting, a sanitary meeting, you know.' "'Was Mr. Lydgate there?' said Dorothea, who looked full of health and animation, and stood with her head bare under the gleaming April lights. "'I want to see him, and have a great consultation with him about the hospital. I have engaged with Mr. Bulstrode to do so.' "'Oh, my dear,' said Mr. Brooke, "'we have been hearing bad news, bad news, you know.' They walked through the garden towards the churchyard gate, Mr. Fairbrother wanting to go on to the parsonage, and Dorothea heard the whole sad story. She listened with deep interest, and begged to hear twice over the facts and impressions concerning Lydgate. After a short silence, pausing at the churchyard gate and addressing Mr. Fairbrother, she said energetically, "'You don't believe that Mr. Lydgate is guilty of anything base? I will not believe it. Let us find out the truth and clear him.'" End of chapter 71 End of book 7《This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Middlemarch by George Eliot. 
as read for LibriVox by Madame Tusk, www.rlowalrus.sitesled.com. Book Eight, Sunset and Sunrise, Chapter Seventy Two. Full souls are double mirrors, making still an endless vista of fair things before, repeating things behind. Dorothy's impetuous generosity, which would have leaped at once to the vindication of Lydgate from the suspicion of having accepted money as a bribe, underwent a melancholy check when she came to consider all the circumstances of the case by the light of Mr. Fairbrother's experience. "'It is a delicate matter to touch,' he said. "'How can we begin to inquire into it? It must be either publicly by setting the magistrate and coroner to work, or privately by questioning Lydgate.' As to the first proceeding, there is no solid ground to go upon, else Hawley would have adopted it, and as to opening the subject with Lydgate, I confess I should shrink from it. He would probably take it as a deadly insult. I have more than once experienced the difficulty of speaking to him on personal matters, and one should know the truth about his conduct beforehand to feel very confident of a good result. I feel convinced that his conduct has not been guilty. I believe that people are almost always better than their neighbours think they are said Dorothea. Some of her intensest experience in the last two years had set her mind strongly in opposition to any unfavourable construction of others, and for the first time she felt rather discontented with Mr. Fairbrother. She disliked this cautious weighing of consequences, instead of an ardent faith in efforts of justice and mercy, which would conquer by their emotional force. Two days afterwards he was dining at the manor with her uncle and the Chettams, and when dessert was standing uneaten, the servants were out of the room, and Mr. Brooke was nodding in a nap, she returned to the subject with renewed vivacity. Lydgate would understand that if his friends hear a calamity about him, their first wish must be to justify him. What do we live for if it is not to make life less difficult to each other? I cannot be indifferent to the troubles of a man who advised me in my trouble, and attended me in my illness. Dorothea's tone and manner were not more energetic than they had been when she was at the head of her uncle's table nearly three years before, and her experience since had given her more right to express a decided opinion. But Sir James Chedham was no longer the diffident and acquiescent suitor. He was the anxious brother-in-law, with a devout admiration for his sister, but with a constant alarm lest she should fall under some new illusion almost as bad as marrying Casbon. He smiled much less when he said, exactly, it was more often an introduction to a dissident opinion than in those submissive bachelor days, and Dorothea found to her surprise that she had to resolve not to be afraid of him, all the more because he was really her best friend. He disagreed with her now. "'But, Dorothea,' he said remonstrantly, "'you can't undertake to manage a man's life for him in that way. Lydgate must know. At least he will soon come to know how he stands. If he can clear himself, he will. He must act for himself. I think his friends must wait till they find an opportunity.' added Mr. Fairbrother. It is possible, I have often felt so much weakness in myself, that I can conceive even a man of honourable disposition, such as I have always believed Lydgate to be, succumbing to such a temptation as that of accepting money which was offered, more or less indirectly as a bribe, to ensure his silence about scandalous facts long gone by. I say I can conceive this, if he were under the pressure of hard circumstances, if he had been harassed, as I feel sure Lydgate has been. I would not believe anything worse of him, except under stringent proof, but there is the terrible nemesis following on some errors, that it is always possible for those who like it to interpret them into a crime. There is no proof in favour of the man outside his own consciousness and assertion. "'Oh, how cruel!' said Dorothea, clasping her hands. "'And would you not like to be the one person who believed in that man's innocence, if the rest of the world belied him? Besides, there is a man's character beforehand to speak for him.' "'But, my dear Mrs. Casabon, said Mr. Fairbrother, smiling gently at her ardour, "'character is not caught in marble. It is not something solid and unalterable. It is something living and changing, and may become diseased, as our bodies do. "'Then it may be rescued and healed,' said Dorothea. "'I should not be afraid of asking Mr. Lydgate to tell me the truth, that I might help him. Why should I be afraid? Now that I am not to have the land, James, I might do as Mr. Bulstrode proposed, and take his place in providing for the hospital.' and I have to consult Mr. Lydgate to know thoroughly what are the prospects of doing good by keeping up the present plans. There is the best opportunity in the world for me to ask for his confidence, and he would be able to tell me things which might make all the circumstances clear. Then we would all stand by him and bring him out of his trouble. People glorify all sorts of bravery except the bravery they might show on behalf of their nearest neighbours. 
Dorothea's eyes had a moist brightness in them, and the changed tones of her voice roused her uncle, who began to listen. "'It is true that a woman may venture on some efforts of sympathy, which would hardly succeed if we men undertook them,' said Mr. Fairbrother, almost converted by Dorothea's ardour. "'Surely a woman is bound to be cautious, and listen to those who know the world better than she does,' said Sir James, with his little frown. "'Whatever you do in the end, Dorothea, you should really keep back at present, and not volunteer any meddling with this Bulstrode business. We don't know yet what may turn up. You must agree with me,' he ended, looking at Mr. Fairbrother. "'I do think it would be better to wait,' said the latter. "'Yes, yes, my dear,' said Mr. Brooke, not quite knowing at what point the discussion had arrived, but coming up to it with a contribution which was generally appropriate. "'It is easy to go too far, you know. You must not let your ideas run away with you. And as to being in a hurry to put your money into schemes, it won't do, you know. Garth has drawn me in uncommonly with repairs and draining, that sort of thing. I'm uncommonly out of pocket with one thing or another. I must pull up. As for you, Chatham, you are spending a fortune on those oak fences round your domain.' Dorothea, submitting uneasily to this discouragement, went with Celia into the library, which was her usual drawing-room. "'Now, Dodo, do listen to what James says,' said Celia, "'else you will be getting into a scrape. You always did, and you always will, when you set about doing as you please. And I think it is a mercy now, after all, that you have got James to think for you. He lets you have your plans, only he hinders you from being taken in, and that is the good of having a brother instead of a husband. A husband would not let you have your plans. "'As if I wanted a husband!' said Dorothea. "'I only want not to have my feelings checked at every turn.' Mrs. Casabon was still undisciplined enough to burst into angry tears. "'Not really, Dodo,' said Celia, with rather a deeper guttural than usual. "'You are contradictory. First one thing, and then another. You used to submit to Mr. Casabon quite shamefully. I think you would have given up ever coming to see me if he had asked you.' "'Of course I submitted to him, because it was my duty. It was my feeling for him,' said Dorothea, looking through the prism of her tears. "'Then why can't you think it your duty to submit a little to what James wishes?' said Celia, with a sense of stringency in her argument. "'Because he only wishes what is for your own good. And, of course, men know best about everything, except what women know better.' Dorothea laughed and forgot her tears. "'Well, I mean about babies and those things.' explained Celia. I should not give up to James when I knew he was wrong, as you used to do to Mr. Casabon. End of chapter 72
there are episodes in most men's lives in which their highest qualities can only cast a deterring shadow over the objects that fill their inward vision lydgate's tender-heartedness was present just then only as a dread lest he should offend against it not as an emotion that swayed him to tenderness for he was very miserable only those who know the supremacy of the intellectual life the life which has a seed of ennobling thought and purpose within it can understand the grief of one who falls from that serene activity into the absorbing soul-wasting struggle with worldly annoyances how was he to live on without vindicating himself among people who suspected him of baseness how could he go silently away from middlemarch as if he were retreating before a just condemnation and yet how was he to set about vindicating himself for that scene at the meeting which he had just witnessed although it had told him no particulars had been enough to make his own situation thoroughly clear to him bulstrode had been in dread of scandalous disclosures on the part of raffles lydgate could now construct all the probabilities of the case he was afraid of some betrayal in my hearing all he wanted was to bind me to him by a strong obligation that was why he passed on a sudden from hardness to liberality and he may have tampered with the patient he may have disobeyed my orders i fear he did but whether he did or not the world believes that he somehow or other poisoned the man and that i winked at the crime if i didn't help in it and yet and yet he may not be guilty of the last offence and it is just possible that the change towards me may have been a genuine relenting the effect of second thoughts such as he alleged what we call the just possible is sometimes true and the thing we find it easier to believe is grossly false in his last dealings with this man bulstrode may have kept his hands pure in spite of my suspicion to the contrary there was a benumbing cruelty in his position even if he renounced every other consideration than that of justifying himself if he met shrugs cold glances and avoidance as an accusation and made a public statement of all the facts as he knew them who would be convinced it would be playing the part of a fool to offer his own testimony on behalf of himself and say i did not take the money as a bribe the circumstances would always be stronger than his assertion and besides to come forward and tell everything about himself must include declarations about bulstrode which would darken the suspicions of others against him he must tell that he had not known of raffles existence when he first mentioned his pressing need of money to bulstrode and that he took the money innocently as a result of that communication not knowing that a new motive for the loan might have arisen on his being called into this man and after all the suspicion of bulstrode's motives might be unjust but then came the question whether he should have acted in precisely the same way if he had not taken the money certainly if raffles had continued alive and susceptible of further treatment when he arrived and he had then imagined any disobedience to his orders on the part of bulstrode he would have made a strict inquiry and if his conjecture had been verified he would have thrown up the case in spite of his recent heavy obligation but if he had not received any money if bulstrode had never revoked his cold recommendation of bankruptcy would he lydgate have abstained from all inquiry even on finding the man dead would the shrinking from an insult to bulstrode would the dubiousness of all medical treatment and the argument that his own treatment would pass for the wrong with most members of his profession have had just the same force or significance with him that was the uneasy corner of lydgate's consciousness while he was reviewing the facts and resisting all reproach if he had been independent this matter of a patient's treatment and the distinct rule that he must do or see done that which he believed best for the life committed to him would have been the point on which he would have been the sturdiest 
as it was he had rested in the consideration that disobedience to his orders however it might have arisen could not be considered a crime that in the dominant opinion obedience to his orders was just as likely to be fatal and that the affair was simply one of etiquette whereas again and again in his time of freedom he had denounced the perversion of pathological doubt into moral doubt and had said the purest experiment in treatment may still be conscientious my business is to take care of life and to do the best i can think of for it science is properly more scrupulous than dogma dogma gives a character to mistake but the very breath of science is a contest with mistake and must keep the conscience alive alas the scientific conscience had got into the debasing company of money obligation and selfish respects is there a medical man of them all in middlemarch who would question himself as i do said poor lydgate with a renewed outburst of rebellion against the oppression of his lot and yet they will all feel warranted in making a wide space between me and them as if i were a leper my practice and my reputation are utterly damned i can see that even if i could be cleared by valid evidence it would make little difference to the blessed world here i have been set down as tainted and should be cheapened to them all the same already there had been abundant signs which had hitherto puzzled him that just when he had been paying off his debts and cheerfully on his feet the townsmen were avoiding him or looking strangely at him and in two instances it came to his knowledge that patients of his had called in another practitioner the reasons were too plain now the general blackballing had begun no wonder that in lydgate's energetic nature the sense of a hopeless misconstruction easily turned into a dogged resistance the scowl which occasionally showed itself on his square brow was not a meaningless accident already when he was re-entering the town after that ride taken in the first hours of stinging pain he was setting his mind on remaining in middlemarch in spite of the worst that could be done against him he would not retreat before calumny as if he submitted to it he would face it to the utmost and no act of his should show that he was afraid it belonged to the generosity as well as defiant force of his nature that he resolved not to shrink from showing to the full his sense of obligation to bulstrode it was true that the association with this man had been fatal to him true that if he had had the thousand pounds still in his hands with all his debts unpaid he would have returned the money to bulstrode and taken beggary rather than the rescue which had been sullied with the suspicion of a bribe for he remembered he was one of the proudest among the sons of men nevertheless he would not turn away from this crushed fellow mortal whose aid he had used and make a pitiful effort to get acquittal for himself by howling against another i shall do as i think right and explain to nobody they will try to starve me out but he was going on with an obstinate resolve but he was getting near home and the thought of rosamond urged itself again into that chief place from which it had been thrust by the agonized struggles of wounded honor and pride how would rosamond take it all here was another weight of chain to drag and poor lydgate was in a bad mood for bearing her dumb mastery he had no impulse to tell her the trouble which must soon be common to them both he preferred waiting for the incidental disclosure which events must soon bring about end of chapter 73 recording by red abras february 2008
mercifully grant that we may grow aged together. Book of Tobit, Marriage Prayer in Middlemarch a wife could not long remain ignorant that the town held a bad opinion of her husband. No feminine intimate might carry her friendship so far as to make a plain statement to the wife of the unpleasant fact known or believed about her husband. But when a woman with her thoughts much at leisure got them suddenly employed on something grievously disadvantageous to her neighbours, various moral impulses were called into play which tended to stimulate utterance candor was one to be candid in middlemarch phraseology meant to use an early opportunity of letting your friends know that you did not take a cheerful view of their capacity their conduct or their position and a robust candor never waited to be asked for its opinion then again there was the love of truth a wide phrase but meaning in this relation a lively objection to seeing a wife look happier than her husband's character warranted or manifest too much satisfaction in her lot the poor thing should have some hint given her that if she knew the truth she would have less complacency in her bonnet and in light dishes for a supper party stronger than all there was the regard for a friend's moral improvement sometimes called her soul, which was likely to be benefited by remarks tending to gloom, uttered with the accompaniment of pensive staring at the furniture and a manner implying that the speaker would not tell what was on her mind, from regard to the feelings of her hearer. On the whole, one might say that an ardent charity was at work setting the virtuous mind to make a neighbor unhappy for her good. There were hardly any wives in Middlemarch whose matrimonial misfortunes would in different ways be likely to call forth more of this moral activity than Rosamond and her aunt Bulstrode. Mrs. Bulstrode was not an object of dislike, and had never consciously injured any human being. Men had always thought her a handsome, comfortable woman, and had reckoned it among the signs of Bulstrode's hypocrisy that he had chosen a red-blooded Vincy instead of a ghastly and melancholy person suited to his low esteem for earthly pleasure. When the scandal about her husband was disclosed, they remarked of her, Ah, poor woman, she is as honest as the day. She never suspected anything wrong in him. You may depend on it. Women who were intimate with her talked together much of poor Harriet, imagined what her feelings must be when she came to know everything, and conjectured how much she had already come to know. There was no spiteful disposition towards her. Rather, there was a busy benevolence anxious to ascertain what it would be well for her to feel and do under the circumstances which, of course, kept the imagination occupied with her character and history from the times when she was Harriet Vincy till now. With the review of Mrs. Bulstrode and her position, it was inevitable to associate Rosamond, whose prospects were under the same blight with her aunt's. Rosamond was more severely criticised and less pitied, though she, too, as one of the good old Vincy family, who had always been known in Middlemarch, was regarded as a victim to marriage with an interloper. The Vincies had their weaknesses, but then they lay on the surface. There was never anything bad to be found out concerning them. Mrs. Bulstrode was vindicated from any resemblance to her husband. Harriet's faults were her own. She has always been showy, said Mrs. Hackbutt, making tea for a small party though she has got into the way of putting her religion forward to conform to her husband she has tried to hold her head up above middlemarch by making it known that she invites clergymen and heaven knows who from riverstone and those places we can hardly blame her for that said mrs prague because few of the best people in the town cared to associate with bulstrode and she must have somebody to sit down at her table Mr. Thesiger has always countenanced him, said Mrs. Hackbutt. I think he must be sorry now. But he was never fond of him in his heart, 
that every one knows said mrs tom toller mr thesiger never goes into extremes he keeps to the truth in what is evangelical it is only clergymen like mr dyke who want to use dissenting hymn books and that low kind of religion who ever found bullshot to their taste i understand mr dyke is in great distress about him said mrs hackbutt and well he may be they say the bullshots have half kept the dyke family and of course it is a discredit to his doctrines said mrs sprag who was elderly and old fashioned in her opinions people will not make a boast of being methodistical in middle march for a good while to come i think we must not set down people's bad actions to their religion said falcon faced mrs plimdale who had been listening hitherto oh my dear we are forgetting said mrs sprag we ought not to be talking of this before you i am sure i have no reason to be partial said mrs plimdale coloring it is true mr plimdale has always been on good terms with mr bulshod and harriet vincy was my friend long before she married him but i have always kept my own opinions and told her where she was wrong poor thing still in point of religion i must say mr bulshod might have done what he has and worse and yet have been a man of no religion i don't say that there has not been a little too much of that i like moderation myself but truth is truth the men tried at the assizes are not all over religious i suppose well said mrs hackbutt wheeling adroitly all i can say is that i think she ought to separate from him i can't say that said mrs sprag she took him for better or worse you know but worse can never mean finding out that your husband is fit for newgate said mrs hackbutt fancy living with such a man i should expect to be poisoned yes i think myself it is an encouragement to crime if such men are to be taken care of and waited on by good wives said mrs tom toller and a good wife poor harriet has been said mrs plimdale she thinks her husband the first of men it is true he has never denied her anything well we shall see what she will do said mrs hackbutt i suppose she knows nothing yet poor creature i do hope and trust i shall not see her for i should be frightened to death lest i should say anything about her husband do you think any hint has reached her i should hardly think so said mrs tom toller we hear that he is ill and has never stirred out of the house since the meeting on thursday but she was with her girls at church yesterday and they had new tuscan bonnets her own had a feather in it i have never seen that her religion made any difference in her dress she wears very neat pattern always said mrs plimdale a little stung and that feather i know she got dyed a pale lavender on purpose to be consistent i must say it of harriet that she wishes to do right as to her knowing what has happened it can't be kept from her long said mrs hackbutt the vincies know for mr vincie was at the meeting it will be a great blow to him there is his daughter as well as his sister yes indeed said mrs sprag nobody supposes that mr lidgate can go on holding up his head in middle march things look so black about the thousand pounds he took just at the man's death it really makes one shudder pride must have a fall said mrs hackbutt i'm not so sorry for rosamond vincy that was as i am for her aunt said mrs plimdale she needed a lesson i suppose the bulshots will go and live abroad somewhere said mrs sprag that is what is generally done when there is anything disgraceful in a family and a most deadly blow it will be to harriet said mrs plimdale if ever a woman was crushed she will be i pity her from my heart and with all her faults few women are better from a girl she had the neatest ways and was always good-hearted and as open as the day 
you might look into her drawers when you would always the same and so she has brought up kate and ellen you may think how hard it will be for her to go among foreigners the doctor says that is what he should recommend the lydgates to do said mrs sprague he says lydgate ought to have kept among the french that would suit her well enough i dare say said miss plimdale there is that kind of lightness about her but she got that from her mother she never got it from her aunt bulstrode who always gave her good advice and to my knowledge would rather have had her marry elsewhere mrs plimdale was in a situation which caused her some complication of feeling there had been not only her intimacy with mrs bulstrode but also a profitable business relation of the great plimdale dying house with mr bulstrode which on the one hand would have inclined her to desire that the mildest view of his character should be the true one but on the other made her the more afraid of seeming to palliate his culpability again the late alliance of her family with the tollers had brought her in connection with the best circle which gratified her in every direction except in the inclination to those serious views which she believed to be the best in another sense the sharp little woman's conscience was somewhat troubled in the adjustment of these opposing bests and of her griefs and satisfactions under late events which were likely to humble those who needed humbling but also to fall heavily on her old friend whose faults she would have preferred seeing on a background of prosperity poor mrs bulstrode meanwhile had been no further shaken by the oncoming tread of calamity than in the busier stirring of that secret uneasiness which had always been present in her since the last visit of raffles to the shrubs that the hateful man had come ill to stone court and that her husband had chosen to remain there and watch over him she allowed to be explained by the fact that raffles had been employed and aided in earlier days and that this made a tie of benevolence towards him in his degraded helplessness and she had been since then innocently cheered by her husband's more hopeful speech about his own health and ability to continue his attention to business the calm was disturbed when lydgate had brought him home ill from the meeting and in spite of comforting assurances during the next few days she cried in private from the conviction that her husband was not suffering from bodily illness merely but from something that afflicted his mind he would not allow her to read him and scarcely to sit with him alleging nervous susceptibility to sounds and movements yet she suspected that in shutting himself up in his private room he wanted to be busy with his papers something she felt sure had happened perhaps it was some great loss of money and she was kept in the dark not daring to question her husband she said to lydgate on the fifth day after the meeting when she had not left home except to go to church mr lydgate pray be open with me i like to know the truth has anything happened to mr bulstrode some little nervous shock said lydgate evasively he felt that it was not for him to make the painful revelation but what brought it on said mrs bulstrode looking directly at him with her large dark eyes there is often something poisonous in the air of public rooms said lydgate strong men can stand it but it tells on people in proportion to the delicacy of their systems it is often impossible to account for the precise moment of an attack or rather to say why the strength gives way at a particular moment mrs bulstrode was not satisfied with this answer there remained in her the belief that some calamity had befallen her husband and of which she was to be kept in ignorance and it was in her nature strongly to object to such concealment she begged leave for her daughters to sit with their father and drove into the town to pay some visits conjecturing that if anything were known to have gone wrong in mr bulstrode's affairs she should see or hear from sign of it she called on mrs thisiger who was not at home and then drove to mrs hackbutt's on the other side of the churchyard 
Mrs. Hackbutt saw her coming from an upstairs window, and remembering her former alarm lest she should meet Mrs. Bulstrode, felt almost bound in consistency to send word that she was not at home. But against that, there was a sudden strong desire within her for the excitement of an interview in which she was quite determined not to make the slightest allusion to what was in her mind. Hence Mrs. Bulstrode was shown into the drawing-room, and Mrs. Hackbutt went to her. With more tightness of lip and rubbing of her hands than was usually observable in her, these being precautions adopted against freedom of speech, she was resolved not to ask how Mr. Bulstrode was. I have not been anywhere except to church for nearly a week, said Mrs. Bulstrode, after a few introductory remarks. But Mr. Bulstrode was taken so ill at the meeting on Thursday that I have not liked to leave the house. Mrs. Hackbutt rubbed the back of one hand with the palm of the other, held against her chest, and let her eyes ramble over the pattern on the rug. Was Mr. Hackbutt at the meeting? persevered Mrs. Bulstrode. Yes, he was, said Mrs. Hackbutt, with the same attitude. The land is to be bought by subscription, I believe. Let us hope that there will be no more cases of cholera to be buried in it, said Mrs. Bulstrode. It is an awful visitation, but I always think Middlemarch a very healthy spot. I suppose it is being used to it from a child, but I never saw the town I should like to live at better, and especially our end. I am sure I should be glad that you always should live at Middlemarch, Mrs. Bulstrode, said Mrs. Hackbutt, with a slight shy. Still, we must learn to resign ourselves, wherever our lot may be cast. Though I am sure there will always be people in this town who will wish you well. Mrs. Hackbutt longed to say, If you take my advice, you will part from your husband. But it seemed clear to her that the poor woman knew nothing of the thunder ready to bolt on her head, and she herself could do no more than prepare her a little. Mrs. Bulstrode felt suddenly rather chill and trembling. There was evidently something unusual behind the speech of Mrs. Hackbutt's, but though she had set out with the desire to be fully informed, she found herself unable now to pursue her brave purpose, and turning the conversation by an inquiry about the young Hackbutt's, she soon took her leave, saying that she was going to see Mrs. Plimdale. On her way thither she tried to imagine that there might have been some unusually warm sparring at the meeting between Mr. Bulstrode and some of his frequent opponents. Perhaps Mr. Hackbutt might have been one of them. That would account for everything. But when she was in conversation with Mrs. Plimdale, that comforting explanation seemed no longer tenable. Selina received her with a pathetic affectionateness and a disposition to give edifying answers on the commonest topics, which could hardly have reference to any ordinary quarrel of which the most important consequence was a perturbation of Mr. Bulstrode's health. Beforehand, Mrs. Bulstrode had thought that she would sooner question Mrs. Plimdale than any one else but she found to her surprise that an old friend is not always the person whom it is easiest to make a confident of there was the barrier of remembered communication under other circumstances there was the dislike of being pitied and informed by one who had been long wont to allow her the superiority for certain words of mysterious appropriateness that Mrs. Plimdale let fall about her resolution never to turn her back on her friends, convinced Mrs. Bulstrode that what had happened must be some kind of misfortune, and instead of being able to say with her native directness, What is it that you have in your mind? she found herself anxious to get away before she had heard anything more explicit. She began to have an agitating certainty that the misfortune was something more than the mere loss of money, being keenly sensitive to the fact that Selina now, just as Mrs. Hackbutt had done before, avoided noticing what she said about her husband as they would have avoided noticing a personal blemish. She said good-bye with nervous haste and told the coachman to drive to Mr. Vincey's warehouse. 
In that short drive her dread gathered so much force from the sense of darkness that when she entered the private counting-house, where her brother sat at his desk, her knees trembled and her usually florid face was deathly pale. Something of the same effect was produced in him by the sight of her. He rose from his seat to meet her, took her by the hand and said, with his impulsive rashness, "'God help you, Harriet! You know all!' That moment was perhaps worse than any which came after. It contained that concentrated experience which in great crisis of emotion reveals the bias of a nature, and is prophetic of the ultimate act which will end an intermediate struggle. Without that memory of Raffles, she might still have thought only of monetary ruin. But now, along with her brother's look and words, there darted into her mind the idea of some guilt in her husband. Then, under the working of terror came the image of her husband exposed to disgrace. And then, after an instant of scorching shame in which she felt only the eyes of the world, with one leap of her heart she was at his side in mournful but unreproaching fellowship with shame and isolation. All this went on within her in a mere flash of time, while she sank into the chair and raised her eyes to her brother, who stood over her. "'I know nothing, Walter. What is it?' she said faintly. He told her everything, very inartificially, in slow fragments, making her aware that the scandal went much beyond proof, especially as to the end of Raffles. "'People will talk,' he said. Even if a man has been acquitted by a jury, they will talk, and nod and wink, and as far as the world goes, a man might often as well be guilty as not. It is a breakdown blow, and it damages Lydgate as much as Bullstrode. I don't pretend to say what is the truth. I only wish we had never heard the name of either Bullstrode or Lydgate. You would better have been a Vincy all your life, and so had Rosamond. Mrs. Bulstrode made no reply. But you must bear up as well as you can, Harriet. People don't blame you. And I will stand by you whatever you make up your mind to do, said the brother, with rough but well-meaning affectionateness. Give me your arm to the carriage, Walter, said Mrs. Bulstrode. I feel very weak. And when she got home, she was obliged to say to her daughter, I am not well, my dear. I must go and lie down. Attend to your papa. Leave me in quiet. I shall take no dinner. She locked herself in her room. She needed time to get used to her maimed consciousness, her poor lopped life, before she could walk steadily to the place allotted her. A new searching light had fallen on her husband's character, and she could not judge him leniently. The twenty years in which she had believed in him and venerated him by virtue of his concealments came back with particulars that made them seem an odious deceit. He had married her with that bad past life hidden behind him, and she had no faith left to protest his innocence of the worst that was imputed to him. Her honest, ostentatious nature made the sharing of a merited dishonour as bitter as it could be to any mortal. But this imperfectly taught woman, whose phrases and habits were an odd patchwork, had a loyal spirit within her. The man whose prosperity she had shared through nearly half a life, and who had unvaryingly cherished her, now that punishment had befallen him, it was not possible to her in any sense to forsake him. There is a forsaking which still sits at the same board and lies on the same couch with the forsaken soul, withering it the more by unloving proximity. She knew when she locked her door that she should unlock it ready to go down to her unhappy husband and espouse his sorrow and say of his guilt, I will mourn and not reproach but she needed time to gather up her strength. She needed to sob out her farewell to all the gladness and pride of her life. When she had resolved to go down, she prepared herself by some little acts which might seem mere folly to a hard onlooker. 
they were her way of expressing to all spectators visible or invisible that she had begun a new life in which she embraced humiliation she took off all her ornaments and put on a plain black gown and instead of wearing her much adorned cap and large bows of hair she brushed her hair down and put on a plain bonnet cap which made her look suddenly like an early methodist bulstrode who knew that his wife had been out and had come in saying that she was not well had spent the time in an agitation equal to hers he had looked forward to her learning the truth from others and had acquiesced in that probability as something easier to him than any confession but now that he imagined the moment of her knowledge come he awaited the result in anguish his daughters had been obliged to consent to leave him and though he had allowed some food to be brought to him he had not touched it he felt himself perishing slowly in unpitied misery perhaps he should never see his wife's face with affection in it again and if he turned to god there seemed to be no answer but the pressure of retribution it was eight o'clock in the evening before the door opened and his wife entered he dared not look up at her he sat with his eyes bent down and as she went towards him she thought he looked smaller he seemed so withered and shrunken a movement of new compassion and old tenderness went through her like a great wave and putting one hand on his which rested on the arm of the chair and the other on his shoulder she said solemnly but kindly look up nicholas he raised his eyes with a little start and looked at her half amazed for a moment her pale face her changed morning dress the trembling about her mouth all said i know and her hands and eyes rested gently on him he burst out crying and they cried together she sitting at his side they could not yet speak to each other of the shame which she was bearing with him or of the acts which had brought it down on them his confession was silent and her promise of faithfulness was silent open-minded as she was she nevertheless shrank from the words which would have expressed their mutual consciousness as she would have shrunk from flakes of fire she could not say how much is only slander and false suspicion and he did not say i am innocent end of chapter 74 Recording by Red Abras, February 2008
the hard and contemptuous words which had fallen from her husband in his anger had deeply offended that vanity which he had at first called into active enjoyment and what she regarded as his perverse way of looking at things kept up a secret repulsion which made her receive all his tenderness as a poor substitute for the happiness he had failed to give her they were at a disadvantage with their neighbours and there was no longer any outlook towards quallingham there was no outlook anywhere except in an occasional letter from will ladislaw she had felt stung and disappointed by will's resolution to quit middlemarch for in spite of what she knew and guessed about his admiration for dorothea she secretly cherished the belief that he had or would necessarily come to have much more admiration for herself rosamond being one of those women who live much in the idea that each man they meet would have preferred them if the preference had not been hopeless mrs cosabon was all very well but will's interest in her dated before he knew mrs lydgate Rosamond took his way of talking to herself, which was a mixture of playful, fault-finding, and hyperbolical gallantry, as the disguise of a deeper feeling, and in his presence she felt that agreeable titillation of vanity and sense of romantic drama, which Lydgate's presence had no longer the magic to create. She even fancied, what will not men and women fancy in these matters? that will exaggerated his admiration for mrs cosabon in order to pique herself in this way poor rosamond's brain had been busy before will's departure he would have made she thought a much more suitable husband for her than she had found in lydgate no notion could have been falser than this for rosamond's discontent in her marriage was due to the conditions of marriage itself to its demand for self-suppression and tolerance, and not to the nature of her husband. But the easy conception of an unreal better had a sentimental charm which diverted her ennui. She constructed a little romance which was to vary the flatness of her life. Will Ladislaw was always to be a bachelor and live near her, always to be at her command, and have an understood though never fully expressed passion for her which would be sending out lambent flames every now and then in interesting scenes. His departure had been a proportionate disappointment, and had sadly increased her weariness of Middlemarch, but at first she had the alternative dream of pleasures in store from her intercourse with the family at Quallingham. Since then the troubles of her married life had deepened, and the absence of other relief encouraged her regretful rumination over that thin romance which she had once fed on. Men and women make sad mistakes about their own symptoms, taking their vague uneasy longings sometimes for genius, sometimes for religion, and oftener still for a mighty love. Will Ladislaw had written chatty letters, half to her and half to Lydgate, and she had replied their separation. She felt was not likely to be final, and the change she now most longed for was that Lydgate should go to live in London. Everything would be agreeable in London, and she had set to work with quiet determination to win this result, when there came a sudden delightful promise which inspirited her. It came shortly before the memorable meeting at the town hall, and was nothing less than a letter from Will Ladislaw to Lydgate, which turned indeed chiefly on his new interest in plans of colonization, but mentioned incidentally that he might find it necessary to pay a visit to Middlemarch within the next few weeks. A very pleasant necessity, he said, almost as good as holidays to a schoolboy. He hoped there was his old place on the rug and a great deal of music in store for him, but he was quite uncertain as to the time. While Lydgate was reading the letter to Rosamond, her face looked like a reviving flower. It grew prettier and more blooming. There was nothing unendurable now. The debts were paid, Mr. Ladislaw was coming, and Lydgate would be persuaded to leave Middlemarch and settle in London, which was so different from a provincial town. That was a bright bit of morning, but soon the sky became black over poor Rosamond. 
the presence of a new gloom in her husband about which he was entirely reserved towards her for he dreaded to expose his lacerated feeling to her neutrality and misconception soon received a painfully strange explanation alien to all her previous notions of what could affect her happiness in the new gaiety of her spirits thinking that lydgate had merely a worse fit of moodiness than usual causing him to leave her remarks unanswered and evidently to keep out of her way as much as possible she chose a few days after the meeting and without speaking to him on the subject to send out notes of invitation for a small evening party feeling convinced that this was a judicious step since people seemed to have been keeping aloof from them and wanted restoring to the old habit of intercourse when the invitations had been accepted she would tell lydgate and give him a wise admonition as to how a medical man should behave to his neighbours for rosamond had the gravest little airs possible about other people's duties but all the invitations were declined and the last answer came into lydgate's hand this is cheechley's scratch what is he writing to you about said lydgate wonderingly as he handed the note to her she was obliged to let him see it and looking at her severely he said why on earth have you been sending out invitations without telling me rosamond i beg i insist that you will not invite any one to this house i suppose you have been inviting others and they have refused too she said nothing do you hear me thundered lydgate yes certainly i hear you said rosamond turning her head aside with the movement of a graceful long-necked bird lydgate tossed his head without any grace and walked out of the room feeling himself dangerous rosamond's thought was that he was getting more and more unbearable not that there was any new special reason for this peremptoriness his indisposition to tell her anything in which he was sure beforehand that she would not be interested was growing into an unreflecting habit and she was in ignorance of everything connected with the thousand pounds except that the loan had come from her uncle bulstrode lydgate's odious humours and their neighbours apparent avoidance of them had an unaccountable date for her in their relief from money difficulties if the invitations had been accepted she would have gone to invite her mamma and the rest whom she had seen nothing of for several days and she now put on her bonnet to go and inquire what had become of them all suddenly feeling as if there were a conspiracy to leave her in isolation with a husband disposed to offend everybody it was after the dinner hour and she found her father and mother seated together alone in the drawing-room they greeted her with sad looks saying well my dear and no more she had never seen her father look so downcast and seating herself near him she said is there anything the matter papa he did not answer but mrs vincey said oh my dear have you heard nothing it won't be long before it reaches you is it anything about tertius said rosamond turning pale the idea of trouble immediately connected itself with what had been unaccountable to her in him oh my dear yes to think of your marrying into this trouble that was bad enough but this will be worse stay stay lucy said mr vincey have you heard nothing about your uncle bulstrode rosamond no papa said the poor thing feeling as if trouble were not anything she had before experienced but some invisible power with an iron grasp that made her soul faint within her her father told her everything saying at the end it's better for you to know my dear i think lydgate must leave the town things have gone against him i dare say he couldn't help it i don't accuse him of any harm said mr vincey he had always before been disposed to find the utmost fault with lydgate the shock to rosamond was terrible it seemed to her that no lot could be so cruelly hard as hers to have married a man who had become the centre of infamous suspicions in many cases it is inevitable that the shame is felt to be the worst part of crime and it would have required a great deal of disentangling reflection 
such as had never entered into Rosamond's life, for her in these moments to feel that her trouble was less than if her husband had been certainly known to have done something criminal. All the shame seemed to be there, and she had innocently married this man with the belief that he and his family were a glory to her. She sowed her usual reticence to her parents, and only said that if Lydgate had done as she wished, he would have left Middlemarch long ago. She bears it beyond anything, said her mother when she was gone. Ah, thank God, said Mr. Vincey, who was much broken now. But Rosamond went home with a sense of justified repugnance towards her husband. What had he really done? How had he really acted? She did not know. Why had he not told her everything? He did not speak to her on the subject, and of course she could not speak to him. It came into her mind once that she would ask her father to let her go home again. But dwelling on that prospect made it seem utter dreariness to her. A married woman, gone back to live with her parents, life seemed to have no meaning for her in such a position. She could not contemplate herself in it. The next two days Lydgate observed a change in her, and believed that she had heard the bad news. Would she speak to him about it, or would she go on forever in the silence which seemed to imply that she believed him guilty? We must remember that he was in a morbid state of mind, in which almost all contact was pain. Certainly Rosamond in this case had equal reason to complain of reserve and want of confidence on his part but in the bitterness of his soul he excused himself. Was he not justified in shrinking from the task of telling her, since now she knew the truth, she had no impulse to speak to him? But a deeper lying consciousness that he was in fault made him restless, and the silence between them became intolerable to him. It was as if they were both adrift on one piece of wreck and looked away from each other. He thought, I am a fool. Haven't I given up expecting anything? I have married care, not help. And that evening he said, Rosamond, have you heard anything that distresses you? Yes, she answered, laying down her work, which she had been carrying on with a languid, semi-conscious, most unlike her usual self. What have you heard? Everything, I suppose. Papa told me. That people think me disgraced? Yes, said Rosamond, faintly, beginning to sue again automatically. There was silence, Lydgate thought. If she has any trust in me, any notion of what I am, she ought to speak now and say that she does not believe I have deserved disgrace. But Rosamond on her side went on, moving her fingers languidly. Whatever was to be said on the subject, she expected to come from Tertius. What did she know? and if he were innocent of any wrong, why did he not do something to clear himself? This silence of hers brought a new rush of gall to that bitter mood in which Lydgate had been saying to himself that nobody believed in him, even Fairbrother had not come forward. He had begun to question her with the intent that their conversation should disperse the chill fog which had gathered between them but he felt his resolution checked by despairing resentment. Even this trouble, like the rest, she seemed to regard as if it were hers alone. He was always to her a being apart, doing what she objected to. He started from his chair with an angry impulse, and thrusting his hands in his pockets, walked up and down the room. There was an underlying consciousness all the while that he should have to master this anger, and tell her everything, and convince her of the facts. For he had almost learned the lesson that he must bend himself to her nature, and that because she came short in her sympathy, he must give more. Soon he recurred to his intention of opening himself. The occasion must not be lost. If he could bring her to feel with some solemnity, that here was a slander which must be met and not run away from, and that the whole trouble had come out of his desperate want of money, it would be a moment for urging powerfully on her that they should be one in the resolve to do with as little money as possible, so that they might weather the bad time and keep themselves independent. 
he would mention the definite measures which he desired to take and win her to a willing spirit he was bound to try this and what else was there for him to do he did not know how long he had been walking uneasily backwards and forwards but rosamond felt that it was long and wished that he would sit down she too had begun to think this an opportunity for urging on tertius what he ought to do whatever might be the truth about all this misery there was one dread which asserted itself lydgate at last seated himself not in his usual chair but in one nearer to rosamond leaning aside in it towards her and looking at her gravely before he reopened the sad subject he had conquered himself so far and was about to speak with a sense of solemnity as on an occasion which was not to be repeated he had even opened his lips when rosamond letting her hands fall looked at him and said surely tertius well surely now at last you have given up the idea of staying in middlemarch i cannot go on living here let us go to london papa and every one else says you had better go whatever misery i have to put up with it will be easier away from here lydgate felt miserably jarred instead of that critical outpouring for which he had prepared himself with effort here was the old round to be gone through again he could not bear it with a quick change of countenance he rose and went out of the room perhaps if he had been strong enough to persist in his determination to be the more because she was less that evening might have had a better issue if his energy could have borne down that check he might still have wrought on rosamond's vision and will we cannot be sure that any natures however inflexible or peculiar will resist this effect from a more massive being than their own they may be taken by storm and for the moment converted becoming part of the soul which enwraps them in the ardor of its movement but poor lydgate had a throbbing pain within him and his energy had fallen short of its task the beginning of mutual understanding and resolve seemed as far off as ever nay it seemed blocked out by the sense of unsuccessful effort they lived on from day to day with their thoughts still apart lydgate going about what work he had in a mood of despair and rosamond feeling with some justification that he was behaving cruelly it was of no use to say anything to tertius but when will ladislaw came she was determined to tell him everything in spite of her general reticence she needed some one who would recognize her wrongs End of chapter 75 Recording by Red Abrus February 2008all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Red Abras. Middle March by George Eliot. Chapter 76 To mercy, pity, peace, and love, all pray in their distress, and to these virtues of delight return their thankfulness. For mercy has a human heart, pity a human face, and love the human form divine, and peace the human dress. William Blake, Songs of Innocence Some days later, Lydgate was riding to Lowick Manor in consequence of a summons from Dorothea. The summons had not been unexpected, since it had followed a letter from Mr. Bulstrode, in which he stated that he had resumed his arrangements for quitting Middlemarch, and must remind Lydgate of his previous communications about the hospital, to the purport of which he still adhered. It had been his duty, before taking further steps, to reopen the subject with Mrs. Cossabon, 
who now wished, as before, to discuss the question with Lydgate. "'Your views may possibly have undergone some change,' wrote Mr. Bulstrode, "'but in that case also it is desirable that you should lay them before her.' Dorothea awaited his arrival with eager interest. Though in deference to her masculine advisers, she had refrained from what Sir James had called interfering in this Bulstrode business. The hardship of Lydgate's position was continually in her mind, and when Bulstrode applied to her again about the hospital, she felt that the opportunity was come to her which she had been hindered from hastening. In her luxurious home, wandering under the boughs of her own great trees, her thought was going out over the lot of others, and her emotions were imprisoned. The idea of some active good within her reach haunted her like a passion, and another's need having once come to her as a distinct image preoccupied her desire with the yearning to give relief, and made her own ease tasteless. She was full of confident hope about this interview with Lydgate, never heeding what was said of his personal reserve, never heeding that she was a very young woman. Nothing could have seemed more irrelevant to Dorothea than insistence on her youth and sex when she was moved to show her human fellowship. As she sat waiting in the library, she could do nothing but live through again all the past scenes which had brought Lydgate into her memories. They all owed their significance to her marriage and its troubles. But no, there were two occasions in which the image of Lydgate had come painfully in connection with his wife and someone else. The pain had been allayed for Dorothea, but it had left in her an awakened conjecture as to what Lydgate's marriage might be to him, a susceptibility to the slightest hint about Mrs. Lydgate. These thoughts were like a drama to her, and made her eyes bright and gave an attitude of suspense to her whole frame, though she was only looking out from the brown library onto the turf and the bright green buds which stood in relief against the dark evergreens. When Lydgate came in, she was almost shocked at the change in his face, which was strikingly perceptible to her who had not seen him for two months. It was not the change of emaciation, but that effect which even young faces will very soon show from the persistent presence of resentment and despondency. Her cordial look, when she put out her hand to him, softened his expression, but only with melancholy. "'I have wished very much to see you for a long while, Mr. Lydgate,' said Dorothea, when they were seated, opposite each other. But I put off asking you to come until Mr. Bulstrode applied to me again about the hospital. I know that the advantage of keeping the management of it separate from that of the infirmary depends on you, or at least on the good which you are encouraged to hope for from having it under your control. And I am sure you will not refuse to tell me exactly what you think." "'You want to decide whether you should give a generous support to the hospital?' said Lilgate. "'I cannot conscientiously advise you to do it in dependence on any activity of mine. "'I may be obliged to leave the town.' "'He spoke curtly, feeling the ache of despair as to his being able to carry out any purpose "'that Rosamond had set her mind against. "'Not because there is no one to believe in you?' said Dorothea pouring out her words in clearness from a full heart. I know the unhappy mistakes about you. I knew them from the first moment to be mistakes. You have never done anything vile. You would not do anything dishonorable. It was the first assurance of belief in him that had fallen on Lydgate's ears. He drew a deep breath and said, Thank you. He could say no more. It was something very new and strange in his life that these few words of trust from a woman should be so much to him. "'I beseech you to tell me how everything was,' said Dorothea fearlessly. "'I am sure that the truth would clear you.' Lydgate started up from his chair and went towards the window, forgetting where he was. 
he had so often gone over in his mind the possibility of explaining everything without aggravating appearances that would tell perhaps unfairly against bulstrode and had so often decided against it he had so often said to himself that his assertions would not change people's impressions that dorothea's words sounded like a temptation to do something which in his soberness he had pronounced to be unreasonable tell me pray said dorothea with simple earnestness then we can consult together it is wicked to let people think evil of any one falsely when it can be hindered lydgate turned remembering where he was and saw dorothea's face looking up at him with a sweet trustful gravity the presence of a noble nature generous in its wishes ardent in its charity changes the lights for us we begin to see things again in their larger quieter masses and to believe that we too can be seen and judged in the wholeness of our character that influence was beginning to act on lydgate who had for many days been seeing all life as one who is dragged and struggling amid the throng he sat down again and felt that he was recovering his old self in the consciousness that he was with one who believed in it i don't want he said to bear hard on bulstrode who has lent me money of which i was in need though i would rather have gone without it now he is hunted down and miserable and has only a poor thread of life in him but i should like to tell you everything it will be a comfort to me to speak where belief has gone beforehand and where i shall not seem to be offering assertions of my own honesty you will feel what is fair to another as you feel what is fair to me do trust me said dorothea i will not repeat anything without your leave but at the very least i could say that you have made all the circumstances clear to me and that i know you were not in any way guilty mr fairbrother would believe me and my uncle and sir james chetham nay there are persons in middlemarch to whom i could go although they don't know much of me they would believe me they would know that i could have no other motive than truth and justice i would take any pains to clear you i have very little to do there's nothing better that i can do in the world dorothea's voice as she made this childlike picture of what she would do might have been almost taken as a proof that she could do it effectively the searching tenderness of her woman's tones seemed made for a defence against ready accusers lydgate did not stay to think that she was quixotic he gave himself up for the first time in his life to the exquisite sense of leaning entirely on a generous sympathy without any check of proud reserve as he told her everything from the time when under the pressure of his difficulties he unwillingly made his first application to bulstrode gradually in the relief of speaking getting into a more thorough utterance of what had gone in his mind entering fully into the fact that his treatment of the patient was opposed to the dominant practice into his doubts at the last his ideal of medical duty and his uneasy consciousness that the acceptance of the money had made some difference in his private inclination and professional behavior though not in his fulfillment of any publicly recognized obligation it has come to my knowledge since he added that holly sent someone to examine the housekeeper at stone court and she said that she gave the patient all the opium in the phial i left as well as a good deal of brandy but that would not have been opposed to ordinary prescriptions even of the first rate men the suspicions against me had no hold there they are grounded on the knowledge that i took money that bulstrode had strong motives for wishing the man to die and that he gave me the money as a bribe to concur in some malpractices or other against the patient that in any case i accepted a bribe to hold my tongue they are just the suspicions that cling the most obstinately because they lie in people's inclination and can never be disproved how my orders came to be disobeyed is a question to which i don't know the answer 
It is still possible that Bulstrode was innocent of any criminal intention, even possible that he had nothing to do with the disobedience, and merely abstained from mentioning it. But all that has nothing to do with the public belief. It is one of those cases on which a man is condemned on the ground of his character. It is believed that he has committed a crime in some undefined way, because he had the motive for doing it. And Bulstrode's character has enveloped me, because I took his money. I am simply blighted, like a damaged ear of corn. The business is done, and can't be undone. Oh, it is hard, said Dorothea. I understand the difficulty there is in your vindicating yourself, and that all this should have come to you who had meant to lead a higher life than the common, and to find out better ways. I cannot bear to rest in this as unchangeable. I know you meant that. I remember what you said to me when you first spoke to me about the hospital. There is no sorrow I have thought more about than that, to love what is great, and to try to reach it, and yet to fail. Yes, said Lydgate, feeling that here he had found room for the full meaning of his grief. I had some ambition. I meant everything to be different with me. I thought I had more strength and mastery. But the most terrible obstacles are such as nobody can see except oneself. Suppose, said Dorothea meditatively, suppose we kept on the hospital according to the present plan and you stayed here though only with the friendship and support of a few the evil feeling towards you would gradually die out there would come opportunities in which people would be forced to acknowledge that they had been unjust to you because they would see that your purpose were pure you may still win a great fame like the louis and lenac i have heard you speak of and we shall all be proud of you she ended with a smile that might do if I had my old trust in myself, said Lydgate, mournfully. Nothing galls me more than the notion of turning round and running away before this slander, leaving it unchecked behind me. Still, I cannot ask anyone to put a great deal of money into a plan which depends on me. It would be quite worth my while, said Dorothea simply. Only think. I am very uncomfortable with my money, because they tell me I have too little for any great scheme of the sort I like best, and yet I have too much. I don't know what to do. I have seven hundred a year of my own fortune, and nineteen hundred a year that Mr. Cossabon left me, and between three and four thousand of ready money in the bank. I wished to raise money and pay it off gradually out of my income, which I don't want, to buy land with and found a village which should be a school of industry. But Sir James and my uncle have convinced me that the risk would be too great. So you see that what I should most rejoice at would be to have something good to do with my money. I should like it to make other people's lives better to them. It makes me very uneasy, coming all to me who don't want it. A smile broke through the gloom of Lydgate's face. The childlike, grey-eyed earnestness with which Dorothea said all this was irresistible, blent into an adorable whole while her ready understanding of high experience. Of lower experience, such as plays a great part in the world, poor Mrs. Cossabon had a very blurred, short-sighted knowledge, little helped by her imagination but she took the smile as encouragement of her plan. I think you see now that you spoke too scrupulously, she said, in a tone of persuasion. The hospital would be one good, and making your life quite whole and well again would be another. Lydgate's smile had died away. You have the goodness as well as the money to do all that, if it could be done, he said. But... He hesitated a little while, looking vaguely towards the window, and she sat in silent expectation. At last he turned towards her and said impetuously, Why should I not tell you? You know what sort of bond marriage is. You will understand everything. Dorothea felt her heart beginning to beat faster. 
Had he that sorrow too? But she feared to say any word, and he went on immediately. It is impossible for me now to do anything, to take any step, without considering my wife's happiness. The thing that I might like to do if I were alone is become impossible to me. I can't see her miserable. She married me without knowing what she was going into, and it might have been better for her if she had not married me. I know, I know, you could not give her pain, if you were not obliged to do it, said Dorothea, with keen memory of her own life. And she has set her mind against staying. She wishes to go. The troubles she has had here have wearied her, said Lydgate, breaking off again, lest he should say too much. But when she saw the good that might come of staying, said Dorothea remonstrantly, looking at Lydgate as if he had forgotten the reasons which had just been considered. He did not speak immediately. She would not see it, he said at last curtly, feeling at first that this statement must do without explanation. And indeed I have lost all spirit about carrying on my life here. He paused a moment, and then, following the impulse to let Dorothea see deeper into the difficulty of his life, he said, The fact is, this trouble has come upon her confusedly. We have not been able to speak to each other about it. I am not sure what is in her mind about it. She may fear that I have really done something base. It is my fault. I ought to be more open. But I have been suffering cruelly. May I go and see her? said Dorothea eagerly. Would she accept my sympathy? I would tell her that you have not been blamable before any one's judgment but your own. I would tell her that you shall be cleared in every fair mind. I would cheer her heart. Will you ask her if I may go to see her? I did see her once. I am sure you may, said Lydgate, seizing the proposition with some hope. She would feel honoured, cheered, I think, by the proof that you at least have some respect for me. I will not speak to her about your coming, that she may not connect it with my wishes at all. I know very well that I ought not to have left anything to be told her by others, but... He broke off, and there was a moment's silence. Dorothea refrained from saying what was in her mind. How well she knew that there might be invisible barriers to speech between husband and wife. This was a point on which even sympathy might make a wound. She returned to the more outward aspect of Lydgate's position, saying cheerfully, And if Mrs. Lydgate knew that there were friends who would believe in you and support you, she might then be glad that you should stay in your place and recover your hopes and do what you meant to do. Perhaps then you would see that it was right to agree with what I proposed about your continuing at the hospital. Surely you would, if you still have faith in it as a means of making your knowledge useful? Lydgate did not answer, and she saw that he was debating with himself. You need not decide immediately, she said gently. A few days hence it will be early enough for me to send my answer to Mr. Bulstrode. Lydgate still waited, but at last turned to speak in his most decisive tones. No, I prefer that there should be no interval left for wavering. I am no longer sure enough of myself. I mean of what it would be possible for me to do under the changed circumstances of my life. It would be dishonorable to let others engage themselves to anything serious in dependence on me. I might be obliged to go away after all. I see little chance of anything else. The whole thing is too problematic. I cannot consent to be the cause of your goodness being wasted. No. Let the new hospital be joined with the old infirmary, and everything go on as it might have done if I had never come. I have kept a valuable register since I have been there. I shall send it to a man who will make use of it. He ended bitterly. I can think of nothing for a long while but getting an income. It hurts me very much to hear you speak so hopelessly, said Dorothea. 
It would be a happiness to your friends who believe in your future, in your power to do great things, if you would let them save you from that. Think how much money I have. It would be like taking a burden from me if you took some of it every year till you got free from this fettering want of income. Why should not people do these things? It is so difficult to make shares at all even. This is one way. God bless you, Mrs. Gossiborn said Lydgate, rising as if with the same impulse that made his words energetic, and resting his arm on the back of the great leather chair he had been sitting in. It is good that you should have such feelings, but I am not the man who ought to allow himself to benefit by them. I have not given guarantees enough. I must not at least sink into the degradation of being pensioned for work that I never achieved. It is very clear to me that I must not count on anything else than getting away from Middlemarch as soon as I can manage it. I should not be able for a long while at the very best to get an income here, and it is easier to make necessary changes in a new place. I must do as other men do, and think what will please the world and bring in money. Look for a little opening in the London crowd, and push myself set up in a watering place or go to some southern town where there are plenty of idle english and get myself puffed that is the sort of shell i must creep into and try to keep my soul alive in now that is not brave said dorothea to give up the fight no it is not brave said lydgate but if a man is afraid of creeping paralysis then in another tone yet you have made a great difference in my courage by believing in me everything seems more bearable since i have talked to you and if you can clear me in a few other minds especially in fair brothers i shall be deeply grateful the point i wish you not to mention is the fact of disobedience to my orders that would soon get distorted after all, there is no evidence for me but people's opinion of me beforehand. You can only repeat my own report of myself. Mr. Fairbrother will believe, others will believe, said Dorothea. I can say of you what will make it stupidity to suppose that you would be bribed to do a wickedness. I don't know, said Lydgate, with something like a groan in his voice. I have not taken a bribe yet. But there is a pale shade of bribery which is sometimes called prosperity. You will do me another great kindness then, and come to see my wife? Yes, I will. I remember how pretty she is, said Dorothea, into whose mind every impression about Rosamond had cut deep. I hope she will like me. As Lydgate rode away, he thought, this young creature has a heart large enough for the Virgin Mary. She evidently thinks nothing of her own future, and would pledge away half her income at once, as if she wanted nothing for herself but a chair to sit in, from which she can look down with those clear eyes at the poor mortals who pray to her. She seems to have what I never saw in any woman before, a fountain of friendship towards men. A man can make a friend of her. Cossabon must have raised some heroic hallucination in her. I wonder if she could have any other sort of passion for a man. Ladislaw? There was certainly an unusual feeling between them, and Cossabon must have had a notion of it. Well, her love might help a man more than her money. Dorothea, on her side, had immediately formed a plan of relieving Lydgate from his obligation to Bulstrode, which she felt sure was a part, though small, of the galling pressure he had to bear. She sat down at once under the inspiration of their interview and wrote a brief note, in which she pleaded that she had more claim than Mr. Bulstrode had to the satisfaction of providing the money which had been serviceable to Lydgate but it would be unkind in Lydgate not to grant her the position of being his helper in this small matter, the favour being entirely to her who had so little that was plainly marked out for her to do with her superfluous money. 
He might call her a creditor or by any other name if it did, but imply that he granted her request. She enclosed a check for a thousand pounds and determined to take the letter with her the next day when she went to see Rosamond. End of chapter 76 Recording by Red Abras February 2008Chapter 77 Middlemarch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Middlemarch by George Eliot. Chapter 77 And thus thy fall hath left a kind of blot to mark the full fraught man and best endued with some suspicion. Henry V. The next day Lydgate had to go to Brassing, and told Rosamond that he should be away until the evening. Of late she had never gone beyond her own house and garden, except to church, and once to see her papa, to whom she said, "'If Tertius goes away you will help us to move, will you not, papa? I suppose we shall have very little money. I'm sure I hope some one will help us.' And Mr. Vincey had said, "'Yes, child, I don't mind a hundred or two. I can see the end of that.' With these exceptions she had sat at home in languid melancholy and suspense, fixing her mind on Will Ladislaw's coming as the one point of hope and interest, and associating this with some new urgency on Lydgate's to make immediate arrangements for leaving Middlemarch and going to London, till she felt assured that the coming would be a potent cause of the going, without at all seeing how. This way of establishing sequence is too common to be fairly regarded as a peculiar folly in Rosamond, and it is precisely this sort of sequence which causes the greatest shock when it is sundered, for to see how an effect may be produced is often to see possible missings and checks, but to see nothing except the desirable cause, and close upon it the desirable effect, rids us of doubt and makes our minds strongly intuitive. That was the process going on in poor Rosamond while she arranged all objects around her with the same nicety as ever, only with more slowness, or sat down to the piano meaning to play, and then desisting, yet lingering on the music-stool with her white fingers suspended on the wooden front, and looking before her in dreamy ennui. Her melancholy had become so marked that Lydgate felt a strange timidity before it, as a perpetual silent reproach and the strong man, mastered by his keen sensibilities towards this fair, fragile creature, whose life he seemed somehow to have bruised, shrank from her look, and sometimes started at her approach. Fear of her, and fear for her rushing in only the more forcibly after it, had been momentarily expelled by exasperation. But this morning Rosamond descended from her room upstairs, where she sometimes sat the whole day while Lydgate was out, equipped for a walk in the town. She had a letter to post— a letter addressed to Mr. Ladislaw, and written with charming discretion, but intended to hasten his arrival by a hint of trouble. The servant-maid, their sole house-servant now, noticed her coming downstairs in her walking-dress, and thought, "'There never did anybody look so pretty in a bonnet, poor thing!' Meanwhile Dorothea's mind was filled with her project of going to Rosamond, and with the many thoughts, both of the past and the probable future, which gathered around the idea of that visit. Until yesterday, when Lydgate had opened to her a glimpse of some trouble in his married life, the image of Mrs. Lydgate had always been associated for her with that of Will Ladislaw. Even in her most uneasy moments, even when she had been agitated by Mrs. Cadwallader's painfully graphic report of gossip, her effort, nay, her strongest impulsive prompting, had been towards the vindication of Will from any sullying surmises and when, in her meeting with him afterwards, she had at first interpreted his words as a probable allusion to a feeling towards Mrs. Lydgate, which he was determined to cut himself off from indulging, she had a quick, sad, excusing vision of the charm there might be in his constant opportunities of companionship with that fair creature, who most likely shared his other tastes, as she evidently did his delight in music. But there had followed his parting words— the few passionate words in which he had implied that she herself was the object of whom his love held him in dread, that it was his love for her only which he was resolved not to declare, but to carry away into banishment. 
From the time of that parting, Dorothea, believing in Will's love for her, believing with a proud delight in his delicate sense of honour and his determination that no one should impeach him justly, felt her heart quite at rest as to the regard he might have for Mrs. Lydgate. She was sure that the regard was blameless. There are natures in which, if they love us, we are conscious of having a sort of baptism and consecration. They bind us over to rectitude and purity by their pure belief about us, and our sins become that worst kind of sacrilege which tears down the invisible altar of trust. If you are not good, none is good. Those little words may give a terrific meaning to responsibility, may hold a vitriolic intensity for remorse. Dorothea's nature was of that kind. Her own passionate fault lay along the easily counted open channels of her ardent character, and while she was full of pity for the visible mistakes of others, she had not yet any material within her experience for subtle constructions and suspicions of hidden wrong. But that simplicity of hers, holding up an ideal for others in her believing conception of them, was one of the great powers of her womanhood, and it had from the first acted strongly on Will Ladislaw. He felt, when he parted from her, that the brief words by which he had tried to convey to her his feeling about herself, and the division which her fortune made between them, would only profit by their brevity when Dorothea had to interpret them. He felt that in her mind he had found his highest estimate. And he was right there. In the months since their parting Dorothea had felt a delicious, though sad, repose in their relation to each other, as one which was inwardly whole and without blemish. She had an active force of antagonism within her, when the antagonism turned on the defence either of plans or persons that she believed in, and the wrongs which she felt that Will had received from her husband, and the external conditions which to others were grounds for slighting him, only gave the more tenacity to her affection and admiring judgment. And now, with the disclosures about Bulstrode, had come another fact affecting Will's social position, which roused afresh Dorothea's inward resistance to what was said about him in that part of her world, which lay within Park Pollings. Young Ladislaw, the grandson of a thieving Jew pawnbroker, was a phrase which had entered emphatically into the dialogues about the Bulstrode business at Lowick, Tipton, and Freshet, and was a worse kind of placard on poor Will's back than the Italian with white mice. Upright Sir James Chatham was convinced that his own satisfaction was righteous when he thought, with some complacency, that here was an added league to that mountainous distance between Ladislaw and Dorothea, which enabled him to dismiss any anxiety in that direction as too absurd. And perhaps there had been some pleasure in pointing Mr. Brooke's attention to this ugly bit of Ladislaw's genealogy, as a fresh candle for him to see his own folly by. Dorothea had observed the animus with which Will's part in the painful story had been recalled more than once, but she had uttered no word, being checked now, as she had not been formerly in speaking of Will, by the consciousness of a deeper relation between them, which must always remain in consecrated secrecy. But her silence shrouded her resistant emotion into a more thorough glow. And this misfortune in Will's lot, which, it seemed, others were wishing to fling at his back as an opprobrium, only gave something more of enthusiasm to her clinging thought. She entertained no visions of their ever coming into nearer union, and yet she had taken no posture of renunciation. She had accepted her whole relation to Will very simply, as part of her marriage sorrows, and would have thought it very sinful in her to keep up an inward wail, because she was not completely happy, being rather disposed to dwell on the superfluities of her lot. She could bear that the chief pleasures of her tenderness should lie in memory, and the idea of marriage came to her solely as a repulsive proposition from some suitor of whom she at present knew nothing, but whose merits, as seen by her friends, would be a source of torment to her. "'Somebody who will manage your property for you, my dear,' was Mr. Brooke's attractive suggestion of suitable characteristics. "'I should like to manage it myself if I knew what to do with it,' said Dorothea. No, she had heard to her declaration that she would never be married again, and in the long valley of her life, which looked so flat and empty of waymarks, guidance would come as she walked along the road, and saw her fellow passengers by the way. This habitual state of feeling about Will Ladislaw had been strong in all her waking hours since she had proposed to pay a visit to Mrs. Lydgate, making a sort of background against which she saw Rosamond's figure, presented to her without hindrances to her interest and compassion. 
There was evidently some mental separation, some barrier to complete confidence which had arisen between this wife and the husband who had yet made her happiness a law to him. That was a trouble which no third person must directly touch. But Dorothea thought with deep pity of the loneliness which must have come upon Rosamond from the suspicions cast on her husband, and there would surely be help in the manifestation of respect for Lydgate and sympathy with her. "'I shall talk to her about her husband.' thought Dorothea, as she was being driven towards the town. The clear spring morning, the scent of the moist earth, the fresh leaves just showing their creased-up wealth of greenery from out their half-open sheaths, seemed part of the cheerfulness she was feeling from a long conversation with Mr. Fairbrother, who had joyfully accepted the justifying explanation of Lydgate's conduct. "'I shall take Mrs. Lydgate good news, and perhaps she will like to talk to me and make a friend of me.' Dorothea had another errand in Lowick Gate. It was about a new, fine-toned bell for the schoolhouse, and as she had to get out of her carriage very near to Lydgate's, she walked thither across the street, having told the coachman to wait for some packages. The street door was open, and the servant was taking the opportunity of looking out at the carriage which was pausing within sight, when it became apparent to her that the lady who belonged to it was coming towards her. "'Is Mrs. Lydgate at home?' said Dorothea. "'I'm not sure, my lady.' "'I'll see, if you'll please to walk in,' said Martha, a little confused on the score of her kitchen apron, but collected enough to be sure that Mum was not the right title for this queenly young widow with a carriage and pair. "'Will you please to walk in, and I'll go and see?' "'Say that I am Mrs. Casabon, said Dorothea, as Martha moved forward, intending to show her into the drawing-room, and then to go upstairs to see if Rosamond had returned from her walk." They crossed the broader part of the entrance hall, and turned up the passage, which led to the garden. The drawing-room door was unlatched, and Martha, pushing it without looking into the room, waited for Mrs. Casabon to enter, and then turned away, the door having swung open and swung back again without noise. Dorothea had less of outward vision than usual this morning, being filled with images of things as they had been and were going to be. She found herself on the other side of the door without seeing anything remarkable but immediately she heard a voice, speaking in low tones, which startled her as with a sense of dreaming in daylight, and advancing unconsciously a step or two beyond the projecting slab of a bookcase, she saw, in the terrible illumination of a certainty which filled up all outlines, something which made her pause, motionless, without self-possession enough to speak. Seated with his back toward her on a sofa, which stood against the wall on a line with the door, by which she had entered, she saw Will Ladislaw close by him and turned towards him with a flushed tearfulness which gave a new brilliancy to her face sat rosamond her bonnet hanging back while will leaning towards her clasped both her upraised hands in his and spoke with low-toned fervour rosamond in her agitated absorption had not noticed the silently advancing figure but when Dorothea, after the first immeasurable instant of this vision, moved confusedly backward and found herself impeded by some piece of furniture, Rosamond was suddenly aware of her presence, and with a spasmodic movement snatched away her hands and rose, looking at Dorothea, who was unnecessarily arrested. Will Ladislaw, starting up, looked round also, and meeting Dorothea's eyes with a new lightning in them, seemed changing to marble. But she immediately turned them away from him to Rosamond, and said in a firm voice, "'Excuse me, Mrs. Lydgate. The servant did not know that you were here. I called to deliver an important letter for Mr. Lydgate, which I wish to put into your own hands.' She laid down the letter on the small table which had checked her retreat, and then, including Rosamond and Will, in one distant glance and bow, she went quickly out of the room, meeting in the passage the surprised Martha, who said she was sorry the mistress was not at home, and then showed the strange lady out, with an inward reflection that grand people were probably more impatient than others.' Dorothea walked across the street with her most elastic step, and was quickly in her carriage again. "'Drive on to Freshet Hall,' she said to the coachman, and any one looking at her might have thought that, though she was paler than usual, she was never animated by a more self-possessed energy, and that was really her experience. It was as if she had drunk a great draught of scorn that stimulated her beyond the susceptibility to other feelings. She had seen something so far below her belief— that her emotions rushed back from it, and made an excited throng without an object. She needed something active to turn her excitement out upon. She felt power to walk, and work for a day without meat or drink. 
and she would carry out the purpose with which she had started in the morning, of going to Freshett and Tipton to tell Sir James and her uncle all that she wished them to know about Lydgate, whose married loneliness under his trial now presented itself to her with new significance, and made her more ardent in readiness to be his champion. She had never felt anything like this triumphant power of indignation in the struggle of her married life, in which there had always been a quickly subduing pang, and she took it as a sign of new strength. "'Dodo, how very bright your eyes are!' said Celia, when Sir James was gone out of the room. "'When you don't see anything you look at, Arthur, or anything, you are going to do something uncomfortable, I know. Is it all about Mr. Lydgate, or has something else happened?' Celia had been used to watch her sister with expectation. "'Yes, dear, a great many things have happened,' said Dodo, in her full tones. "'I wonder what?' said Celia, folding her arms cosily and leaning forward upon them. "'Oh, all the troubles of all the people on the face of the earth,' said Dorothea, lifting her arms to the back of her head. "'Dear me, Dodo, are you going to have a scheme for them?' said Celia, a little uneasily at this Hamlet-like raving. But Sir James came in again, ready to accompany Dorothea to the Grange, and she finished her expedition well, not swerving in her resolution until she descended at her own door. End of chapter 77 Read for LibriVox by Madame Tusk www.rlowalrus.sitesled.com Chapter 78 Middlemarch This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Middlemarch by George Eliot. Chapter 78 Would it were yesterday, and I in the grave, with her sweet faith above for monument. Rosamond and Will stood motionless, they did not know how long, he looking towards the spot where Dorothea had stood, and she looking towards him with doubt. It seemed an endless time to Rosamond, in whose inmost soul there was hardly so much annoyance as gratification from what had just happened. Shallow natures dream of an easy sway over the emotions of others, trusting implicitly in their own petty magic to turn the deepest streams, and confident, by pretty gestures and remarks, of making the thing that is not as though it were. She knew that Will had received a severe blow, but she had been little used to imagining other people's states of mind except as a material cut into shape by her own wishes, and she believed in her own power to soothe or subdue. Even Tertius, that most perverse of men, was always subdued in the long run. Events had been obstinate, but still Rosamond would have said now, as she did before her marriage, that she never gave up what she had set her mind on. She put out her arm, and laid the tips of her fingers on Will's coat-sleeve. "'Don't touch me!' he said, with an utterance like the cut of a lash darting from her, and changing from pink to white and back again, as if his whole frame were tingling with the pain of the sting. He wheeled around to the other side of the room, and stood opposite to her, with the tips of his fingers in his pockets, and his head thrown back, looking fiercely, not at Rosamond, but at a point a few inches away from her. She was keenly offended. But the signs she made of this were such as only Lydgate was used to interpret. She became suddenly quiet, and seated herself, untying her hanging bonnet, and laying it down with her shawl. Her little hands, which she folded before her, were very cold. It would have been safer for Will, in the first instance, to have taken up his hat and gone away. But he had felt no impulse to do this. On the contrary, he had a horrible inclination to stay and shatter Rosamond with his anger. It seemed as impossible to bear the fatality she had drawn down on him without venting his fury as it would be to a panther to bear the javelin wound without springing and biting. And yet how could he tell a woman that he was ready to curse her? He was fuming under a repressive law which he was forced to acknowledge. He was dangerously poised, and Rosamond's voice now brought the decisive vibration. In flute-like tones of sarcasm, she said, "'You can easily go after Mrs. Casabon and explain your preference.' "'Go after her!' he burst out with a sharp edge in his voice. "'Do you think she would turn and look at me, or value any word I uttered to her again at more than a dirty feather?' "'Explain! How can a man explain at the expense of a woman?' "'You can tell her what you please,' said Rosamond, with more tremor. "'Do you suppose she would like me better for sacrificing you? 
She is not a woman to be flattered because I made myself despicable, to believe that I must be true to her because I was a dastard to you. He began to move about with the restlessness of a wild animal that sees prey but cannot reach it. Presently he burst out again. I had no hope before, not much, of anything better to come. But I had one certainty, that she believed in me. Whatever people had said or done about me, she believed in me. That's gone. She'll never again think me anything but a paltry pretense, too nice to take heaven except upon flattering conditions, and yet selling myself for any devil's change of by the sly. She'll think of me as an incarnate insult to her from the first moment we— Will stopped, as if he had found himself grasping something that must not be thrown and shattered. He found another vent for his rage, by snatching up Rosamond's words again, as if they were reptiles to be throttled and flung off. Explain! Tell a man to explain how he dropped into hell! Explain my preference! I never had a preference for her, any more than I have a preference for breathing. No other woman exists by the side of her. I would rather touch her hand, if it were dead, than I would touch any other woman's living. Rosamond, while these poisoned weapons were being hurled at her, was almost losing the sense of her identity, and seemed to be waking into some new terrible existence. She had no sense of chill, resolute repulsion, of reticent self-justification, such as she had known under Lydgate's most stormy displeasure. All her sensibility was turned into a bewildering novelty of pain. She felt a new, terrified recoil under a lash never experienced before. What another nature felt in opposition to her own was being burnt and bitten into her consciousness. When Will had ceased to speak, she had become an image of sickened misery. Her lips were pale, and her eyes had a tearless dismay in them. If it had been Tertius who stood opposite to her, that look of misery would have been a pang to him, and he would have sunk by her side to comfort her with that strong-armed comfort which she had often held very cheap. Let it be forgiven to Will that he had no such movement of pity. He had felt no bond beforehand to this woman who had spoiled the ideal treasure of his life, and he held himself blameless. He knew that he was cruel, but he had no relenting in him yet. After he had done speaking, he still moved about, half in absence of mind, and Rosamond sat perfectly still. At length, Will, seeming to bethink himself, took up his hat, yet stood some moments irresolute. He had spoken to her in a way that made a phrase of common politeness difficult to utter, and yet— now that he had come to the point of going away from her without further speech, he shrank from it as a brutality. He felt checked and stultified in his anger. He walked towards the mantelpiece, and leaned his arm on it, and waited in silence for he hardly knew what. The vindictive fire was still burning in him, and he could utter no word of retraction, but it was, nevertheless, in his mind that, having come back to this hearth where he had enjoyed a caressing friendship, he had found calamity seated there. He had suddenly revealed to him a trouble that lay outside the home as well as within it, and what seemed a foreboding was pressing upon him as with slow pincers, that his life might come to be enslaved by this helpless woman who had thrown herself upon him in the dreary sadness of her heart. But he was in gloomy rebellion against the fact that his quick apprehensiveness foreshadowed to him, and when his eyes fell on Rosamond's blighted face, it seemed to him that he was the more pitiable of the two— for pain must enter into its glorified life of memory before it can turn into compassion. And so they remained for many minutes, opposite each other, far apart, in silence, Will's face still possessed by a mute rage and Rosamond's by a mute misery. The poor thing had no force to fling out any passion in return. The terrible collapse of the illusion towards which all her hope had been strained was a stroke which had too thoroughly shaken her. Her little world was in ruins, and she felt herself tottering in the midst, as a lonely, bewildered consciousness. Will wished that she would speak, and bring some mitigating shadow across his own cruel speech, which seemed to stand staring at them, both in mockery of any attempt at revived fellowship. But she said nothing, and at last, with a desperate effort over himself, he asked, "'Shall I come in and see Lydgate this evening?' "'If you like,' Rosamond answered just audibly. And then Will went out of the house, Martha never knowing that he had been in. After he was gone, Rosamond tried to get up from her seat, but fell back, fainting. When she came to herself again, she felt too ill to make the exertion of rising to ring the bell, and she remained helpless until the girl, surprised at her long absence, thought, for the first time, of looking for her in all the downstairs rooms. Rosamond said that she had felt suddenly sick and faint, and wanted to be helped upstairs. 
When there, she threw herself on the bed, with her clothes on, and lay in apparent torpor, as she had done once before on a memorable day of grief. Lydgate came home earlier than he had expected, about half-past five, and found her there. The perception that she was ill threw every other thought into the background. When he felt her pulse, her eyes rested on him with more persistence than they had done for a long while, as if she felt some content that he was there. He perceived the difference in a moment, and seating himself by her, put his arm gently under her, and bending over her said, "'My poor Rosamond, has something agitated you?' Clinging to him, she fell into hysterical sobbings and cries, and for the next hour he did nothing but soothe and tend her. He imagined that Dorothea had been to see her, and that all this effect on her nervous system, which evidently involved some new turning towards himself, was due to the excitement of the new impressions which that visit had raised. End of chapter 78 Read for LibriVox by Madame Tusk www.rlowalrus.sitesled.com Chapter 79 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 79 Now I saw in my dream that just as they had ended their talk, they drew nigh to a very miry slough that was in the midst of the plain, and they, being heedless, did both fall suddenly into the bog. The name of the slough was Despond. Bunyan when Rosamond was quiet, and Lydgate had left her, hoping that she might soon sleep under the effect of an anodyne, he went into the drawing-room to fetch a book which he had left there, meaning to spend the evening in his workroom, and he saw on the table Dorothea's letter addressed to him. He had not ventured to ask Rosamond if Mrs. Casabon had called, but the reading of this letter assured him of the fact, for Dorothea mentioned that it was to be carried by herself. When Will Ladislaw came in a little later, Lydgate met him with a surprise which made it clear that he had not been told of the earlier visit, and Will could not say, "'Did not Mrs. Lydgate tell you that I came this morning?' "'Poor Rosamond is ill,' Lydgate added immediately on his greeting. "'Not seriously, I hope,' said Will. "'No, only a slight nervous shock. The effect of some agitation. She has been overwrought lately. "'The truth is, Ladislaw, that I am an unlucky devil.' We have gone through several rounds of purgatory since you left, and I have lately got on to a worse ledge of it than ever. I suppose you are only just come down. You look rather battered. You have not been long enough in the town to hear anything. I travelled all night and got to the White Hart at eight o'clock this morning. I have been shutting myself up and resting, said Will, feeling himself a sneak, but seeing no alternative to this evasion. And then he heard Lydgate's account of the troubles which Rosamond had already depicted to him in her way. She had not mentioned the fact of Will's name being connected with the public story, this detail not immediately affecting her, and he now heard it for the first time. "'I thought it better to tell you that your name is mixed up with the disclosures,' said Lydgate, who could understand better than most men how Ladislaw might be stung by the revelation. "'You will be sure to hear it as soon as you turn out into the town. I suppose it is true that Ravel spoke to you?' "'Yes,' said Will, sardonically. "'I shall be fortunate if gossip does not make me the most disreputable person in the whole affair. I should think the latest version must be that I plotted with Raffles to murder Bulstrode and ran away from Middlemarch for the purpose.' He was thinking, "'Here is another new ring in the sound of my name, to recommend it to her hearing. However, what does it signify now?' But he said nothing of Bulstrode's offer to him. Will was very open and careless about his personal affairs, but it was among the more exquisite touches in nature's modelling of him that he had a delicate generosity which warned him into reticence here. He shrank from saying that he had rejected Bulstrode's money in the moment when he was learning that it was Lydgate's misfortune to have accepted it. Lydgate, too, was reticent in the midst of his confidence. He made no allusion to Rosamond's feeling under their trouble, and of Dorothea he only said, Mrs. Casabon has been the one person to come forward and say she had no belief in any of the suspicions against me. Observing a change in Will's face, he avoided any further mention of her, feeling himself too ignorant of their relation to each other not to fear that his words might have some hidden painful bearing on it, and it occurred to him that Dorothea was the real cause of the present visit to Middlemarch. The two men were pitying each other, but it was only Will who guessed the extent of his companion's trouble. When Lydgate spoke with desperate resignation of going to settle in London, and said with a faint smile, 
"'We shall have you again, old fellow.' Will felt inexpressibly mournful, and said nothing. Rosamond had that morning entreated him to urge this step on Lydgate, and it seemed to him as if he were beholding in a magic panorama a future where he himself was sliding into that pleasureless yielding to the small solicitations of circumstance, which is a commoner history of perdition than any single momentous bargain. We are on a perilous margin when we begin to look passively at our future selves, and see our own figures led with dull consent into insipid misdoing and shabby achievement. Poor Lydgate was inwardly groaning on that margin, and Will was arriving at it. It seemed to him this evening as if the cruelty of his outburst to Rosamond had made an obligation for him, and he dreaded the obligation. He dreaded Lydgate's unsuspecting good will. He dreaded his own distaste for his spoiled life which would leave him in motiveless levity. End of chapter 79「Chapter 80 Middlemarch This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Middlemarch by George Eliot Chapter 80 Stern lawgiver, yet thou dost wear the godhead's most benignant grace, nor know we anything so fair as is the smile upon thy face. Flowers laugh before thee on their beds, and fragrance in thy footing treads. Thou dost preserve the stars from wrong, and the most ancient heavens through thee are fresh and strong. Wordsworth, Ode to Duty when Dorothea had seen Mr. Fairbrother in the morning, she had promised to go and dine at the parsonage on her return from Freshet. There was a frequent interchange of visits between her and the Fairbrother family, which enabled her to say that she was not at all lonely at the manor, and to resist for the present the severe prescription of a lady companion. When she reached home and remembered her engagement, she was glad of it, and finding that she had still an hour before she could dress for dinner, she walked straight to the schoolhouse and entered into a conversation with the master and mistress about the new bell, giving eager attention to their small details and repetitions, and getting up a dramatic sense that her life was very busy. She paused on her way back to talk to old Master Bunny, who was putting in some garden seeds, and discoursed wisely with that rural sage about the crops that would make the most return on a perch of ground, and the result of sixty years' experience as to soils, namely, that if your soil was pretty mellow it would do, but if there came wet, wet, wet to make it all of a mummy, why then? Finding that the social spirit had beguiled her into being rather late, she dressed hastily and went over to the parsonage rather earlier than was necessary. That house was never dull, Mr. Fairbrother, like another white of Selborne, having continually something new to tell of his inarticulate guests and protégés whom he was teaching the boys not to torment, and he had just set up a pair of beautiful goats to be pets of the village in general, and to walk at large as sacred animals. The evening went by cheerfully, till after tea, Dorothea talking more than usual, and dilating with Mr. Fairbrother on the possible histories of creatures that converse compendiously with their antenna, and for aught we know may hold reformed parliaments, when suddenly some inarticulate little sounds were heard which called everybody's attention. "'Henrietta Noble,' said Mrs. Fairbrother, seeing her small sister moving about the furniture legs distressfully, "'what is the matter?' Oh. "'Oh, I have lost my tortoiseshell lozenge-box. I fear the kitten has rolled it away,' said the tiny old lady, involuntarily continuing her beaver-like notes. "'Is it a great treasure, aunt?' said Mr. Fairbrother, putting up his glasses and looking at the carpet. "'Mr. Ladislaw gave it to me,' said Miss Noble. "'A German box, very pretty. But if it falls, it always spins away as far as it can.' "'Oh, if it is Ladislaw's present,' said Mr. Fairbrother, in a deep tone of comprehension, getting up and hunting." The box was found at last under a chiffonier, and Miss Noble grasped it with delight, saying, "'It was under the fender last time.' "'That is an affair of the heart with my aunt,' said Mr. Fairbrother, smiling at Dorothea as he reseated himself. "'If Henrietta Noble forms an attachment to any one, Mrs. Casabon, said his mother emphatically, "'she is like a dog. She would take their shoes for a pillow and sleep the better.' "'Mr. Letters lost shoes, I would,' said Henrietta Noble. Dorothea made an attempt at smiling in return. She was surprised and annoyed to find that her heart was palpitating violently, 
and that it was quite useless to try after a recovery of her former animation. Alarmed at herself, fearing some further betrayal of a change so marked in its occasion, she rose and said in a low voice, with undisguised anxiety, "'I must go. I have overtired myself.' Mr. Fairbrother, quick in perception, rose and said, "'It is true. You must have half exhausted yourself in talking about Lydgate. That sort of work tells upon one after the excitement is over.' He gave her his arm back to the manor, but Dorothea did not attempt to speak, even when he said good-night. The limit of resistance was reached, and she had sunk back helpless within the clutch of his inescapable anguish. Dismissing Tantrip with a few faint words, she locked her door, and turning away from it towards the vacant room, she pressed her hand hard on the top of her head, and moaned out, "'Oh, I did love him!' Then came the hour in which the waves of suffering shook her too thoroughly to leave any power of thought. She could only cry in loud whispers between her sobs after her lost belief which she had planted and kept alive from a very little seed since the days in Rome, after her lost joy of clinging with silent love and faith to one who, misprized by others, was worthy in her thought, after her lost woman's pride of reigning in his memory, after her sweet, dim perspective of hope, that along some pathway they should meet with unchanged recognition and take up the backward years as a yesterday. In that hour she repeated what the merciful eyes of solitude have looked on for ages in the spiritual struggles of man. She besought hardness and coldness and aching weariness to bring her relief from the mysterious, incorporeal might of her anguish. She lay on the bare floor and let the night grow cold around her, while her grand woman's frame was shaken by sobs as if she had been a despairing child. There were two images, two living forms that tore her heart in two, as if it had been the heart of a mother who seems to see her child, divided by the sword, and presses one bleeding half to her breast while her gaze goes forth in agony towards the half which is carried away by the lying woman that has never known the mother's pang. Here, with the nearness of an answering smile, here, within the vibrating bond of mutual speech, was the bright creature whom she had trusted, who had come to her like the spirit of mourning, visiting the dim vault where she had sat as the bride of a worn-out life, and now, with a full consciousness which had never awakened before, she stretched out her arms toward him and cried with bitter cries that their nearness was a parting vision. She discovered her passion to herself in the unshrieking utterance of despair. And there, aloof, yet persistently with her, moving wherever she moved, was the Will Ladislaw, who was a changed belief of exhausted hope, a detected illusion, no, a living man towards whom there could not yet struggle any wail of regretful pity from the midst of scorn and indignation and jealous offended pride. The fire of Dorothea's anger was not easily spent, and it flamed out in fitful returns of spurning reproach. Why had he come, obtruding his life into hers, hers that might have been whole enough without him? Why had he brought his cheap regard and his lip-born words to her, who had nothing paltry to give in exchange? He knew that he was deluding her, wished in the very moment of farewell to make her believe that he gave her the whole price of her heart, and knew that he had spent it half before. Why had he not stayed among the crowd of whom she asked nothing but only prayed that they might be less contemptible? But she lost energy, at last, even for her loud whispered cries and moans. She subsided into helpless sobs, and on the cold floor she sobbed herself to sleep. In the chill hours of the morning twilight, when all was dim around her, she awoke, not with any amazed wondering where she was or what had happened, but with the clearest consciousness that she was looking into the eyes of sorrow. She rose, and wrapped warm things around her, and seated herself in a great chair where she had often watched before. She was vigorous enough to have borne that hard night without feeling ill in body, beyond some aching fatigue. But she had waked to a new condition. She felt as if her soul had been liberated from its terrible conflict. She was no longer wrestling with her grief, but could sit down with it as a lasting companion, and make it a share in her thoughts. For now the thoughts came thickly. It was not in Dorothea's nature, for longer than the duration of a paroxysm, to sit in the narrow cell of her calamity, in the besotted misery of a consciousness that only sees another's lot as an accident of its own. She began now to live through that yesterday morning deliberately again, forcing herself to dwell on every detail and its possible meaning. Was she alone in that scene? Was it her event only? She forced herself to think of it as bound up with another woman's life 
a woman towards whom she had set out with a longing to carry some clearness and comfort into her beclouded youth. In her first outloop of jealous indignation and disgust, when quitting the hateful room, she had flung away all the mercy with which she had undertaken that visit. She had enveloped both Will and Rosamond in her burning scorn, and it seemed to her as if Rosamond were burned out of her sight for ever. But that base prompting which makes a woman more cruel to a rival than to a faithless lover could have no strength of recurrence in Dorothea when the dominant spirit of justice within her had once overcome the tumult and had once shown her the truer measure of things. All active thought with which she had before been representing to herself the trials of Lydgate's lot, and this young marriage union, which, like her own, seemed to have its hidden as well as evident troubles, all this vivid sympathetic experience returned to her now as a power. It asserted itself, as acquired knowledge asserts itself, and will not let us see, as we saw in the way of our ignorance. She said to her own irremediable grief, that it should make her more helpful, instead of driving her back from effort. And what sort of crisis might not this be in three lives whose contact with hers laid an obligation on her as if they had been suppliants bearing the sacred branch? The objects of her rescue were not to be sought out by her fancy. They were chosen for her. She yearned towards the perfect right, that it might make a throne within her and rule her errant will. What should I do? How should I act now, this very day, if I could clutch my own pain, and compel it to silence, and think of those three? It had taken long for her to come to that question, and there was light piercing into the room. She opened her curtains, and looked out towards the bit of road that lay in view, with fields beyond, outside the entrance gates. On the road there was a man with a bundle on his back, and a woman carrying her baby. In the field she could see figures moving, perhaps the shepherd with his dog. Far off in the bending sky was the pearly light, and she felt the largeness of the world, and the manifold wakings of men to labour and endurance. She was a part of that involuntary palpitating life and could neither look out on it from her luxurious shelter as a mere spectator, nor hide her eyes in selfish complaining. What she would resolve to do that day did not yet seem quite clear, but something that she could achieve stirred her as with an approaching murmur which would soon gather distinctness. She took off the clothes which seemed to have some of the weariness of a hard watching in them, and began to make her toilet. Presently she rang for Tantrip, who came in her dressing-gown. "'Why, madam!' never been in bed this blessed night burst out tantrip looking first at the bed and then at dorothy's face which in spite of bathing had the pale cheeks and pink eyelids of a mater dolorosa you'll kill yourself you will anybody might think you had a right to give yourself a little comfort don't be alarmed tantrip said dorothy smiling i have slept i am not ill i shall be glad of a cup of coffee as soon as possible and i want you to bring me my new dress and most likely i shall want my new bonnet to-day They've lain there a month and more ready for you, madam, and most thankful I shall be to see with a couple of pounds where less a crepe, said Tantrip, stooping to light the fire. There's a reason in mourning, as I've always said, and three folds at the bottom of your skirt and a plain quillin on your bonnet, and if anybody looked like an angel it's you in a net quillin, is what's consistent for a second year. At least that's my thinking, ended Tantrip, looking anxiously at the fire. And if anybody was to marry me, flattering himself I should wear those hideous weepers two years for him, he'd be deceived by his own vanity, that's all. The fire will do, my good Tam, said Sia, speaking as she used to do in the old Lausanne days, only with a very low voice. Get me the coffee. She folded herself in the large chair and leaned her head against it in fatigued quiescence, while Tantrip went away, wondering at this strange contrariness in her young mistress that just the morning, when she had more of a widow's face than ever, she should have asked for her lighter mourning, which she had waved before. Tantrip would never have found the clue to this mystery. Dorothea wished to acknowledge that she had not the less an active life before her, because she had buried a private joy, and the tradition that fresh garments belonged to all initiation haunting her mind, made her grasp after even that slight outward help towards calm resolve, for the resolve was not easy. Nevertheless, at eleven o'clock she was walking towards Middlemarch, having made up her mind that she would make as quietly and unnoticeably as possible her second attempt to see and save Rosamond. End of chapter 80 Read for LibriVox by Madame Tusk www.rlowalrus.sitesled.com Chapter 
81. Middlemarch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Middlemarch by George Eliot. Chapter 81. Du ert warst auch dies Nacht bestandig, und auf möchst nur erquickt zu meinen Fossen, beginnest schon mit lützt mich zu umgeben, zum Rechts und Rochurst in kraftiges Rechlissen, zum Rechten dasen immerfort zu schreiben. Fast. Tja. When Dorothea was again at Lydgate's door, speaking to Martha, he was in the room close by, with the door ajar, preparing to go out. He heard her voice, and immediately came to her. "'Do you think that Mrs. Lydgate can receive me this morning?' she said, having reflected that it would be better to leave out all allusion to her previous visit. "'I have no doubt she will,' said Lydgate, suppressing his thought about Dorothea's looks, which were as much changed as Rosamond's. "'If you will be kind enough to come in and let me tell her that you are here. She has not been very well since you were here yesterday.' but she is better this morning, and I think it is very likely that she will be cheered by seeing you again. It was plain that Lydgate, as Dorothea had expected, knew nothing about the circumstances of her yesterday's visit. Nay, he appeared to imagine that she had carried it out according to her intention. She had prepared a little note, asking Rosamond to see her, which she would have given to the servant, if he had not been in the way, but now she was in much anxiety as to the result of his announcement. After leading her into the drawing-room, he paused to take a letter from his pocket and put it into her hands, saying, "'I wrote this last night, and was going to carry it to Lowick in my ride. When one is grateful for something too good for common thanks, writing is less unsatisfactory than speech. One does not at least hear how inadequate the words are.' Dorothea's face brightened. "'It is I who have most to thank for, since you have let me take that place. You have consented?' she said, suddenly doubting. "'Yes, the cheque is going to bolster it to-day.' He said no more, but went upstairs to Rosamond, who had but lately finished dressing herself, and sat languidly wondering what she should do next, her habitual industry in small things, even in the days of her sadness, prompting her to begin some kind of occupation, which she dragged through slowly, or paused in from lack of interest. She looked ill, but had recovered her usual quietude of manner, and Lydgate had feared to disturb her by any questions— he had told her of Dorothea's letter, containing the cheque, and afterwards he had said, "'Ladislaus, come, Rosie. He sat with me last night. I dare say he will be here again to-day. I thought he looked rather battered and depressed.' And Rosamond had made no reply. Now, when he came up, he said to her very gently, "'Rosie, dear, Mrs. Casbon has come to see you again. You would like to see her, would you not?' That she coloured and gave rather a startled movement did not surprise him, after the agitation produced by the interview yesterday, a beneficent agitation, he thought, since it seemed to have made her turn to him again. Rosamond dared not say no. She dared not, with a tone of her voice, touch the facts of yesterday. Why had Mrs. Casabon come again? The answer was a blank, which Rosamond could only fill up with dread, for Will Ladislaw's lacerating words had made every thought of Dorothea a fresh smart to her. Nevertheless, in her new humiliating uncertainty, she dared do nothing but comply. She did not say yes, but she rose and let Lydgate put a light shawl over her shoulders, while he said, "'I am going out immediately.' Then something crossed her mind which prompted her to say, "'Pray, tell Martha not to bring anyone else into the drawing-room.' And Lydgate assented, thinking that he fully understood this wish. He led her down to the drawing-room door, and then turned away observing to himself that he was a rather blundering husband to be dependent of his wife's trust in him on the influence of another woman. Rosamond, wrapping her soft shawl around her as she walked towards Dorothea, was inwardly wrapping her soul in cold reserve. Had Mrs. Casabon come to say anything to her about Will? If so, it was a liberty that Rosamond resented, and she prepared herself to meet every word with polite impassibility. Will had bruised her pride too sorely for her to feel any compunction towards him and Dorothea. Her own injury seemed much the greater. Dorothea was not only the preferred woman, but had also a formidable advantage in being Lydgate's benefactor, and to poor Rosamond's pained, confused vision it seemed that this Mrs. Casabon, this woman who predominated in all things concerning her, 
must have come now with a sense of having the advantage, and with animosity prompting her to use it. Indeed, not Rosamond only, but any one else, knowing the outer facts of the case, and not the simple inspiration on which Dorothea acted, might well have wondered why she came. Looking like the lovely ghost of herself, her graceful slimness wrapped in her soft white shawl, the rounded, infantine mouth and cheek inevitably suggesting mildness and innocence, Rosamond paused at three yards' distance from her visitor, and bowed. But Dorothea, who had taken off her gloves, from an impulse which she could never resist when she wanted a sense of freedom, came forward, and with her face full of a sad yet sweet openness, put out her hand. Rosamond could not avoid meeting her glance, could not avoid putting her small hand into Dorothea's, which clasped it with gentle motherliness, and immediately a doubt of her own prepossessions began to stir within her. Rosamond's eye was quick for faces, and she saw that Mrs. Casaubon's face looked pale and changed since yesterday, yet gentle, and like the firm softness of her hand. But Dorothea had counted a little too much on her own strength. The clearness and intensity of her mental action this morning were the continuance of a nervous exaltation which made her frame as dangerously responsive as a bit of finest Venetian crystal. And in looking at Rosamond, she suddenly found her heart swelling, and was unable to speak. All her effort was required to keep back tears. She succeeded in that, and the emotion only passed over her face like the spirit of a sob. But it added to Rosamond's impression that Mrs. Casaubon's state of mind must be something quite different from what she had imagined. So they sat down, without a word of preface, on the two chairs that happened to be nearest, and happened also to be close together, though Rosamond's notion, when she first bowed, was that she should stay a long way off from Mrs. Casaubon. But she ceased thinking how anything would turn out, merely wondering what would come. And Dorothea began to speak, quite simply, gathering firmness as she went on. I had an errand yesterday which I did not finish. That is why I am here again so soon. You will not think me too troublesome when I tell you that I am come to talk to you about the injustice that has been shown towards Mr. Lydgate. It will cheer you, will it not, to know a great deal about him, that he may not like to speak about himself just because it is in his own vindication, and to his own honour. You will like to know that your husband has warm friends, who have not left off believing in his high character. You will let me speak of this without thinking that I take a liberty. The cordial, pleading tones which seemed to flow with generous heedlessness above all the facts which had filled Rosamond's mind, as grounds of obstruction and hatred between her and this woman, came as soothingly as a warm stream over her shrinking fears. Of course Mrs. Casaubon had the facts in her mind, but she was not going to speak of anything connected with them. That relief was too great for Rosamond to feel much else at the moment. She answered prettily in the new ease of her soul. "'I know you have been very good. I shall like to hear anything you will say to me about Tertius.' "'The day before yesterday,' said Dorothea, "'when I had asked him to come to Lowick to give me his opinion on the affairs of the hospital,' He told me everything about his conduct and feelings in this sad event, which has made ignorant people cast suspicions on him. The reason he told me was because I was very bold, and asked him. I believed that he had never acted dishonourably, and I begged him to tell me the history. He confessed to me that he had never told it before, not even to you, because he had a great dislike to say, I was wrong, as if that were proof, when there are guilty people who will say so. The truth is, he knew nothing of this man Raffles, or that there were any bad secrets about him, and he thought that Mr. Bulstrode offered him the money because he repented, out of kindness, of having refused it before. All his anxiety about his patient was to treat him rightly, and he was a little uncomfortable that the case did not end as he expected, but he thought then, and still thinks, that there may have been no wrong in it on any one's part. And I have told Mr. Fairbrother, and Mr. Brooke, and Sir James Chetham, they all believe in your husband. That will cheer you, will it not? That will give you courage?" Dorothea's face had become animated, and as it beamed on Rosamond very close to her, she felt something like bashful timidity before a superior in the presence of this self-forgetful ardour. She said, with blushing embarrassment, "'Thank you. You are very kind.' And he felt that he had been so wrong not to pour out everything about this to you. But you will forgive him. It was because he feels so much more about your happiness than anything else. He feels his life bound into one with yours, and it hurts him more than anything that his misfortunes must hurt you. He could speak to me because I am an indifferent person, and then I asked him if I might come to see you, because I felt so much for his trouble in yours. That is why I came yesterday, and why I am come to-day. 
Trouble is so hard to bear, is it not? How can we live and think that any one has trouble, piercing trouble, and we could help them and never try? Dorothea, completely swayed by the feeling that she was uttering, forgot everything but that she was speaking from out the heart of her own trial to Rosamond's. The emotion had wrought itself more and more into her utterance, till the tones might have gone to one's very marrow, like a low cry from some suffering creature in the darkness, and she had unconsciously laid her hand again on the little hand that she had pressed before. Rosamond, with an overmastering pang, as if a wound within her had been probed, burst into hysterical crying as she had done the day before when she clung to her husband. Poor Dorothea was feeling a great wave of her own sorrow returning over her, her thought being drawn to the possible share that Will Ladislaw might have in Rosamond's mental tumult. She was beginning to fear that she should not be able to suppress herself enough to the end of this meeting, and while her hand was still resting on Rosamond's lap, though the hand underneath it was withdrawn, she was struggling against her own rising sobs. She tried to master herself with the thought that this might be a turning point in three lives, not in her own. No, there the irrevocable had happened, but in those three lives which were touching hers with the solemn neighbourhood of danger and distress. The fragile creature who was crying close to her, there might still be time to rescue her from the misery of false, incompatible bonds, and this moment was unlike any other. She and Rosamond could never be together again with the same thrilling consciousness of yesterday within them both. She felt the relation between them to be peculiar enough to give her a peculiar influence, though she had no conception that the way in which her own feelings were involved was fully known to Mrs. Lydgate. It was a newer crisis in Rosamond's experience than even Dorothea could imagine. She was under the first great shock that had shattered her dream-world, in which she had been easily confident of herself and critical of others and this strange, unexpected manifestation of feeling in a woman, whom she had approached with shrinking aversion and dread, was one who must necessarily have a jealous hatred towards her, made her soul totter all the more with a sense that she had been walking in an unknown world which had just broken in upon her. When Rosamond's convulsed throat was subsiding and calm, she withdrew the handkerchief with which she had been hiding her face. Her eyes met Dorothea's as helplessly as if they had been blue flowers. What was the use of thinking about behaviour after this crying? And Dorothea looked almost as childish, with a neglected trace of a silent tear. Pride was broken down between these two. "'We were talking of your husband,' Dorothea said, with some timidity. "'I thought his looks were sadly changed with the suffering the other day. I had not seen him for many weeks before. He said he had been feeling very lonely in his trial. But I think he would have borne it all the better if he had been able to be quite open with you.' "'Hershes is so angry and impatient with me if I say anything,' said Rosamond, imagining that he had been complaining of her to Dorothea. "'He ought not to wonder that I object to speaking to him on painful subjects.' "'It was himself he blamed for not speaking,' said Dorothea. "'What he said of you was that he could not be happy in doing anything which made you unhappy, that his marriage was, of course, a bond which must affect his choice about everything.' and for that reason he refused my proposal that he should keep his position at the hospital, because that would bind him to stay in Middlemarch, and he would not undertake to do anything which would be painful to you. He could say that to me, because he knows that I had much trial in my marriage, from my husband's illness, which hindered his plans and saddened him, and he knows that I have felt how hard it is to walk always in fear of hurting another who is tied to us. Dorothy awaited a little. She had discerned a faint pleasure stealing over Rosamond's face, but there was no answer, and she went on with gathering tremor. Marriage is so unlike everything else. There is something even awful in the nearness it brings. Even if we love someone else better than, than those we were married to, it would be no use. Poor Dorothea, in her palpitating anxiety, could only seize her language brokenly. I mean, marriage drinks up all our power of giving or getting any blessedness in that sort of love. I know it may be very dear, but it murders our marriage, and then the marriage stays with us like a murder, and everything else is gone. And then our husband, if he loved and trusted us, and we have not helped him, but made a curse in his life. Her voice had sunk very low. There was a dread upon her of presuming too far, and of speaking as if she herself were perfection addressing error. She was too much preoccupied with her own anxiety to be aware that Rosamond was trembling too, and filled with the need to express pitying fellowship rather than rebuke. She put her hands on Rosamond's, and said, with more agitated rapidity, 
i know i know that the feeling may be very dear it has taken hold of us unawares it is so hard it may seem like death to part with it and we are weak i am weak the waves of her own sorrow from out of which she was struggling to save another rushed over dorothy with conquering force she stopped in speechless agitation not crying but feeling as if she were being inwardly grappled her face had become of a deathlier paleness her lips trembled and she pressed her hands helplessly on the hands that lay under them rosamond taken hold of by an emotion stronger than her own hurried along in a new movement which gave all things some new awful undefined aspect could find no words but involuntarily she put her lips to dorothea's forehead which was very near her and then for a minute the two women clasped each other as if they had been in shipwreck you are thinking what is not true said rosamond in an eager half whisper while she was still feeling dorothea's arms round her urged by a mysterious necessity to free herself from something that oppressed her as if it were blood guiltiness they moved apart looking at each other when you came in yesterday it was not as you thought said rosamond in the same tone there was a movement of surprised attention in dorothea she expected a vindication of rosamond herself he was telling me how he loved another woman that i might know he could never love me said rosamond getting more and more hurried as she went on and now i think he hates me because because you mistook him yesterday he says it is through me that you will think ill of him think that he is a false person but it shall not be through me he has never had any love for me i know he has not he has always thought slightly of me he said yesterday that no other woman existed for him besides you the blame of what happened is entirely mine he said he could never explain to you because of me he said you could never think well of him again but now i have told you and he cannot reproach me any more rosamond had delivered her soul under impulses which she had not known before she had begun her confession under the subduing influence of dorothea's emotion and as she went on she had gathered the sense that she was repelling will's reproaches which were still like a knife wound within her the revulsion of feeling in dorothea was too strong to be called joy it was a tumult in which the terrible strain of the night and morning made a resistant pain she could only perceive that this would be joy when she had recovered her power of feeling it her immediate consciousness was one of immense sympathy without cheek she cared for rosamond without struggle now and responded earnestly to her last words no he cannot reproach you any more with her usual tendency to overestimate the good in others she felt a great outgoing of her heart towards rosamond for the generous effort which had redeemed her from suffering not counting that the effort was a reflex of her own energy after they had been silent a little she said you are not sorry that i came this morning no you have been very good to me said rosamond i did not think that you would be so good i was very unhappy i am not happy now everything is so sad but better days will come your husband will be rightly valued and he depends on you for comfort he loves you best the worst loss would be to lose that and you have not lost it said dorothea she tried to thrust away the too overpowering thought of her own relief lest she should fail to win some sign that rosamond's affection was yearning back towards her husband tertius did not find fault with me then said rosamond understanding now that lydgate might have said anything to mrs casaubon and that she certainly was different from other women perhaps there was a faint taste of jealousy in that question a smile began to play over dorothea's face as she said no indeed how can you imagine it but here the door opened and lydgate entered i am come back in my quality of a doctor he said after i went away i was haunted by two pale faces mrs casaubon looked as much in need of care as you rosie and i thought that i had not done my duty in leaving you together so when i had been to colman's i came home again i noticed that you were walking mrs casaubon and the sky has changed i think we may have rain may i send one to order your carriage to come for you oh no i am strong i need the walk said dorothea rising with animation in her face mrs lydgate and i have chatted a great deal and it is time for me to go i have always been accused of being immoderate and saying too much she put out her hand to rosamond and they said an earnest quiet good-bye without kiss or other show of effusion there had been between them too much serious emotion for them to use the signs of it superficially as lydgate took her to the door she said nothing of rosamond but told him of mr fairbrother and the other two friends who had listened with belief to his story 
When he came back to Rosamond, she had already thrown herself on the sofa in resigned fatigue. "'Well, Rosie,' said he, standing over her and touching her hair, "'what do you think of Mrs. Casabon, now you have seen so much of her?' "'I think she must be better than any one,' said Rosamond, "'as she is very beautiful. If you go to talk to her so often you will be more discontented with me than ever.' Lydgate laughed at these so often. "'But has she made you any less discontented with me?' "'I think she has.' said Rosamond, looking up in his face. "'How heavy your eyes are, Tertius! And do push your hair back.' He lifted up his large, white hand to obey her, and felt thankful for this little mark of interest in him. Poor Rosamond's vagrant fancy had come back terribly scourged, meek enough to nestle under the old despised shelter, and the shelter was still there. Lydgate had accepted his narrowed lot with sad resignation. He had chosen this fragile creature, and had taken the burden of her life upon his arms. He must walk as he could, carrying that burden pitifully. End of chapter 81 As read for LibriVox by Madame Tusk www.rlowalrus.sitesled.com Chapter 82 Middlemarch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Middlemarch by George Eliot. Chapter 82. My grief lies onward, and my joy behind. Shakespeare. Sonnets. Exiles notoriously feed much on hopes, and are unlikely to stay in banishment unless they are obliged. When Will Ladislaw exiled himself from Middlemarch, he had placed no stronger obstacle to his return than his own resolve, which was by no means an iron barrier, but simply a state of mind liable to melt into a minuet with other states of mind, and to find itself bowing, smiling, and giving place with polite facility. As the months went on, it had seemed more and more difficult to him to say why he should not run down to Middlemarch, merely for the sake of hearing something about Dorothea, and if on such a flying visit he should chance by some strange coincidence to meet with her, there was no reason for him to be ashamed of having taken an innocent journey which he had beforehand supposed that he should not take. Since he was hopelessly divided from her, he might surely venture into her neighbourhood, and as to the suspicious friends who kept a dragon-watch over her— their opinions seemed less and less important with time and change of air. And there had come a reason, quite irrespective of Dorothea, which seemed to make a journey to Middlemarch a sort of philanthropic duty. Will had given a disinterested attention to an intended settlement on a new plan in the far west, and the need for funds in order to carry out a good design had set him on debating with himself whether it would not be a laudable use to make of his claim of Bulstrode, to urge the application of that money which had been offered to himself as a means of carrying out a scheme likely to be largely beneficial. The question seemed a very dubious one to Will, and his repugnance to again entering into any relation with the banker might have made him dismiss it quickly, if there had not arisen in his imagination the probability that his judgment might be more safely determined by a visit to Middlemarch. That was the object which Will stated to himself as a reason for coming down. He had meant to confide in Lydgate, and discuss the money question with him, and he had meant to amuse himself for the few evenings of his stay by having a great deal of music and badinage with the fair Rosamond, without neglecting his friends at Lowick Parsonage. If the parsonage was close to the manor, that was no fault of his. He had neglected the fair brothers before his departure, from a proud resistance to the possible accusation of indirectly seeking interviews with Dorothea. But hunger tames us, and Will had become very hungry for the vision of a certain form and the sound of a certain voice. Nothing had done instead, not the opera, or the converse of zealous politicians, or the flattering reception, in dim corners, of his new hand in leading articles. Thus he had come down, foreseeing with confidence how almost everything would be in his familiar little world, fearing, indeed, that there would be no surprises in his visit, but he had found that humdrum world in a terribly dynamic condition, in which even a badinage and lyricism had turned explosive, and the first day of his visit had become the most fatal epoch of his life. The next morning he felt so harassed with the nightmare of consequences, he dreaded so much the immediate issues before him, 
that seeing while he breakfasted the arrival of the Riverston coach, he went out hurriedly and took his place on it, that he might be relieved, at least for a day, from the necessity of doing or saying anything in Middlemarch. Will Ladislaw was in one of those tangled crises which are commoner in experience than one might imagine, from the shallow absoluteness of men's judgments. He had found Lydgate, for whom he had the sincerest respect, under circumstances which claimed his thorough and frankly declared sympathy, and the reason why, in spite of that claim, it would have been better for Will to have avoided all further intimacy, or even contact with Lydgate, was precisely of the kind to make such a course appear impossible. To a creature of Will's susceptible temperament, without any neutral region of indifference in his nature, ready to turn everything that befell him into the collisions of a passionate drama, the revelation that Rosamond had made her happiness in any way dependent on him was a difficulty which his outburst of rage towards her had immeasurably increased for him. He hated his own cruelty, and yet he dreaded to show the fullness of his relenting. He must go to her again. The friendship could not be put to a sudden end, and her unhappiness was a power which he dreaded. And all the while there was no more foretaste of enjoyment in the life before him than if his limbs had been lopped off and he was making his fresh start on crutches. In the night he had debated whether he should not get on the coach, not for Riverston, but for London, leaving a note to Lydgate which would give a makeshift reason for his retreat. But there were strong cords pulling him back from that abrupt departure, the blight on his happiness in thinking of Dorothea, the crushing of that chief hope which had remained in spite of the acknowledged necessity for renunciation, was too fresh a misery for him to resign himself to it, and go straight away into a distance which was also despair. Thus he did nothing more decided than taking the Riverston coach. He came back again by it while it was still daylight, having made up his mind that he must go to Lydgate's that evening. The Rubicon, we know, was a very insignificant stream to look at. Its significance lay entirely in certain invisible conditions. Will felt as if he were forced to cross his small boundary ditch, and what he saw beyond it was not empire, but discontented subjection. But it is given to us sometimes, even in our everyday life, to witness the saving influence of a noble nature, the divine efficacy of rescue that may lie in a self-subduing act of fellowship. If Dorothea, after her night's anguish, had not taken that walk to Rosamond, why, she, perhaps, would have been a woman who gained a higher character for discretion, but it would certainly not have been as well for those three who were on one hearth in Lydgate's house at half-past seven that evening. Rosamond had been prepared for Will's visit, and she received him with languid coldness, which Lydgate accounted for by her nervous exhaustion, of which he could not suppose that it had any relation to Will. And when she sat, in silence, bending over a bit of work, he innocently apologized for her in an indirect way, by begging her to lean backward and rest. Will was miserable in the necessity for playing the part of a friend who was making his first appearance and greeting to Rosamond, while his thoughts were busy about her feelings since that scene of yesterday, which seemed still inexorably to enclose them both like the painful vision of a double madness. It happened that nothing called Lydgate out of the room, but when Rosamond poured out the tea and Will came near to fetch it, she placed a tiny bit of folded paper on his saucer. He saw it, and secured it quickly, but as he went back to his inn he had no eagerness to unfold the paper. What Rosamond had written to him would probably deepen the painful impression of the evening. Still, he opened and read it by his bed-candle. There were only these few words in her neatly flowing hand. "'I have told Mrs. Casabon. She is not under any mistake about you. I have told her, because she came to see me and was very kind. You will have nothing to reproach me with now. I shall not have made any difference to you.' The effect of these words was not quite all gladness. As Will dwelt on them with excited imagination, he felt his cheeks and ears burning at the thought of what had occurred between Dorothea and Rosamond, at the uncertainty how far Dorothea might still feel her dignity wounded in having an explanation of his conduct offered to her. There might still remain in her mind a changed association with him which made an irremediable difference, a lasting flaw. With active fancy he wrought himself into a state of doubt little more easy than that of a man who has escaped from a wreck by night, and stands on unknown ground in the darkness. Until that wretched yesterday, except the moment of vexation long ago, in the very same room, and in the very same presence, all their vision, all their thought of each other, had been as in a world apart, where the sunshine fell on tall white lilies, where no evil lurked, and no other soul entered, 
But now, would Dorothea meet him in that world again? End of chapter 82 As read for LibriVox by Madame Tusk www.rlowalrus.sitesled.com Chapter 83 Middlemarch This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Middlemarch by George Eliot Chapter 83 And now good morrow to our waking souls, which watch not one another out of fear, for love all love of other sights controls, and makes one little room and everywhere. Dr. Don. On the second morning after Dorothy's visit to Rosamond, she had had two nights of sound sleep, and had not only lost all traces of fatigue, but felt as if she had a great deal of superfluous strength, that is to say, more strength than she could manage to concentrate on any occupation. The day before, she had taken long walks outside the grounds, and had paid two visits to the parsonage, but she never in her life told any one the reason why she spent her time in that fruitless manner, and this morning she was rather angry with herself for her childish restlessness. To-day was to be spent quite differently. What was there to be done in the village? Oh, dear, nothing. Everybody was well, and had flannel, nobody's pig had died, and it was Saturday morning, when there was a general scrubbing of doors and door-stones, and when it was useless to go into the school. But there were various subjects that Dorothea was trying to get clear upon, and she resolved to throw herself energetically into the gravest of all. She sat down in the library, before her particular little heap of books on political economy and kindred matters, out of which she was trying to get light as to the best way of spending money so as not to injure one's neighbours, or, what comes to the same thing, so as to do them the most good. Here was a weighty subject which, if she could but lay hold of it, would certainly keep her mind steady. Unhappily, her mind slipped off it for a whole hour, and at the end she found herself reading sentences twice over with an intense consciousness of many things, but not of any one thing contained in the text. This was hopeless. Should she order the carriage and drive to Tipton? No, for some reason or other she preferred staying at Lowick. But her vagrant mind must be reduced to order. There was an art in self-discipline, and she walked round and round the brown library, considering by what sort of manoeuvre she could arrest her wandering thoughts. Perhaps a mere task was the best means, something to which she must go doggedly. Was there not the geography of Asia Minor, in which her slackness had often been rebuked by Mr. Casaubon? She went to the cabinet of maps, and unrolled one. This morning she might make herself finally sure that Paphagonia was not on the Levantine coast, and fix her total darkness about the Chalabes firmly on the shores of the Euxine. A map was a fine thing to study when you were disposed to think of something else, being made up of names that would turn into a chime if you went back upon them. Dorothea set earnestly to work, bending close to her map, and uttering the names in an audible, subdued tone, which often got into a chime. She looked amusingly girlish after all her deep experience, nodding her head and marking the names off on her fingers with a little pursing of her lip, and now and then breaking off to put her hands on each side of her face and say, "'Oh, dear! Oh, dear!' There was no reason why this should end any more than a merry-go-round, but it was at last interrupted by the opening of the door and the announcement of Miss Noble. The little old lady, whose bonnet hardly reached Dorothea's shoulder, was warmly welcomed, but while her hand was being pressed she made many of her beaver-like noises, as if she had something difficult to say. "'Do sit down,' said Dorothea, rolling a chair forward. "'Am I wanted for anything? I shall be so glad if I can do anything.' "'I, I will not stay.' said Miss Noble, putting her hand into her small basket, and holding some article inside it nervously. I, I have left a friend in the churchyard. Oh, oh! She lapsed into her inarticulate sounds, and unconsciously drew forth the article which she was fingering. It was the tortoise-shell lozenge-box, and Dorothea felt the colour mounting in her cheeks. Mr. Ladislaw, continued the timid little woman, he, he fears he has offended you, and has begged me to ask if you will see him for a few minutes. Dorothea did not answer on the instant. It was crossing her mind that she could not receive him in this library, where her husband's prohibition seemed to dwell. 
She looked towards the window. Could she go out and meet him on the grounds? The sky was heavy, and the trees had begun to shiver as at a coming storm. Besides, she shrank from going out to him. "'Do see him, Mrs. Casaubon,' said Miss Noble, pathetically, "'else I must go back and say no, and that will hurt him.' "'Yes, I will see him,' said Dorothea. "'Pray tell him to come.' What else was there to be done? There was nothing that she longed for at that moment except to see Will. The possibility of seeing him had thrust itself insistently between her and every other object, and yet she had a throbbing excitement, like an alarm upon her, a sense that she was doing something daringly defiant for his sake. When the little lady had trotted away on her mission, Dorothea stood in the middle of the library with her hands falling clasped before her, making no attempt to compose herself in an attitude of dignified unconsciousness. What she was least conscious of just then was her own body. She was thinking of what was likely to be in Will's mind, and of the hard feelings that others had had about him. Could any duty bind her to hardness? Resistance to unjust dispraise had mingled with her feeling for him from the very first, and now, in the rebound of her heart after her anguish, the resistance was stronger than ever. If I love him too much, it is because he has been used so ill. There was a voice within her saying this, to some imagined audience in the library, when the door opened and she saw Will before her. She did not move, and he came towards her with more doubt and timidity in his face than she had ever seen before. He was in a state of uncertainty which made him afraid lest some look or word of his should condemn him to a new distance from her, and Dorothea was afraid of her own emotion. She looked as if there were a spell upon her, keeping her motionless and hindering her from unclasping her hands, while some intense, grave yearning was imprisoned within her eyes. Seeing that she did not put out her hand as usual, Will paused a yard from her and said with embarrassment, "'I am so grateful to you for seeing me.' "'I wanted to see you,' said Dorothea, having no other words at command. It did not occur to her to sit down, and Will did not give a cheerful interpretation to this queenly way of receiving him, but he went on to say what he had made up his mind to say. "'I fear you think me foolish, and perhaps wrong, for coming back so soon. I have been punished for my impatience. You know, every one knows now, a painful story about my parentage. I knew of it before I went away, and I always meant to tell you of it, if—if if we ever met again.' There was a slight movement in Dorothea, and she unclasped her hands but immediately folded them over each other. "'But the affair is a matter of gossip now,' Will continued. "'I wished you to know that something connected with it, something which happened before I went away, helped to bring me down here again. At least, I thought it excused my coming. It was the idea of getting Bulstrode to apply some money to a public purpose, some money which he had thought of giving me. Perhaps it is rather to Bulstrode's credit that he privately offered me compensation for an old injury. He offered to give me a good income to make amends.' but I suppose you know the disagreeable story. Will looked doubtfully at Dorothea, but his manner was gathering some of the defiant courage with which he always thought of this fact in his destiny. He added, "'You know that it must be altogether painful to me.' "'Yes, yes, I know,' said Dorothea hastily. "'I did not choose to accept an income from such a source. I was sure that you would not think well of me if I did so,' said Will. "'Why should you mind saying anything of that sort to her now?' She knew that he had avowed his love for her. I felt that he broke off nevertheless. "'You acted as I should have expected you to act,' said Dorothea, her face brightening and her head becoming a little more erect on its beautiful stem. "'I did not believe that you would let any circumstance of my birth create prejudice in you against me, though it was sure to do so in others,' said Will, shaking his head backward in his old way, and looking with a grave appeal into her eyes. "'If it were a new hardship, it would be a new reason for me to cling to you.' said Dorothea fervidly. Nothing could have changed me, but— Her heart was swelling, and it was difficult to go on. She made a great effort over herself, to say in a low, tremulous voice, But thinking that you were different, not so good as I had believed you to be. You are sure to believe me better than I am in everything but one, said Will, giving way to his own feeling and the evidence of hers. I mean, in my truth to you. When I thought you doubted that, I didn't care about anything that was left— I thought it was all over with me, and there was nothing to try for, only things to endure. "'I don't doubt any longer,' said Dorothea, putting out her hand, a vague fear for him impelling her unutterable affection. He took her hand, and raised it to his lips with something like a sob, but he stood with his hat and gloves in the other hand, and might have done for the portrait of a royalist. 
Still, it was difficult to loose the hand, and Dorothea, withdrawing it with confusion that distressed her, looked and moved away. "'See how dark the clouds have become, and how the trees are tossed,' she said, walking towards the window, yet speaking and moving with only a dim sense of what she was doing. Will followed her at a little distance and leaned against the tall back of a leather chair, on which he ventured now to lay his hat and gloves, and free himself from the intolerable durance of formality to which he had been for the first time condemned in Dorothea's presence. It must be confessed that he felt very happy at that moment, leaning on the chair. He was not much afraid of anything that she might feel now. They stood silent, not looking at each other, but looking at the evergreens, which were being tossed, and were showing the pale underside of their leaves against the blackening sky. Will never enjoyed the prospect of a storm so much. It delivered him from the necessity of going away. Leaves and little branches were hurled about, and the thunder was getting nearer. The light was more and more sombre, but there came a flash of lightning, which made them start and look at each other, and then smile. Dorothea began to say what she had been thinking of. That was a wrong thing for you to say, that you would have had nothing to try for. If we had lost our own chief good, other people's good would remain, and that is worth trying for. Some can be happy. I seem to see that more clearly than ever when I was the most wretched. I can hardly think how I could have borne the trouble if that feeling had not come to me to make strength. You have never felt the sort of misery I felt, said Will, the misery of knowing that you despised me. But I have felt worse. It was worse to think ill. Dorothea had begun impetuously, but broke off. Will coloured. He had a sense that whatever she said was uttered in the vision of a fatality that kept them apart. He was silent a moment, then said passionately, "'We may at least have the comfort of speaking to each other without disguise. Since I must go away, since we must always be divided, you may think of me as one on the brink of the grave.' While he was speaking there came a vivid flash of lightning which lit each of them up for the other, and the light seemed to be the terror of a hopeless love. Dorothea darted instantaneously from the window. Will followed her seizing her hand with a spasmodic movement, and so they stood, with their hands clasped, like two children, looking out on the storm, while the thunder gave a tremendous crack and roll above them, and the rain began to pour down. Then they turned their faces toward each other, with the memory of his last words in them, and they did not loose each other's hands. "'There is no hope for me,' said Will, "'even if you love me as well as I love you, even if I were everything to you, I shall most likely always be very poor.' On a sombre calculation one can count on nothing but a creeping lot. It is impossible for us ever to belong to each other. It is, perhaps, base of me to have asked for a word from you. I meant to go away into silence, but I have not been able to do what I meant. "'Don't be sorry,' said Dorothea, in her clear, tender tones. "'I would rather share all the trouble of our parting.' Her lips trembled, and so did his. It was never known which lips were the first to move towards the other lips, but they kissed, tremblingly and then they moved apart. The rain was dashing against the window-panes as if an angry spirit were within it, and behind it was the great swoop of the wind. It was one of those moments in which both the busy and the idle pause with a certain awe. Dorothea sat down on the seat nearest to her, a long, low ottoman in the middle of the room, and with her hands folded over each other on her lap, looked at the drear outer world. Will stood still an instant, looking at her, then seated himself beside her, and laid his hand on hers, which turned itself upward to be clasped. They sat in that way, without looking at each other, until the rain abated and began to fall in stillness. Each had been full of thoughts, which neither of them could begin to utter. But when the rain was quiet, Dorothea turned to look at Will. With a passionate exclamation, as if some torturous crew were threatening him, he started up and said, "'It is impossible!' He went and leaned on the back of the chair again, and seemed to be battling with his own anger, while she looked towards him sadly. "'It is as fatal as a murder or any other horror that divides people,' he burst out again. "'It is more intolerable to have our life maimed by petty accidents.' "'No, don't say that. Your life need not be maimed,' said Dorothea gently. "'Yes, it must,' said Will angrily. "'It is cruel of you to speak in that way, as if that were any comfort. You may see beyond the misery of it, but I don't.' It is unkind. It is throwing back my love for you as if it were a trifle to speak in that way, in the face of the fact we can never be married. Sometime we might, said Dorothea in a trembling voice. When? 
said will bitterly what is the use of counting on any success of mine it is a mere toss-up whether i shall ever do more than keep myself decently unless i choose to sell myself as a mere pen and mouthpiece i can see that clearly enough i could not offer myself to any woman even if she had no luxuries to renounce there was silence dorothy's heart was full of something that she wanted to say and yet the words were too difficult she was wholly possessed by them at that moment debate was mute within her and it was very hard that she could not say what she wanted to say will was looking out of the window angrily if he would have looked at her and not gone away from her side she thought everything would have been easier at last he turned still resting against the chair and stretching his hand automatically towards his hat said with a sort of exasperation good-bye oh i cannot bear it my heart will break said dorothea starting from her seat the flood of her young passion bearing down all the obstructions which had kept her silent the great tears rising and falling in an instant i don't mind about poverty i hate my wealth in an instant will was close to her and had his arms around her but she drew her head back and held his gently away that she might go on speaking her large tear-filled eyes looking at his very simply while she said in a sobbing childlike way we could live quite well on my own fortune it is too much seven hundred a year i want so little no new clothes and i will learn what everything costs End of chapter 83 As read for LibriVox by Madame Tusk www.rlowalrus.sitesled.com Chapter 84 Middlemarch This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Middlemarch by George Eliot. Chapter eighty four. Though it be song of old and young that I should be to blame, theirs be the charge that spoke so large in hurting of my name. The Not Brown Maid. It was just after the Lords had thrown out the Reform Bill that explains how mr cadwallader came to be walking on the slope of the lawn near the great conservatory at freshet hall holding the times in his hands behind him while he talked with the trout fisher's dispassionateness about the prospects of the country to sir james chetham mrs cadwallader the dowager lady chetham and celia were sometimes seated on garden chairs sometimes walking to meet little arthur who was being drawn in his chariot and as becomes the infantine buddha was sheltered by his sacred umbrella with handsome silken fringe the ladies also talked politics though more fitfully mrs cadwallader was strong on the intended creation of peers she had it for certain from her cousin that truebury had gone over to the other side entirely at the instigation of his wife who had scented peerages in the air from the very first introduction of the reform question and would sign her soul away to take precedence of her younger sister who had married a baronet lady chetham thought that such conduct was very reprehensible and remembered that mrs truebury's mother was a miss walshingham of melspring celia confessed it was nicer to be lady than mrs and that dodo never minded about precedence if she could have her own way mrs cadwallader held that it was a poor satisfaction to take precedence when everybody about you knew that you had not a drop of good blood in your veins and celia again stopping to look at arthur said it should be very nice though if he were a viscount and his lordship's little tooth coming through he might have been if james had been an earl my dear celia said the dowager james's title is worth far more than any new earldom i never wished his father to be anything else than sir james oh i only meant about arthur's little tooth said celia comfortably but see here is my uncle coming she tripped off to meet her uncle while sir james and mr cadwallader came forward to make one group with the ladies Celia had slipped her arm through her uncle's, and he patted her hand with a rather melancholy, "'Well, my dear,' as they approached, it was evident that Mr. Brooke was looking dejected, and this was fully accounted for by the state of politics, and as he was shaking hands all round without more greeting than a, "'Well, you're all here, you know,' and the rector said laughingly, "'Don't take the throwing out of the bill so much to heart, Brooke. You've got all the riffraff of the country on your side.' "'The bill, eh? Ah,' said Mr. Brooke, with a mild distractedness of manner, "'thrown out, you know, eh?' the lords are going too far though they'll have to pull up sad news you know i mean here at home sad news but you must not blame me chetham what is the matter said sir james not another gamekeeper shot i hope it's what i should expect when a fellow like trapping bass is let off so easily 
"'Gamekeeper? No, let us go in. I can tell you all in the house, you know,' said Mr. Brooke, nodding at the Cadwalladers, to show that he included them in his confidence. "'As to poachers like trapping bass, you know, Chetham,' he continued as they were entering, "'when you are a magistrate you'll not find it so easy to commit. Severity is all very well. But it's a great deal easier when you've got somebody to do it for you. You have a soft place in your heart yourself, you know. You're not a Draco, a Jeffreys, that sort of thing.' Mr. Brooke was evidently in a state of nervous perturbation. When he had something painful to tell, it was usually his way to introduce it among a number of disjointed particulars, as if it were a medicine that would get a milder flavour by mixing. He continued his chat with Sir James about the poachers until they were all seated, and Mrs. Cadwallader, impatient of this drivelling, said, "'I am dying to know the sad news. The gamekeeper is not shot. That is settled. What is it, then?' "'Well, it's a very trying thing, you know.' said Mr. Brooke. "'I'm glad you and the rector are here. It's, it's a family matter. But you will help us all to bear it, Cadwallader. I've got to bring it to you, my dear.' Here Mr. Brooke looked at Celia. "'You've no notion what it is, you know. And Chetham, it will annoy you uncommonly. But, you see, you have not been able to hinder it any more than I have. There's something singular in things. They come round, you know.' "'It must be about Dodo,' said Celia, who had been used to think of her sister as the dangerous part of the family machinery. She had seated herself on a low stool against her husband's knee. "'For God's sake, let us hear what it is,' said Sir James. "'Well, you know, Chetham, I couldn't help Casabon's will. It was a sort of will to make things worse.' "'Exactly,' said Sir James. "'But what is worse?' Uh, "'Dorothy is going to be married again, you know,' said Mr. Brooke, nodding towards Celia, who immediately looked up at her husband with a frightened glance, and put her hand on his knee. Sir James was almost white with anger, but he did not speak. "'Merciful heaven!' said Mrs. Cadwallader. "'Not a young lad is law.' Brooke nodded, saying, "'Yes, to Ladislaw, and then fell into a prudential silence. "'You see, Humphrey,' said Mrs. Cadwallader, waving her arm towards her husband, "'another time you'll admit that I have some foresight, or rather you will contradict me and be just as blind as ever. You suppose that the young gentleman has gone out of the country?' "'So he might be, and yet come back,' said the rector quietly. "'When did you learn this?' said Sir James, not liking to hear anyone else speak, though finding it difficult to speak himself. "'Yesterday.' said Mr. Brooke meekly. I went to Lowick. Dorothy sent for me, you know. It had come about quite suddenly. Neither of them had any idea two days ago. Not any idea, you know. There's something singular in things. But Dorothy is quite determined. It is no use supposing. I put it strongly to her. I did my duty, Chatham. But she can act as she likes, you know. It would have been better if I had called him out and shot him a year ago, said Sir James, not from a bloody-mindedness, but because he needed something strong to say. Really, James, that would have been very disagreeable, said Celia. "'Be reasonable, Chetham. Look at the affair more quietly,' said Mr. Cadwallader, sorry to see his good-natured friend so overmastered by anger. "'That is not so very easy for a man of any dignity, with any sense of right, when the affair happens to be in his own family,' said Sir James, still in his white indignation. "'It is perfectly scandalous. If Ladislaw had had a spark of honour, he would have gone out of the country at once and never shown his face in it again. However, I am not surprised. The day after Casabon's funeral I said what ought to be done, but I was not listened to. "'You wanted what was impossible, you know, Chetham.' said Mr. Rook. "'You wanted him shipped off. I told you Ladislaw was not to be done as we liked with. He has his ideas. He was a remarkable fellow. I always said he was a remarkable fellow.' "'Yes,' said Sir James, unable to repress a retort. "'It is rather a pity you formed that high opinion of him. We are indebted to that for his being lodged in this neighbourhood. We are indebted to that for seeing a woman like Dorothea degrading herself by marrying him.' Sir James made a little stoppage between his clauses, the words not coming easily. "'A man so marked by her husband's will that delicacy ought to have forbidden her from seeing him again. "'Oh, takes her out of a proper rank, into poverty, has the madness to accept such a sacrifice, "'has always had the objectionable position, a bad origin, and, I believe, is a man of little principle and light character. "'That is my opinion.' "'Sir James ended emphatically, turning aside and crossing his leg. "'I pointed everything out to her,' said Mr. Brooke apologetically. "'I mean, the poverty in abandoning her position. "'I said, "'My dear, you don't know what it is to live on seven hundred a year "'and have no carriage and that kind of thing, "'and go amongst people who don't know who you are. "'I put it strongly to her. "'But I advise you to talk to Dorothea yourself. "'The fact is, she has a dislike to Casabon's property. "'You will hear what she says, you know.' "'No, excuse me, I shall not,' said Sir James, with more coolness. "'I cannot bear to see her again. It is too painful. "'It hurts me too much that a woman like Dorothea should have done what is wrong.' "'Be just, Chetham,' said the easy, large-lipped rector, who objected to all this unnecessary discomfort. "'Mrs. Casabon may be acting imprudently. She is giving up a fortune for the sake of a man, and we men have so poor an opinion of each other that we can hardly call the woman wise who does that. But I think you should not condemn it as a wrong action, in the strict sense of the word.' "'Yes, I do,' answered Sir James. 
I think that Dorothea commits a wrong action in marrying Ladislaw. My dear fellow, we are rather apt to consider an act wrong because it is unpleasant to us, said the rector quietly. Like many men who take life easily, he had the knack of saying a home truth, occasionally, to those who felt themselves virtuously out of temper. Sir James took out his handkerchief and began to bite the corner. "'It is very dreadful of Dodo, though,' said Celia, wishing to justify her husband. "'She said she never would marry again. Not anybody at all.' "'I heard her say the same thing myself,' said Lady Chetham majestically, as if this were royal evidence. "'Oh, there is usually a silent exception in such cases,' said Mrs. Cadwallader. "'The only wonder to me is that any of you are surprised. You did nothing to hinder it. If you would have had Lord Trilton down here to woo her with his philanthropy, he might have carried her off before the year was over. There was no safety in anything else. Mr. Casaubon had prepared all this as beautifully as possible. He made himself disagreeable, or it pleased God to make him so, and then he dared her to contradict him. It's the way to make any trumpery tempting, to ticket it at a high price in that way. "'I don't know what you mean by wrong, Cadwallader,' said Sir James, still feeling a little stung, and turning round in his chair towards the rector. "'He's not a man we can take into the family. At least I must speak for myself,' he continued, carefully keeping his eyes off Mr. Brooke. "'I suppose others will find his society too pleasant to care about the propriety of the thing.' "'Well, you know, Chetham,' said Mr. Brooke, good-humouredly, nursing his leg, "'I can't turn my back on Dorothea. I must be a father to her up to a certain point. I said, my dear, I won't refuse to give you away. I had spoken strongly before, but I can cut off the entail, you know. It will cost money and be troublesome, but I can do it, you know.' Mr. Brooke nodded at Sir James, and felt that he was both showing his own force of resolution, and propitiating what was just in the baronet's vexation. He had hit on a more ingenious mode of parrying than he was aware of. He had touched a motive of which Sir James was ashamed. The mass of his feeling about Dorothea's marriage to Ladislaw was due partly to excusable prejudice, or even justifiable opinion, partly to a jealous repugnance hardly less in Ladislaw's case than in Casabot's. He was convinced that the marriage was a fatal one for Dorothea. But amid that mass ran a vein of which he was too good and honourable a man to like the avowal even to himself. It was undeniable that the union of the two estates, Tipton and Freshett, lying charmingly within a ring-fence, was a prospect that flattered him for his son and heir. Hence, when Mr. Brooke noddingly appealed to that motive, Sir James felt a sudden embarrassment. There was a stoppage in his throat. He even blushed. He had found more words than usual in the first jet of his anger but Mr. Brooke's propitiation was more clogging to his tongue than Mr. Cadwallader's caustic hint. But Celia was glad to have room for speech after her uncle's suggestion of the marriage ceremony, and she said, though with a little eagerness of manner, as if the question had turned on an invitation to dinner, "'Do you mean that Dodo is going to be married directly, uncle?' "'In three weeks, you know,' said Mr. Brooke helplessly. "'I can do nothing to hinder it, Cadwallader,' he added, turning for a little countenance toward the rector, who said, "'I should not make any fuss about it.' If she likes to be poor, that is her affair. Nobody would have said anything if she had married the young fellow because he was rich. Plenty of beneficed clergy are poorer than they will be. Here is Eleanor, continued the provoking husband. She vexed her friends by me. I had hardly a thousand a year. I was a lout. Nobody could see anything in me. My shoes were not the right cut. All the men wondered how a woman would like me. Upon my word, I must take Ladislaw's part until I hear more harm of him. Humphrey, that is all sophistry, and you know it, said his wife. "'Everything is all one, that is, the beginning and the end with you, as if you had not been a Cadwallader. Does any one suppose that I would have taken such a monster as you by any other name?' "'And a clergyman, too,' observed Lady Chetham, with approbation. "'Eleanor cannot be said to have descended below her rank. It is difficult to say what Mr. Ladislaw is, eh, James?' Sir James gave a small grunt, which was less respectful than his usual mode of answering his mother. Celia looked up at him like a thoughtful kitten. "'It must be admitted that his blood is a frightful mixture,' said Mrs. Cadwallader. "'The Casabon cuttlefish, to begin with, and then a rebellious Polish fiddler or dancing-master. What was it? And then an old clo— "'Nonsense, Eleanor,' said the rector, rising. "'It is time for us to go.' "'After all, he is a pretty sprig,' said Mrs. Cadwallader, rising to and wishing to make amends. "'He is like the fine old Crickley portraits before the idiots came in.' "'I'll go with you,' said Mr. Brooke, starting up at the lectory. "'You must all come and dine with me to-morrow, you know, eh?' "'Celia, my dear?' "'You will, James, won't you?' said Celia, taking her husband's hand. "'Oh, of course, if you like,' said Sir James, pulling down his waistcoat, but unable yet to adjust his face good-humouredly. "'That is to say, if it is not to meet anybody else.' "'No, no, no,' said Mr. Brooke, understanding the condition. "'Dorothea will not come, you know, unless you had been to see her.' When Sir James and Celia were alone, she said, "'Do you mind about my having the carriage to go to Lowick, James?' "'What? Now, directly?' He answered with some surprise. 
"'Yes, it is very important,' said Celia. "'Remember, Celia, I cannot see her,' said Sir James. "'Not as she gave up marrying. What is the use of saying that? However, I am going to the stables. I'll tell Briggs to bring the carriage round.' Celia thought it was of great use, if not to say that, at least to take a journey to Loig in order to influence Dorothea's mind. All through their girlhood she had felt that she could act on her sister by a word judiciously placed, by opening a little window for the daylight of her own understanding to enter among the strange coloured lamps by which Dodo habitually saw, and Celia, the matron, naturally felt more able to advise her childless sister. How could anyone understand Dodo so well as Celia did, or love her so tenderly? Dorothea, busy in her boudoir, felt a glow of pleasure at the sight of her sister so soon after the revelation of her intended marriage. She had prefigured to herself, even with exaggeration, the disgust of her friends, and she had even feared that Celia might be kept aloof from her. "'Oh, Kitty, I am delighted to see you,' said Dorothea, putting her hands on Celia's shoulders and beaming on her. "'I almost thought you would not come to me.' "'I have not brought Arthur, because I was in a hurry.' said Celia, and they sat down on two small chairs opposite each other, with their knees touching. "'You know, Dodo, it is very bad,' said Celia, in her placid guttural, looking as prettily free from humours as possible. "'You have disappointed us all so, and I can't think that it ever will be. You never can go and live in that way. And then there are all your plans. You never can have thought of that. James would have taken any trouble for you, and you might have gone all your life doing what you liked.' "'On the contrary, dear.' said Dorothea. I never could do anything that I liked. I've never carried out any plan yet. Because you always wanted things that wouldn't do. But other plans would have come. And how can you marry Mr. Ladislaw, that we none of us ever thought you could marry? It shocks James so dreadfully. And then it is all so different from what you have always been. You would have Mr. Casabon, because he had such a great soul, and was so dismal and learned. And now to think of marrying Mr. Ladislaw, who has got no estate or anything— I suppose it is because you must be making yourself uncomfortable in some way or other. Dorothea laughed. Oh, it is very serious, Dodo, said Celia, becoming more impressive. How will you live? And you will go away among queer people, and I shall never see you, and you won't mind about little Arthur, and I always thought you would— Celia's rare tears had got into her eyes, and the corners of her mouth were agitated. Dear Celia, said Dorothea, with tender gravity, if you don't ever see me, it will not be my fault. "'Yes, it will,' said Celia, with the same touching distortion of her small features. "'How can I come to you, or have you with me, when James can't bear it? That is because he thinks it is not right. He thinks you are so wrong, Dodo. But you always were wrong, only I can't help loving you, and nobody can think where you will live. Where can you go?' "'I am going to London,' said Dorothea. "'And how can you always live in a street? And you will be so poor. I could give you half my things, only how can I when I never see you?' "'Bless you, Kitty,' said Dorothea, with gentle warmth. "'Take comfort. Perhaps James will forgive me some time.' "'But it would be much better if you would not be married,' said Celia, drying her eyes and returning to her argument. "'Then there would be nothing uncomfortable, and you would not do what nobody thought you could do. James always said you ought to be a queen, but this is not at all being like a queen. You know what mistakes you have always been making, Dodo, and this is another. Nobody thinks Mr. Ladislaw a proper husband for you, and you said you would never be married again.' "'It is quite true that I might be a wiser person, Celia,' said Dorothea, "'and I said I might have done something better if I had been better. "'But this is what I am going to do. "'I have promised to marry Mr. Ladislaw, and I am going to marry him.' "'The tone in which Dorothea said this was a note that Celia had long learned to recognize. "'She was silent a few moments, and then said, as if she had dismissed all contest, "'Is he very fond of you, Dodo?' "'I hope so. I am very fond of him. Well, that is nice.' said Celia comfortably. "'Only I'd rather you had such a sort of husband as James is, with a place very near, that I could drive to.' Dorothea smiled, and Celia looked rather meditative. Presently she said, "'I cannot think how it all came about.' Celia thought it would be pleasant to hear the story. "'I dare say not,' said Dorothea, pinching her sister's chin. "'If you knew how it came about, it would not seem wonderful to you.' "'Can't you tell me?' said Celia, settling her arms cosily. "'No, dear.' You would have to feel with me, as you would never know. End of chapter 84 As read for LibriVox by Madame Tusk www.rlowalrus.sitesled.com Chapter 85 Middlemarch 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Middlemarch by George Eliot. Chapter 85. Then went the jury out, whose names were Mr. Blindman, Mr. No Good, Mr. Malice, Mr. Lovelust, Mr. Live Loose, Mr. Heady, Mr. High Mind, Mr. Enmity, Mr. Liar, Mr. Cruelty, Mr. Hate Light, Mr. Implacable, who every one gave in his private verdict against him among themselves, and afterwards unanimously concluded to bring him in guilty before the judge. And first among themselves, Mr. Blindman, the foreman, said, I see clearly that this man is a heretic. Then said Mr. No Good, Away with such a fellow from the earth. I, said Mr. Malice, for I hate the very look of him. Then said Mr. Lovelust, I could never endure him. Nor I, said Mr. Live Loose, for he would be always condemning my way. Hang him, hang him, said Mr. Heady. A sorry scrub, said Mr. High Mind. My heart riseth against him, said Mr. Enmity. He is a rogue, said Mr. Liar. Hanging is too good for him, said Mr. Cruelty. Let us dispatch him out of the way, said Mr. Hate Light. Then said Mr. Implacable, Might I have all the world given me, I could not be reconciled to him. Therefore, let us forthwith bring him in guilty of death. Pilgrim's Progress When immortal Bunyan makes his picture of the persecuting passions bringing in their verdict of guilty, who pities faithful? That is a rare and blessed lot, which some greatest men have not attained to know ourselves guiltless before a condemning crowd, to be sure that what we are denounced for is solely the good in us. The pitiable lot is that of the man who could not call himself a martyr, even though he were to persuade himself that the men who stoned him were but ugly passions incarnate, who knows that he is stoned not for professing to be right, but for not being the man he professed to be. This was the consciousness that Bulstrode was withering under while he made his preparations for departing from Middlemarch, and going to end his stricken life in that sad refuge, the indifference of new faces. The duteous, merciful constancy of his wife had delivered him from one dread, but it could not hinder her presence from being still a tribunal before which he shrank from confession and desired advocacy. His equivocations with himself about the death of Raffles had sustained the conception of an omniscience whom he prayed to, yet he had a terror upon him which would not let him expose them to judgment by a full confession to his wife. The axe which he had washed and diluted with inward argument and motive, and for which it seemed comparatively easy to win invisible pardon, what name would she call them by? That she should ever silently call his axe murder was what he could not bear. He felt shrouded by her doubt. He got strength to face her from the sense that she could not yet feel warranted in pronouncing that worst condemnation on him. Some time, perhaps, when he was dying, he would tell her all. In the deep shadow of that time, when she held his hand in the gathering darkness, she might listen without recoiling from his touch. Perhaps. But concealment had been the habit of his life, and the impulse to confession had no power against the dread of a deeper humiliation. He was full of timid care for his wife, not only because he depreciated any harshness of judgment from her, but because he felt a deep distress at the sight of her suffering. She had sent her daughters away to board at a school on the coast, that this crisis might be hidden from them as far as possible. Set free by their absence from the intolerable necessity of accounting for her grief, or of beholding their frightened wonder, she could live unconstrainedly in the sorrow that was every day streaking her hair with whiteness and making her eyelids languid. "'Tell me anything that you would like to have me do, Harriet,' Bulstrode had said to her. "'I mean with regard to arrangements of property.' It is my intention not to sell the land I possess in this neighbourhood, but to leave it to you as a safe provision. If you have any wish on such subjects, do not conceal it from me." A few days afterwards, when she had returned from a visit to her brother's, she began to speak to her husband on a subject which had for some time been in her mind. "'I should like to do something for my brother's family, Nicholas, and I think we are bound to make some amends to Rosamond and her husband. Walter says Mr. Lydgate must leave the town, and his practice is almost good for nothing, and they have very little left to settle anywhere with. I would rather do without something for ourselves, to make some amends to my poor brother's family. Mrs. Bulstrode did not wish to go nearer to the facts than in the phrase, make some amends, knowing that her husband must understand her. He had a particular reason which she was not aware of for wincing under her suggestion. He hesitated before he said, 
"'It is not possible to carry out your wish in the way you propose, my dear. "'Mr. Lydgate has virtually rejected any further service from me. "'He has returned the thousand pounds I lent him. "'Mrs. Casabon advanced him the sum for that purpose. "'Here is his letter.' "'The letter seemed to cut Mrs. Bulstrode severely. "'The mention of Mrs. Casabon's loan seemed a reflection of that public feeling "'which held it a matter of course that every one would avoid a connection with her husband.' She was silent for some time, and the tears fell one after the other, her chin trembling as she wiped them away. Bulstrode, sitting opposite to her, ached at the sight of that grief-worn face, which two months before had been bright and blooming. It had aged to keep sad company with his own withered features. Urged into some effort at comforting her, he said, "'There is another means, Harriet, by which I might do a service to your brother's family, if you like to act on it.' and it would i think be beneficial to you it would be an advantageous way of managing the land which i mean to be yours she looked attentive garth once thought of undertaking the management of stone court in order to place your nephew fred there the stock was to remain as it is and they were to pay a certain share of the profits instead of an ordinary rent that would be a desirable beginning for the young man in conjunction with his employment under garth would it be a satisfaction to you yes it would said Mrs. Bulstrode, with some return of energy. "'Poor Walter is so cast down. I would try anything in my power to do him good before I go away. We have always been brother and sister.' "'You must make the proposal to Garth yourself, Harriet,' said Mr. Bulstrode, not liking what he had to say, but desiring the end he had in view, for other reasons, besides the consolation of his wife. "'You must state to him that the land is virtually yours, and that he need have no transactions with me.' "'Communications can be made through Standish. "'I mention this because Garth gave up being my agent. "'I can put into your hands a paper which he himself drew up, "'stating conditions, and you can propose his renewed acceptance of them. "'I think it is not unlikely that he will accept "'when you propose the thing for the sake of your nephew.'" End of chapter 85 As read for LibriVox by Madame Tusk www.rlowalrus.sitesled.com Chapter 86 and Finale of Middlemarch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Middlemarch by George Eliot. Chapter 86 and Finale. Chapter 86. Le coeur si sartre d'amour comme d'un seul de qui la conserve de la incorruptible adherence de que si c'est c'est un des larves de la vie et la fraîcheur des vieilles émaux prolonge. Il existe un embarrement d'amour cest de Daphnis et Chloe qui s'en fait filament et balsi. Cette vieillesse est la ressemblance de soi avec la war. Victor Hugo, la homme qui rit. Mrs. Garth, hearing Caleb enter the passage about tea time, opened the parlor door and said, There you are, Caleb. Have you had your dinner? Mr. Garth's meals were much subordinated to business. Oh, yes, a good dinner. Cold mutton and I don't know what. Where's Mary? In the garden with Letty, I think. Fred has not come yet? No. Are you going out again without taking tea, Caleb? said Mrs. Garth, seeing that her absent-minded husband was putting on again the hat which he had just taken off. No, no. I'm going to Mary for a minute. Mary was in a grassy corner of the garden, where there was a swing loftily hung between two pear trees. She had a pink kerchief tied over her head, making a little poke to shade her eyes from the level sunbeams, while she was giving a glorious swing to Letty, who laughed and screamed wildly. Seeing her father, Mary left the swing and went to meet him, pushing back the pink kerchief and smiling afar off at him with the involuntary smile of loving pleasure. "'I came to look for you, Mary,' said Mr. Garth. "'Let us walk about a bit.' 
Mary knew quite well that her father had something particular to say. His eyebrows made their pathetic angle, and there was a tender gravity in his voice. These things had been signs to her when she was Letty's age. She put her arm within his, and they turned by the row of nut trees. It will be a sad while before you can be married, Mary, said her father, not looking at her, but at the end of his stick, which he held in his other hand. Not a sad while, father, I mean to be merry, said Mary, laughingly. I have been single and merry for four and twenty years and more. I suppose it will not be quite as long again as that. Then after a little pause, she said more gravely, bending her face before her father's, If you are contented with Fred? Caleb screwed up his mouth and turned his head aside wisely. Now, father, you did praise him last Wednesday. You said he had an uncommon notion of stock and a good eye for things. Did I? said Caleb rather slyly. Yes, I put it all down and the date. Anno Domini and everything, said Mary. You like things to be neatly booked. And then his behavior to you, father, is really good. He has a deep respect for you, and it is impossible to have a better temper than Fred has. Ay, ay, you want to coax me into thinking him a fine match. No, indeed, father, I don't love him because he is a fine match. What for, then? Oh, dear, because I have always loved him. I should never like scolding anyone else so well, and that is a point to be thought of in a husband. "'Your mind is quite settled, then, Mary,' said Caleb, returning to his first tone. "'There's no other wish come into it since things have gone on as they have been of late?' Caleb meant a great deal in that vague phrase, "'because better late than never. "'A woman must not force her heart. "'She'll do a man no good by that.' "'My feelings have not changed, father,' said Mary calmly. "'I shall be constant to Fred as long as he is constant to me.' I don't think either of us could spare the other, or like anyone else better, however much we might admire them. It would make too great a difference to us, like seeing all the old places altered, and changing the name for everything. We must wait for each other a long while, but Fred knows that. Instead of speaking immediately, Caleb stood still, and screwed his stick on the grassy walk. Then he said, with emotion in his voice, "'Well, I've got a bit of news. What do you think of Fred going to live at Stone Court and managing the land there?' "'How can that ever be, father?' said Mary, wonderingly. "'He would manage it for his Aunt Bulstrode. The poor woman has been to me begging and praying. She wants to do the lad good, and it might be a fine thing for him. With saving, he might gradually buy the stock, and he has a turn for farming.' oh fred would be so happy it is too good to believe ah but mind you said caleb turning his head warningly i must take it on my shoulders and be responsible and see after everything and that will grieve your mother a bit though she mayn't say so fred had need be careful perhaps it is too much father said mary checked in her joy there would be no happiness in bringing you any fresh trouble "'Nay, nay, work is my delight, child, when it doesn't vex your mother. "'And then, if you and Fred get married,' here Caleb's voice shook just perceptibly, "'he'll be steady and saving, and you've got your mother's cleverness, and mine too, in a woman's sort of way, "'and you'll keep him in order. "'He'll be coming by and by, so I wanted to tell you first, "'because I think you'd like to tell him by yourselves. "'After that, I could talk it well over with him, and we could go into business and the nature of things.' oh you dear good father cried mary putting her hands round her father's neck while he bent his head placidly willing to be caressed i wonder if any other girl thinks her father the best man in the world nonsense child you'll think your husband better impossible said mary relapsing into her usual tone husbands are an inferior class of men who require keeping in order when they were entering the house with Letty, who had run to join them, Mary saw Fred at the orchard gate and went to meet him. "'What fine clothes you wear, you extravagant youth!' said Mary, as Fred stood still and raised his hat to her with playful formality. "'You are not learning economy.' 
now that is too bad mary said fred just look at the edges of these coat cuffs it is only by dint of good brushing that i look respectable i am saving up three suits one for a wedding suit how very droll you will look like a gentleman in an old-fashioned book oh no they will keep two years two years be reasonable fred said mary turning to walk don't discourage flattering expectations why not one lives on them better than on unflattering ones if we can't be married in two years the truth will be quite bad enough when it comes i have heard a story of a young gentleman who once encouraged flattering expectations and they did him harm mary if you've got something discouraging to tell me i shall bolt i shall go into the house to mr garth i am out of spirits my father is so cut up home is not like itself i can't bear any more bad news should you call it bad news to be told that you are to live at stone court and manage the farm and be remarkably prudent and save money every year till all the stock and furniture were your own and you are a distinguished agricultural character as mr borthrop trumbull says rather stout i fear and with the greek and latin sadly weather-worn you don't mean anything except nonsense mary said fred colouring slightly nevertheless that is what my father has just told me of as what may happen and he never talks nonsense said mary looking up at fred now while he grasped her hand as they walked till it rather hurt her but she would not complain oh i could be a tremendously good fellow then mary and we could be married directly not so fast sir how do you know that i would not rather defer our marriage for some years that would leave you time to misbehave and then if i liked some one else better i should have an excuse for jilting you pray don't joke mary said fred with strong feeling tell me seriously that all this is true and that you are happy because of it because you love me best it is all true fred and i am happy because of it because i love you best said mary in a tone of obedient recitation they lingered on the doorstep under the steep roofed porch and fred almost in a whisper said when we were first engaged with the umbrella ring mary you used to the spirit of joy began to laugh more decidedly in mary's eyes but the fatal ben came running to the door with brownie yapping behind him and bouncing against them said fred and mary are you coming in or may i eat your cake finale every limit is a beginning as well as an ending who can quit young lives after being long in company with them and not desire to know what befell them in their after years for the fragment of a life however typical it is not the sample of an even web promises may not be kept and an ardent outset may be followed by declension latent powers may find their long-waited opportunity a past error may urge a grand retrieval marriage which has been the bourne of so many narratives is still a great beginning as it was to adam and eve who kept their honeymoon in eden but had their first little one among the thorns and thistles of the wilderness it is still the beginning of the home epic the gradual conquest or irremediable loss of that complete union which makes the advancing years a climax and age the harvest of sweet memories in common some set out like crusaders of old with a glorious equipment of hope and enthusiasm and get broken by the way wanting patience with each other and the world all who have cared for fred vincey and mary garth will like to know that these two made no such failure but achieved a solid mutual happiness fred surprised his neighbors in various ways he became rather distinguished in his side of the county as a theoretic and practical farmer and produced a work on the cultivation of green crops and the economy of cattle feeding which won him high congratulations at agricultural meetings in middlemarch admiration was more reserved most persons there were inclined to believe that the merit of fred's authorship was due to his wife since they had never expected fred vincey to write on turnips and mangle wurzel 
but when mary wrote a little book for her boys called stories of great men taken from plutrarch and had it printed and published by grip and company middlemarch every one in the town was willing to give the credit of this work to fred observing that he had been to the university where the ancients were studied and might have been a clergyman if he had chosen in this way it was made clear that middlemarch had never been deceived and that there was no need to praise anybody for writing a book since it was always done by somebody else moreover fred remained unswervingly steady some years after his marriage he told mary that his happiness was half owing to fairbrother who gave him a strong pull-up at the right moment I cannot say that he was never again misled by his hopefulness, the yield of crops or the profits of a cattle sale usually fell below his estimate, and he was always prone to believe that he could make money by the purchase of a horse, which turned out badly, though this, Mary observed, was of course the fault of the horse, not of Fred's judgment. He kept his love of horsemanship, but he rarely allowed himself a day's hunting, and when he did so it was remarkable that he submitted to be laughed at for cowardliness at the fences, seeming to see Mary and the boys sitting on the five-barred gate or showing their curly heads between hedge and ditch. There were three boys. Mary was not discontented that she brought forth men-children only, and when Fred wished to have a girl like her, she said laughingly, That would be too great a trial to your mother. Mrs. Vincy, in her declining years, and in the diminished luster of her housekeeping, was much comforted by her perception that two at least of Fred's boys were real Vincy's and did not feature the Garths but mary secretly rejoiced that the youngest of the three was very much what her father must have been when he wore a round jacket and showed a marvellous nicety of aim in playing at marbles or in throwing stones to bring down the mellow pears ben and letty garth who were uncle and aunt before they were well in their teens disputed much as to whether nephews or nieces were more desirable Ben contending that it was clear girls were good for less than boys, else they would not be always in petticoats, which showed how little they were meant for, whereupon Letty, who argued much from books, got angry in replying that God made coats of skin for both Adam and Eve alike. Also it occurred to her that in the East the men too wore petticoats. But this latter argument obscuring the majesty of the former, was one too many, for Ben answered contemptuously, The more spoonies they! and immediately appealed to his mother whether boys were not better than girls. Mrs. Garth pronounced that both were alike naughty, but that boys were undoubtedly stronger, could run faster, and throw with more precision to a greater distance with this oracular sentence ben was well satisfied not minding the naughtiness but letty took it ill her feeling of superiority being stronger than her muscles fred never became rich his hopefulness had not led him to expect that but he gradually saved enough to become owner of the stock and furniture at stone court and the work which mr garth put into his hands carried him in plenty through those bad times which are always present with farmers mary in her matronly days became as solid in figure as her mother but unlike her gave the boys little formal teaching so that mrs garth was alarmed lest they should never be well grounded in grammar and geography Nevertheless, they were found quite forward enough when they went to school, perhaps, because they had liked nothing so well as being with their mother. When Fred was riding home on winter evenings, he had a pleasant vision beforehand of the bright hearth in the wainscoted parlor, and was sorry for other men who could not have Mary for their wife, especially for Mr. Fairbrother. He was ten times worthier of you than I was friend could now say to her magnanimously to be sure he was mary answered and for that reason he could do better without me but you i shudder to think what you would have been a curate in debt for horse hire and cambric pocket handkerchiefs on inquiry it might possibly be found that fred and mary still inhabit stone court 
that the creeping plants still cast the foam of their blossoms over the fine stone wall into the field where the walnut trees stand in stately row and that on sunny days the two lovers who were first engaged with the umbrella ring may be seen in white-haired placidity at the open window from which mary garth in the days of old peter featherstone had often been ordered to look out for mr lydgate lydgate's hair never became white he died when he was only fifty leaving his wife and children provided for by a heavy insurance on his life he had gained an excellent practice alternating according to the season between london and a continental bathing place having written a treatise on gout a disease which has a good deal of wealth on its side his skill was relied on by many paying patients but he always regarded himself as a failure he had not done what he once meant to do his acquaintances thought him enviable to have so charming a wife and nothing happened to shake their opinion rosamond never committed a second compromising indiscretion she simply continued to be mild in her temper inflexible in her judgment disposed to admonish her husband and able to frustrate him by stratagem as the years went on he opposed her less and less whence rosamond concluded that he had learned the value of her opinion on the other hand she had a more thorough conviction of his talents now that he had gained a good income and instead of the threatened cage in bride street provided one all flowers and gilding fit for the bird of paradise that she resembled in brief lydgate was what is called a successful man but he died prematurely of diphtheria and rosamond afterwards married an elderly and wealthy physician who took kindly to her four children she made a very pretty show with her daughters driving out in her carriage and often spoke of her happiness as a reward she did not say for what but probably she meant that it was a reward for her patience with tertius whose temper never became faultless and to the last occasionally let slip a bitter speech which was more memorable than the signs he made of his repentance he once called her his basil plant and when she asked for an explanation said that basil was a plant which had flourished wonderfully on a murdered man's brains rosamond had a placid but strong answer to such speeches why then had he chosen her it was a pity he had not had mrs ladislaw whom he was always praising and placing above her and thus the conversation ended with the advantage on rosamond's side but it would be unjust not to tell that she never uttered a word in depreciation of dorothea keeping in religious remembrance the generosity which had come to her aid in the sharpest crisis of her life dorothea herself had no dreams of being praised above other women feeling that there was always something better which she might have done if she had only been better and known better still she never repented that she had given a position and fortune to marry will ladislaw and he would have held it the greatest shame as well as sorrow to him if she had repented they were bound to each other by a love stronger than any impulses which could have marred it no life would have been possible to dorothea which was not filled with emotion and she had now a life filled also with a beneficent activity which she had not the doubtful pains of discovering and marking out for herself will became an ardent public man working well in those times when reforms were begun with a young hopefulness of immediate good which has been much checked in our days and getting at last returned to parliament by a constituency who paid his expenses dorothea could have liked nothing better since wrongs existed than that her husband should be in the thick of a struggle against them and that she should give him wifely help many who knew her thought it a pity that so substantive and rare a creature should have been absorbed into the life of another and be only known in a certain circle as a wife and mother 
but no one stated exactly what else that was in her power she ought rather to have done not even sir james chetham who went no further than the negative prescription that she ought not to have married will ladislaw but this opinion of his did not cause a lasting alienation and the way in which the family was made whole again was characteristic of all concerned mr brooke could not resist the pleasure of corresponding with will and dorothea and one morning when his pen had been remarkably fluent on the prospects of municipal reform it ran off into an invitation to the grange which once written could not be done away with at less cost than the sacrifice hardly to be conceived of the whole valuable letter during the months of this correspondence, Mr. Brooke had continually, in his talk with Sir James Chetham, been presupposing or hinting that the intention of cutting off the entail was still maintained, and the day on which his pen gave the daring invitation, he went to Freshet expressly to intimate that he had a stronger sense than ever of the reasons for taking that energetic step as a precaution against any mixture of low blood in the air of the brook brookses but that morning something exciting had happened at the hall a letter had come to celia which made her cry silently as she read it and when sir james unused to see her in tears asked anxiously what was the matter she burst out in a wail such as he had never heard from her before dorothea has a little boy and you will not let me go and see her and i'm sure she wants to see me and she will not know what to do with the baby she will do wrong things with it and they thought she would die it is dreadful suppose it had been me and little arthur and dodo had been hindered from coming to see me i wish you would be less unkind james good heaven celia said sir james much wrought upon what do you wish i will do anything you like i will take you to town to-morrow if you wish it and celia did wish it it was after this that mr brooke came and meeting the baronet in the grounds began to chat with him in ignorance of the news which sir james for some reason did not care to tell him immediately but when the entail was touched on in the usual way he said my dear sir it is not for me to dictate to you but for my part i would let that alone i would let things remain as they are Mr. Brooke felt so much surprised that he did not at once find out how much he was relieved by the sense that he was not expected to do anything in particular. Such being the bent of Celia's heart, it was inevitable that Sir James should consent to a reconciliation with Dorothea and her husband. Where women love each other, men learn to smother their mutual dislike sir james never liked ladislaw and will always preferred to have sir james's company mixed with another kind they were on a footing of reciprocal tolerance which was made quite easy only when dorothea and celia were present it became an understood thing that mr and mrs ladislaw should pay at least two visits during the year to the grange and there came gradually a small row of cousins at freshet who enjoyed playing with the two cousins visiting tipton as much as if the blood of these cousins had been less dubiously mixed mr brooke lived to a good old age and his estate was inherited by dorothea's son who might have represented middlemarch but declined thinking that his opinions had less chance of being stifled if he remained out of doors sir james never ceased to regard dorothea's second marriage as a mistake and indeed this remained the tradition concerning it in middlemarch where she was spoken of to a younger generation as a fine girl who married a sickly clergyman old enough to be her father and in little more than a year after his death gave up her estate to marry his cousin young enough to have been his son with no property and not well born those who had not seen anything of Dorothea usually observed that she could not have been a nice woman, else she would not have married either the one or the other. Certainly those determining acts of her life were not ideally beautiful. 
they were the mixed result of young and noble impulse struggling amidst the conditions of an imperfect social state in which great feelings will often take the aspect of error and great faith the aspect of illusion for there is no creature whose inward being is so strong that it is not greatly determined but what lies outside it a new Teresa will hardly have the opportunity of reforming a conventional life any more than a new Antigone will spend her heroic piety in daring all for the sake of a brother's burial, the medium in which their ardent deeds took shape is forever gone. But we, insignificant people, with our daily words and acts, are preparing the lives of many Dorotheas, some of which may present a far sadder sacrifice than that of the Dorothea whose story we know. Her finely touched spirit had still its fine issues, though they were not widely visible. Her full nature, like that river of which Cyrus broke the strength, spent itself in channels which had no great name on the earth. But the effect of her being on those around her was incalculably diffusive, for the growing good of the world is partly dependent on unhistoric acts, and that things are not so ill with you and me as they might have been, is half owing to the number who lived faithfully a hidden life and rest in unvisited tombs. End of chapter 86 and finale. Recording by Aaron Elliott, St. Louis, Missouri. End of Middlemarch by George Elliott.